What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Tuesday, March 5th, 2024, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours on today's show. Texas basketball implodes in Waco. Plus, is Arch Manning really doing that? We'll talk some NFL as well. A massive shakeup in the quarterback market as Russell Wilson has been released by the Denver Broncos. We'll talk about where the Broncos go from here and where Russ goes from here. Dak Prescott spoke at a charity event in Dallas yesterday about his future with the Cowboys. We'll talk about that. And, uh, oh, yeah, Texas baseball hosts Texas A&M at the dish tonight. We are locked and loaded on a Tuesday morning here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. What's going on, Buck? Uh, just another day in paradise, which will it will be. Another summer day here in Austin in March, man. I'm loving it. I, I'm loving it. I know in another month or two I'm going to be bitching about it's too hot. Whatever happened to winter. But, man, I'm not bitching about 88 today. Or yesterday, I thought it was just fantastic, you know. It's just that um, got to get to my gardening, man. I've been spending some time in the garden. My guys are here getting some work done yesterday. I'm ready to – I better start planting now or this stuff going to be burned up in a week. Forget waiting till April before it burns up. Hell, it may be burning out in March the way the weather's going, BK. It's going to be beautiful again today. Yeah, I stopped by Leaf Landscape Supply, one of our newest sponsors here on TSU. And yeah, there was, was a lot of people there. That place was packed, and I'm like, I live in an apartment, but I'm thinking I need some plants right now, and I'm like, no, I can barely keep myself alive. Ain't no way I'm going to be able to keep a plant alive. (laughs) That's the fun in it. It dies, you go get another one. Uh, Is that fun? It's all right, man. It's all right. Some of it can just got to – certain things about plants is you put them in one spot and you don't move them. People have a tendency, oh, let's try it over here a little bit. Let's move it over here. Once they get to a spot that they like, where the sun hits them the, the right way and they get shaded and watered. They don't, they don't like to be moved. They, mm. they don't, they don't like to be moved around. People have a tendency to move things around, you know, Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't look good here, but it's been doing all right. And then you put it in a spot and then it just dies. It just, they don't, they don't like movement. They, they really don't. Whether it's a pot or in the ground, they don't like to be moved. How do you know that you talk to the plants? I am a whisperer. Yes. I'm a leaf whisperer. <laughs> Okay, so Sark is a quarterback whisperer, and you're a leaf whisperer? Yes, yes, I am. Huh, interesting. By yeah, the way, have, you, have you heard any of my forecast for rain anytime soon? I've not. No, no reason to. No rain coming up? No, we're going to go through this week, nothing. You sure? I'm pretty sure, yes. Okay. I am, I'm pretty sure. I, I mean, I mean, did you see the folks in Leaf? Were they there? Their trucks, big trucks, loading up stuff too. That place is always busy, man. Yeah, they uh, they asked me if I'm a big plant guy, and I said, "Oh, I've been a plant guy for a long time." Yeah. And oh yeah, like, yeah. I love the nature, the plants. Yes, I do. They're like, "Not that plant, you idiot!" And I was like, "Oh yeah, you're right." Now, one of these days, I'll be a plant guy. I was yeah, talking to uh, Caitlin behind the counter, and she's like. I told her I lived in an apartment, so I don't really have space for plants. And she's like, well, do you have a balcony? I'm like, yes. There she's you like, go. Well, let me show you a picture of my balcony from the apartment I lived in. Like, jung- like a jungle? Oh, my God. There were 50 plants on that thing. <laughs> that looked like a lot of work, didn't it? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah, how long does it take you to water all these plants? And she's like, oh, not that long. I only water them a couple of days and I'm, uh, or a couple of days a week. And I'm like, that's a lot of work, isn't it? She's yeah, like, yeah. no. She's invested and she's emotionally invested. So if a leaf starts to turn a different color or gets, you know, a little dried out, she probably cries. She gets very emotionally involved and there's no doubt about it. I was like, how do you tell when you need to water the plant? She's like, oh, you just look at it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I don't just look at it. You work at Leaf Landscape Supply. You're an expert here. I, this is not what I do. This is what you do. So I one of these see- days. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. I. I really am. You know, this is a big, it's a big deal for me because I've always been, I've been a gardener, but I've been one of those small type of little area gardeners. I'm not, I'm not adventured into a, almost a 15 by 15 garden. And that's, that's a really big deal for me. So I'm putting boxes inside and it's got to be fenced in because that stupid Louie, this morning I saw him 
the guys that come and put the post in yesterday, you know, then they'll put the, the metal stuff around and then they'll put boxes inside of inside of the but dude was all dirty and nasty because he's laying in the dirt that I just took off the truck and put in there. Mm. The foundation that's been in there. That dog's I mean, he's just he's stupid. I mean, I hey. I mean I, I've never had a dog, I never had an animal so dumb as this dude. And last night was the 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 kicker last night. The freaking Beverly Hillbillies that live right beside me over here with all the goats and and ducks and geese and chickens and turkeys. I mean, the dogs were – dude, the dogs started at like 1.30 this morning. You know, the, the big Pyrenees bark, the deep boy. Dude, they were still at it at 3.30 this morning. And I actually went out on the deck and said, shut up. <laughs> it took you two hours to do that? Yes. I mean, I, I you, oh. some, at some point you get used to the bark and you sleep through it. And I haven't been getting a lot of sleep. You know, I, I just, I just haven't lately. And so I, I got up, I didn't cut the light on cause it would have freaked my wife out, but she heard me of course, get up in the sliding glass door and tell the dogs to shut the hell up. Did it work? Uh, it, it really did. It did for, it did. I mean, I went to bed and I got about another two hours in. So I get a, I got a full four hours of sleep last night, uh. but it's 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 it does that when when people's animals next to you start going like if the rooster starts his thing at like two o'clock in the morning with cock a doodle doos or whatever he does and then the goats start and then everything and now they got them they're closer to my fence now i got a bunch of goats that are close to my fence area over here so the dogs they're doing their job they think they're you know great pyrenees are supposed to be protectors so they think they're protecting those animals plus you know what there's been some coyotes spotted by me, you know, down by the fence. And you know what those coyotes want? They smell them chickens and them goats and them mm. turkeys. They don't care. And so my dogs go nuts. They just go down there and start barking at them. But the coyotes don't leave. They're trying to find a way in over there. Now, they're not going to mess. Those coyotes aren't going to mess with those big ass cows. But if they keep it up, they're going to have they're going to have some weird mountain lion come from some distance to have a really good meal. If, if one of those goats sticks their heads through the fence and the coyotes, I mean, they will chop it off and just eat the head. God, <laughs> you got to get a Red Rider BB gun and no. start taking some yeah. shots at that rooster. Oh, no, I don't, I don't have a, I've got a real, I got the real thing, but, oh. and it doesn't make much noise, but I can't do that. They're just trying to live. They're just, you know, this is what they do. They're waiting for Armageddon. I don't know. I don't know where they're packing all this meat and stuff because they're the same four cows that I've seen three years ago. I yeah. mean, nothing's changed. I'm like, maybe, what are they, pets now? I don't know. It's man. nuts. It's nuts. Good morning to the soldiers at Fort Cabasas, Texas, the soldiers in the state of Texas, and all those that fight for us each and every day. Thank you so much for what you do. We do appreciate your service, and do be careful out there, please. Yes, yes indeed. Shout out, Ruse Goofy Growing. Me and Ruse. Both talk to the plants. I think y'all are talking to different plants. And yes. uh-oh. For the first time in the history of this great program, we might have a weather off because our girl Dee Dee is claiming that we are going to be getting rain on Thursday and Friday. And she is saying this after the buck has said there is no rain in the forecast this week. So I'm not feeling it, Dee Dee. Might have a duel here between the buck and Dee Dee on the is weather. She, is she trying to get rid of me as the official rainmaker? I don't know, but if she's right and you're wrong, she might what does take that mean? the status. What does that mean? I'm in the 90 percentile. I, I mean, I can afford to be. She's just coming into her own now. You think one forecast by DD makes her the brilliance of the buck? I don't think so. Not when it, calls, not when it comes to forecasting rain. Yeah, you've been chilly lately with your predictions. You're on a little bit of a cold streak, so you're losing your lead as the Foremost weather authority on Texas sports unfiltered, and there might be. I'm, becoming a just, I'm just becoming a guesser again. You're just a guesser again, so we'll see. Didi might be uh, trying to take your title as the TSU weather person. Let me check out one of my weather forecasting. <laughs> oh, Stop. oh, wait, you're just copying what everyone no, else says. I'm just, dropping, I'm just copying what Didi's probably looking at. Okay, well, I figured you had she this is. by yourself. You always talk about your back and your she hips is. and your shoulders being the reason you could tell what the weather is going to be. She's got a little percentage on Friday. Very low. 
35 percent around this place is my is like zero percent okay sorry All right. dude. not we'll gonna see happen. It. we'll see how it goes the bug versus dd that's hilarious well you said you were up late last night and my guess is you were up late watching that disaster in waco as awesome. texas falls to the baylor bears 93 to 85 the final score the last scheduled meeting between the two teams, of course, with Texas moving to the SEC after this season. Texas led by as many as 14 points in the first half of this one. They took an eight-point lead into the locker room at halftime. They actually pushed the gap back to double digits early in the second half, but they were unable to hold on. Baylor went on a 24-4 to run at one point in the second half to take the lead and really take control, and they never – Gave it up. So no. felt like Texas was in a great spot to get a big time road win. And unfortunately, they let things slip away in the second half and they come up short in Waco. Yeah, you know what? They had a really good first half. They did some really nice things early in the game. And then they they forgot to cover that bridges dude, the six nine shooter. I mean, they just they didn't they didn't even cover him. They just he was just popping threes, getting open, rising over the top of guys. That was a very poor defensive effort on that guy. I don't care if you tried everybody on your bench. Somebody should have got a shot at that guy to, to hold him down. He was the only threat. He was crushing them in the second half. He was making jumper after jumper. When Texas would not run off to a lead that looks like it was going to get even bigger, that guy would make a big a big shot. And they didn't defend him well. And, and nobody was nobody denied him the ball. They gave him the ball. He was going to – he's 6'9". He's going to get his shot. I think – a lot of times, once again, you look at the big guy and you say, well, I don't want him going by me. Let's let him have this jumper. Okay. Then that guy was hitting his jumpers. He wasn't – I mean, he didn't have to go by. He was shooting over the top. I mean, he was shooting over the top of, of taller players. They just – they never denied the ball to him. Yeah, it was, it was a struggle defensively for yeah. both teams. And, you know, Baylor got to 93 points. And you're right, Jalen Bridges led Baylor with 32 last night. And he made – what six threes? He was six of seven from wow. downtown yesterday. You gotta be in that guy's face now. You can't yeah. let him shoot threes like that. And I'll give Baylor some credit, right? They were running Jalen Bridges all over the floor, and whoever yes. was guarding him, I mean, they were setting so many off ball screens too to create open looks for Jalen Bridges. I think Scott Drew realized early on that he was hot and like, okay, let's get this guy as many open looks as possible. And Texas wasn't really switching on any of the screens, like whoever was guarding Jalen Bridges running man around man, the screens. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those guys were trying to run around screens. They were running through screens. I mean, it just – it didn't work. And credit Bridges. I mean, look, he, even when you get as many open looks as he got, it, it, it takes a lot to make them. And he was yes. making everything last night. But, yeah. And they Texas, all seem like big shots when, when they really huh? needed him, too. Yeah. And, and he – look, I think he hit five or six threes in the first half, too. I mean, he had 18 points at halftime, 14 in the second half. So, he obviously did his damage over the course of all 40 minutes. But when Texas was – you know, in control of that game in the first half, Baylor was able to kind of stay relatively close because Jalen Bridges hit big shots every time Baylor needed one. And it's just like every time it felt like Texas was really distancing itself, you know, Bridges would hit a big three, and it's like, okay, well, it's back to eight. Yeah, I, I thought they got lazy, BK, just before half. I thought Texas got just a little lazy, you know, with about three minutes to go before the half. They just started – they were trying to widen the margin a little bit. You know, the eight-point margin. I think they were trying to get it back into double digits or into the teens, deep into the teens. And I thought they, they they didn't take their time. I thought they were careless with the ball. You know, Aismas had one turnover last night, and I thought it was a big turnover. After a rebound, he tried to throw the ball to Brock Cunningham over, like, two people. I mean, it was a, it was one of those tough passes in a crowd that I think he thought Cunningham was going to out-jump the guys for the ball or get fouled and make a play, and then end up being a turnover – and it turned into three points going back the other way. Mm. And it just it just made momentum before half just kind of stagger there a little bit, you know. Instead of bringing the ball up, maybe getting a good shot, maybe going to the free throw line to get to 10 to 12 points, I thought it was a turnover that was, it just seemed really at a bad point in the game. It just, it just did. You know, that eight-point lead, it looked like they were trying to widen the margin instead of really play the clock out before halftime. Wow. Uh, and, and it's just – it's, it's just a tough play. If you only have one turnover and you score 33 points, you've had a hell of a night. You, yeah, that Max, means you showed up to play. So. Well, the problem is nobody else showed up to play yeah, besides exactly. Max Asmus. I mean, Asmus was incredible. And, and look, Texas played damn near a perfect offensive 
first yes. half, right? They scored 48 points. That's the most Baylor had given up in a first half all season long, home or away. And Texas was making just about everything from the opening tip. The problem was, and all the ESPN analysts said this at halftime, Baylor was only down by eight because Texas couldn't get enough stops defensively. Right. So Texas played damn near a perfect half, but they didn't have a huge lead. And it had me feeling a little bit uncomfortable at halftime. And look, the, Texas actually got off to a good start in the second half. I was expecting Baylor to go on some early Absolutely. run to get right back in the game. Texas scored the first four points in the second half. And it's like, okay, no, maybe the Longhorns actually have it going. But then, you know, Baylor started to go on a run. Obviously, Dylan DeSue gets hurt, sprains his knee, and then after that, Texas just completely imploded. I mean, this team, like everybody forgot, Matt, uh, everybody except Max Aismas forgot how to play basketball after Dylan DeSue went down with that injury, and Texas missed 11 shots. They went nine minutes and 40 seconds, Buck. They went almost a half of a half without making a shot in the game last night, and that's obviously how Baylor was able to uh, come back and take a lead and. Yeah, it was a crazy turnaround going from up 14 to down double digits. I know Texas only lost by eight, but they were down double digits with about three or four minutes left. It was a total collapse by Texas after Dylan DeSue went down, yeah. and it hurts. No I'm very disappointed with, with Mitchell and the way he's played. You know, he, he gets up, then he gets down, he's up, he's down. I mean, I, he's so overrated as a basketball player, I believe. As an athlete, great, great. It's great to be a great athlete, but what part of it that – what is it that you do well? He didn't defend well last night. He scored, I think, five points. Uh, he's had – where he's got, gotten off the deck and played good for three games, then he disappeared. To me, part of that's him and part of it's coaching. Uh, I mean, Rodney can't get these guys to stay consistent enough. Now, Shedrick has now found his way around. Thank goodness that that guy has found his offensive game and, and a little bit of physicality you know, on the boards and blocking shots and stuff. But telling Mitchell, if you're telling me that's an NBA player, I, I'm looking at him and going, what part of the NBA, I mean, is it athleticism? I mean, he doesn't defend all that well. I mean, he gets into those. He's not consistent at all. I, I, I think he's very, to me, he's just overrated. Yeah, he's he's bad. I mean, Dylan Mitchell was just going through a cardio workout last night. He was yeah. not contributing to this team's success at all on either end of the floor. And but he can do that in games, and he, you you can't they can't win with him just doing that every once in a while. I mean, I mean, if he's going to defend, be a great defender. If you're going to be, if you can't defend, score me twelve points. Come on, don't give me five points. And you're, they're talking about you should have gone to the, you could have gone to the NBA last year and done what? Sit on the bench. He, he should have gone to the NBA because he's actually hurting his draft stock this season. It, it would have been better for Dylan Mitchell to leave for his sake than to come yeah. back because, yeah, I mean, it's another year of NBA teams seeing that this guy's just not very good. And I was pumped when Dylan Mitchell announced that he was coming back because I thought he would take a step in his second year. We're talking yeah. about a former top 10 recruit in the country. Five-star, blue chip. This guy was as highly touted as you could possibly be. That was a big stage game. last night. You're playing some of the best talented guards and forwards in basketball right there last night for, for Baylor. They just have been, every, you know, since Scott Drew has got there and got that thing changed around. That was your highlight reel. That should have been your highlight reel. Yeah. And that's what he offered up last night. And you're thinking, you know, okay, he's back for a second year. That's going to be huge for our program. He's sure. going to be one of the biggest pieces for this team this year. And he has scored a total of nine points in the last three games. A total. Wow. The last, this is March. Like, this is the time. The, the season is over. You need to be developed. This is when you should be putting it all together. And Dylan Mitchell has gone the other way. And yeah. his yeah, minutes have been going down, too. Like, he, he only played as many, many minutes as he did yesterday because DeSue had that stomach bug, and then obviously he got hurt. And because Kendall Weaver could only play 13 minutes because he was in foul trouble. Like, that's the only reason Mitchell even played a lot last night. But you're right. That was a big opportunity for yes. him to showcase his stuff you know, to the NBA, but also to his own coaching staff that like, hey, I'm still valuable here. Like, put me in, coach. I'm good. Yeah, he looks like a and bench guy to me. Like, bring him off the bench and see, well, hey, cover that big son of a gun bridges for them that were shooting jumpers. Get him in his face. Show me some NBA defense against that guy. No, no. I mean, that's one of those ones where, BK, you tell your coach at halftime, I'll take that dude right there. He's good. He's hot. Let me cover him. I know he's 6'9". I can handle him. I'm athletic enough to handle him. He looks like a guy who would say, 
nah, no thanks. I'll just go, like you said, I'll go get a good, nice cardiac workout. They like me in the NBA, but what is it that they like? Well, it's the athleticism. I mean, so much of the NBA draft is about potential, and Dylan Mitchell is a freak athlete, but at some point that athleticism needs to translate into success yeah. on the court, and it just hasn't happened consistently enough for Dylan Mitchell. So, look, as crazy as it sounds, I still think there's a chance he would get drafted after this year. And for Dylan Mitchell, he'll have to answer that same question again, right? Like, is it better for me to leave Absolutely. now and just be a second round pick or, or can I come back and actually get better next season? But obviously the risk in coming back is you don't get better next season. And that's now three years of bad college film to where NBA teams are just going to be like, yeah, cool. There are plenty of great athletes in our I don't know league, what he does with the, I don't know what the coaches do with him or they just let him be himself or they don't, they don't plan things for him. You know, your guy even listens to you. Your guy Horton took that long sleeve off last night, played with a short sleeve shirt, and played okay. I thought he was okay at times. He's yeah. a he's now he's turned into a volume shooter, though. Not a volume scorer, but a volume shooter. He'll take some shots now. Yeah. Horton had eight points last he's night. Not, and he's, he's not a big time defender either. It was uh no, he's not he's a horrible defender. And yeah. I, I, he's not expected to be a good defender, but Baylor was going after him. And yeah, uh, yeah. Look, Baylor got what it wanted. Even in that first half when Texas was in control, Baylor was able to have a bunch of success offensively. And once Texas started missing shots in the second half, Baylor just continued to have success offensively. And that's how the game turned around. But yeah, Texas just could not keep Baylor in front of them. And then a huge story of the game, like I don't know if the refs are the reason why Texas lost. But Baylor shot 27 free throws in the second half. They shot 42 for the game. Wow. Te Texas shot 21. Now, part of that is on Texas, right? Like Dylan DeSue going out was huge because he's the guy who's going to get to the foul line the most for this Texas team. And Texas just wasn't aggressive at all. And it felt like the refs were calling everything in the second half. So, hey, as much as we love Max Aceman shooting, and last night he was making a lot, it's like, well, let's maybe try to be more aggressive and get to the lane so we can get to the line because that's what Baylor was doing, and Baylor was literally shooting free throws on every single possession. Yeah, if those guards for them will jump over the top of, of Aceman. He was trying to cover those guys. He, they, he can't stop them once they're in the paint. He go, they go over the, they just they just go over him. Well, and, was, he, and he doesn't go down the lane because I think he's afraid of getting the ball slapped away. Now, for a couple yeah. games, remember, he was going to the rack and going right. to the line. Right. That's what yeah, I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not mad at Aismith. This is not oh, Max no. Aismith should have been more aggressive. This is one of the other four players on the court should have done something. Something. Yeah. Max Aismith should have taken the bus home by himself. Everybody else should have had to walk from Waco. Like, see, he was the yeah. only guy who showed up last night. You know, and, and as, as, as aggressive as Weaver is, he's a hacking machine sometime now. Yeah. He will, yeah, he will hack you. He's He's got away with a lot of – they got him last night. I mean – some of those ones he goes to block. Some of those are a lot of arms, too. All right. Yeah, and elbows he that he fouls. hits. I like the way he plays. Still love it. I don't like him open shot guy. I like because he's going to go to the right side. He's right-handed. He loves to go right. But he will try to block every shot. He will set it up that he will go. He'll run the full length of the court and try to pin it like the old buck would. But he's some of these, he's getting lots of, he's, he's getting lots of body on guys. I mean, I wish everybody on the team was as aggressive as he is. I could take it that way, you know? Right. Yeah. But some yeah. of those guys just defensively, you know, that's why Shedrick picking up the pace with him defensively is big. But the athletic guy, Mitchell, and the other guys, Horton, those guys that get in, and Therese Hunter, I don't even know. He's just there. He's just a body. Yeah, that was – it was like Hunter got off to such a great start. He hit two threes in the first two minutes of the game. Yes. In his first game against Baylor, he obviously hit the game winner right. at the end of regulation. And that's all they could talk about on TV. Well, yeah, he had 21 points in that game. It's like, okay, maybe he's just got Baylor's number. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but some guys just play better against certain teams. And even though Baylor's one of the best teams in this conference and they're the 11th-ranked team in the country, like maybe Tyrese Hunter just has it against Baylor. Right. But then literally after those two threes, he didn't do anything the rest of the game. And that's – like, he looked so passive in the second half. Baylor was giving him open looks, and without Dylan DeSue on the floor, and with Baylor, like, clearly making it a point of emphasis to slow down Max Aismas, like, Hunter needed to be that other guy to step up. Right. And he just wouldn't even shoot. Like, forget making him. He was just too scared to even shoot. And it's like, dude, what? you're an upperclassman. You're a leader on this team. Like, you're one of this team's most important players. Like, this is your time. 
You have to step up right now. And he just, he cowered in the, in a big moment. He just came up small. Yeah. I think when his career is done at Texas, whether he comes back again or not, is going to be just like you said, he comes up small. He's going to, the majority of time we're going to say that dude came up small. And shout out to JR for the super chat. He says, please bring up Shedrick having money on Baylor. Yeah, I mean, Chedrick had the second most points on this team last night. Now, defensively, yeah, Baylor was going after him in the pick and roll in the second half, and uh, he could not hold his own. Like, he just doesn't have the foot speed or the lateral quickness to hang with some of Baylor's bigs, and Baylor took advantage of that. So, credit Scott Drew. But uh, sadly, J.R. Shedrick was one of Texas's best players last yeah. night. Yeah. Uh, as, as bad as that seems. And honestly, like, Scott, if Texas won this game, I would have been roasting Scott Drew, happily roasting Scott Drew. But, like, I don't know why it took him so long to, like, double-team Max Acemas because without Dylan DeSue, I mean, I DeSue played 10 minutes. Like, he was barely playing before he got hurt because of that stomach bug. And it's honestly, if you told any Texas fan that DeSue was going to play 10 minutes last night, I would have said we lost by 30, and we never had a chance to win. So it does feel like a minor miracle that Texas even had a chance with DeSue being the conference's leading scorer uh, basically not playing at all last night. But as soon as Scott Drew was like, oh, shit, this Ace Miss guy's really good, and uh, he's the only guy who's really good. As soon as he re realized he needed to double Ace Miss, that's when the game changed because nobody else on the floor for Texas did anything. And that's where that's where Mitchell is supposed to yep. take over the game. That's where his one-on-one, -on -one, he's going to get these one-on-ones when they're doubling up. He's going to get these cracks in the defense where he can go to the rim, you know what I mean, and make a slam every once in a while because – He's now to the point again. He won't take a jumper. No, he won't. No. He'll come around a pick and have the, an open jumper, and he'll either try to go to the rim, some funky shot, or he'll pass it off. He won't take the shot. I don't, I don't should, know what it is. I mean, I, Rodney Terry knows. I don't understand why they don't tell him, dude. You came back for a, what is the reason you came back? I know this, this team. Like, there's a reason why this team was picked to be a top twenty team in the country at the start of the year and Texas was picked to finish third in the big 12 before the year began. This is the toughest conference in college basketball. Like people looked at this roster and they're like, okay, we know what Max Acemas has done. He's one of the most prolific scorers ever in college basketball. We know how good Dylan DeSue was last season. Mm -hmm. And then also they might have a lottery pick with Dylan Mitchell and they have this guy, Tyrese Hunter going into year three, who's supposed yes. to take a big step and be really good. The problem is only two of those guys have held up their end of the bargain. Like that, you were expecting to have four really, really strong, consistent players on this team this year. Acemas and DeSue, for the most part, have done their jobs. They haven't been perfect every single night, but they've no. they, they've done what you need them to do. The problem is, it's really anybody. You can go down the list beyond just those two. Sure. But Mitchell and Hunter were supposed to be like three and four for this team, and those guys just way too often are no shows for this team right now. And it's and it's March, so. Yeah, and um, I and I don't I don't like that loss last night. I don't like when you have a lead like that that you could have you could have really stuck it to that group and played a little bit of defense in the second half and got out of there with a three point, four point, eight point win and said, you know what? Now we've now we're gathering some momentum here before our tournament play and, and, and then you know getting into the big tournament. Now that last night, that ended up being a downer when it shouldn't have been that way. I mean, yeah. it, you know, from the very beginning, as you said. If Dylan DeSue plays 10 minutes and you're in a game, finish it. Finish the game, guys. Don't, don't let them come back on you in the second half and do what they did to you. And, and, you, and you look so meek and mild about it. You know, you're not defending anybody. You know, one guy's shooting jumpers over everybody coming off screens. That's, as I said, that's to me where Dylan Mitchell, because we talk about his athleticism, then he should be able to cover bridges. He should be the guy that says, no, no, he's not running around these picks. I'm going to, you know what? I'm coming off the pick. I'm going to, I can jump high enough to, to block his shot. He, I won't let him get to the rim. He just, Mitchell just doesn't seem like the guy who wants to take that on. And I don't think they want to give him that responsibility. You know why? Because he doesn't want to take that on. Yeah. Yeah. It's frustrating. Another super chat from JR. Shout out to you, JR. Thank you very much for uh, supporting the channel and uh, hooking us up this morning. Should the freshman Chris Johnson get some run? Tyrese is not good. Yeah, look, I, I've been asking for more Johnson all mm – -hmm. oh, that sounds weird. I've been asking for more Chris Johnson uh, all year, and we haven't seen it. So it, it is March. I don't expect to all of a sudden see Chris Johnson play a lot more in the most important month of the college basketball season. But, man, with all the inconsistencies that we've seen from Texas this year, 
Uh, it's like it feels like Chris Johnson, considering how highly touted of a recruit he was, yeah. should be getting more run. Uh, we're not privy to practice, so maybe he just doesn't look ready in practice. But, God, a lot of the guys who do play don't look that ready in game. So I would have tried to have found more minutes uh, for Chris Johnson earlier in conference play to where maybe he could be a more steady part of this rotation right now. But because that never happens. So maybe maybe in this con- maybe in the conference tournament, you get that kid in sometime, you know? Yeah. Somebody. Yeah, I, mean, it's not, I mean, to me, this group looks like a group that I, I don't expect them, you know, you know, to, to go and play at home that last game playing against Oklahoma to all of a sudden be gangbusters again. You know, I think they can win that game. I think they should win that game. But I don't expect them for, to, to carry that momentum in it may be a time to rest some guys and let some other guys get some playing time. Let's go, you know? Yeah. I mean, look, the, every Texas fan held their breaths last night when Dylan oh, DeSue got sure. hurt. Like, I, I, I'll be honest with you, when DeSue got carried off the floor and he couldn't put any weight on that leg, I didn't give a crap about what happened in Waco last night. I was like, I felt like Texas was going to lose that game by 10 at that point because the wheels were already starting to fall off. And then it's like, right. oh, your best player's getting hurt? Like, see you later. This one, but my mind went to okay to hell with tonight. Like the season's over if this guy's hurt. Right. And thankfully, Dylan DeSue was able to come back to the bench. He didn't have crutches. He didn't have a boot. Uh, it seems like Texas has dodged a bullet. They're calling it a sprained knee, but of course, the knee is what Dylan DeSue hurt last year, which caused him to miss uh, the end of the tournament run for Texas. So we got to wait and see what's going on with Dylan DeSue. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. You know, you'd like to think Texas can beat Oklahoma on Saturday because they beat them pretty handily in Norman earlier this year. But if Dylan DeSue isn't playing, then OU's got a good shot to come in here and win. And OU's a team on the tournament bubble. Now, they're probably in, like Texas, but they would like to have another quality win on their resume to solidify a spot in the field of 68. So, yeah, I mean, like I'd like to think Texas finds a W on Saturday and can bounce back and then, okay, you know, you're still upset about what happened in Baylor, but that's three of your last four going into the conference tournament. Like, that's a pretty decent way to end the year. But if Dylan DeSue is going to have to miss that game and potentially some more time after that, then you can cancel Christmas because the season's over. You're right. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, it, I mean, and, and for him, he this is a guy who can't afford to bring it back slowly. When he comes back, he has to be back. He has to play. He has to score a bunch of points and, and rebound and everything else for this group because I just don't, I, I just don't see it. I don't see enough consistency in the, in the in the individual players. You know how you talk about Sark making individual players that are good players better. I don't see this group. I mean, I see Shedrick now. I don't know. Maybe it's just a pat, the fact that maybe he's a lot healthier now. Maybe the back isn't. You know, he's not sitting there with a heating pad on anymore. His back feels pretty good. I just know he looks like a more active player. I don't know if they stuck a cattle prong in his rear end to get him cranked up or he just feels better. You know what I'm saying? But later in the year, you don't feel better. You start to, to tire out a little bit. Well, he hadn't played a lot of minutes. So he yeah. should be. And offensively, I like his game. I, I I think he can do a lot of things. You know, he's a big man that passes the ball pretty well. You know, he can get his assists going. He can help this team out in a lot of ways. And I still do like him defending. I mean, he's, he's just – I know he will hack you, but he's a big body. They need a big body. They really do because they're not getting that that guy flying over the top and Mitchell, who's supposed to be this great athlete. He's he's the most inconsistent. But he and Tyrese Hunter, how about that? The two the two guys that everybody wonders about are the two most inconsistent guys, Hunter yeah. and Mitchell. I mean, these are supposed to be almost NBA type of players, right? Once again, and Mitchell is supposed to be an NBA type of player. Yeah, uh, part of the reason why people felt not just Texas fans, but why you know folks yes. around the college basketball country felt good about this Texas team uh, being one of the better teams in the country again this season, despite how much they lost from last year's Elite Eight squad, was uh, because of Dylan Mitchell and Tyrese Hunter and and those guys just they they haven't been there enough for this team. They so. don't have staying power. They don't do it from game to game. They're so inconsistent. Now, yep. Tyrese Hunter, as I said, when his career is over, we're all going to say he was never consistent enough. You know, he had two games maybe in a row that he was okay. And then he had three games that were bad. But for Mitchell to not go to the NBA and to come back, and then he showed a little bit of something, a little bit of an offensive game. How does that just disappear? I mean, for a guy like that, as the season goes on, your individual game is supposed to get better. His is like gone back to where it was last year. 
Sure feels that way. All right, let's hear from Rodney Terry. This is uh, from his post-game press conference last night following Texas's 93-85 loss to Baylor. He was asked if he believes Texas is a tournament team. Here's what he had to say. In the country. Look at our schedule. Look at our body of work. We probably played more quad ones as as, as as much as anybody in the country. I mean, look at our schedule. What, who you want us to play? You know, I mean, we played six ranked teams. First time in school history. We've done that, you know, and we stood toe-to-toe. You know, hey, we had a stumble here, there, you know, just like everybody in this league have. Yeah, we've had that. But we're, we're one of the best teams in the country. We can play with anybody. We come into a hostile environment. I don't know what these guys are ranked today, but uh, they needed every call that they could get today in terms of getting it done here at home. So, I mean, what else you got to do? You know, we're a good team. We can play with anybody on any given night. Moral victory. Uh-oh. It's a Houston game. Maybe this is another, their, their second game of the year. It's a moral victory. On a loss. No? Well, they're, not they're, really. You're up by 14. We could really spend the next hour and 23 minutes diving into that soundbite, and we're not going to do that because there's other things we want to talk about today. Uh, the, the crux of Rodney Terry's answer is correct. Texas is absolutely an NCAA tournament team. Uh, even if they lose to Oklahoma on Saturday, even if mm-hmm. they lose to Oklahoma on Saturday and lose their first game in the Big 12 tournament next week, they are still going to make the tournament. Right now, they are just playing for seeding. Like they have built up enough of a resume to where they will hear their name called on selection Sunday. But to say that Texas is one of the best teams in the country, and then to compare yourself to some of the other teams in the Big 12 and say that, oh, everybody slipped up a bunch in this conference. Like no one's undefeated in the Big 12. So, yeah, everybody's lost some games. But I mean, coach, you're eight and nine in this conference. You're four, five, six, seven, eight. You're like in ninth place in the league. Don't compare yourself to Houston and Iowa State and Baylor, please. No. You know, the teams that are at the top of this league right now, like this is not one of the best teams in the country. Now, has no. this team shown that they can hang with some of the better teams in the country? Yeah, occasionally. They hang, but they don't win them. They also got their ass kicked by Houston. They got their ass kicked by Kansas. They got their ass kicked by Marquette. They got their ass kicked by UConn. Those are four of the best teams in the country. And you didn't play well in any of those games. Now, you nearly beat Houston on your home floor, but I had to sit here and act like, or even say, what an act. He said, this is one of the best teams in the country. Like, that's that's ridiculous, RT. Like, come no. on. Like, I, I get making a pitch to be in the tournament. You should be in the tournament. I agree with you. But one of the best teams in college basketball? What are we doing here? Best teams in the country aren't eight, nine, ten seeds. They're ones no. and two. Last year, you were a two seed. You were one of the best. You could have said this at this time last year, and nobody would have batted an eye because you were one of the best teams in the country. But right now, come on, man. What are we doing? No, here? You're not even playing like one of the close to one of the best. Yeah. I mean, you're you're as you said, you're ninth in your own conference. He is he is right about the refs. The refs were terrible. Like they went from not calling anything in the first half to calling everything in the second half. And players and coaches just want consistency. But I have not spent too much time harping on the refs because I feel like Texas would have lost that game even without the refs. Like, just once the Sioux went down, the, the team just forgot how to play basketball. I've never seen anything like it. Like, everybody except Max Acemas, just like, it's almost like they never picked up a basketball in their life. They didn't know no, what to you, do. You, on you lose a guy like that, you're supposed to pick it up. Somebody else is supposed to pick up the pace. Yeah, next man up. Every, every team in the history of sport yes. talks about next man up. Texas no. – Everyone went down after Ace. Or Absolutely, after the they went, went down. down like he did. Now, hopefully, it's just a, uh, a, a, you know, if he plays on Saturday, I'd be careful of playing him on Saturday. Even, he yeah, I would too. Is that dude? I mean, like as much as I want to beat OU, as much as I want to make a run in the Big Twelve tournament, like yes, the, the real tournament's the one that matters. So if the Sioux is banged up, then rest him and try to yes. get him back by the actual tourney because you got no shot without him. Uh, you could at least win a game, maybe two. It's tough to say that after last night if you do have the Sioux and you are at full strength. But, uh, yeah, frustrating. 14-point lead in the first half. Texas led by eight at halftime. Hell, they were up double digits at one point in the second half. But Baylor at one point, hell, it was 24-4. to four. It was also a 21-2 to two run as Texas missed 11 straight shots. In yeah, that I feel like pass. I'm the only one that feels that way about Dylan Mitchell. I know you, you you're starting to see it. But it seems like the rest of the world seems to think, no, this guy is incredible. I'm like, what is it that's so incredible about him? Because he makes some great, you know, off the rim dunks every once in a while. But I mean, what is it that what is it that he does on a consistent basis that you can hang your hat on? 
Is he is he a great defender? I don't think so. I mean, is he a scorer? Really? Five nice. last night against Baylor on a, 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 a nationally televised game with some of the best players, and not only in your league and in the country that you're going against, and you look like that, you score five points. I mean, what is it that he does that's so incredible? Yeah, he 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 should be this team's best defender. And on Easily. certain nights, he is a really, really good defender. But uh hell, I heard Zay talking about it yesterday. I mean, he's not even doing that anymore. No. And his minute he only played 12 minutes against Oklahoma State on Saturday. And that it's not like that game was a blowout. That game was tied at 52. Like Texas just felt like they had better options than Dylan Mitchell. And once again, he only played as many minutes as he did last night because, at least I think, because Dylan DeSue had a stomach bug and had the injury, and also Kendall Weaver was in foul trouble all night. Dude, after about game number 10 or so, right in the, in the teens, that guy started to take his use his jumper. He would take a jumper. He doesn't even think about he, – he doesn't come off and then take that jumper anymore. It's like he's afraid that he's going to miss. He plays scary like, oh, I can't take this jump shot. Well, I mean, that's what you were supposed to start to get better at, right? That's what I thought last summer was going to do for him. Yeah, Dylan decided? Mitchell yeah. Dylan Mitchell had four straight games of double-figure scoring from yeah. January 29th to February 10th. And then since then, Texas has played six games. He's been three points, eight points, 12 points, two points, two points, five points. So just wow. one double-figure output and a couple of basically nothing burgers in that stretch. So, yeah, it's uh, – and it's noticeable. I mean, I noticed that with him. I mean, it it's is. just so noticeable. It is. It is. It is. And he can't make free throws, as Gigi says, too. Yeah, annoying. All right, we'll get we'll get into Texas hoops again in hour two, uh, but more to talk about. But before we shift gears and talk some Texas football and some Texas baseball and some NFL, we've got to give some love to some of our sponsors. Let's talk to the folks at Texas Orthopedics. If you're seeking that specialized patient-focused orthopedic care, contact the experts at Texas Orthopedics today. The physicians offer comprehensive surgical and non-surgical orthopedic care for children and adults, folks. Spinal care, sports medicine, joint replacement, rheumatology, and more. Say hello to Dr. Christopher Daney and, of course, Chris Stockton. Their goal is to get you back into that good health and that great quality of life that you deserve. Visit TXOrtho.com for more information. Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. Once again, for more info, go to TXOrtho. Dot com. Yes, indeed. Shout out to them. And also, we'll let you hear from and see our great friends over at Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Say hello, our friends over at Sue Patrick, of course, Jay Willems since 1975. They got an incredible selection of Texas Longhorn apparel, of course, collectibles, accessories, and even more. I'll be going over there to pick up some stuff for the mullet open. Got my polo on today. They've got tons of these over there in all sizes. As a matter of fact, they offer free shipping on online orders over $49. And folks, there's plenty of parking here at 5222 Burnett Road, of course. And right there, say hello to Sue. Of course, for more information, just go to Sue Patrick. Dot com. Love the folks at Sue Patrick. Yes, indeed. They are the a jelly cat. Get yourself a little jelly cat while you're there. Get yourself a few jelly cats like the oh, box. There you go. How many of those have you bought since we were there a couple of weeks ago? I got three of them. All three. Uh oh, sorry. Four. Got another green kid. Yeah. Jelly cats were big at soccer on Saturday. Is that right? Yeah. My wife wanted to bring them out like at the game. I said, no, oh, no, you got to leave these in the car. If the other kids see these jelly cats, Old, old Grandpa Buck is going to end up coming back next week with like 10 jelly cats for the team. I'm like, no, I can't. No, leave them in the car. Leave them in the car. So Joyce ran out at halftime. She ran out to get the jelly cats. So they were still kind of hidden. Mm. And my grandkids love those. The soccer ball, my uh, granddaughter has named Footy. The turtle, which I think, I forget his real name, but my grandson calls him uh, Grumpy because he's got a little frown on his face. Grumpy the turtle. Nice. And I don't know what the other granddaughter is called. I got her one of those Easter bunnies, those little purple Easter bunnies. I got one of those. So this looks like it's going to be a collector's item, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're selling like crazy. Got some of that that uh, dishwashing uh, 
I mean, not dishwashing, uh, laundry detergent, finally. There you go. Got that. Smells good. The Tyler Campbell laundry detergent? Tyler, Tyler, Cam, is it Canville? What is he? I think it's Candle. Candle, yeah. The Candle guy, yeah. I don't think it's Earl's. Yeah, they're doing a couple snow glows at the uh, Mullet Open there for the regular raffle, too. There we and go. Those are for any time of the year, by the way. That's not just a Christmas thing. No, because they've got bats instead of snow. There you go. Now you're talking. And the bats are a year-round thing. You can get chat on by a bat anytime oh. in this city. One time, I've uh, have you ever gone to watch underneath the bridges the bats fly? You've done that several times when you were loaded or doing your plants. No? I, n- never as an adult or even as a college kid. I, I went a couple of times with my parents growing up, and I just did not see the appeal at all. When so, they came out from another, no big deal. No, I don't. I don't care about them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like what you won't go. You can literally other. just go watch a YouTube video of bats flying. Like, really, that's what you want to see? Is that they don't do uh, very much, do they? All those people, they're just flying and making annoying ass noises. You really want to wait for like an hour to see that? Do something better with your life, people. You just get through a Christmas tree off the bridge, right? Yes. Oh, my God. Now, that would be awesome. You're telling me someone throws a Christmas tree while the bats are flying? They now you're in. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's, that's one of Austin's worst. Well, we've got a lot of bad bits. I do love this city, but that's one of like our, our weirdest traditions, and I just I can't figure out why people like it so much. They come from all over for that. I know. It's a huge deal. It's not Austinites. It's probably mostly tourists who come in just for that. That's what I was. I grew up in Dallas, and my family's like, we're going to see the bats. I'm You're like, going. Are they going to do, the gonna do a magic trick? Are they going to do like what the drones do after the third quarter at a Texas football game and make like a hook em sign? Are they going to spell out a word? Oh, no, they're just going to fly and shit and make annoying noises. <laughs> like, oh, man. You're never going to have a pet. You're going to be an old grumpy man without a pet. That's what it's going to be. No bats, no iguanas, no birds, no, no dogs. You, you know what you are going to be? end up being? Cat man. No chance yeah. I'm a yes. cat man. You're going to be a cat man. You're going to be sitting on your in your favorite relaxed the back chair, and you're going to have a cat sitting on your lap. Yeah, that kind of cat. Not the other cat. That kind of cat is just the, the, the real furry one that meow is going to be sitting on your lap. And you're going to be watching court TV. Oh, That's she's, it. Gonna, she's going to be furry, huh? <laughs> it's going to be court TV and you and the cat just, trying just, to figure out. Just if the two of us? Guilty or not guilty. The cat's no. going to tell you if they're guilty. I have no beef with cats, but I have no interest in ever owning a pet cat. Really? Not, yeah. Not even I at your apartment where you are. Just put out a little dish. One will come around and they'll continue to come around. That's the beauty of the cat is that they're... T- Pretty low maintenance, and that's oh, yeah. what I like because I just try to avoid responsibility as often as I can. But uh, I don't know; they're too smart. For yeah, me. that that is yeah, they're too smart for their own good. Yeah, they are. They are, and they can turn on you in a second too. They, they can exactly. I'd be worried. Yeah. I'd, I'd forget to do something to the cat, and then they would hate me. And then I just I don't need I any. Don't of that. like when they bring in other little animals and lay them. You know, they think they're doing you a favor by bringing a mouse or something but they don't totally kill it. And you reach down and the son of a bitch and bird is still alive. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hey, do me a favor. If you're going to bring something back, make it dead. I don't want a mouse that can bite me when I reach down because you haven't successfully made the kill, you know, right. I don't want to finish. I don't want to finish off a bird or a mouse Ew. or a baby rabbit. I, I want you to finish it off and go ahead and eat all the parts of it. I'll take the blood and wash it off the deck, but don't bring it back alive. I don't want it alive, you know? I don't, I don't want to finish off any animal ever. No. Gross. Uh, yeah, I'd pet a cat, GG, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, back into the sports here. Um, I, this, this story won't mean much to you, but <laughs> it's blowing up on social media, and it's blowing up because it involves Arch Manning. Who are you is, saying I'm not a social media guy? Are you? No, okay. not at all. Okay. Well, like you use social media more than you play video games. Yes, absolutely. And, and this story has to do with the new NCAA football video game. Which won't that, be played by me, no. 
Right, exactly. Now, the last time we had a copy of the NCAA football game released was 2014, and it's coming back this year for the first time in over a decade. And college football fans and gaming fans are stoked about it. And I'm stoked about it because I loved playing those NC2A football video games growing up. And it's a big deal to a lot of people that the game is coming back. And, oh, by the way, a huge part of the return is the fact that the players and their names and image and likenesses will actually be a part of the game. Like back in the day, like when you bought the game and you put it into your console, like Colt McCoy would have been not McCoy. It would have said QB number 12. Vince Young, it wouldn't have had Vince Young's name. It would have said QB number 10. Like because the EA Sports company did not have the rights to players NIL, that's what it was. It would just be like a traditional looking brother and it would be QB number 10 or a standard looking white guy and QB number 12. Like that's how it was. But now for the first time, because of all of the advances in name, image, and likeness, the players can opt in to the video game and they can actually have their own name, their own number, their own stats, everything. So Facial that's stuff look look more like them. Yep, their own picture, all the above. So that's like people would be pumped for the return of the game, regardless of if that was a feature. But because that is a feature, I think that has increased the excitement level even more about the college football video game franchise coming back. Well, this tweet was sent out last night by Anwar Richardson of Orange Bloods, good dude, and he tweeted this. Quote, multiple people have told me that Texas redshirt quarterback Arch Manning will not opt in to EA Sports College Football 25. I'm told Arch is focused on playing football on the field, end quote. So the players don't have to be in this game, right? If they opt in, they get a little bit of money, and you get to claim that you were in a video game. So I think 99% of the college football players that exist would say, hell yes, I want to be a part of this video game. I'll take that money. I'll take a free copy of the game, and I'll get to play with myself. That sounds weird. That does sound weird, but that's true. But yeah, you know what I mean. And Arch Manning, according to Anwar Richardson, it has opted out of being in this game. And Texas So when fans, the game was around, how old was he when the game – how long has it been? How many years has it been? 2014, the last time the game was released, wow. so a decade. Yeah. So he was still playing, and he was still old enough to mess with it, right? Yeah, I mean, he would have been like seven or eight at the time. So Which the kids do it then. They still sure. they're playing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's, so. That's that's a little – that's strange. I mean, to each his own, but, I mean, I think you can focus on your game and still play that game. I mean, I don't – because because kids play that game, I don't, I don't see that hurting them. Right. I mean, is it that he's not a starter yet? What is if he was a starter, would he opt in for playing doing it? What's the deal? Will he will well when he becomes a starter, will he opt in? Or is this just I, I need to focus more on the game? Yeah, I, I would love to hear from Arch Manning himself. Like obviously Anwar is not going to reveal his source. I don't know if he talked to Arch. I don't know if he talked to Cooper or anybody well, in the man. It's all true. But what what a weird, like that's a weird excuse. I'm told Arch is focused on playing football on the field. Like, dude, yeah. you, you don't have to, like, practice for the video game. You're, no, you're, no. You you're can in the suck. game. That way you can suck being you on the video game. That's right? the slogan, EA Sports. It's in the game. You're in the game already. Like, you don't have to do any extra work to be a part of this game. It's not like, hey, Arch, we're going to need you to miss a, a day of spring practice to come to our facility and work out so we can see how good you – no. Like – you're, he's in the game. So it's frustrating from a selfish standpoint. I'm probably not going to buy the game because that would require me buying a new console. And I just, I don't play video games enough, but I, I sure as hell, I'm going to go over to buddies places and play this game. And I think every Texas fan, and it's not just Texas fans. I think college football fans would want to play as Arch Manning in the game. And it's like, damn, this, it feels like we're kind of getting robbed of the opportunity to do that. Now it's his prerogative. It's his choice. Right. You don't have to do this game. Uh, you know, be a part of this thing. But like, if that's the actual excuse. No, the focus- excuse is he's like the buck. He just wants to play pinball and that's it. He's okay. done. That, that, that that's is- it. That's it. That's a great excuse. Arch, just use that. If there's no pinball or there's no Miss Pac-Man, we don't play. How's that? We're going to up the price. The Annie just went up to get me to play. There you now, go. Let me tell you this. My, my respect for Arch Manning would be sky high if he came out and said that. 
He's like, no, nah, I don't play these video games. I only play Miss Pac-Man and Galaga. There, okay. If That'd you want to put okay. me in one of those games, then yeah, I'm in. But yeah. this new age college football game, no thank you. I don't want You're any part of that. Me. You're not going to boo me. I, so mean, I, I just think that's strange because he's. He, I got to believe somewhere at some of his friend's house as a kid or even at his own house, he got on there and played, you know, or one of his uncles was on there and or NFL or something. I don't yeah. I don't get this that he has to focus in on what he's doing on the field. Why? It's not taking anything away from you on the field. Maybe maybe he doesn't want to suck on the field and in the game. Yeah. So I think I think you alluded to the reason why this is happening. And, and some of our YouTube commenters are bringing this up as well. I'm going to continue to say that I don't agree with this decision. And look, I, we don't know for sure if it's true. Number one, right, that's right. You got to figure out if it's true. And number two, we, we don't know if the reasoning that Anwar mentions is true either. Now, I, I don't mean that as a shot to Anwar. He does a great job and he's right way more often than not. So this is not like me questioning Anwar's reporting. It's just, okay, we'll, we'll see when the game comes out if Arch Manning is in there. Hell, maybe he changes his mind after the sure. reaction that has come from this. But the reason why I, I think this is happening is this falls in line with what the Mannings have talked about since Arch got to campus last year. They have said Arch Manning will not accept a single dollar in NIL deals until he is the starting quarterback at the University of Texas. Yes. And every athlete who opts into this game gets paid. It's not a lot, and it's not like, oh, the best players make a lot and the, the walk-ons make nothing. No, it's the same amount for every player, but it is still money that would be going into Arch Manning's pocket if he opted into this game. Give it away so, to charity. Make that a charity deal. And the one NIL deal he has made was with Panini, the trading card company. Right. And he had his card sell for over a million dollars, and he gave it all to charity. Right. And people were lauding Arch Manning. It's like, dude, you could take all this money. You're worth so much. But instead, he decided to donate it all to charity. Great bits. We love that. But, like, that just that falls in line with Arch not taking a single dollar sure. of NIL money until he's a starting quarterback. And I think that's the real reason. I think – you know, maybe whoever leaked this to Anwar was like, oh, maybe we'll we'll make it seem like he's just focused on being a football player and that that will be our cookie cutter excuse that'll make him look good. And instead, it actually makes him look pretty bad, if I'm being completely honest. But my guess is it's just, yeah, he, he does not want any sort of money. And this is money until he is QB1 in Austin. Then why would he take the other money? I mean, that made him look good, too. He wasn't taking that money. He was giving it away. But that. I mean, he got paid for that. They right. say he didn't get paid, but he really truly did get paid, right? Yeah, and that was – I mean, I, maybe the difference was, look, that card sold for over a million dollars. So, so it's, yeah, was, I mean, it's about – is it about the money? Right. Well, he donated that, and it's like, oh, this will look good if I donate a million dollars. I think the players get, what, like 600 bucks is the number? And he's just like, yeah, There's I don't – charity can use 600 bucks. You're right. You're right. I, I don't know. Like this uh, – Part of Anwar's tweet makes me think that Arch is making this decision so he can be less of a distraction. And I think this is making him more of a distraction, right? Like it's yeah, just an unnecessary – head. it wouldn't be a headline if he opted into the game because everyone's going to opt in. He's going to be like one of, I don't know, five, ten players. Maybe I'm wrong on this. Maybe it's way more who do opt out. But I feel like 99.9% .9 of college football players are going to say – I want to be in this video game because who the hell yeah, wouldn't want to play there? They want to play. They want to be themselves in a game. That's yeah, all. That's like a job. I would love to be in a video game. I used to create myself to be in a video game. Uh, like I just, I, you know, maybe he was doing, I think he was kind of doing this to try to be less of a distraction. But once again, it has become, and it's stupid that it's a national story, but breaking news, anything Arch Manning does is going to be a national story. Remember the guy lost his student ID in his first month on campus yeah. as a UT student. And that was a national story. Like that's just how it's going to be. So this, this is becoming. Yeah. Once again, that's story. just who you are. That is, that's, those are the people that you walk amongst, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's just the way it is, you know, so, so get used to that. But, you know, I, I don't know how much of a distraction it is. If you were in it, I would say none because you're saying everybody's going to jump in it. I would just think that as a young kid, when he played that versus his cousins or his uncle or his dad or something, he enjoyed the game. So why wouldn't you be part of the game? I don't, because, I mean, it doesn't take away your ability to play the game of football. But once again, it's just a choice. It's it's his choice, and 
no matter what, it still comes down to his choice. If he thinks if he thinks it's a distraction to the way he's going to play, and I don't know if Anwar, if if that's what it truly is, I'd like to find out what it truly is. Or I really don't care because once again, I don't care about those games, so it doesn't mean it doesn't mean much to me. But for those that really are into it, that want to be Arch Manning in the game part of it, and they love the game when they played it, which he probably did as a young kid. I don't see why you wouldn't. It's not going to hurt you. I know. I know. It's just weird. Um, and I think when Arch Manning is the starter at Texas, presumably next season, he will opt in to the video game, assuming the video game comes out next year as well. If it doesn't, I, I, I got a feeling when that dude becomes the starter, he's going to break the bank on every level. There's uh-huh. not going to be any, here's this is 600. It's going to be money, 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 money. And he's going to opt in on a lot of things he didn't opt in on. You know, and that's fine. And that's that's why first your family's already said it. You've already said it. I want to be the starter. I'm not taking money as the backup. I'm not taking fame because I'm Arch Manning and I'm on this team. When I start, then I'll then it's going to cost you. You yeah. know, well, I think. Why. Yeah, I think for the video game, it's going to be the same amount for every player every sure. year. But maybe maybe part of this, and I don't peg Arch as the type of guy to do this. And we know his family doesn't mean money, but. Hell, maybe there will be some athletes. I won't pin this on Arch because I don't think this is him. There might be some athletes who are like, really, you're going to pay me as much as you're going to pay the 85th scholarship player on Western Kentucky? These things turn out that way sometimes. Yeah. So I think like right now, it's the honeymoon period of this video game and everyone's so excited for it to come back that I think most of the players will just opt in. But, you know, at some point there's going to be a – There's going to be somebody that says, I need more. Yeah, there's going to be a Caleb Williams type who's like, the best player in college football who's just like, yeah, if you're only going to pay me that much, I don't really want to do this. Right. And I remember like some of the baseball games growing up, Barry Bonds never opted in to these deals. He was like John Dowd. That was his name in my favorite baseball video game growing up. Like everybody else opted in and Barry Bonds is like, nah, I'm good. I don't like, this isn't worth it to me. So there might be players who start to do that. Once again, I don't, I don't think Arch is that type and of guy. And I would guy. love for this to be just a no story, but once again, it's that kid. So yeah. it just becomes a story. To me, as a coach, I mean, I wouldn't – I mean, if I'm – I mean, because I ask my my players that play for me, I, I ask them all kinds of personal questions in their lives. Because if I was a coach, I'd say, what, what's the deal? Why, why, why didn't you want to do this? I would get it from them as a coach, you know? Yeah. And if it goes along the same lines of – I don't take my, I, I would say you've already taken a million dollars and you've given it to charity. Take this 600, find another charity around this town or something and give it to, it's not a distraction. So you can't do it one time and then say, Oh, I'm not going to do it this time. It's not quite a million. It's 600. Uh, that's not worth doing it. I mean, it just, it, it's more, it's more talk than it needs to be, you know? Right. And now look, I, I don't know if distraction's the right word because he opted out, but now it's a story. It's it's just an unnecessary story. Like once again, if he just decided to opt in and didn't tell anybody, like the game just came out and boom, Arch Manning is in there with Quinn Ewers and with everybody else on this sure. Texas team, then all right, cool. Arch is in the game. But now, yeah, it's like it's it's a story that and people are going to bring this up stupidly enough, but it's going to happen. That's how the and internet works. Be looking, and they'll be looking into it and see how this game progresses after year, his family. Cause it seems like they do everything through the family, you know, everybody, yeah. everybody's involved. So maybe they wait a year, see how the, the, the game goes itself. I mean, is it making all kinds of money? Is it doing well? Are kids, are, are they, are they having good kids play uh, as role models in the game and stuff? And then it may change, you know, the following year for him. Right. Right. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, Yeah. Weird story. Once again, I'm sure there are a lot of folks out there who are mad that we are even talking about this. It's a national story again. And yeah, look, if you do plan on buying the video game, I'm sure somebody out there will make updated rosters like they always do. And yes, you'll be able to download a roster with Arch Manning in the game. But the original copy, at least according to Anwar Richardson, that you purchase when the game comes out this summer will not have Arch Manning as uh, a quarterback for the University of Texas. I assume we'll but just Frogger, be – But Frogger will. Frogger? Or Miss Pac-Man or what is that, <laughs> Kong? Donkey Kong? I'm proud of you for knowing what Frogger is. I feel like Frogger is much newer than those other two. Yeah, man. Frogger. I never wow. played Frogger. I just said the word. I've never played it. 
That game, I think I had that game growing up. I don't know if it was the original Frogger. It probably wasn't, but it was not very good. No. I also was not very good at it, which I think contributed to me not liking it very much. It's a game with those two pizza guys. Super Mario. I mean, the the two. (laughs) Mario Bros? Did I call them pizza guys? Sorry about that, all my Italian friends. I thought they were plumbers, not pizza guys. Oh, they weren't? They weren't pizza dudes? No, they were plumbers. Really? Yeah, Mario and Luigi. It sounded like they should have been at the pizza parlor. Uh, That would have made sense, too. They did love pizza, but who doesn't love pizza? (laughs) That's that's a silly stereotype. Oh, Italians love pizza. Everybody loves pizza. The shit's incredible. Yeah, really. No, and I never played that either. Oh, oh, no, I'm only the jump, the jump, the jump, the jump, the jump, the jump. Yes. Ping, the pong thing that you do. That's me. Atari? Yes, I never got into any of that. I've never played a competition against anybody in a game except for pinball. That's it. Mm, and you were a pinball wizard. I was the wizard. I was the wizard of O. That's right. What does that mean? You're making O faces while you were playing pinball? Oh, I'm good. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> what was going on under the table? <laughs> oh, man, I used to kick that pinball machine. I was so good. I was really a good pinball player. You and Roger Daltrey, I guess, huh? Yes, indeed. I was a pinball wizard. Oh, man. All I right. All my quarters, man. Every quarter I got, every the paper routes and everything. I'd be down there, be buying uh, Philly cheese steaks, having a milkshake, some pierogies, and on the pinball machines after school. If I wasn't because – well, I didn't, have a, I didn't play baseball. I wasn't a baseball player. We didn't have the kind of baseball at our high school, so. And you had football practice in the morning? No, we never practiced in the morning. You kidding me? We only had 700, 800 kids. You had to get all the kids into school. We didn't have we didn't have morning practices. We didn't have spring ball. Okay. Pennsylvania. So you wouldn't play pinball in the fall. You would only play in the spring when you didn't have practice. Oh no, no, no. On, now there are times where 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 I lived, I would walk. You know, I would either walk to school and get to a pinball machine, or in the summertime, I just go hang out at the pinball place because it had you know it had a soda fountain. It had you know. Get yourself a grilled treat, get grilled cheese and fries. I mean, that's yeah, that's where my paper route money went. It wasn't like saving, like you know, my paper route money mm. and putting it in the bank. No, that was putting it in a shoe and yeah. then taking it and spending it at the pinball place. You're a high school kid. You're supposed to be doing stuff like that in high school. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. That's awesome. How long would you stay at this pinball place? I probably I probably average about two hours, like a full a full two playing. All right. Yes. All my tips from all my tips from the paper route. Dude, I used to fling those papers. I was good at that. <laughs> I carried those. I carried those on show my shoulders. I had double bag too. Did you bike? Bag. Huh? Did you bicycle? No, I didn't do I didn't I didn't I didn't bicycle. Huh. No, I tried that one time. You know how I quit my paper route? On a Sunday, it was freezing cold in Pennsylvania. And I got to where the papers were. And they delivered the papers late. And I untied the, the tie thing. You know, like you see the Dallas Morning News. Sure. And I took the stack of them and threw them up in the air. And they went everywhere. And I called them up and said, hey, your guy didn't stack the papers right. And that's how you got fired? That's how I, I quit. That was oh. it. Oh, that was yeah, my yeah. way of quitting at that time. Yeah, you blamed somebody double. else on your way out the door. Oh, Very yeah. millennial of you to do. That's interesting. Yeah. Up in the air with the papers. I took, I just jumped on the bike and went home, but I didn't, I wasn't one of those dudes that had my dad on Sunday, you know, helping me deliver papers. I did that shit with double bags, bicycle. Let's go. That sucked. That's how you quit. Huh? In the words of Walker from Ricky Bobby, greatest generation, my ass. (laughs) Yeah. Up in the air, they went everywhere. The wind took them. It was freezing cold. I had had enough. I'd done that for like three years. I had enough. I had enough of working then. Yeah, I bet. I bet. All right, we'll uh, we'll get into Texas baseball here. Huge game for the Longhorns as they host Texas A&M tonight. The Aggies coming into this one undefeated, ranked number seven in the latest D1 baseball poll. We'll talk about that here in a second. But uh, first, Buck, how about another sponsor shout out? My good friends at Relax the Back. Talked a little bit about them. You know, I've got this unbelievable chair that I've been sitting in for over 20 years now. Now, I've gotten up every once in a while to go to the bathroom and eat food and go play golf, but I love this cheer from Relax the Back. They've got everything that you need, whether you have thoracic pain, lumbar pain, neck pain, 
shoulders, the whole works. You're going to enjoy it once you go to their two locations. They got perfect pillow fitting pillows just for you. You know, they got the Tempur-Pedic mattress, and they've always they're always having wonderful sales over at their locations here. Love the folks over there. I was over there the other day just to say hello to everybody, and they said for me to say hello to you too. They love the show, BK. They absolutely love us in the morning. They love us in the afternoon, and Jason loves what we're doing with, with the stores over there. Now, they take a holistic approach for a healthier lifestyle based on 35 years of proven expertise. They've got new stuff all the time that relax the back just for you. you got two great locations, folks. At BK's at the Hill Country Gallery across from Whole Foods and in Austin at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the Container Store. Folks, go find yourself a chair, a pillow, a desk, anything you need to relax the back. Yes, indeed. Shout out to Relax the Back. Also, some love to 7-Eleven. Speaking of oh, locations, yeah. they've got locations all over the great state of Texas. Absolutely. Tuesday, hard copy day. Today's the day? Yeah, hard copy. Th throw it up in the air and then blame somebody else for no, it? No, no, no. We don't need to do that. I'm not a kid anymore. Okay. Uh-uh. Well, if you want to get the newspaper, you don't because nobody does. They've got them at 7-Eleven, but more importantly, they've got the great drinks, the great food, the great snacks, the great everything. It's the best convenience store in the world. That's where I go to get gas for my car. It's where I go to fuel up myself. I go to 7-Eleven all the time. Shout out to our guy, Ashish. Shout out to our gal, Wendy, who own and operate four different 7-Elevens here in the Austin area. They do a great job at their stores, but every 7-Eleven brings it uh, with an incredible selection and great service every time you go in there. Make sure you all download that 7-Eleven app as well. If you haven't, you are missing out on some great deals. It is 7-Eleven. I met a young girl the other day at Starbucks, her, her dad, and the young girl was in the car. And dad wanted to introduce me to the daughter. And she was, I'm thinking, there's going to be a, a kid in like a baby seat or something, like a, a car seat. I go, and it's like a grown woman. And she goes, I've been listening to you for so many years. I just And she wanted to meet me. And I was like, oh, I was like blushing. I felt so weird. And she goes, and I love the tips for kids in the car line. She goes, those were the greatest. My dad used to turn those up loud so Uncle Buck can tell me what to do to the day uh, in the car line. They just love that. She's like the fourth girl that said, that's what I listen for. I said, what about the sports part? She goes, oh, I can get that too. But I got to have those tips when I'm in the car. Because because I was waiting in the car line. I said, you didn't take the bus? Nah. Oh, no. Wow. I'm in I'm in the car line. That's pretty cool. That was cool. That was that was that was absolutely wonderful. And, and she I wanted, wanted your tip, huh? No, 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 no. No, you just no. said she, she wanted your tip, tip every week. Yes, every week. Yes. That that's the fun part about this gig as you get older. I mean, you'll see, you know, all the people that you saw on all of a sudden on your just your 30th birthday, all the people that have been listening to you for years, all of a sudden you're 30. Wait till you're my age if you get to be that going the way you're going. But yeah. it is that that's an awful fun. That's the fun part about doing this job to me. I mean, I like to talk about sports, but boy, the memories of the people are just incredible because now I'm going through a second generation, sort of like me going to soccer, soccer games for my grandkids. Mm -hmm. I hate it, but I'm going. You know what I mean? You've got a lot of people out there who love you. And uh you have, I was have to bring orange slices, man. I'm not doing that. I'm not no, doing that's it. Not, that's not the grandparents' job. That's the team mom's job. Okay. I, I'm not doing the orange slice deal. I'm not doing it where they touch their nose and put their hands in the orange slices. I'm not bringing orange slices. No. You now, just uh, bring the jelly cats. That's your oh, job. No, no, no. I'd rather bring the orange slices. They're not quite as expensive as the jelly cats. <laughs> wow. Uh, I like two Patrick's, but those things, those are collector's items, the jelly cats. So, no, I'm not doing that. But, Thank you to all our sponsors. I mean, just just wonderful people. And I'm glad a bunch of them showed up on Saturday, too. Amen. It was really, really good to see them. Absolutely. Quick shout out to CentexTickets.com yeah. as well. If you're looking for tickets to any sporting event, any concert, any Broadway show, basically anything live coming to Austin or going anywhere in the country, you can get those tickets online at CentexTickets.com. Jennifer Lopez coming to town. Jay no, Lowe. I wouldn't see that. No, I wouldn't. I, there, okay. no. Well, hold, on, hold on, hold on. No, I wouldn't see it. If you gave me a ticket, I wouldn't go. No. You you would pay to go see Justin Timberlake by yourself. Yes. But you wouldn't go see I, No, I'm not, I'm not saying I would go by myself. I'm just saying, can I go by myself? I'm asking the people. And nobody gave me, I didn't give, you, you did any answers come up? Yes, you can go by yourself. Or it's better to go to your wife or find yourself 
I can't go with another dude. Mm, no, probably I not. I go see Magic Mike by myself in the theater. Well, yeah, what's going on in that popcorn tub? <laughs> no, I did. I went to see. I saw Magic Mike one and two. Now I saw one with somebody else, but I saw two by myself because I wanted to see the dancing. I wanted to see that dude. What's his name? Um, uh, Channing Tatum. Is that him? Yeah, Channing Tatum, but the other dude, the black dude, uh, Samuel uh, Jackson. No, the singer, the young singer and dancer rapper Lil Nas X no 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 not Lil Nas X oh somebody Usher, else. I've never you. seen it Chris Brown Usher no a black somebody. guy who sings and dances that's not really helping me out that much <laughs> there's a uh, lot of those out there man his name will come to me uh I'll I'll do a google search while you tell the rest of the story oh yeah it's so I, I went to the theater to see, because I wanted to see the, I, after I saw Magic Mike 1, I did want to see the dancing, because those are moves that I did back in the day. Those are things I used to be able to do back no. in the day. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. There wasn't the twist. It wasn't, I wasn't doing the monkey or the hitchhike or, or what, I mean, no. Those are my moves back in the day. No, they weren't. I mean, I, so, I haven't seen that movie, but no, they weren't. You Sure. I just like seeing the uh, the TV commercials for Magic Mike two or three or whatever the hell they're on right now. Like I was more ain't... like the I was more like the Jardians lady. Those yeah, are... you were more like the mailman in the Jardians. <laughs> <laughs> the mailman. Yes. Was it That's Donald Glover? Was... Yes, Donald Glover. Yes. Uh, Childish Gambino. Yeah, I was trying to get. I mean, I was trying to find out a way to send because uh, he he plays some golf. I was going to try to send a message to him to come to the Mullet Open. Donald Glover and get in there and play at the mullet open. Yeah. I, that's a talent. Is that dude any, is he still, is he making me, what is the deal with him? What Super talented. I don't know. I mean, I, he's still an actor and I don't think he's released an album recently, but he has within like the last five years. I, I don't know if it's like the last one or two, but was he supposed to come to a concert here and fell off a stage. Was he supposed to be South by Southwest or something? And before yeah. that he fell off the stage and hurt himself. I haven't, I haven't heard about him going and doing much concert stuff anymore. I don't remember. I know he's that. probably producing. He's probably producing. It's like Babyface. They do all these things, and all of a sudden they say, "Okay, that's it. I'm stopping. I'm just producing. I'm not doing anymore." Well, he's, he's, he's got. That, at, he's fabulous in Magic Mike. He's got. Uh, he's got that show Atlanta that okay, he yeah. either writes for. I think he writes and produces for that okay. one. So I, I know that's been consuming a lot of his time. But yeah, I mean, he's kind of a jack of all trades. Like that guy is pretty, good at pretty, pretty much. Talented, isn't he? He, yeah, he's good at everything that he does, and apparently you like him most as a male stripper. So wow, <laughs> man, wow, that's see, no, I yes, I I don't think I can go now. I can't go see, I can't go, I I can't go to that concert now. And you won't go Sorry see J Lo because I don't know why. You won't go front row to that show and get to see no. everything you could see there, but instead you'll go front row to Justin Timberlake and see that. J-Lo can't sing. I'm not going to hear her sing oh. or dance around. You think she can sing? Sorry, yeah. about, that. Sorry about that, Jenny from the block <laughs> or Julie from the block yeah. or whatever. I don't think it's Julie. That wouldn't make much sense. No, but I go to see Justin Timberlake because he can sing and move. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with no. that. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, we'll see if something is wrong with Texas baseball tonight because everything oh. went wrong with the Longhorns over the weekend in Houston. Texas, of course, swept. They lost to LSU on Friday night. They lost to Texas State on Saturday. And then uh, another groin kick on Sunday, falling to Vanderbilt after blowing an 11-3 to lead. Uh, the schedule doesn't get any easier this week for the Horns because coming to town tonight, the seventh-ranked and unbeaten Texas A&M Aggies. Oh, yeah. Give them their first loss. Hell, yeah. Be nice. A&M 11-0 on the season. They have been one of the best offensive teams in college baseball, which is a scary thought for the Texas pitching staff coming off yeah. of what we just saw at Minute Maid these last few days. Uh, if you want to get things back on track, David Pierce, you find a win against one of your biggest rivals, Tonight, Texas did win in College Station last year, but for the most part in these one-off regular season matchups between Texas and Texas A&M as non-conference foes, uh, the Aggies have gotten the better 
of the Longhorns. This is obviously the last time these two teams will meet yes. as not conference members. So we'll see. But yeah, for Texas to get things back on track and for David Pierce to kind of calm the loud voices of Texas baseball fans who were asking questions following the weekend performance, a win tonight would be just what the doctor ordered, Buck. Yeah, I mean, I, I, David Pierce seems to be under the same microscope as Rodney Terry. You know, that they'll, I mean, people are going to question what happened at Baylor last night. Even though Baylor's really good at the 11th ranked team, you had them down by 14 points at their place. You had all the momentum going. Coach, what happened? What happened in the second half? Why can't you guard anybody? Why isn't your NBA type player not playing like that? You know, you have to develop, your job is to develop too. Even if you're a basketball coach or baseball coach or the soccer coach, you know, you're the volleyball coach, you have to develop. You know, whether you say as an individual, that's not on me. That person is skilled. You know, what am I supposed to do? You're still supposed to develop these, these people. And people are going to start, I, I think Rodney and, and David are under that same kind of microscope, you know. They don't get to Omaha this year. Believe me, there's going to be a lot of rumblings going on. Yeah, I, I, it's way more fair to be critical of David Pierce than it is Rodney Terry because this is David Pierce's eighth season as the head coach yes. of Texas baseball. Now, he's had some great years. They made it to Omaha a few times, which is no easy feat, but yeah, he's still missing that national championship. And look, the standard of Texas baseball is higher than the standard of any college baseball program in the country. And it's significantly and much higher, higher than the basketball program. Bingo. Sure. Yeah, it's exact. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, Texas basketball doesn't have a lot of history. It kills me, but that's the truth. Texas baseball is the most historic program in the country. So, I mean, you're talking about a, a, a team that has had four coaches span over a hundred years, right? And, and obviously what uh, David Pierce's predecessors were able to do in Austin, like that has raised the bar on him to have a similar right. level of success. So, you know, there are guys, there are Texas baseball fans who were never in favor of the David Pierce hire in the first place because he wasn't. Oh, no, Texas. there's no doubt. He was not Texas's first choice. Like they totally bungled the the move back in 2016 and they tried to lowball all of these probably more qualified coaches that were top targets. And instead they ended up with David Pierce. Okay, that's fine. Pierce gets the job. But obviously now, you know, people expect results and the results have been good, but they haven't been as great as a lot of the Texas baseball diehards would have wanted. So yeah, any Texas baseball coach buck is going to be under a microscope that just comes with the job. But yeah. This is year eight right now. And like after last season, not making it to Omaha, Texas got screwed with the way that that happened, but there is going to be added pressure on David Pierce. And if this team doesn't have a great year, with the move to the SEC coming, and this is the best conference in college baseball that Texas is about to waltz into, uh, they're going to be expecting this program to be ready to go. And uh, if Texas has a down year, I don't know if Longhorn fans are going to feel good about that. No, I agree 100%. I, I mean, I still feel the same about Rodney. I think they have to go somewhere. They can't They can't get to the tournament. They, they definitely can't be out in week one. Yeah, they can. I mean, Rod, Rodney's not getting fired. Are you talking about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean that that this is a. Remember, you just talked about a team was that was supposed to be one of the top teams in the, you know in the top twenty. Right. Look, it's it's been a disappointing year for Texas basketball, but this is like the first full season of RT as the head coach here. Like he he's not getting let go. You know, Texas is going to make the tournament, but even if Texas didn't, I would tell you that I think RT would be back for a year too. Okay. Uh, he's he's not getting fired after this season. Now, you, well, no, I'm not saying getting fired. I just said the Heat will be up on. On both of these guys, I think they're they're viewed very similar. Sure, like no there's a, there's a scenario that exists where both guys are relieved of their duties within the next two years. I think mm -hmm. um, I, you shouldn't be rooting for that, right? You you hope this Texas baseball team just had a bad weekend. It's a long season, and they've struggled. And they've had those, bad weekends before in these particular tournaments. Yes. Oh yeah, and, and for some reason in those major league parks in Arlington and in Houston, it's like they just. I mean, they're three and twelve since 2020 in these uh, early season showcases and more often than not since 2020, they've been able to have good years. Um, so yeah, yeah they can use a win. Left. In other words, they can use a win tonight. Yeah. Well, they got four big games coming up this week against two rivals. You got a at home tonight, and then you're in Lubbock this weekend to take right. on your mark. You so a uh, and ranked in the top seven. I think Texas tech is still ranked. I got to double check. They were ranked in the top 20 last week. I think they're still in the top 25. So yeah, I mean, look, if, if you go two and two, 
Okay. Obviously, if you go three and one, I think people buy back in. But if it's one and three or oh and four, then the calls for a change, as crazy as it may seem this early in the yeah. season, those calls will get louder and louder. That's that's just the way it is right now. So yeah. Uh we'll see. Tanner Witt gets the ball for Texas tonight. He pitched uh, in relief on Friday in that loss to LSU and looked okay. He's pitched in Omaha before. Like th This game should not be too big for Tanner Witt, but obviously he's still coming off of uh, that Tommy John surgery, and he hasn't looked the same this year as he did before, TJ. So uh, you'd, you'd like to feel confident in the guy that Texas has on the bump for this big game on a Tuesday, but uh, with what we saw, once again, in H-Town, I don't know how confident anybody is in, in this Texas pitching staff because they're going to need more than Tanner Witt. They're going to need the bullpen at some point tonight, and that bullpen. Yeah, they can score runs, but they're going to need to hold people from scoring runs for sure. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about it. BK, let me ask you about the NFL. There's some NFL news out there. I mean, of course, uh, Kelsey retiring, um, Russell Wilson. That 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 cap hit from Denver is is massive, but they can't they can't keep him. Yeah, he no, doesn't want gone. to be there. The head coach doesn't want him there. Um, I just, I just don't, you know. I mean, I feel, I, I feel bad because I think Russell Wilson still had some, something left in his tank. I, I think he's, I think he, he got sagged more than any quarterback last year. They sucked on the offensive line. You know, everything, wanted, everything was going to be blamed to him because he was the one making all the money and let Russ cook and all that other shit that went along with it. But, dude, when you, can, when you can't hold them out, and you've aged a little bit as, a, aged a lot as a quarterback, and you can't escape the way you did, and you're, you're you know your bootlegs don't work anymore because everybody knows that's how you run your offense. It, that's a that's a tough deal. And now they're going to take a massive cap hit, and they've got to get rid of him. He's got to go. Well, I don't think they had to get rid of him, but they made the decision to yeah. get rid of him. No, they and, didn't have to. Yeah, I mean they released him yesterday. That was the big news out of the NFL that uh, came down yesterday afternoon. Russell Wilson released by the Broncos. Buck, they're going to pay, or at least they're going to take on. 85 million dollars in dead money over the next two years. Wow, that is an NFL record. And it's that's sure hurts building your team, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I don't know what the Broncos do from here. I mean, we can obviously get into where Russ is going to end up, but for Denver, I mean, look this this was a heavily criticized trade when it happened, and now the trade that they made with Seattle to go get Russ is going to go down as one of the worst trades in the history of the NFL. Yeah. They, gave up, they gave up two firsts, two seconds, a fifth, and three players to go get Russell Wilson. And then they gave him that ridiculous contract extension on top of that. And he was 11-19 and 19 in his 30 games as a starter. They paid him $120 million for those 30 starts in Denver. They brought him in thinking he would be, you know, the next Peyton Manning, like veteran quarterback with a Super Bowl under his belt who's going to lead us to another championship Nope. And he was nothing close to that. So, yeah, he was much better in year two than he was in year one. Looked like Sean Payton, you know, figured something out with Russ, and it looked like Russ figured something out with Russ. But uh, he obviously wasn't the same guy that he was in Seattle for the first 10 years of his career. And, you know, Denver, uh, the decision was basically made at the end of the regular season when they benched him yes. for those last two games. And I'm sure they tried to trade him, but nobody wanted to take on that contract. So I guess Denver felt like this was the best move for them. But like you said, they, uh, man, I, I mean, what do they do? You know, from here, I don't know if Mike Tomlin takes that on in Pittsburgh because Mike Tomlin is borderline. You know, they say they won't fire him. Let me tell you, if he doesn't make the playoffs next year, they've got to get to the playoffs and they've got to get into the playoffs and be in there pretty solidly because little hands is not going to be the guy that takes them where they need to go. They, their defense is too good. You know, it, with with why them and their defense is just too good for them not to be able to find a guy offensively at quarterback somehow some way. They're yeah, gonna take. They, I don't know what they do. They move up in the draft and take one of these six or seven guys because there's a whole bunch of them. But are they a, are they like Pickett again? Or are they just, are they just like him? Some of them in the back end. They keep, well, they keep saying that they want to run it back with Kenny Pickett. Now actions speak louder than words, and this is silly season in the NFL. Sure. Where, Everybody will say everything, and you know we've seen teams back their quarterback publicly, and then two months later in the draft take somebody else. So I don't know how much stock I put into uh, Pittsburgh saying that, even though they spent a first on Kenny Pickett just two years ago. 
But yeah, here you go. I mean, here are the odds for Russell Wilson's next team. And the team that's the Vegas favorite right now, according to DraftKings, is Pittsburgh at minus 200. You've got the Raiders right behind them, then the Falcons, and then the Patriots, and your Minnesota Vikings rounding out the top five right there. But Pittsburgh right now, uh, the favorite in Vegas to land Russell Wilson. And I, it could work. I just, it depends on what Russ has left in the tank. But with that defense and some of those weapons they have on offense. You don't have to get, do a lot. You know, you wouldn't have to do a lot. They've run right? the ball well enough. I mean, I mean, he'd had to make, he'd had to make some throws in the pocket. That's, I don't see their offense all of a sudden becoming, okay, bootleg here, bootleg there. I think those bootleg days are over with, with him, you know, yeah. everybody, everybody knows what's, what's going to happen. Fake toss here, go the other way. He doesn't have the leg. He doesn't have the wheels for that anymore. He can't outrun those guys around the corner anymore. Here's your Peyton Manning comparison, right? Like Peyton Manning wasn't great in his last year in Denver. Now he had some awesome years there. He won an MVP and set some records in one of his seasons in Mile High. But um, yeah, the year they actually won the Super Bowl, he he was kind of a noodle arm. Yes. And like I, I don't think Russ right now is as bad as last year Peyton Manning. But Denver won that Super Bowl because they had an elite defense and plenty oh, yeah. of talent around him. And Manning just did enough as a as a really good game manager to lead Denver to the promised land, but he got benched that season at one point for Brock Osweiler and then came back in late in the year. So it's not like he was that great. Russ doesn't have to be, you know, Hall of Fame. Caliber he's throwing the ball over. He can't throw a bunch of picks. Right. Like that That defense is good enough. I think that coach is good enough. Now it's the AFC, so it's tough because, you know, Russ is going to have to do something against some of the quarterbacks that Pittsburgh would right. run into in the playoffs, like Mahomes and Allen and Lamar and whatever. But – it could work. I could see Pittsburgh making a move and it's not going to call. They don't have to trade anything. And because no. Russ is going to make so much money from Denver, even though he's not playing in Denver, I don't know if he's going to be looking for a ton of money on the open market. He might be willing to take less on a prove it type of deal just to show that he's still got a few good years left. Yeah. He'll leave his family in Denver. He ain't moving them to Pittsburgh. That's for damn sure. Oh, you don't want to live in the steel city. No. Nah. Not with what about Bethlehem. Name's... You don't want to live not in Sierra. Bethlehem. Not with Sierra and what's his name's kid. The rapper's uh, kid. Oh, Future's kid. Yeah. Yeah. Kid, what is that kid now? 15 now or what? Something like that? It's a good question. Yeah, he's like 20. I think he's that old? <laughs> no, he's probably about 12. Uh, so if you had to pick right now, where do you think Russ ends up? I would say with Tomlin. And then, so if the ship goes down and Tomlin finally gets fired, Russ will be gone too. They'll all go down together. This is the, this will be the year that – I mean, like I said, they don't have to do very much, especially with that defense. They just can't turn the ball over. Mm -hmm. They can't have little hands. You know, and he'd have to battle with little hands and teach little hands some stuff about being a little guy because Russell Wilson is not that big either. No, he's not. I'm going to go with – He used to be able to escape though, but he, he doesn't escape now. Now he doesn't have that speed or elusiveness no. that he did. And the injuries, I think, have played a part in that. God, some low moments in Denver, too. I remember it was Nathaniel Hackett's only year as the coach out there, and Denver had, like, a bunch of a delay of games in a row, and the oh, fans yeah. in Denver were, like, counting down the play clock because the players and coaches couldn't figure it out. I think that was a game against the Texans, which is why I remember it so vividly because I was down in Houston. And they just, they had to do a count. It was that bad in Denver. And then, you know, Hackett gets fired because he was a total hack. But Sean Payton comes in. And once again, it got better. I felt like they could have run it back for another year just to see. Yeah, I thought uh, they would do that at least two years. Yeah, you're right. Sean Payton is, is stubborn and he wanted to make a move. And well, Denver and gave up a, a huge lot. Move. Boy, that's a huge move. Yeah, they gave up a lot to get him. And, yeah, they're paying, once again, $85 million in dead cap money over the next two seasons. That is by far an NFL record. That's actually more than the previous two dead cap money records combined. Wow. Yeah. So I'm going to go with Vegas as my pick for Russ. Are you? Division rival. I could see Vegas trying to stick it to Denver a little bit. Uh, I think Russ at this point in his career maybe makes more sense being an indoor quarterback than an outdoor quarterback. Like his arm has looked bad at times in Denver and Seattle, which those are outdoor stadiums, and you've got to sure. deal with the elements there. You also have to deal with the elements in Pittsburgh. And Vegas, I don't know what the hell Vegas is going to do. They need a quarterback, but they're not drafting high enough to take one. So I'll go with uh, the Raiders as the team that ends up with uh, – 
Yeah, you see her can get a deal in Vegas. You know, she can get a do a couple nights a week in Vegas. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Yeah, that'll work. Good job for the family. That'll work. And uh, Longhorn Bear says Kirk Cousins going to Atlanta. There was a report out there yesterday yeah. that said Cousins' family is looking at homes in Atlanta. I right think that's now. where he's going to end up. Yep. What are your Vikings going to do? They're going to move up in the draft and take uh, McCarthy. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what that does for him, but yeah. J.J. is kind of moving up the chart a little bit. I, I know he was okay, but he's not that good. No. I mean, Minnesota's picking 11 right now, if memory serves. They're thinking of that guy moving up to there. Uh, he, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if he's going to be there at 11. You might be right. They might have to move up into the top 10 if they want to get him. Because there are a lot of teams who could be willing to jump up to draft J.J. McCarthy, who is seemingly the fourth best QB in this class in the eyes of NFL folk right now. But, yeah, if uh, Cousins does end up in the ATL, then Minnesota all of a sudden becomes a spot oh, yeah. that needs a quarterback. And that's why Russell Wilson is being kind of linked to Minnesota. They've got top five odds for him too, but I don't know if that one would make a lot of sense. I'd be okay with that. You know I would. You want Russ? Yeah, I'd rather have Russ than a young guy right now. Well, do you, you think the Vikings can win a Super Bowl with Russ? The Vikings can't win a Super Bowl, okay? It doesn't matter. What does it mean <laughs> with Russ? But he'd have some success here. But no, they can't win a Super Bowl. They're the Vikings. They don't win Super Bowls. So you've they, given go up to, hope. they go to Super Bowls. Uh, not often, but you're right. They've been to a couple. A couple? They, yeah. Lost yeah, to Miami been, one time. They lost to. They've lost two super, two or three Super Bowls. Yes. Okay. Who do they? Who's the other one too? Mm, it'll hit me at some point. Give me a minute. Uh, all right. Well, we know it's not the Bills because they don't win Super Bowls either. Nobody loses Super Bowls to the Bills, <laughs> and, and the Bills can't even get to the Super Bowl nowadays because that guy Patrick Mahomes. Exists in Kansas what about City. Dak Prescott, the news of Dak. Jerry, um, very ready to pull the trigger. They've been pulling this trigger since the end of the season. This has been in the works. What what trigger are you talking about? That they're going to have to pay Dak. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think so. I mean, if the Cowboys want to be able to spend any semblance of money in free agency this off season to better the rest of their team, then they're going to have to yes. give Dak an extension. So, yeah, I think it's going to happen. Uh, Dak was. At some charity event yesterday in Dallas, and it was probably for the kids. Probably for the kids. Very yep. charitable dude, Walter Payton, Man of the Year, a couple of years ago. Yeah, you, you can say what you want about Dak on the field, but off the field, he's uh, as good as it gets, and he sleeps well on that sleep number bed. Yes, he does. And of course, as I try to pull up the exact quote on my phone, my phone is freezing right now. But he basically said he's confident that a deal is going to get done. Jerry Jones at the Combine last week said Dak is our quarterback. And, yeah, I, I think ultimately before we get to training camp, there will be a contract extension done with Dak. I don't know how many years. I don't know how much money. But I think they'll find a way to get something done that extends him beyond 2024. You see them in the in the line for a, another running back, too? Are they going to wait to the draft? They're waiting to round five or six or whatever it is to grab a running back? Or, or is this going to be somebody they pick up, one of these old dudes? Um, I, I think they should go young. I, I never like paying running backs. So if you want to get like a guy like Devin Singletary to be your RB2 and just give him a one-year deal for a couple of million dollars, then that's fine. But if you're talking about like spending Saquon money or Josh Jacobs money, then no, nah, I'm out on that. What's the word on, on Saquon? Have you, is there anything out there? Nope. They're just waiting. They're on hold. Oh, the offseason hadn't started. Like, you can't make moves yet. You can re-sign with teams, but you can't sign with other teams. So under the table stuff. I mean, I, I gotta believe that they're a quarterback. They're they're not thinking about returning him. They're gonna get another quarterback. Yeah, I don't know what they do. Like Barkley's a free agent, so it's easy to let him go. Sure. Daniel Jones is under contract, not easy to let him go. I don't think they're gonna do what Denver just did with Russ and pay Daniel Jones a bunch of money to leave. I don't think they're in that type of situation, but I don't know. Like I, they, they can't run it back with Daniel Jones if they expect to be a no. contending team next season. He had that one flash in the pan year two seasons ago. Got him beat a contract. Your, beat your Vikings in the playoffs. Not hard to do. No. Uh, got him that big contract. And then last year, he gets hurt a lot, but also when he does play, he's not very good. So that's a bad. Yeah, that's, that's another landing spot maybe for J.J. McCarthy a little later on. 
you know, if he doesn't, when did when is when are the Vikings picking? They're picking past eleven. No, they're at eleven. Yeah, that may be the one right there, right? For the Vikings? Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that a couple of minutes ago. That could be okay. a spot for him. I, they might yeah. have to trade up to get him. I mean, the Giants have the sixth pick. Could they take a quarterback? No, that's what I'm saying. The Giant. That's what I meant. The no. Giants. Would they? Would they try to get to JJ McCarthy? Is he? The, is he Maybe. good enough? Big enough? Strong enough? Mentally ready enough for the for New York City media? Mm. No, but nobody knows. Nobody knows about these quarterbacks. Like. He could be really good, you know. So I think the kid from LSU is going to be really good. Daniels. Yes. Is he number one on your big board? No, Caleb Williams is still number one. Okay. But he's number two on my big board. All right. Sorry about that, Mr. Right. Curtis Mayfield. I thought no. you had a bold prediction this morning, but now no. most people oh, have Jane Daniels. See, you see him if he's not two, he is three, right? Right, yeah. I think yeah. I think most people have him ahead of Drake May at this point, honestly. But uh yeah, it feels like that's your one, two, three in some order. It's Williams more than likely one to Chicago and then uh either Daniels May or May Daniels to uh Washington and New England, respectively. And what does Justin Fields do? Is he sticking what are they gonna do? They can't have two of those guys. No, they'll they'll trade him. They're not getting a first round pick, which we could have told you months ago that that sure. wasn't going to happen, but they'll they'll trade him and get maybe a third. For him, okay. some team will take. Maybe Minnesota takes Justin Fields if Cousins does end up signing with Atlanta. Yeah, that could another be a landing spot for him. I mean, yeah. boy, I don't know. I don't know if that's giving up too soon on a young guy, but he is an Ohio State quarterback. So well, CJ Stroud really is CJ Stroud is an Ohio State quarterback too. Yeah, he finally uh, figured that thing out. Yeah, I, I would give up on Bears Fields. just suck, don't they? I mean, the Bears, Bears suck. Yeah, they always have. They always will. So, what? like, if they trade Fields, he's going to be great somewhere else, and the guy they draft is going to suck because that's just how it works for the Bears. Okay. But I would still trade Okay, Justin well, then Fields. bring him to Minnesota. Let's go. There, there you go. All right, uh, before we shift gears here, and I think you got to bounce here in a couple of minutes. But yes, uh, Oh, yeah, no kidding. I'm st- I forgot about that. Thank you yeah. for reminding me because I would have forgotten. There you go. Any – uh. You got some sponsor shout outs, maybe a big hat read this yeah, morning. I love my big hat. The folks at Big Hat, I had a couple big hats. I did not have one on Saturday, but on Sunday I did watching the real PGA, the real golf, not the live golf, but I had a couple of those mocktails that were delicious. As a matter of fact, love the taste of the ginger, the lime, and the orange in those mocktails from Big Hat. I love Big Hat. They are, they are, they're starting to really move around. I, I saw their, uh, they had a display at uh, HEB out our way, out at B Caves. And boy, they are on the move, the Big Hat Company. And folks, if you're thinking of a wonderful drink without alcohol, you've got to taste their mocktails. They're about to come out with a couple of different uh, tastes of, of their mocktails without the alcohol. But the one that they have out right now with the ginger taste is spectacular. And I do advise that. I really, really do. And as I said, I don't, I don't need to have a drink in my hand socially, but there are people that are weaning themselves away from alcohol and you want to fit in a little bit, try one of these delicious mocktails. Not everybody's going to stand there with a glass of water. I know I wouldn't be mm. a glass of Coca-Cola, but I can't have Coke anymore. Olipop, do what are you doing drinking I, I, Coke? I don't do Coke anymore. I do Olipop, but I don't do Coke anymore. I am on mm. quite the streak right now. And then I had to tell my wife yesterday, you, you were like, hey, give her cake away. To the homeless instead of sitting it in the in the freezer just sitting there freezing you don't worry bk i'll get to that cake she'll take a day trip somewhere and that cake will be gone mm. i'll devour that birthday cake of hers so you don't do coke anymore that's good that's a positive development and uh you a little cake you are going to eat your wife's cake at some point yes i am oh yes okay. i am it's not birthday bad. cake or not no doubt about it <laughs> that's not a Love bad life change. Big hat, and i know everybody loves olipop i mean it is ah. it is i am i am going today i'm playing golf today so later on today i'm going to go and i'm going to have the creamsicle yes i'm feeling that way you see i've got my little see my shirt that i have there you go mm. or the orange flavor the orange creamsicle flavor the orange creamsicle flavor yes ah, not the cream soda okay that's a good one you like that one. I like all of the olipops. But yep. try, I mean, I know you haven't messed with the mocktails because you need to have alcohol in your drink. 
there's something that little twinge of alcohol or that little percentage or that big percentage. You need to have that, you know, yeah. and better off Trey walking around with a tray with a tray of drinks like he did on Saturday, <laughs> being the male servant looking like a male servant. Oh, that's, no. That, that, that's exactly what it reminded me of. Calling Trey a manservant? Manservant. He looked like a manservant with the tray. All he needed to do is have it above his head. That would have been wonderful. All right, I got to get out of here, brother. All right, Double R is here to relieve you. See you, boys. Smack. Take care, buddy. There he goes. What's going on, Rodney? Man, I'm doing, man, I'm enlightened. No, Bucky doesn't do Coke anymore. Yeah. Uh, that's good. And, and he's going to get his wife's cake. I mean, that's um, it's a hell of a way to start the day. No wonder he's getting off work early. Is all that shit happening die. today? Jeez. He's he's doing more than just getting off work early, it seems like. Yeah, no doubt about it. No mm. doubt about it. Man, I was listening to you guys talk about that whole Russell Wilson thing. Do you think – I've kind of – Wags and I have talked about it to where it's like with Justin Fields, you're kind of waiting kind of for that domino to fall, and, and I think that needs to happen sooner than later. But with the Russ thing, you think that's the first domino that's maybe going to trigger some of this stuff to start happening for some of these – you know, free agent quarterbacks start moving around and get our draft more on a path somewhat? Yeah, that's a great question, right? Because obviously free agency happens before the draft, and and you would think a Justin Fields trade is going to happen before the draft. It just depends on, yeah, what's the first domino? Is it Kirk Cousins going to Atlanta? Is it a Justin Fields trade? Is it Russell Wilson signing with somebody now that he's a free agent? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think I think a lot of it depends on what Russ is looking for. Right, because he's going to get paid thirty-five million dollars by Denver next season, even though yeah. he won't be playing in Denver next season. So, is he willing to take a very low money, prove it type of contract, or is he going to play hardball and be like, "No, I still feel like I'm worth you know twenty-five, thirty million dollars next season." So, I don't know if he's willing to take almost nothing. Then that deal could get done pretty quickly. If there are a team or is a team or are a couple of teams who are interested there, but I don't know exactly how that order is going to go down, but it does sort of feel like those are kind of the three moves that you can expect before the draft, the Kirk cousins decision. Cause he's the biggest name, free agent quarterback, Russell Wilson, who's now a big name, free agent quarterback. And then, yeah, I think everybody assumes that Justin Fields is going to be dealt at this point. Cause it feels like Chicago has honed in on drafting a QB one, one, so I don't know the order of those three, but those three will be happening within the next month and a half. Yeah, and I think I think the Russ thing is going to be a, a big thing because it it really is a matter of him, it, you know, the, the big money versus the small money. I mean, obviously, if you look at the last couple of years, I mean, last year was better, like you guys mentioned. But I mean, is this is this where Russ says is this where Russ goes out and tries to prove everybody, prove to everybody that he still, you know, is the Russell Wilson that we remember in Seattle, and and with everything that, that he did there, or you know, is he going to hold out and still want even more money? I mean, I. I think you take the high road right here and go go prove, look, I, I can still play. I think that needs to be the position he's in, whether it be in Pittsburgh or, or Atlanta. I mean, I think Pittsburgh seems to be the landing spot, but I think that's the mindset he has to have right now. I mean, he's got money. He's going to be getting money, like you said. I mean, go out, go out, there, and go out there and prove that you can still do this because that's the question, in my opinion. Yeah, and I don't know if he can do this, right? Well, what is do this now? Like, I don't think we're ever going to see prime Seattle Russell Wilson ever again. But can doing this be better than what he's been the last two years? Once again, I, I think he was better in 23 than he was in 22, but still not worthy of the contract he was getting in Denver. So, you know, is that just who Russ is? Is he a, a below average quarterback in this league right now? Or can he find the fountain of youth and, you know, get at least close to the top 10 conversation again? I mean, that guy was a top 10 lock for most of his time in Seattle. And now, yeah, the thought of putting Russ anywhere near the top 10 is asinine. So what are you getting from him? I, once again, yeah, if he is willing to take less money, then teams will absolutely be willing to take a flyer on him. But, uh, man, I mean, it's, it's is it better to bring in Russell Wilson or draft a young quarterback and just hope that that guy turns into something? I don't know. That's, I mean, that that's the other part of this. I mean, and we've been we've been kind of touching on it a little bit too, where it's like, 
you know, you, you look at this and it's like, can't miss. I mean, all five of these guys. I mean, I guess even if you add in Bo Nix, well, six, if you add in Michael Penix, I guess Penix is maybe the one where it's like, maybe that dude can miss because he's been hurt or whatever. It's like, these are all can't miss. You know, I, I just, I, I'm waiting for somebody to, you know, kind of make the, the correlation to the 83 draft, you know, with Elway, Elway and Marino and all those guys that none of this, that these are all going to be great quarterbacks. We don't know that. I mean, in the Caleb Williams thing, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I've said it. I'm just, yeah, great natural talent, great ability. But, I mean, I, I, mean, I got to see it. I got to see it. And it all comes down to if he lands in a spot, you know, in Atlanta or Chicago. I mean, if he lands in Atlanta, I mean, I, I think it would really uh, behoove him to land there. I mean, he's going to do well. But we don't know, man. We, we absolutely don't know. And that's, and that's the beauty of this because we can project, project, project. We don't know until they get on the field because it's a hell of a difference when you get to the NFL. Yeah, it is. It is. And Caleb Williams is the closest thing to can't miss, but he's not Joe Burrow or – Mm -hmm. uh trevor lawrence level to me but he's close and yeah like I, I like this quarterback draft class a lot but i think if you have a top three pick you don't consider kirk cousins or justin fields or russell wilson right like you take right. your chance on a top three pick the question is after that right you look at uh you know the giants at six what do they do you look at atlanta at eight you brought them in it seems like they're being linked to kirk cousins a lot that would make sense because they're not going to be able to end up with one of the top three qbs in this class and then you start looking at teams like minnesota and now denver and vegas and seattle like there are so many teams drafting in the teams that could be in the market for a quarterback and it's just what what do you do so uh yeah cousins to atlanta is getting a lot of steam russ is another one of those guys who will probably go to one of those teams that's not drafting in the top 10 but could use a quarterback yeah if you're in the top three then you're taking those top three qbs and you're hoping that uh, one of them turns into that can't miss guy that you're talking about. Yeah, and and you have to. Uh, I think with some of the with some of the veteran guys. I mean, with like Wilson and with Cousins. I, I mean, Cousins coming off an injury. I mean, what you have to do is. I mean, look what happened to the J E T uh, J E T E S. However, they said it. Look hmm. what happened to the Jets last year. I mean, what what what's going to be your fallback there if one of these guys that's a little longer in the tooth goes down? I mean, what's what's your backup plan? I mean, it, it, you know, the Jets weren't ready for that, and and, and you have to factor that into with. with with some of these older dudes yeah i mean look if you lose your starting quarterback in the nfl your season's done like i yeah. like you want to have a good backup it's it's insurance for the most important position in the sport so you you got to have a good backup just in case your starter misses a few games but if your starter plays one drive not even one drive like aaron Rodgers, then yeah you're done your season's over so you gotta hope if you are bringing in a kirk cousins then he's your guy i mean russell wilson Maybe a team that brings him in, they still draft a quarterback like that. That would make sense to me because you got to have some sort of plan. Just, hey, we have Russ on a one year deal. And if he's not good this year, then, OK, we got to have something in the hopper just in case. But, yeah, I mean, for a lot of teams like Atlanta bringing in Kirk Cousins, they're not going to do anything else at quarterback. They shouldn't right. do anything else at quarterback. So, uh, yeah, like Minnesota season fell off the rails when Cousins got hurt. Not that they were having that great of a year beforehand. But once he went down, it was like, boom, okay, this is over. This team's not making the playoffs again this season. Uh, that's that's what it is. So I think, look, guys come back from ACL and Achilles injuries enough in today's NFL. It's not like Kirk Cousins is a dude who relies on his athleticism either to, to make him a really good quarterback in this league. Like if he's a little bit more immobile next season, that's fine. As long as the arm talent is still what it was, I think uh, he's going to be a hot commodity on the open market. But – uh, yeah, I mean, that's, it'll be fun to watch. It'll be fun to watch. It's the, once again, the most important position in sports. And there are a lot of teams. It's amazing. Like there are some years, Rodney, where I'll go into the season and I'll look around and be like, yeah, it kind of feels like every team has their quarterback situation figured out. Yeah. And and then like a month into the season, it's like, oh shit. By the time we get to next off season, there's like five teams that already need a quarterback. And then by the time we get to the end of the season, it's like, oh, there might be 10 teams that need a quarterback. And you know, you, you got to remember who's won the last two Super Bowls, right? Like, you have to have somebody who can out-duel Patrick Mahomes. And they're, they're not going to win every Super Bowl. Tom Brady didn't win every Super Bowl. But you got to look at, like, the standard of what you need production-wise from your quarterback and at least compare it to what Mahomes is doing in Kansas City. And if you know you don't have that guy, then you got to make a move until you do. 
Yeah, and and to find and to find the next Mahomes, you, you know, I think what, when I hear folks that, that want to try to compare somebody to Mahomes, it's like, look, look, don't don't even go down that road. I mean, that that's a very rare thing right there. And and looking at, I mean, what? Hey, man, I counted Kansas City out of this thing, you know, three months before the season was over, and still here they are. They're the world champions again. I mean, he did it. He did it with not that fantastic supporting cast. I mean, that cast got really damn good when they needed to be. Uh, by the way, Texas basketball, you're not doing that. You're going <laughs> bass backwards. Um, before Wags comes on, I, I do want to talk to you about that, BK. It was like, dude, you're sitting there watching that. I think I think that's more of a morale crushing thing than anything. As you get into Big Twelve tournament time and 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 Big Dance time, man, that that's a gut punch in my opinion. Last night, yeah, tough one. I mean, look, uh, the fact that Texas had a 14 point lead on the road at Baylor without Dylan DeSue being a factor at all is like, all right, you can get some positives mm-hmm. from that, but then, you know, it's not moral victory time right now, and you blew a 14-point lead uh, in a game that you felt like you had in uh, control of for most of it. So, yeah, it's a gut punch. Um, we'll see how Texas responds. They've got one game left in the regular season against Oklahoma on Saturday. If they win that game, look, if I would have signed up for three of the last four with the way the schedule was looking like. But, yeah, I mean, last night was a gut punch, and it becomes way more than that if something is seriously wrong with Dylan DeSue. Seems like Texas has dodged a bullet, but uh, who knows? Who knows? And this is the wrong time to be wondering whether or not your best player is healthy enough to play. Obviously, DeSue getting hurt in the tournament last year uh, probably cost Texas a trip to the Final Four. And if he's hurt right now, before the tournament even starts this year, then it's going to probably cost Texas any chance of winning a game in the dance. (laughs) Man, I'm totally with you. I mean, when when I saw that last night, it became I didn't give a damn about what was happening with the Baylor game. It's like, okay, this if this is going to be a loss, it's going to be a loss, whatever. But I mean, that that was my first thought. It's like, man, if that dude. It, so when he walked back out, I'm like, okay, th- there's a good sign. But but still, this isn't. It's just a lot of things that happened last night where the timing of them is is just not good. Just not good. Yeah. You know, well, you, they they had one guy show up last night, and that's. that's- unacceptable i mean max max ace must carry the team and i don't know why it took scott drew as long as it did for him to start doubling uh max ace miss or to start shading more of that zone defense over to max ace miss to get the ball out of his hands but once he did that coupled with the fact that the sioux got hurt nobody else on texas could do anything offensively so yeah i mean it's uh, you, look star players can carry you in the tournament but to, to really make a deep run you need some of your other guys to step up and do something And to win a game against a team as good as Baylor in their house on senior night, you needed more than just one player to show up for you. And unfortunately, in that second half, nobody else besides Max A. Smith showed up for the horn. So that's annoying. And that's why I think against the Oklahoma game, it's going to be so important to be reading body language of this team. I mean, if they come out and they look defeated and deflated before you ever start i mean that's going to set your path right there i mean folks that are panicking over over getting into the tournament don't worry about that you're going to get in i mean you're going to be eight nine ten whatever it's going to be um that's the card that you've been dealt right there but i think what you need to worry about right now is the psyche and the mental part of this team going into the tournament big 12 tournament and the big tournament because i mean i just think after that last night that was one where man that's hard to come back from i mean if you want to you want to question the coaching of rt and this staff their big thing that they're going to be needing to do the next two days is to get some confidence instilled into this bunch and and get them on some kind of path heading into these tournaments. Otherwise, it's going to be a quick exit in both of them. Yeah, yeah. Saturday's uh, a chance to uh, right the ship a little bit. This team has been playing well. They played well at times last night, but uh, nothing to show for it. So uh, before we bring Wags on, i got to give some shout-outs to some great sponsors, some love to Altstadt Beer, the best beer that you can find all throughout the great state of texas one more thank you to the fine folks at the altstadt brewery for footing the bill for the 30th birthday bash at kelly's irish pub this past weekend of course kelly's is a great spot as well they've got tons of different altstadt brews there at kelly's and altstadt's popping up all over central texas and the state of texas so next time you're at uh, your local watering hole make sure you're asking your bartenders for Altstad beer, and you can pick some up at HEB Specs, Twin Liquors, 34 Wine and Spirits, Total Wine. Wherever you go, you can find some six packs of Altstad beer. No impurities, no regrets, and uh, some love to AV Consultations as well. We love our guy Tom McKay. I know Wags will tell you more about uh, Tom and AV Consultations 
during chaos theory, but just give them a call 512-255-8678 for the home TV setup of your dreams. Try to get it done by March Madness. Selection Sunday is less than two weeks away. Don't spend a bunch of money going all over the city to watch the NC2A tournament. Make sure uh, your home is the place to be for friends, for family, but most importantly for yourself. You can do that with that custom TV setup from Audiovisual Consultations. They've been around since 1988. They're the very best at what they do, and that will continue into the future. So see here, man, Wag's doing something over there. I'm not sure what he's doing over there. <laughs> He's, he's still he's still cleaning my out. fucking my eye. I have something in my fucking eye, man. <laughs> Whoa, is that is that pink eye? What what happened? Oh, to your like, last I can't night? I can't fucking see, man. You might turn my camera off, dude. That that looks contagious. Go go get some eye drops real quick. We're taking yeah. wags off the stage because yikes, man. We don't have an HR department, but I feel like someone's gonna file a complaint if uh, <laughs> if we force people to look at that for a few more yeah. seconds. That uh wow, God is, dang it, man! That uh, did, did his wife fart in his pillow last night? I mean, what? I, I, I don't know what he did right there, man. I, I think I, I mean Tom McKay's got it right here. Wax is a fucking mess. Yeah, li literally. Uh, that that's about right, right there. Oh, oops, wrong one. There it is. Wax is a fucking mess. <laughs> uh, yeah, he'll uh he'll be back here shortly. Um, I'm assuming. <laughs> Jeez, Louise, man, that's that's a hell of a way to start. It's like I could see him there the way he kind of came rumbling in. You know, he kind of kind of looked like an ape, just kind of stumbling himself in, and then he turns that camera on. It's like holy. Holy, that's a hell of a deal right there. We'll, uh, we'll see if we get to Wags here in a moment, but uh, yeah, that was bizarre. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about what about Texas baseball? You guys might get into this, but uh, boy, after the disappointing weekend in Houston, Double R, any faith, any confidence that the Horns can bounce back and pick up a win over A&M tonight? Well, you know, um, I, I'd like to see, and I saw some chats. Uh, by the way, our chat is going crazy with apparently uh, something going on with the uh, with the old Blitz uh, the, that may be trying to be revived at another spot. Um, or oh, some, they're stealing ideas over there, huh? Uh, apparently so. Apparently Interesting. So. But um, we have Blitz all day from 8 to 5. You guys can just, just sound off on the Blitz <laughs> right there um, on our thing. Man, I'm uh, bullpen, shaky. But you know what? It's early. It's way early. And th those were good teams. I just, man, BK, the 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 Saturday and the Sunday losses to me, kind of kind of going back to what we're talking about with Texas baseball or basketball. It's like, oh man, those those hurt. Those hurt. But it's yeah. way early though. But man, I, I'd like to see some bullpen some bullpen work here because that that that's a little concerning. Yeah, look, ultimately in the standings, all losses count the exact same. But, uh, you know, Saturday and Sunday, like you said, Sting, I mean, you were down 6 nothing to Texas State on Saturday. You come all the way back. You hit go-ahead homers in the seventh and eighth inning, and it's like, bang, come back complete. This is a good win for us early in the year. And then your bullpen can't hold either lead. And then Sunday was even worse. Like, as, as bad as Saturday was, Sunday, even though it was against an SEC team that's ranked in the top 10 in Vanderbilt, uh, to be up 11-3, to after the fourth inning and to lose 14 to 11, that's, that's as bad as it gets. I mean, the bullpen gave up 16 runs combined in those two games yeah. on Saturday and Sunday. So look, every team's got some bullpen questions at this stage in the season. That's just how college baseball works. But yeah. golly, I mean, to go from, I know Cal Poly is Cal Poly. They're not LSU, Texas State, and Vanderbilt. But to go from that, where every single pitcher who pitched in that series didn't give up a run, to basically every pitcher who did pitch in this series giving up multiple runs. Yeah. That's as much of a 180 as you could possibly take. So, yeah, yeah they've got to figure it out. Hopefully Tanner Witt can give them some length tonight so they don't have to rely on their bullpen a whole lot because if Witt only gets through an inning or two, then it's like, ah, oh, shit. And I feel yeah. like uh, your chances of winning are very, very slim. But, yeah, I mean, this pitching staff just – Everyone was feeling pretty good about it, I think, through the first eight games, and now I don't think anybody's feeling good about it. Yeah, yeah, and Chris Cortez will go for the Aggies, and I think that's where we'll see. I mean, this is a big test for the Aggies. I mean, yeah, I know they're undefeated. They're, what, seventh? I guess they're ranked seventh. But, I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, you look at their schedule, and again, you know, we like to talk shit about the Aggies, but it's it's been a relatively soft schedule. I was talking yesterday that they kind of rolled through their weekend tournament there. Uh, I guess Cortez's last outing was against Lamar or? or something like that so you know th this will be a good test we'll see how good a&m is if 
if Tanner Wick goes deep. That that's that's the whole other part. So I I, I think we get some questions answered tonight, but it, it it's early. But you know that that's the cool thing about this when baseball starts and you have a weekend like we just had, BK. It's like oh, okay. It, it, it's like urgent. It's like urgent concern because you don't have this with baseball, basketball. It's like, okay, yeah, you, you know, yeah, it is what it is. But when it comes to Texas baseball, um, you, you just don't have this shit happen. You do not have that happen. And it's yeah. a, it's a panic button moment early in the season. Yeah. Big week chance to turn things around, right? You got four rivalry games coming up and Texas tech is pretty good. You'll see them this weekend in Lubbock. You know, that fan base is going to be amped up. We saw it in basketball a couple of weeks ago, and I don't think it'll be as hostile at Dan Law in baseball as it was at the USA in hoops. But, uh, you know, the last chance in a big three sport to get to you before you head to the SEC. So, yeah, uh, David Pierce can calm the tides a little bit with a strong week this week, or uh, the storm could get worse and this ship could start to spiral out of control if Texas goes one and three or, God forbid, worse than that. So they beat AM last year in College Station. The Aggies, I think, won the previous four games, though, between these two teams. So uh, they're the better team right now. That offense is legit. I don't care about the level of competition they've played. That offense can score. And that offense going up against this pitching right now, that is a, a slightly terrifying thought, I think, for Texas. So... Yeah. Um, we'll see, but yeah, frustrating weekend and the offense scoring double digit runs, two games in a row. You should never lose at a place like Texas when that happens. And you lost twice. Well, and the thing about it is you, you guys alluded to it, um, you know, with LSUs and and with, with this A&M team that's coming in to, to UFCU tonight. I mean, you're about to embark yourself again. There's a lot of work to be done this year. You got a long way to go this year. But you're about to. We talk about football. You're about to embark yourself in one badass baseball conference. So I, I think you know. I know a lot of people are looking forward to, to SEC football, dude. SEC baseball. I cannot wait. That that's oh, be- oh I can. I'm yeah. sorry. I I can very much wait. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because this team is not ready for SEC this baseball not ready. right now. This, this so team I, I can absolutely wait. I mean, you're talking about like the SEC has won the last three national championships, and they're a couple outs away from winning the last four. Yeah, so you're that, right. that conference, you're right. I mean, it's the best in the sport, and it's exciting. You like testing your medal against the best, and there's going to be some fun road trips, and every series is going to be great. But yeah, shit, like it was a huge year for Texas football to prove that they could be ready for the SEC. We all feel like they're ready for the SEC because of the season that they just had. I'm not saying there's no chance Texas baseball turns it around. Like by the time we get to May and June, we could be saying, oh, the early season, whatever. We're ready for the SEC. We're one of the best teams in the country. We can make this move to the best league and be perfectly fine. But if, you know, if this season goes downhill and we see more performances like we just saw at Minute Maid, then shit, I'll wait. I'll wait. Can we get another year in the Big 12, please? Yeah, you come out and start laying eggs like that, and that's where – and that was that was the thing because we talked about it last week to where it was going to be. We knew, I mean, even with with the folks that were saying, "Well, you got the Texas State game in the middle right there." There's that one. I'm like, "Fuck, are you kidding?" That they play really good baseball in San Marcos. They have for a long time. So when you have the weekend that you have right there coming of like you were talking about coming off of what you had done prior, that's where it really is. Just just a kick in the nuts because it's like, um, you know, you. I, I, my honest thought was you take two or three, you're doing pretty damn good. Um, and you should have taken two of three, honestly, but you don't, and you, you don't like you mentioned, you can't score 11 runs and get beat. That's just not whether here or anywhere that that's, that's bad baseball, man. That is bad baseball. Yeah. I mentioned it to the buck yesterday, right there. There are years where Texas, if they got to five runs, it's like, Oh, say goodnight to it in the words of Craig way like, oh, yeah. this thing this thing is over we're winning this game and now it's yeah I mean if Texas gets to double digits tonight I don't know if they will but even if they get to 10 tonight it'll be like uh, is that enough do they need more can they hold on to this lead with this bullpen um I don't know it's gonna be a fun crowd tonight though we're doing a pregame broadcast yep. by the way with the folks at Occupy left field so if you are making your way to the dish 6 30 first pitch make sure you stop by left field beforehand Say what's up to us. We'll have some koozies to give out, and uh, we'll be setting the stage. Of course, we'll be live on YouTube and on the Texas Sports Unfiltered app as well. So if you can't make it out there tonight, you could still uh, consume our pregame coverage. And then the game, I think, will be on LHN on the TV side this evening. Should be a fun crowd. A lot of Aggie fans always make their way to Austin for this one. Hell, a lot of Aggie fans already do live in Austin. 
because, uh, you know, how would you want to live in College Station after school? But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it'll be a fun one at the dish. And obviously look forward to these two teams getting to play more than just once a year starting right. in 2025. But uh, I'm glad that baseball has found a way to make this rivalry happen. And tonight should be uh, nearly a record crowd, if not a record-setting crowd at the dish, because it feels like most time the Aggies are in town, they get close. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Code of text line, uh, Longhorn and Lubbock. Media is asking for their fans, I'm assuming A&M, and hecklers to show up for Texas. Well, well hell yeah. I mean, they better. I mean, when, when you get these two schools together, yeah, they better show up. Uh, CB, there's got to be a cyber attack going on because I had Facebook pulled up earlier, and it just like, I don't know what happened. I was trying to do some racing posts, and I can't do shit there. So I, I don't know what's going on. I, I think my phone's yeah. working. Um, I tell you, man, we're so reliant on all this stuff nowadays, and it's like it immediately quits working, and it's like, holy shit, what do I do now? What, yeah. uh, what's this? A pen? Paper? Oh, my God, what do I do? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, what's, ha- what's happening? Like, we, Well, we had the AT&T outage maybe two weeks ago. Is it what's oh Instagram's down apparently? Fa- well, Facebook own in- owns Instagram, right? So maybe it's just a Facebook issue. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Shoot, I'm afraid that uh, maybe the cyber attack is getting into Wags' eye too. I don't know what's going on there. Could be. Hey, also uh, before Wags comes back on, and and Wags is <laughs> he's gonna kill me to read this. Go to text line two five four number nine eight one. Don't forget, guys, give us your handle. If you had a handle at the old place, let us know so we can get your name in there. That way, we we can say your 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 handle or your name. It says, uh, what about the Texas women's basketball team before Wags comes back? I think they have a good chance to go far this year, and the softball team is looking good so far as well. Wags yeah. up my ass yesterday about talking about that. Stuff. Oh yeah, because Wags hates women. And since he can't defend himself, we'll just start uh, pinning that on him. Wags hates Title IX. He hates all women. Uh, doesn't think they should be able to vote. Doesn't think they should be able to drive. It was misogynistic Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would work for a second. Yeah, I mean, the women's team is great. The the loss to OU, that one hurt. They got jobbed by the refs, but also they they yeah. – you know, deserve blame for the collapse that they had in Norman. So missing out on the Big 12 title stings. We'll see if they can win the conference tournament. Um, and they're going to be a two seed at worst. If they win the Big 12 tourney, I think they'll be a one, which would be great. And then softball is number two in the country. And there's a poll that has them as the number one team in the country right now, which I think is crazy. Like, even though OU lost, I still think I still think they should be the number one team until yeah. Texas goes and beats them, if that happens this year. Yeah, the women's sports are holding their own right now. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, most of the Olympic sports are still doing their thing at Texas, too. But, yeah, you, you get football right finally. And then now it's like uh, you had to sacrifice basketball. And I'm not ready to say baseball yet because I, I still think this team has a chance to be fine. But right now it feels like uh, you may have you may have sacrificed the other two of the big three to get your football figured out. Then swimming, swimming just won another national national championship, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, boom, there you go again. I mean, that that rolls on. Football was always one lacking. We were talking about that the other day, where we were, um, you know, what? And now I can't remember the name of the damn award. They had to they had to send us. What's it called? Uh, what, it was school? a command. It was um. It was the uh, Director's Cup. The Director's Cup. It was always like every year, you know, Texas wins the Director's Cup, and it's like imagine if football could get their shit or together. Stanford. It's either Texas or Stanford. Yeah, that's right. Well, well, they got football's got their shit together. Like so. the collective championships between all the sports. That's right. In the program or in the institution. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what the hell is going on. With don't, my eye here. I don't think you should keep oh. rubbing it. I don't know if that's going to help. <laughs> hey, so we're, it's we're it's not pink eye. Yeah. This literally happened like maybe ten minutes before we went on. I was I was, you know, coming up from up. I was literally walking up the damn stairs, and it felt like it felt like either a piece of hair or lint or something got in my left eye, and I it was just like it, it fucking hit me like a ton of bricks all of a sudden to where it stopped me in my place, and I literally felt like something like a. Like a needle went in my damn eye, man, and now where's I can't them, get it out. Where's You've been sporting. I, I got my Bono ones, uh, Bono, whatever the hell. I is. have, I have the shades, dude. I just <laughs> don't get. God, don't keep, so keep rubbing your eye. You're I'm rubbing trying your to eye. get it out. I'm trying to push it out. Like I feel like use it. Use it like a compress or something. Dirt, don't dirty use hand. Your hand. Compress. Dirty yeah, hand. Yeah, that, that is better. A Kleenex or something is better than a. Your dirty ass hand. As he's just got out of the shower. 
got a pubic hair in his eye and now it's all thrown off over I'm here. I'm sure it's so it's it's so irritating. It feels like a grainy sand. In what my about eye. water? Have you put water in there? You try to rinse I it just, out? Like five, like it happened 10 minutes before, and that's why like I showed up all wet and stuff because I just jumped out of the damn shower trying to drain my eye. I you were excited to see us today, but wax right. showing up showing up for work all wet, mm. pubic hairs well, in his eye. Like, I, 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 there's no way to explain this, so I had to let you all see this. You know what I mean? Like, there's just no way. Uh, hey, uh, what am I going to say? Oh, to my ball. Oh, hey, I'm um, sorry. Two minutes before I come on, something just strangely happened to my left eye to where I can't see. Oh, yeah, Wags. We're going to believe that bit. That's why I had to come on here and show you. What are you Wags, Lisa take your top eyelid and pull it down and blink. What are you, Lisa oh, yeah. Lopes over here? What's going on? <laughs> You know, burn down somebody's house. Yeah, I, I don't even know how to do that. Take my top eyelid. Yeah, it's like when you used to flip your eye eyelid in and just kind of like try to freak people out. I remember doing that as a kid, and it's like holy shit. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you're watching. I mean, we've got like modern medicine happening right here on Chaos Theory as we're diving in here with BK. I apologize for this. Oh, you're, you're totally fine, man. man. Shit, shit happens, brother. Shit you got happens. eye? Did you already put in eye drops? I can't get my eye open, man. I can't put down my arms. Yeah. Hey, where's an eye patch? Do you have an eye patch? Cover that eye up. Turn him into. Let's go. Let's go. Let's Keep it back. rolling. Let's go. Cut what are we talking back. about today, guys? Hey, shit. What? We're done with women's sports, so we can get down to business, brother. Hey, look, and by the way, like, it was misogynistic Monday, man, and we were talking about some <laughs> geek stuff, and that's when that's when you threw in the the women's talk on me yesterday. So I just wanted to talk about the geeky stuff. That's all. <laughs> I like women. You, we can we can make a segment about the women's stuff. We have Ass Master Wednesday or Ass Lead of the Week on Wednesday. <laughs> yes, so. that is very pro women in sports. I that's do right. Agree. That's right. We're we're a very very female showcase. friendly program. Showcase, right man, the showcase. Yeah. That's right. What's okay, going on, guys? Nice. Anyways, happy uh happy Tuesday. I wish I could say I, I really this is I don't know where the hell this is gonna go today. I don't you gonna make it? Do you need yeah, me? Yeah, we're gonna make it. We're gonna power through. I've been blown up twice in one day. Are you serious? Uh yeah, but nothing got in your eye when you got blown up, did That's it? right. That's right. <laughs> it got in my it got in my other parts, not in my eye. All right. Well, I'll be around. Y'all holler if uh if you need me, Wags. Get better. Thank man. I'm you. Here. I appreciate it. Well, we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it work. I'll get oh, I'll yeah. get through it. We got yeah. it. Thank you, BK. Yeah, it, I won't, it, I won't be able to put the glasses on for a while, but Facebook anyway. is broke, Instagram's broke. You got one eye jacked up, man. This is just this is just a terrible team. I gotta drive to San Antonio in a little bit. Shit. I think I may hey, bunker look, in here. Listen, the show must go on, damn it. That's right. That's right. Here How's we go. You're gonna have you're gonna have to do the reading today, okay? Yeah, I got it. I got it. And, and Steven's got it. Pain and, and you'll appreciate this, Wax. Pain is weakness leaving the body, my That's man. That's exactly what it is, sir. That's exactly what it is. Um, well, you want to talk a little bit about what happened last night? I mean, I, before my vision went out, I was able to at least see a little bit of the game, even though you know, damn my eyes, take my eyes from watching it last night. But we kind of talked a little bit about it. Texas basketball, man. Um, you you kind of were all over, man. Aspis needed to come out there and, and start shooting the lights out of the gym. It looked like he did that, but we kind of added insult to injury there. No pun intended. Um, Dylan Nassou exited stage right out of the game and a little bit of more concern to the Longhorns as we continue to go into conference play here, Rodney. Yeah, that was, you know, it was. I mean, Ace was 33 points. I mean, shit, yeah, he, he shut my ass up. But like we were talking about with, with BK, I mean, it's like need, needed somebody else. I mean, it'd have been nice if somebody else would have uh, would have been able to 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 help him. But I got to tell you, I mean, your thoughts on this, man? It's one thing. It's one thing if you're going to lose the game. I think we both thought that they were going to lose the game, but the manner that they lost it in, I mean, it's just. I mean, that that's one that it. I called it a, a kick to the nuts earlier, and that's mm -hmm. that's really what that was. I mean, to blow that 14 point lead and then lose that yeah. way. I, when the second half started, I, I thought, okay, well, maybe they're going to be okay. But man, it was just. And then the Dassu injury. It's just, man, that that hurt. That one hurt, I think, in a lot of different ways. Yeah, and um, the thing is with, with the injury going now, like you kind of knew that you were going to be a little bit – I didn't I didn't expect to win the game last night. Um, I would have liked to, you know, seen just like a, a, a close fight or whatnot. Um, but I, 
I did want us to be able to come out of there unscathed and clean and be able to, to get healthy here. Um, we'll get the reports on the suit. I didn't hear from uh, Coach RT on you know on the uh, the extent of it or whatnot. Uh, I don't know if we have any sound. By the way, you're gonna have to check on that because I can't see. But if we do have any sound from RT on the suit, I'd like to hear that. Um, but yeah, uh, got to sure up. Got to get a little bit healthy. We got Oklahoma coming up um, right before we get into conference play here, and you got to think with a solidified ticket being punched already to uh, March Madness. We won't, we probably won't see Desu at all in the conference tournament. Yeah. Yeah. They're calling it a knee sprain is what they're calling it. So, Thank so if, if that is the case, yes. He's I, out I think, for a while. Yeah. 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 So yeah, we do have some sound from RT. And I think the question was, I think it was said golden that asked, you know, is Texas a tournament team, which they definitely are. But uh, Rodney's response here was kind of one where you're listening to it and it's like, okay, dude, we, we know you're a tournament team, but, but, but don't, but don't try to sell us on this. Uh, take a listen to this. This is Rodney after the we game. We played one of the hardest schedules in the country. Look at our schedule. Look at our body of work. We probably played more quiet ones as as, as 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 much as anybody in the country. I mean, look at our schedule. What, who you want us to play? You know, I mean, we played six ranked teams. First time in school history. We've done that, you know, and we stood toe-to-toe. You know, had we had a stumble here or there, you know, just like everybody in this league have, yeah, we've had that. But we're, we're one of the best teams in the country. We can play with anybody. We come into a hostile environment. I don't know what these guys are ranked today, but uh, they needed every call that they could get today in terms of getting it done here at home. So, I mean, what else you got to do? You know, we're a good team. We can play with anybody on any given night. Yeah, I agree with that sentiment. And, um, I understand, you know, we can play with anybody, but the, the whole – Fact is, coach, you got to be able to beat, uh, you know, anybody. That's the thing. Um, being able to get to the fight is one thing, but you got to be able to finish the fight. And uh, look, they are a good team. They're just not a great team. And that's what you need to be. You need to be a great team if you want to make a run going into this thing. And you could argue without the Sioux, are you even a good team? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm serious. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but, you know, seeing that, seeing that injury last night really did take a lot of the wind out of the sails. So, um, for me, you know, we were, you know, past two weeks, past three weeks, we've been, you know, worried and, and kind of talking about chopping it up about, the, you know, is Ace Smith going to show up or not? You know, when will he get out of his funk? Good thing he got out of it because it's going to be all on his shoulders from here on out, Rodney. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, with Tyrese Hunter, I mean, I love to start. I, I mean, Hunter starts out and I'm like, God dang, here we go, man. It's like, yeah, I, I'm like, here, here we go. We're going to be one of them games. going to be one of them Hunter games. That's, that's right. That's, that's right. That's what it felt like. It's like Ace Smith is doing what he needed and look at Tyrese Hunter. But then you get, then it's like, dude, take a shot. I mean, I, I, I don't know what happened there. I, I don't know what happened. To, to, well, I, I know what happened. I mean, Baylor's Ace was got hot. Ace was got hot. It felt like a lot of Longhorns were sitting back wide. You know, if you got one shooter that's going off watching, you know, usually, and we talk about the two shooters. Uh, one of them got hot and the other one got hot, got hurt. So uh, this yeah. team likes to stand back and watch a little bit. I want to see him be a little bit more active and more physical and more aggressive getting to the cup. Um, it felt like that's that started to, to come to fruition last night and then kind of just went away from the game plan. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think probably, you know, the m most watched thing or most, uh, you know, we're going to have our ears perked up trying to figure out the the severity of the, quote, knee sprain to Dylan DeSue. I mean, because that that really is what's going to drive. Well, knee sprain, what is, knee sprain's what? At, at least, that's at least a month, man. At least a month, right? A knee sprain? Because oh, and, you don't want to rush that. You, if you rush it coming back too soon, you're going to be out for another two weeks, three weeks. Yeah, I, I don't. I've 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 jacked up my knees whenever I'm messing with a lower body injury or whatnot. I, you know, you don't rush that to get back. I mean, upper body's one thing, man. You can play without an arm or whatnot, but damn, you need your wheels, man. You yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Especially in basketball, and I mean, I, I think this is something when when it comes to uh, to Oklahoma, where it's. I mean, don't play them. Uh, I mean, just, I mean, let them rest. I mean, this isn't, this isn't a make or break game from you. I mean, your seating may change up a little bit right here, but I, I mean, I, I am concerned wags. I, I mean, I, I say that I say it's a tournament team. They're going to be in the big dance, but I, I am concerned for two reasons. I mean, if you go in and you slide and you get knocked out in round one of the big 12 tournament, um, right. and, and you lose to Oklahoma in the in the finale. I mean, what does that do to CD? Does it take you out of the tournament? I mean, I wouldn't think that it would. Um, yeah, Lenardi's got him in right now. Um, and like I agree with RT, man. Stro look, six six top twenty schools. What do you say? Six top twenty schools or something like that. I can't remember. 
Yeah. Uh, six, the actual book six, uh, said, Q1s, uh, 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 Q1s, quadrant ones. Quadrant ones, thank yeah. you. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it is it is the toughest schedule. You could argue that the Longhorns had one of the toughest schedules in all of college basketball this year. And it, it speaks volumes that you're able to show up and play um, you know, play with these teams, these stalwarts, uh, you know, of teams on a night in, night out. But still, you got to be able to to capture some victories here. I'm I'm not a fan of moral victories. I don't believe many of us are. Um, it it shows a good, um, it shows a a, a good litmus test, I guess. But still, you got to be able to beat you know some of the studs. And right now, without your stud, it's going to be hard for you to even get close to even beating the studs. Yeah, and and like I was talking earlier with with Brad, I mean, what what needs to happen now? I, I mean, talking kind of preaching the moral victory thing right there. I mean, what what you have to do is you, you need to go preach some confidence to your team. Because I would think that after what you saw last night, when you get when you rally get, the troops, that's right, man, them a little bit. That's right. You got to get them all together. And I mean, if anything, finish with a sprint right here and go out and beat the snot out of Oklahoma if you can. I think is something taking taking you into the tournament. So I, I don't know. That's that's going to be the things to watch here the next couple of days for Texas because um, you you don't want to be you don't want to be going into tournament time half assing or at a half ass pace. And and I just fear. I just fear with what we've seen with this team, with the inconsistency and, and lack of confidence, it seems like at times, that they're going to go into tournament time, both of them, the conference tournament and the NCAA tournament, and, and you're going in with a lack of confidence, and that's just a that's just a recipe for round one exits, dude. You know how that shit works. Yeah, I, got, I think we got a little bit of reprieve here, Rodney. Is that helping? I think uh, I just had like a little bit of juice come out of my left eye. Nice. I don't know what the hell happened, man. Oh my god, the body's crazy. The body's absolutely nuts. How we respond to things, man. Um, that thing was beat when red when hot, you first came on. When we get too hot, we cool ourselves off with sweat. Um, I don't know, just, just, just we're we're fascinating, fascinating by uh body. That's for sure, man. And it really it it's nuts to to the fact that you can't see just all of a sudden. When you're walking up the damn stairs, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyways, what's yeah, going cool. on, guys? It feels like a brand new to the show now that I can see a little bit better. <laughs> you're like, oh, holy shit, it's a brand new day. You can check out all the comments. It looks like a lot of people concerned for you. Stop right there. touching it. Stop you've been called Ray it. Charles. You've been called Ray Charles, uh, telling you to stop touching it. Um, it, it, I think the people, the people are caring for you, Wags, because uh, I appreciate the people. Hey, this is. So this is not a bit. I swear to God that this is not a bit. This is a very frustrating way to talk about sports when you can't see what the hell you're talking about. So, um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of it's just sitting here staring at the cameras with my eyes closed like an idiot, thinking that you guys are going to judge me or whatnot, but I don't give a shit anymore, yeah, to be honest, right. to be completely honest with you. I got my dog. I got Rodney Rodriguez with me, and we're all here on Chaos Theory. That's uh, all we need, man. Anyways, That's all we man. Need. Um, what let's talk about, you want to talk a little bit about baseball. You want to talk a little bit about uh college baseball here before you're, you're, I'm telling you right now, you're leading the show and my vision's going in and out here. My guy. <laughs> yeah. We, we were kind of talking about that to where it, it's, it's a similar situation where t the Texas baseball, uh, extremely humble this past weekend at Minute Maid Park, uh, with those losses to LSU and Texas state and, and, and Vanderbilt, um, Obviously, the 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 bullpen is going to be the question. Um, how does that continue? How does that continue to come together? Do you think uh, it would have been? Do you think it would have been different at the dish? Uh, yeah, because it it really seems like Texas sure does struggle in these major league parks. You notice that? It's like it's like they go to Minute Maid, or or if you go to, I mean, it's like man, they get in the in those parks, and it's. I mean, like, I'm not man. I'm not sure if it was a major league park or anything like that, but I wonder. You know, it was a, a jamboree. You know of of you know, a conglomerate of all of a whole bunch of teams or whatnot. I'm wondering if uh, if maybe that kind of got a little bit of the best of of the Longhorns uh, sports psychology or whatnot here. Um, I don't I don't want I don't so much think it's a, a major league park. I just think maybe it's just a, a, you know, a gathering of a whole bunch of different squads or whatnot, which, you know, this is if, if you're struggling like this, you know, in the regular season. I mean, what the hell is going to happen when you get to Omaha, Rodney, which was kind of my point with this. Well, and, and the whole thing about it is, you know, with that, to your point, Major League Park. Or, right, or, or, I guess no. I'm being a little bit uh, a little bit presumptuous sitting here saying when you get to Omaha this year. But 
Hell, well, if you play like he did played this past week, and you're not going to get them all. Th that's the other part about it is, I mean, look who you played, and, and that's yeah, like I was saying, yeah. like I was saying earlier about a And M. I mean, a And M's coming in here undefeated, ranked number seven in the country. Uh, a And M's about to get a pretty good test right here. Um, Chris Cortez and Tanner Witt. We'll see how deep Tanner Witt goes, but uh, I mean, the, here's a big test for a And M. Um, and, and this, this is one hell of a, this is one hell of a schedule right here for Texas. I mean, th this is, th you want to find out how fucking good you are. You're finding out right now. And you drop yeah. the first three. Yeah. Um, we just talked about a litmus test. This is a litmus yeah. test already. You're getting tested right away from the start of it. So, yeah. And, and talking about, uh, you know, what Rodney Terry's talking about right there about those, you know, quad one schools or whatever. I mean, look, look what you're playing. I mean, number three, LSU, number what, 11, 10, 13, 14, whatever. Vanderbilt and and now here comes Texas A and M. Well, it's back to back years now for for SEC in baseball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back to back years yeah. or um yeah and, and uh, no and, um three years three years now. And back and the thing, and the thing about it is in these in these Tuesday matchups with with the Aggies, hell the Aggies have gotten the, the better of Texas. So so I mean you're, you're coming in here and you're backsliding into this thing and you got a red hot hitting Texas A and M team that's coming in to. to UFCU. I mean, the one thing about it is it's going to be one hell of an atmosphere. I mean, whether you're out in Occupy Left Field, whether you're in the the Yeti uh, area out there, dude, this place is going to be pretty lit up. And and I think it's going to be it's a rebound game for Texas. And when you talk about a rebound game against your rival that's playing top notch college baseball, it doesn't get any better than that, dude. Right. This, this is going to be a fun baseball game tonight. Well, I tell you what, I hope I, I hope the hell I can see it. That's for sure. I hope I can watch it tonight. Um, it will be on the Longhorn Network, and there will be, uh, just a reminder, there will be a pregame show. Um, That's right. BK and Mark going to be doing some stuff out there. Uh, Mark from um, Arc Occupy Left Field. So make sure you guys are tuning in and checking that out on Texas Sports Unfiltered there. Uh, what time is that getting kicked off at? What time is the pregame? 6.30. 6.30, I believe, is first pitch. And don't forget, our man, uh, Longhorn Laundry, um, he will be out there as well. My man, Mr. Khan, he's going to have his uh, setup doing a tailgate out there as well. Uh, so go track him down. Go track him down. Um, and, and the Blitz, well, it's still going crazy, the, the chat on, on the Blitz. Apparently, uh, I was telling BK, apparently the Blitz has come to life in another fashion at another radio station in town. And it's like, I'm telling our folks, I'm like, guys, you are on Blitz all day. <laughs> you you guys blitz all fucking what, this show yeah this show the, the blitz don't stop that's the best yeah. thing about it man yeah but not just yeah. this show this station this this entire station the blitz always continues to go down hey real quick uh while i'm on top of it and um you know i'm, I'm thinking about it let me tell you about audio visual consultations because that's something that i can do off the top of my head uh without even you know reading anything 512-255-8670 that's avconsultations.com um, they are the best in the business since 1988, 35 years in the business, setting the standard in audiovisual automation. You guys call them up, 512-255-8678, uh, um, and you will get the setup of your dreams, whether it's the two screens that I have behind me or the four screens that BK has. If you want to watch Texas baseball, if you want to watch Texas basketball, any sport, any show, program, of the evening, give them a call. Audio visual consultations 512 255 8678. That's avconsultations.com. Go to the, the website, see the gallery of projects they have, and ask them about that Sonos surround sound uh, theater. I'm telling you guys, it's a perfect setup for you. Yeah, no doubt. Code of text line, uh, Chris from Edmond, Oklahoma. I, I promise you, Wags, these are really coming in. I'm not just doing this to mess with You're you. You're an asshole. I, I'm, I'm, I got you. <laughs> Chris from hey, what Oklahoma. goes around comes around. That's all I got to say, Rodney. Remember, and, and this is this is kind of half and half. Uh, do, do you think Texas baseball can win it all? Um, and the softball team. Uh, I'm feeling better <laughs> about the softball team at the moment, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, and do you think the te Texas what? women's basketball team can go to the Why final are you four? Apologizing for talking about women's sports. I was. I'm not. I don't. I don't hate on women's sports at all. Stop throwing that shit on me. Uh, so I I feel that the that the 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 women's teams at the moment I have a little more confidence in. Uh, let's yes, talk again after 100%. the A and M game, Chris from uh, Edmond, Oklahoma, and uh, we'll kind of figure out uh, what's what's going on with all of that. Um, filtered, it's a filtered blitz. Filtered blitz, shit. We don't have we don't have anything filtered in our yeah. blitzes. Nothing yeah. filtered here. No, that's we, we we take this shit like Paul Mall cigarettes, man. No filter. Yeah, yeah. I, I talked to somebody at the at the party the other day, and 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 
she walked up and she said, I just love it on chaos theory that, that you guys say, say the F word a lot. I said, we say what? She said the F word. I said, you can say it. We say fuck a lot on there. <laughs> so we get a little yeah, animated. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I don't like being classless though. You know what I, I mean? Know. I like having a little bit of class. I know. So just, I a, know. just a small amount, just a small it, bit. Every now and then wags, Russell Wilson. Um, we, we, how about it? We well, just talked about last week. How many champion? how many Super Bowls is he going to win in Denver? Two more, <laughs> you know, and here's like, we looking into the camera at least. Yeah. You're looking right at the camera. You're looking right at the, the funny thing is though, you're holding up that zero and it's like right in front of your mouth. So that, that, that's not the most, that may be your new profile picture. Maybe if we hey, get the man, social screenshot, media's it, screenshot it, give me, you know, make something <laughs> funny out of it. I don't care. But the, the whole thing is, so now you get Russ out of the way. Where, where's Russ going to go? I don't know. Denver's still on the hook. Who's going to fill the spot, Rodney? Who's going into Denver? What's well, Denver's plan? What's their succession plan? That was my <laughs> question. Like, sure. You're getting rid of Russell Wilson. No one's going to want to pay that bag. But who's coming in for Russell Wilson? Well, you haven't had a quarterback since Peyton Manning's left. Right. Let, seriously, you haven't had yep. good continuity at that position since Peyton Manning left that that team. Yeah, no, no, you're totally right. And, I mean, what, what Denver may be wise to do at this point, now that you got that off, you're still going to have that cap hit for, for, I guess, a couple of years. You're still going to be paying that money. I mean, roll with the backup. I mean, roll with the backup. Uh, he's not a, he's not a, you know, splash, you know, whatever, but, but I mean, you, you, you well, don't it tells know. me, that Dem- it tells me that Denver is going to be in the, in the mix and in the running this draft for a quarterback. That's clear, right? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know that that's where I think maybe, maybe you roll with Stidham. I mean, did you see capable. enough out of what you seen? Did you need to see enough or excuse me? Did you get to see enough out of Jared Stidham in his run at new England? Is, did he make you a believer? Are you? Are we really going to roll with Jared Stidham as the Denver as the quarterback for the Denver Broncos? Well, is Denver going to do that? This is this is where I go back to the Mac Jones thing. I mean, it's like because I sure as hell ain't I sure as hell ain't seen it out of Mac Jones, but it's like you know, was it that system? I mean, I don't know. Um, you, you know, you think about Denver right here. If you if you roll with Stidham, um, go try to get some other pieces and, and then find a quarterback. I know this is a quarterback heavy draft. Maybe you can find I one. I think Denver's going to be. In, I think Denver's going to be in the market to take a quarterback, Rodney, and yeah. for for the draft. I mean, that's what this is equaling up to or adding up to. Where does Denver pick in this draft? Are they in the top ten? You're yeah, going to have to excuse I, I me. I don't have that pulled around. Up. I thought they were somewhere around 14th, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to take a look at the draft. What does and, the good people of chaos well, theory see? They have the tw- they, they, they have the, our eyes today. They have the 12th pick. They have the 12th pick in the draft. And at one point, I did see, I did see JJ McCarthy was targeted to Denver. Now it looks like JJ McCarthy after the combine is being targeted to Minnesota. Oh, dang it. I didn't have it ready. That's uh, all right is being targeted to Minnesota. So if that's the case, I mean, if you're Denver, do you go get a, you try to chase one of the young dudes, move yourself up, or do you go get a veteran? Uh, or, or do you get in the, do you get in the, in the race for Justin Fields? I mean, this still, there's that. Then there's a Justin Fields thing. It's going to cost you a second and a third did round. JJ McCarthy, did JJ McCarthy win money at the, at the combine for you? Um, I mean, I, I thought he threw the ball. Well, I mean, I, he seemed to be what I thought JJ McCarthy was. I mean, I wasn't blown away. I wasn't disappointed. Uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, I, I pretty much what I expected, pretty much what I expected with him, but he's got, I, I tell you what, dude, he's, he's got, he's getting rave reviews coming out of the combine. So he's being targeted as the fourth best quarterback in the draft. So I don't know, ahead of Bo Nix, ahead of Michael Penix. So how about that? We'll, we'll, we'll see where he ends up. We'll see where he ends up. For a dude that ha- didn't have to throw the football, I'm hearing a lot of people say, "Oh, he's a great thrower." Well, I didn't see him throw it in college. He didn't have to, All so right, I- he he will be an interesting spot to see where he lands. But I think the next domino that needs to fall into place now that you got the Russ Wilson thing is done, which which you expected uh, that had been hinted around. Now now what happens to Kirk Cousins? And that really seems to be Atlanta, which oh, man, you know. I'd, I'd, I'd rather see Fields. I'd rather see Williams in Atlanta. That would make some kind of high-powered offense, I think, with one of those dudes. But if it's Kirk Cousins, it's Kirk Cousins. Dude's coming off an injury, and, you know, a lot of people put a lot of stock in Kirk Cousins. I just think Atlanta could do something more productive than Kirk Cousins. 
I'm with you there. Um, so there's been some mentionings that uh, the Giants will not franchise tag uh, Saquon Barkley. We knew we kind of knew about this that the top running backs uh, that were going into free agency this year would not be uh, franchise tag, and Saquon Barkley was one of them. Derrick Henry, another one. Um, Swift, another one. Uh, but yeah, so you know we talked a little about the, about the quarterback carousel uh, yesterday, Rodney, and I told you that I was a little bit more intrigued in the fact of the running back scenario right um what are s some more landing spots or some decent landing spots for one saquon barkley because it doesn't look like that he will be a new york giant um it looks like he will be in another uniform there are a lot of people factoring in the dallas cowboys for the uh for the landing spot of saquon barkley is that something that jerry jones would welcome into that lineup i think it's something that he would take in a heartbeat my guy also the fact you know, you, you're looking to shore up a little bit of the bat of that backfield. A good one-two punch with Saquon Barkley and um, and Tony Pollard. We were kind of flirting with that a little bit two weeks ago, but it looks like that actually might come to fruition this week. I, or, I uh, agree, this year, man. Rodney. I agree. It really seems like that's going to be the path for him uh, to end up in Dallas. And not only that, for for Jerry Jones and for the Cowboys. I mean, you're you're ta you're taking him from a division rival. You know, um, when and if the Giants get themselves turned around. Um, you know, that, that's one less weapon that you'll have right there with Saquon Barkley if you're able to get him and, and team him up with Pollard and Dak Prescott in that backfield. And, you know, talking about the Giants, I mean, uh, I've I've been kind of watching there. There's a lot of folks, Wags, that are saying that the Giants need to make some kind of move and move themselves up in this draft from the sixth pick to to try to get into this quarterback battle as well. Uh, I mean, the, the latest mock. Well, if, you're, if, you're moving up, if you're moving up from the sixth spot, Right. Yeah. You like to, I'd like to think that you can get a quarter. Like if you really want a quarterback, if you want to if you want to one outside of the top three, I don't think you're going to take a, a stab at it, man. I just don't think there's a quarterback that's worth it. Um, yeah. Honestly, like if you're in the six hole, I think that there's some other spots for the Giants that they need to shore up instead of a quarterback there. Um, I'm not a big fan of Daniel Jones. We all know that. But I mean, like their offensive line is atrocious. They just let, you know two offensive linemen they just released two offensive linemen this past week um so they got to solidify that spot uh i would love yeah. to see him go get alt at six I, I mean it's fantastic i think alt i think Alt's probably the best probably the best overall tackle in this draft i'm gonna go yeah. with uh with joe Alt. Um, yeah i think if you want a quarterback and you are the giants just stay pat I mean, stay back. Hell, get, there's McCarthy. I mean, if, if McCarthy is or really trade out or, or trade back, you know what or, I mean? Trade or, back or trade and some more pieces if you actually have absolutely need to. I'm not buying into the first round tag on a lot of these guys. I'm yeah. just not. Yeah. yeah. Um, latest mock has the Giants taking uh, Romeo Dunzi, which it's like, that's great, but who's going to throw the ball to him? A <laughs> um, I got I got a Dunze going to, uh, to Atlanta, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Oh, my God. Holy shit. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you right now, the Atlanta, or excuse me, not Atlanta, um, Chicago. Atlanta oh, makes the Chicago. trade. Yeah, Atlanta makes the trade to um to Chicago. They acquire Caleb Williams, and then the Chicago Bears gets either Alt or the second best tackle in the draft, and um Romeo Dunze, which arguably is number two. Um, I'm I don't know. I guess you could say he's either two or three. Either two or three. I mean, that's that's not a hot take. I, yeah. I, probably put him over there at two though but as as much as as much as even before the combine and and after the combine post combine we're seeing um you know just different mock drafts and so forth the, the one that i see that hasn't changed from from the first mock draft it seems like the one that hasn't changed is marvin harrison jr going to arizona at number four so other than that man there's some so many alt in this latest one going to tennessee which obviously they need the offensive line help there as well. But it's like, you know, the, the one thing that I guess I really can project, you know, like an election. Oh, it is Super Tuesday, by the way. I guess my, my one projection that I can make is it looks like it's going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. going to Arizona because that, that seems to be the only thing that hasn't moved itself around. Um, is it Super Tuesday? Yeah, Super Tuesday. Get out and vote if you haven't already. Go vote. A lot of people died for you to go vote. So make sure your asses get out there and go vote. Don't be lazy and sitting on your ass. Go vote. Yeah. yeah. Serious. You everybody, can't bitch about anything if you don't vote. So go vote. So say everybody wants to bitch about everything. It's like you vote in the last election. Fuck that. My vote don't make a difference. Yes, it does. If you even if you write in no confidence, right? If you write in no confidence. That is a vote. 
You're yeah. le- you're giving your opinion. You're letting them know that you don't have confidence in the leadership of this country. I've done it several times. You yeah. know, there's not a candidate for you to pick. Right? No confidence. Yeah. Right. You're so fucking Harambe. Harambe beat Gary uh, Gary Johnson one year in votes. Write your vote. Yeah. Write your vote. Matter of fact, that's that's when I actually got out of politics. When when uh, my candidate got beat by a damn gorilla that was dead. I was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, does Wags consider women athletes? I absolutely do. As a matter of fact, I consider cheerleaders athletes. I, I just, I don't know how the bad bit got on me to where I'm chauvinistic and misogynistic. That's, that's not it. That's not how it goes here. Um, yeah. I, I just didn't want to talk about female sports yesterday when I was trying to talk about video games. That's all. <laughs> uh, uh, Chris and Edmund, thank you. We get a hook em horns here uh, for you and I, WAG. So uh, Coda Text Line uh, doing its thing tonight. And speaking of Super Tuesday, speaking of voting. Um, I still see my eye, how bad my eye is with these glasses on. Well, at least, uh, dude, when you first came on, it was like, oh, my God, dude. It, it, like, it looked like it felt like there was blood coming out. It looked like it. crimson red. Dude, you looked like Ric Flair when you came on here. I'm like, man, what? Is this, this guy been I blading looked, over I here? I looked like Jake the Snake. What happened to Jake the Snake when Rick the Model Martell hit him with the arrogance? The fragrance. Jake the you know what I'm talking about? Jake the Snake Roberts. Taking, yeah. taking, an old, taking it back old school, baby. That's way back. Old That's school. way back. Hey, talking about video games. Um. I did want to throw this out here. I don't know if you guys saw this, but Arch Manning, Arch uh-huh. Manning has opted out, opted out of college football 2025, EA's college football 2025. So if you're trying to throw Arch Manning in there for Quinn Ewers or you're running a season of um, your Texas Longhorns and you want to make your dynasty league happen, but something happens unexpectedly to where Quinn Ewers goes down you got to you know you got to put Arch Manning in there you're not going to be able to put Manning in there you're going to have to put his actual QB uh generic um uh face in there so it's not going to be the name image and likeness stuff oh, I, I'm maybe I again I don't know how the game works out I don't know if Panini or whatever his uh, brand that he's working or he's working with his sponsors or whatever. I don't know if that's actually going to um, be in the game or not. I don't know the details, but th- for some reason, what's the uh, what uh, one of another Arch Manning did not elect to go with the opt in for EA Sports College Football 2025. Not that big of a deal. Um, uh, I apparently don't remember did. Eli Manning having his name in yeah. there. Well, I don't think any of them had their names back in the day, but I, I don't remember Eli Manning even having like actual number 10, his real number in there for when uh, he was in college, uh, in college football. So again, um, it's all speculation or whatever or hoopla that I'm throwing out there, but it might just be like the whole Manning name that's sitting here saying, I don't want to be, you know, involved or, or have EA make money off of me. So yeah. I thought it was a little bit of a, a weird, you know, type of uh, headline that came out there. You know, I don't know why Arch Manning wouldn't want to do this. Um, I'd love to talk to him about it. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, it kind of, you know, if you're trying to play college football 2025 and you want to throw Arch Manning in there, it's not going to have his name in there. It's just going to be his generic face and stuff like that. So but part of me thinks that it's that he, that he wants to be the starter. That, that he wants to be the starter, and th- and this is very much like the Mannings. I mean, this isn't this isn't anything you know odd. I like that, Daryl G. I like that. Focus on what matters. I get it. Yeah, yeah. That's and code of text line uh, four oh, or I'm sorry five one two six nine nine number. Uh, the Manning name is worth more than six hundred dollars. That, that, that I one hundred percent. I think all of our names are worth more than six hundred dollars. But I thought it was a real. I mean, it's a collective two two million dollar deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Two hundred yeah. million dollar deal, as a matter of fact. So yeah, and so I mean, I, I do think a lot of it is that, that he wants to be the starter. I mean, just kind of, just kind of the mindset right there, where maybe the Manning family tell him, "Look, when you're the starter, that's when you can opt in and do that if you want to do it." I, I mean, I don't think, I don't think it's anything malicious. Um, I heard the guys talking this morning to where maybe, maybe that was done to not be a, not be a distraction to this Probably. football team, and and it's Probably. becoming a distraction. More of a distraction, yeah. Team. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sit here. I, 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 I agree with Rob right here, man. Get out and vote. Primaries absolutely matter. I'm not trying to make this a political thing. Uh, it was nice to, to share a beer and have a, you know, have a good conversation with Rob too. 
got to see Rob on Saturday as well. So, yeah, I agree with Rob 100% here, man. Um, primaries absolutely matter. Your local elections matter more than the national elections. Um, I'll, I'll continue to, to go with that as well. So uh, make sure you get out there and vote. Um, you know, use your voice. Use your voice, yeah. guys. Yeah, for sure. I totally please. agree. I mean, your local government, I mean, that, that's really what you need to focus in on. I mean, yeah. all, this, all this other stuff with the, all, the, all, all the, the thieves, all the thieves and the cronies and stuff over yeah. there in Washington stealing all of our money. That yeah, shit don't matter. What matters is what happens here that, in Orlando. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's going to happen over there. I'm sorry who you like or don't like. I mean, it's the same shit. Doesn't matter who it is. They can't work together. You're pissed off at this person because they can't do anything, and it's because right. these other people don't want to work with them. So I, Rex I mean, Charles says this is a Manning team decision, not an arch decision. Okay. Yeah. He probably wanted to be in. His team probably said, be patient, more money to come, makes good sense, and it's why the Mannings are who they are. No, I, I agree with that. I, um, I, that, yeah. I think that's that's probably um, a well-thought-out answer. Um, and, yeah, because – from what I remember talking to uh, to Michael Taft, they're huge gamers, um, which is kind of why I wanted to get something going like a like a Longhorn tournament with the Wagner Wire or whatnot to see you know when college football does roll out to have these guys actually play. And now you know with Manning not having his name, image, and likeness in there, um, you know it'd be a little bit awkward, I guess, to kind of have that. Um, tournament with Arch, you know, trying to have Arch Manning lead that thing, but you know, not having his name, image, and likeness in there. So, um, yeah, it makes perfect sense that it's probably a team decision instead of like an Arch Manning decision as well. Of course, you know, if you're a, a college football, you know, kid or whatnot, you're gonna want your your name in in one of the biggest titles of all of video games. So, uh, that makes really good sense there, Rex St. Charles. Um, Probably a Manning team decision. Yeah, right? it kind of, kind of comes to the point with that to where it's kind of like irrelevant. I mean, six hundred dollars, great. I mean, six hundred dollars is a lot of money to a kid. I mean, six hundred dollars is a lot of money to me. I mean, you're you're gonna spend that one night, honestly. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna yeah, like you know, really. But, you're gonna spend that one night. That's that's a what? Yeah. That's two phone bills. That's that's a a rent check. That that they pay rent. That's a mortgage payment, check. But well, they don't pay car payments. But yeah, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. I wonder they what got, they do pay for. That's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering what they do pay for. Not much. <laughs> Probably not much. Hey, guys, speaking of election, uh, only one uh, vote to cast when you need a brand new or pre-owned car, truck, or SUV. And, of course, that vote is for our friends at Covert B Cave. How about a word from the great Covert? Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert B Cave. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Yes, indeed, since 1909, the Covert family. $600 was probably only a portion of the bill at BK's birthday bash this weekend. Yeah, I imagine. I can only imagine yeah. what that bill looked like. I, I actually I actually paid for a damn drink. You did? Oh, it's yeah, you I, well, I tipped them. I tipped them as well. Oh, good, 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 good. Damn, I forgot. Um, to do that. I need damn, to go back So this is very frustrating, man. Just when I think we're having a little bit of reprieve with it, it gets bad again, man. And it's really hard to collect your thoughts when you got something just grainy in your eye. That's just so frustrating, dude. Yeah, no, that that's not good, man. I, I don't know um, what that might have been for you. I, I feel like you got another like hair lodged up in there, do you? Because no, I, no, no. This has got to be like a hair or a sty or something oh, like that. Okay. It. If, honestly, it feels like sand pebbles. It feels like little grainy, grainy sand pebbles and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I, I was gonna say because, like, like we've talked about before, I've gotten contacts shoved up in there and then just boom, I oh, can't yeah. see anything and it falls out. You know, while I have another one in there. So, so anyway, I don't know, dude. You might want to get some eye wash and try to wash that shit out. I hope you don't have pink eye, dude. I hope you're not getting. I don't pink think eye. I don't. I don't have pink eye. I, I don't go anywhere, man. Well, <laughs> think about think about it. Is how I gonna get pink eye? Uh, what's, that on shit, if, what's on if, your docket for the rest of the day? I'm going to try and get something going on with my eye here. I might even have to call out of work. I was going to say, if you if your kiddo has been around pink eye at school, dude, that uh, there's all kinds of shit at school. It's gross there. Ugh. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm actually driving to San Antonio, a little San Antonio road trip coming up uh, as soon as we are done right here. Need to go meet uh, with a partner um, in one of the racing deals there. So I'll be doing that and headed over. Uh, Dan, who farted on your face, Wags? Oh, my I don't know, man. Maybe it was my wife. Yeah, well, that's right that's there. what it is right there. Double D Wags wife farting in his pillow. So we don't that, we don't uh, get we don't get that kinky anymore. That that seems to to be the response right there. But uh, I'm very curious to see, kind of back to the NFL as li like I said with the with the first piece falling with Russell Wilson. If we get anywhere, uh, and and you said it, you said it. A lot of this I think is league driven uh, with the Justin Fields thing, where you just want to drag this thing out and just let it continue to stew, 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 stew until you get closer to the draft and make shit happen. And then what are you doing? You're building must see TV. Is gonna, I mean, how many people are going to watch that shit anyway? But if you make this thing push all the way out and and we get to the end of April and that's when this stuff starts to happen, but. I don't know, man. I just got a feeling that that things are going to fall in place. Uh, the Kirk Cousins thing, I think, is going to be next, and then maybe after that, we figure out what's going to happen with Fields. Um, I know I'm a lot. Of, see, I'm curious to see if Minnesota brings Kirk Cousins back. I, I, I think they should. I, like, I, mean, I, like, I don't. I don't. I don't. Under, I've been trying to go through this and do game theory with this. I don't see a better scenario for Minnesota if they do not bring Kirk Cousins back. Like, I think. Uh, like, you know, the quarterback that you're getting with the guy, right? You know that you can probably get him on a front. And I say this a lot, um, but with, with Kirk Cousins, especially because he just came off of Achilles, right? Mm -hmm. he, knows, he knows the value there. He knows that he's prone to injury or, or it could be more prone to injury now coming off of that uh, Achilles tear. Why not try and sit there and say, hey, Kurt, man, would you do a franchise friendly deal? I mean, we 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 need a quarterback. We know we need a quarterback. You're you are our guy. You were our guy before you went down. Can we shore something up with you and maybe get you a two, a two three year deal, three year deal to where uh, you're taken care of, and we have a decent run at the quarterback position in the quarterback room for at least three years until we get out of this mess. What team needs to do that? I would say Minnesota. If Minnesota would break Minnesota, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I walked yeah. right into that Joe Biden bullshit. Yeah, you know, I, I think that is the best place. I mean, because it it is with the Vikings. I mean, that, that's been your guy. I, I mean, you've had success with that guy. I mean, you know, I'd lump him in right there with Dak Prescott and all this. Where I mean, yeah, he's great in the regular season. I mean, getting the playoffs. I saw a hypothetical where Minnesota would trade away Justin Jefferson because of the emergence of Addison. No. Like just like Addison's great, but J JJ is is the I, I can't call him. I can't call him the best slot receiver right now, but he's the, he's top three, top three best slot receivers in the game right now. Well, Justin Jefferson. I, you know what? I will say that he's he's best slot receiver right now. He's best slot. Well, and that's and that's where we start getting all this these crazy half ass shit. You know, like I was talking about the other day, where it's like Chicago keeps Fields and and drafts Caleb Williams. You know, where where we get to this time of year, where everybody's getting just so radical with some of the stuff they're coming up with that you know these crazy scenarios of work right there. I mean, if you, you know, CD, CD, I'm sorry to cut you off, Ronnie, but I, I well, let me walk that back. Ceedee Lamb's in the slot, is he not? Yeah, yeah. CD Lamb, CD Lamb might be the best damn slot receiver in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah, I might, take that, I might take that back from Justin Jefferson. I might, you know what? Give me that shit. Taking it away from you, CD Lamb. CD Lamb's the best wide, but the best slot receiver in the NFL right now. And that's and that's something else that we need to watch is Dak Prescott thing because there, there's all this cowboy drama now, and and it's like you know I heard I heard something the other day where people were a little irritated with Jerry Jones, where Jones you know d had his bus over there in Indianapolis and doing all these different things, and people were pissed off at Jerry Jones because he made the Im implication that that. Uh, Mike McCarthy was was a, a big part of the turnaround in Dak this year. Why are you pissed off at Jerry Jones? That's one hundred percent true. I mean, it, this was. I, I wouldn't. I don't know if it's so much Mike McCarthy, but or that, maybe that it was calling the play. Right. Yeah. Um. I think I thought maybe it had a little bit to do with simplifying things. So McCarthy, that would be a little bit, um, you know, with McCarthy there. But also, I thought it was removing more. Or, exactly. or, am I, or am I wrong? Like I, I thought, I thought more kind of made things a little bit convoluted for Dak Prescott, maybe a little bit confusing, and you know, too. Fa I think maybe too fast paced or whatever. I think a lot got simplified for Dak with McCarthy instead of more. And and I think I, I saw it early in the season where 
I mean, it, it, they played it out so well where one of the biggest changes that we saw in Dak is very much a three-step motion and quick pass to where in the past it was a, a deeper drop, maybe maybe five steps, and he'd sit back there and he had happy feet and he's looking all over the fucking field. Uh, I mean, the, this guy would go to option one. Then if he had, go to, had to go to option two, it was all so quick, just boom, boom, boom down the road and and i think that's a huge difference right there and and when we start talking about when we start talking about the change right there with kellen moore i mean the, the pattern i mean look what happened in san er, la look you can what say happened san diego there. i know what you mean yeah look, look what happened there so yeah i mean i think mccarthy's play calling and that style of offense was much better for prescott i would love to see i would uh, dak is going to be the dallas quarterback i don't even know why the conversation oh yeah, oh, yeah. I, I would like to see Dak do a hometown team friendly what? deal. I'm still on to Saquon Barkley to Dal to Dallas, man. Like I think that's going to happen. But if that does fall through, what's another good landing spot for Saquon? Oh man, I mean, I think so any spot. You you just brought it. You just brought it up. Yeah. The Chargers. The Chargers could be yeah. also going away with Austin Eckler. Austin Eckler. Yeah. Seeing, could we just be seeing like a little bit of a you know I, I'm. I'm done with this guy. Let's, you know, let me see if your trash is is just as good as my treasure. You know what I mean? Or what's that old adage? So, you know, someone's trash is is another person's treasure or whatnot, right? Yeah. Maybe we see Eckler and uh and 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 Saquon and Swift and a few of these other running backs, you know, that are you know and find themselves in or found themselves in good spots or seem to be in good spots. Maybe they just shift the rotation a little bit and find themselves in, you know. In in other uh, other running backs, old homes. So yeah, well, uh, and and CB just nailed my thought. I mean, imagine Saquon Barkley in Houston. Holy, moly. holy shit, dude! I actually I actually saw something <laughs> about him going to Houston dude. too. I mean, and if CB if, CB brought up a good point, I actually saw something about him in that backfield with uh with CJ Stroud. That yeah, yeah. um, yeah. Which, I mean, imagine that. Imagine I, that. I mean, I think. I think you can. I think you can do great things with Singletary. I thought the one-two combination between Pierce and um, and Singletary is fantastic. Here's the thing, though, man. You you bring in Saquon Barkley oh. instead of Singletary, and you have Saquon Barkley and Pierce for a while. Have Pierce be the ground and pound guy in between the tackles, and Saquon Barkley just let him eat. Man, that's oh. uh. So that's a that's a that's a scary offense, too. dude. Yeah. And I mean, that's think about that because in, in in Dallas, you know, Tyron Smith is gone, you know, or going to be gone. I mean, center is a is a, is a question right there. I mean, you've got some holes in that offensive line. Where Houston, I mean, just look at the scenario for Houston right now. These next couple of years, Wags, you got a quarterback on a rookie deal that's already doing what he's doing. You've got you've got all of this money now. You've got all of this money right there. And you don't have all these gaping holes to fill. And you had a Saquon Barkley in the backfield. Holy shit. I mean, that the, the, I'm not going to say they beat I like, that, I like that spot a lot more than Dallas, honestly. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if they could beat Kansas City, but Kansas City be going like this. And, and I don't think that they had – I don't think that Houston had a drop-off or a fall-off in the running back position in the first place. But, I, I mean, this is clearly, you know – you know, one hell of an addition, one hell of a get in your backfield. Um, again, I'm, I'm a, I was a fan of Singletary. I thought that he wowed a lot of people in the latter portion of that season, but it's hard to sit here and say that you're not going to take Singletary over Saquon Barkley right now. Oh. I know Saquon Barkley comes with a little bit of uh, injury prone um, to that backfield. It adds a little bit of more injury prone to that backfield, but um, the, I would say that the the risk is far more beyond the reward if you bring Saquon Barkley into that backfield and he is able to give you the 1,200 to 1,500 yard max that he can absolutely get um, that he just wasn't able to see at the Giants with the Giants because the Giants just did not know how to utilize him. Yeah, or they that, knew how to utilize him. They just failed to do it. That is failed, that failed is just an unbelievable addition for Houston if that happens. And, and that just makes your team better, like you're talking about. I mean, it's not – it's. I mean, you don't look at Houston and you're like, holy – oh, man, they need a running back. They really need a running back really bad. They don't. But, hell, if that dude is sitting there and you've got money and, and you can get this dude cheap. I mean, none of these running backs are, are going to cost you. I, that's hell. the thing. That's the thing. Um, running backs are yeah. they're going to be cheap from now on. That's yeah. and it just sucks because they do the. I would say that they do the uh, the shittiest work. Like you can say that the you know the trenches are, are where you do the you know the worst the dirtiest work and or whatnot yeah. and it gets dirty in the trenches. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But I mean, you 
you've got it when you're when you're toting a rock and you're just taking nothing but poundage, man, the entire time. You got to sit there and say that that's probably the shittiest job in the NFL to yeah. tote the rock and not get paid for it and just get pounded. Isn't it crazy when when we talk about you know how much the running back has become devalued and all that? It's like th- that job hasn't gotten any easier. Uh, I know, I know some of the penalties and stuff has so- have softened up and, and different things for quarterbacks and why you can't receivers. leave with your head anymore. You know I mean? If you're the running back, you can yeah. leave with your head, but you can't leave with your head if you're the, if you're the defender, but you know what? These, these defensive linemen, these linebackers, dude, they're massive. They're fucking huge. They're strong. These nuts. They're fast. Sorry, yeah. I had to get it in there. No, I can't uh, see, so I just had to be. I had. I'm frustrated, so I had to throw some frustration stuff out. So yeah, yeah. No. What a what a what a what a shitty show. I'm sorry, guys, but this has been this has not been the greatest experience for me. I will say that. These nuts. Yeah. <laughs> You, you hung in there, Wags. You did it, my man. You pulled through. It's like one of those things, you know, where it's like a, like a, a sick mare. You made it through. You know what? A sick mare? Yeah, a horse. Oh, yeah. well, in, the, like, in, the, in the mare of, of a woman? A female Quim- horse? Mayor Quimby? <laughs> Is that oh, Jeff? Yeah. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> Vote hey, Quimby. Jeff, let me introduce you to it Ronnie. Super Tuesday, over there. So maybe you might actually have to vote Quimby today. I don't know. Hey, Jeff, how are you, sir? <laughs> hey, man. Yeah. I yeah, can that's... see one eye. There we go. My, one eye back. No, so I don't, Jeff, I don't know if you caught the show, but I had one hellacious sty in my eye. It yeah, looks man. Like kind of cleared up a little bit, man. Are you a contact lens wearer, Wags? I was. I've been a, I've been a, a contact lens wearer. And Rodney said I'm, I could have something back in there. So probably, yeah. I get those every now and every once in a while. Usually, uh, just like sweat dripping in your eyes mm-hmm. and something just not cleaning your eyes all the yeah, way. It felt it felt sandy. It felt grainy. It felt gritty. So usually, so- uh, usually I get a sty if I'm not careful. I, when I do yard work, I gotta wear sunglasses because you know if like you're mowing the yard, you get mm-hmm. all kinds of. Mm-hmm. I don't all have hair goop. up top. All to, the goop. I don't have hair up top to filter anything out, so it just kind of hits <laughs> your face and runs down. So I gotta make sure I'm wearing sunglasses or something. It may be like I'm wondering if it was a dog hair or whatever that got in my eye or whatnot, but it was it was awful. But anyways, man, um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of here, guys. I'm so, I'm having a a tough time. We'll get you but, an eye uh, patch, why I should be like a you, black, black beard. Hey, thank you guys <laughs> so much for hanging in there with us today on Chaos Theory, and you guys enjoy the rest of the shows here um on texas sports and filter we'll talk to you guys tomorrow man y'all be good wags wags gonna be saying this uh for the rest of the I'll day i'll never have the flu i'll never have the flu but hey you know what senior night though i saw me some kim Dwayne walkie looking good man looking good i'm joking guys i'm joking oh yeah yeah no doubt See, wags, i decided a long time ago rodney if i ever have something where i've got like a you know i'm in an accident i lose an eye or something yeah. i'm not gonna go like you know prosthetic eye or try to get it souped up dude i'm just going full eye patch yeah i'm going i'm going full pirate full black beard I'm, yeah. I'm leaning i'm leaning into the bit yeah that's that's a sign of a badass right there when when you have that that nobody one yeah like nobody that. would mistake me for that but doesn't then i mean if you're gonna lose a limb or something right just lean into the bit like i don't want like no terminator arm like dude i'll, I'll walk around with a stump i don't care well, it's, you know, I've noticed here as I've gotten a little older, my hair's starting to thin. I mean, it, it still grows okay. Yeah, just lean into the bit. That's what I'm talking about. You know, when it gets to the point where I can't even get it to do whatever, I, that's what I'm doing. I mean, I'm going that way. I mean, I'm not going to try to. It's like all these folks that color their, uh, dudes that color their hair and shit. I'm like, man, just lean here's, uh, here's my Theo Vaughn-esque contribution to today's program. My uncle, when he, he used to manage some apartment complexes in Denver, it was kind of his gig. He's since transitioned jobs, but uh, his electrician, like his handyman, the dude had one arm. A guy named Harold, great dude, great dude. But like he had learned to, you know, he could hold a beer. Like he was pretty much amputated from the elbow, so he could like hold a beer or whatever. Like he could carry stuff. It was, yep. it was awesome to see. Like, dude, he's a, I'm like a one armed electrician. How's that work? He's like, no. He's like Harold's better than most two armed electricians. You see, I'm like. Crazy. That's a badass right there. Yeah, yeah. You see a lot of that. I mean, you see a lot of that where you have somebody that has something something like that, and they just, I mean, they're fucking lights out, man. They they're just lights out. That was the good. That was the def. That was the good thing about. I almost said definition because I was looking at Fozzie Wazzy's post. That was the good thing about, uh, or the interesting thing about growing up in Florence, Texas, America, is you know between between the meats lab and uh, the wood shop and the ag department. 
is a given somebody at some point's getting a finger cut and they're losing something, something's gonna happen. And it's, it's one of those deals, Rodney. It's not even like it got to the point where, like, probably by my sophomore, by the middle of my sophomore year, it doesn't even register. It's like, hey, where's so and so? No, that around the hospital. They got uh, got their finger cut in a meat slicer. I'm like, oh, okay, he'll be back. Yeah, yeah. I I, I ran a countertop shop for a lot of years, and and yeah. we, we we did cultured marble. One one of our shops was cultured marble. One morning, I'm, I'm back in the shop, and I hear I hear a tub fall. You know, a big marble tub fall, Oof. and I hear a oh you know whatever so i mean i'm going over to i'm on my way to check to see what's going on over there and one of the other guys walks up and says oh man uh i, I think his finger got cut off and i'm like oh I, what do you mean and he's like i, I have it i'm like oh god damn <laughs> that's probably a shock right like i think <laughs> yeah yeah finger. i'm like uh wow i'm like do we have some ice somewhere geez louise they put that some bitch right back on yeah man it's uh there's some you grew up in where'd you grow up, Rodney? I grew up in Lockhart. I grew up in okay. Lockhart. Yeah, you grow he, up in you grow up in small town Texas, man. You grew up around some tough dudes. Like I really do, man. I, man, I I played I played football with dudes that because uh, you know like the co op program is real. People are like, oh, maybe I get a job. Like, no, I need to go to school half a day and then I need to go work half a day so my family can have some money coming in. Like I, I had some buddies mm -hmm. that did that. I, I went to school. I played ball with dudes that would go to the athletic period in the morning, so get that morning workout go to school half a day, go bust concrete in the hot ass afternoon, then be back for football practice after school. You just don't, you don't meet a lot of, a lot of dudes like that. And they're, they're guys that guys have their own excavation companies or their own contracting companies. Now they're doing, they're doing pretty well for themselves. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. And, and that's the one thing. And, and I tell uh, PSA to kids uh, and I'll tell you right here on, on, on Jeff's show is, I mean, I really think if there's, you know, when folks talk about college and going to college, if that's not for you, find a trade school, hey, find a trade school, go learn a trade. I know welders, electricians, plumbers that make so much money you work your ass off the hours may suck but they make a they, they live a very comfortable life yeah they my brother's an hvac i would not trade jobs for him like during the summer you can't you know you no. can't pay me enough to do some of that yeah. but it's a nice living if you can get it hey rodney before jordan gets on here yeah. uh you, you want to talk a little basketball a little texas basketball uh yeah man my yeah. only my only takeaway from the game last night is and I, I've got a feeling Zay will will have this same take later when he's on with Chip. I don't know if BK will have this take, but once Desue went down, you could feel Baylor chipping away at the lead. Like it's 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 sizable enough. They they weren't able to get within like six. Texas was still keeping them at arm length. It was still a two possession game. And once Desue hit the deck, yeah. the out for me, the outcome of the game it was inconsequential at that point. Like I'm like I don't even care. Like if he's done, they're done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was talking about that earlier, Jeff, to where it's like the, the instant that happened, I thought, I don't give a shit about Baylor. Um, you know, at this point, I really don't even care about Oklahoma because the writing's on the wall right here. If that dude, if that dude is not going to be a part of this basketball team, yeah, yeah I know Max Acemus is doing what he's doing, but but still everything runs through Dylan DeSue. And that that was my thought. It's like we're it's over. It's over. You and you've got a must win. Look, if you get to 20 wins. You get to 20 wins, you finish 500 in the conference, you're in the tournament, no question. You should yeah. be in the tournament playing in this league. Uh, it's not a given that they're going to be. If they don't have Dylan DeSue, I don't know if this team's making the tournament. And at that point, man, you can blame Rodney Terry, but at that point, can you really fault him? I mean, when you lose your best player in the stretch run, it's just one of those things that just happens. And for the second year in a row, I hope he's okay because I don't want for the second year in a row to be this team – misses out on whatever their ceiling is because of a Dylan DeSue injury. And it's not exactly. Dylan's fault, man. It's just one of those things that just happens. It sucks. And, and, it, and it may be a dramatic com comparison that I, I'm about to make, but if if DeSue is out, I mean, is this a Florida State situation where the committee looks at this and it's like uh, their best player is not going to play? Um, they were borderline getting in anyway. Could be. Uh, I don't know. I still feel like if they beat Oklahoma Saturday, they're in. Yeah. You can't you can't keep a 20 in this league. You can't keep a 20 win team that finished 500 in the conference. You can't keep them out of the tournament. Right. Yeah. I don't I, I don't I, care I, what else happens in your other in, in any other power six league in the country. You can't keep Texas out of the tournament. 
if they get to 20 wins and nine conference wins. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think as long as, as long as they went on Saturday, even if you get bounced very early in the big 12 tournament, I think you're still going to get yourself in. I mean, they're, they're hovering right there, eight, nine or 10. Yeah. When uh, Saturday, when Saturday and a first round loss in Kansas city, and you're probably sweating it, but still feeling like you're going to be in yeah. lose Saturday and losing Kansas city. Then you probably know you're prepping for the NIT at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. Win Saturday and win a game in Kansas City. You're, you're, you're home free at that. Point. Yeah, and and I really think uh, I was talking about this earlier as well, Jeff. I'd love your thoughts on this. I, I think you know with Rodney Terry. I mean, I know there's been a lot of criticism and, and a lot of pressure, obviously on the hot seat. I guess if we want to say that, but it's um, I, I think this is where we're going to need to see one of his best um, internal coaching performances because after that collapse last night and then with the injury to Dassault, I mean, I think you, you've got to get this team mentally prepared to go play basketball on Saturday. Because I mean, the season's kind of hanging in the balance right here. You got to have these guys yeah. ready to play. the the problem The problem with Texas, the problem that they had last night, and the problem that they've had all season. If the Seward Acemas aren't scoring, where are they getting their other? Where are they getting buckets? Exactly. You know, you can't. There's no. There's nobody else on that roster you can depend on. I mean, Kendall Weaver for all the things he does well, getting a bucket isn't something you can depend on him for right now. That's right. That's exactly right. Whether it's Shedrick or Horton, everybody's got deficiencies in their game. I mean, Tyrese Hunter. I don't know that I've ever seen a he was a blazing better, a when it better, started. Yeah. A better bad shooter than Tyrese Hunter. And what I mean by that is I don't think I've ever seen a guy do so many things right, getting himself a good look at the basket only to miss as consistently as he did yeah. last night. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's rough, man. Yeah, the yeah. way he started out, I'm like, oh man, he's he's he is balls on today. Well, you know, well, then the rest happened. It's just clank after clank after clank in the second half. That's it. All right, gentlemen. There's Jordan. I'm gonna hit the road. We gotta gotta go to San Antonio. So uh I will see you guys manana. Make sure you stop at Bucky's on the way down there, Rodney. That's a plan. Need gas. Good. Need go. gas. See y'all on Chaos Theory tomorrow from 10 to 11, guys. See you, Rodney. All right. It's uh only about 45 minutes today with, with myself and Jordan. Jordan, where'd you go this morning? You had a school visit. Where'd you go? I was at the home of Jake Majors um, at Prosper up in way, way North Dallas. Prosper America. Yes, sir. They uh, So there's only one kid with the Texas offer that's there, uh, Connor Cardi, three-star offensive lineman, uh, 2025. He'll be a, a guard most likely, um, could be a center, but no matter what, he'll be in the interior at the next level. Uh, so caught up with him, um, you know, got some good stuff on him. I'll, I'll have a story on him out either later today or tomorrow. Um, and then, you know, he's not – while he's the only guy that's a Texas offer, he's not the only guy they got over there. They're they're loaded across the board. And um, <laughs> believe it or not, they actually have five offensive linemen with FBS Power 5 offers. And five. that's what – yeah. And last year they had seven. Um <laughs> And the two that left, one went to Texas Tech. Uh, I believe he ended up in the top 247 um, by the final rankings. His name's Ellis Davis, uh, pursued by pretty much everyone except for Texas, just because, you know, he was probably in like the 270, 280 range. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, we've talked about it before. Cal Flood is only going to recruit, you know, big humans and guys that, that fit his description of what he likes. And honestly, that's, this is not what the other four guys are, but they're they're still incredibly talented. Um, and behind Cardi uh, in 25, uh, they have another one named Aiden, I believe Khalil, it's something with a K. Um, pardon if I'm butchering it, I just met him this morning. Um, but they got him, he's got Pitt, Duke. And then in 2026, they got uh, their three others. They got one named Bryce Gilmore, he's at nine offers. Uh, I like him a lot, definitely upside, athletic as hell, um, and can move super well and, you know, it, it's really cool when you get out to, to schools like Prosper and um, like the kids will have offers, but it hasn't really hit them yet. And yeah. it's almost like they're still with the same mindset where it's like they hope to be D1, but they don't know if they can actually do it. And usually, you know, it'll after the first few weeks of having offers, that mindset will change a little. So, it, you know, it's really refreshing when, you know, you get out and, you know, can I get your headshot? Like, oh, you want to take a picture of me or whatever? Instead of like, yeah, you can. You need to interview me too. You know, that's nice. It's refreshing. Um, they got three in 2026 with power fives, two in 2025 with power fives. But, but yeah, so they're uh, they're loaded. 
All right. Uh, so good, good visit to Prosper this morning, uh, Jordan. I, I I love having you on this show because we can go a number of different ways, but your expertise in NIL comes in handy more often than not. I feel like I lean on you too much for NIL stuff, but such is life. You're in the seat, so let's do this, man. I, first off, do you, do you feel I I don't <clears throat> I try not to pay attention to social media as much as I can. Is Arch Manning getting a lot of flack for not opting into the video game? <laughs> oh, my God. I got to show you something. Yes, he is getting a lot of flack on social media for, for opting out of the uh, – Okay. For can opting I, out of it. But check something? this out. So okay. this is a meme. I know my, my screen is flipped. But Arch is saying they don't know I won't be in NCAA 25. He's in the corner of the party. The girl says, I'm going to use UAB anyways. And the dude says, isn't he a backup? <laughs> but if I don't know. I'll yeah. uh, I'll retweet it so y'all can go check out, I guess, my Twitter if you want to see what that, that meme actually Are, looks like. Is there Jordan Scruggs 247 or is it Jay Scruggs 247? Yeah, Jay Scruggs 247. It's up in the, it's up in the corner of uh, okay. your screen. But oh. – um, this look, this one I think about it. Well, the time marker's blocking it. That's what's <laughs> oh, no, nah, you're all good. Um, but the, this one I think about it like, look, he's a backup, it doesn't matter if he's not in the game. Like, we're still gonna go create a uh, custom number 16 yeah. versions of him. Yeah. You can make it where we can't make number 16 for Texas have the name Arch Manning, but everyone's gonna know who that is. So, really, I, I, I don't they care for it personally. I really don't think much of it. I know people are like pissed off, but like, like honestly, who cares? And second of all, like, there I've seen some people who just don't have enough information try to be like, oh, it's because he's going to try to negotiate, um, you know, to be paid more than six hundred dollars or something like that. Like, EA came out and said, you know, it's either six hundred dollars or nothing. Like, we're not negotiating with anyone. Um, yeah. And so, you know, as far as Arch goes. I don't really know why he isn't just taking that six hundred dollars, but I mean, it's not like he needs it. It's not like his family needs it. So, yeah. you know, it. I guess you know this is. Uh, I really think this is just something that, you know, it's dead of the off season. We're going to talk about anything that involves Arch Manning to begin with, but you know, making headlines with something everyone's excited for that that's going to go nuclear. So, can I? I'll give you my thought. Brad Crawford, uh, for our nationals, the twenty four seven national side. Brad did a story on this this morning. He actually called me this morning. I, actually, I called him. We were texting, and I was just like, "Dude, it's just easier for me to call because I do that. To, I do that to you too. Like, I'm like, dude, I don't want to text back and forth. Just I'll, I'll call you. It's so much easier. Oh, I'm um, the same way. I'm the same way. But uh, but I was talking to Brad, and I'm like, look, and Brad quoted me, and I'm like, it, it's very possible that the option never even got to Arch. Like it was never his call to make because he, he made it pretty clear to sugar bowl that he doesn't have anything to do with his NIL. It all goes through his dad. His dad's running every one point on everything. And man, I, I don't know what people expect from him. It's like, it, it's, it's, he's bizarro Quinn Ewers right now. Cause when Quinn was at Ohio state, it was oh he's greedy. All he cares about is the money. Uh, you know, he's probably gonna be a bad teammate, he's gonna be a bust. And with Arch, it's almost like, well, is he is he too good to take this? Like, like what, what is the deal? Eh, man, Jordan, you know, you you've got enough team sources, you know this man, you hear the same stuff I do. Arch Manning, it's and it's not it's not coach speak, it's not lip service, man. Arch Manning really is trying as hard as he can to have the normal college experience that every other student has as a freshman. It just it, it just so happens that when other freshmen lose their ID on campus, it doesn't make every single news service that covers college football. But that said, I, I think I just everything he does is under the microscope and fair or not. That's just what it is. I just think this is much ado about nothing. I'm, I'm going to go ahead. I would almost be willing to guarantee that the option to, to take the 600 or not never even got on. Never even was on Arch's plate. Yeah, um, I don't know, man. Like, I know everyone's gonna have their opinion of whatever happens, but like, <laughs> like his his dad figured out a way to navigate, um, to navigate the, the highest profile recruitment that has ever existed in any sport. Right? They figured out a way to navigate that where not once was the 
the message from the Manning side, like ever a circus or a clown show, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which uh-huh. not, not that every single five star high profile kid is going to be like that, but most of them there, there's some stuff going on that, you know, is either annoying to deal with for uh, colleges and the people trying to recruit them, you know, or it's impossible for us to cover them, you know, but they did a great job of, you know, keeping it professional the whole time. And, you know, they've Cooper Manning has shown us, you know, he, he's pretty smart about, what he's doing with his son. So, you know, if that's his word, you know, I guess we'll trust it. But again, I, I personally would, would have probably just been like, all right, you know, he's in the game. I've seen some people try to come up with the theory that like, well, the reason they're opting out is because they knew they'd be, uh, or they knew he'd be a 77 overall or something. And because he's Arch Manning, they don't want a 77 number next to his name. They want him in the game once he's like a 90 something. I was like, y'all shut up. Like, Oh, stop. Be that. <sighs> yeah. And again, like the fact that this is big as it is that we spent like however long we spent talking about Arch Manning opting out of a video game. Ridiculous. Because exactly. again, this is a, it's not going to be a thing a week from now. I'm I'm a very uh, I'm a very firm believer in so sometimes the right explanation is the easiest explanation. And I think the explanation here is. It never got to Arch. His dad took a look at him was like, no, he's good. He doesn't need to opt in. Like, like you said, Arch man, Arch doesn't need the the six hundred dollars for F around money on the weekend. You know? It's yeah. I, I I've spent more time talking about it than I just I just didn't know if you've heard anything about how Arch's NIL situation is going or or if that's his if because you you know about most guys in IL situations. If you're not hearing anything about it, then it really is, you know, being done as close to the vest as possible. Yeah, no, I, I mean, personally, I've never asked what Arch's NIL setup like, so I I really don't know. But you know, I do know like <laughs> for other guys who receive similar, uh, I don't know, notoriety. Um, it seems like they're running everything way, way smarter than other guys who are often in his shoes, at least from an NIL perspective. Um, yeah, yeah. But and, – and what, what Daryl G said about people are going to hate on him for whatever he does, they hate on him for his NIL valuation and now this, like, that's true. And, like, yeah. I think most Texas fans that have common sense have gotten used to it already and aren't getting as triggered whenever people, I guess, talk down on him or whatever. But, like, you know, that that's just how it's going to be, you know, like – Think about this. My, my dad talks about this all the time. Texas beat the shit out of Texas Tech, right? Beat mm-hmm. the absolute shit out of them. Everyone scored. They scored 60-something points or 50-something, whatever. Everyone scored. The number one thing ESPN put when talking about the game was Arch's, like, three highlights. <laughs> that was the thing. They based off, hey, everyone, Texas just beat the shit out of Texas Tech. Here's Arch Manning handing the ball off and running for like eight yards in the fourth quarter when the game had been decided in warm-ups. I, I've even – it's to the point now where like for, for Eric and uh, – no, I didn't write – I was at Arch's media scrum at the Sugar Bowl, but Brandon Marcello wrote that for National. So I was like, okay, I don't – we don't need to double up on on Arch's availability, right? Mm-hmm. So I've got, I've, got, I've got the audio archived in case we need to pull from it or whatever, but – uh, I was like, I'll let Marcelo hit up, but it's to the point now where, like, on the on the team beat, like, I've told Chip and Eric, I'm like, unless it's like something you know pertinent that's like super urgent, I'm like, I'll just take Arch off y'all's plate because we have to write it to to CB's point there in the in the chat. Anything he does makes national news. I told you guys, I had Arch Manning makes his Texas debut. I had that story in the can for months. Just waiting, waiting for all I had to do was change the name of the opponent and the score. The date. Pretty much, yeah, just change, pretty much change everything there, and then it was done. Because you know, for us, it's gonna. Everybody wants to know about Arch. Everybody wants to to read about it. But you know, it's it's not like it's not like everything we do covering Texas has to do with Arch Manning. I think it's much, it's much more. I, I'll say this. I know I'm kind of stumbling over my words here. I feel like the writers and the people that are there every day in the Texas market have handled Arch Manning at Texas infinitely better than the national media has. Because for us, it's okay. Yes, he is who he is, but 
in the grand scheme of covering this team and following this team through a season, he's still the backup quarterback. Now, were the, yeah. there, the, you ask questions about Arch when they're relevant, like when Quinn went down, it's okay. If Malik struggles or if Malik gets hurt, now you have to ask questions about Arch because he it really is one play away from being the guy all of a sudden. So now it's pertinent, but it's not like every week there's a question being asked about Arch. So I'll give my colleagues in the Texas market props for how they've handled the Arch situation. Again, much better than some of the national media has. But at the end of the day, man, I, I you know, anything, anything that Arch Manning does, you got to understand the Manning family, they're not going to do anything just half cocked. They went into this deal where they understood, they obviously understood. Look, this is, this is a family. And I know Cooper's handling, Cooper and, and Archie's mom are handling the bulk of this, right? Archie's there. If they need to talk to him. Peyton and Eli are kind of on the periphery if they're needed. But based on what Arch said, based on what Sark and AJ Milley have said, Peyton and Eli have been complete non factors throughout this whole time. But this is a family that when they make decisions, like they knew what they were getting into, like when Eli was coming out in the draft, they basically held the draft hostage because. They didn't want Eli to go to San Diego because the Chargers at the time were a complete and utter, you know what show, they were, and they didn't want they didn't want Eli Manning to they didn't want Eli dealing with the Chargers, so they orchestrated the trade in New York and Eli got to New York. They're not gonna. You think about that. How much effort then do you think was put into a six hundred dollar decision over a video game? It's yeah. it's 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 very very small potatoes compared to the big picture. And honestly, man, if just to to be on a campus where he can as much as possible blend in and just be a guy, man, going to going to Texas and being in Austin, that's one of the one of the places where you can do that. He wouldn't have been able to do that in Tuscaloosa or, or Athens or anywhere else. Austin's kind of the place where he, for the most part, can just be a guy. Sure, he's going to get recognized, but shoot, Jordan, it's it's a it's a major metropolitan city now. It's not a little college town anymore. Yeah, and also, like, not only was the the comfort level in Austin that he felt, you know, a humongous part of why he's in Austin right now, yeah. it's also, like, exactly what you said. Like, it's not a college town. It's a growing metroplex. You know what I mean? There's so many opportunities in Austin for everyone involved in the business. And yeah. last week when, when we were talking about, uh, you know, all the old Arch Manning to Westlake rumors, yes. um, you know, yeah. you, you brought it up how, you know, Cooper began checking around West Austin for different business ventures while Arch was a junior, while Arch was a senior, you know, different times around then. And it's because, like, they're in love with everything the school and city had to offer from top yeah. to bottom. Um, you have to think, and, right? Like, like, hey, man, uh, Tesla and Apple and Samsung and all these Fortune 500 companies are, you know, in a race to get to Austin and build up facilities. Maybe there's something going on here, some kind of enterprise you could kind of get your hands on and make some nice coin. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, the the Manning family felt the exact way, except for the weekend Texas plays Georgia. <laughs> that, that's probably the only reason they don't like it for, for what it's g grown into just because prices are going to be out the ass. But, Man, you know, with what, yeah. with what the Manning family has made in career earnings from the sport of football, I assume they probably went ahead and just bought a house somewhere in Austin. You know what, man? I, I, I think about it. You brought it, you bring up Georgia shifting gears a little bit. That that game's got to be either a two thirty or a night game, right? There's no way you're putting that on at eleven a.m. because right? it's because yeah. you don't have Fox is gonna Fox wants to own that eleven a.m. window, and now that you're in the SEC where ESPN slash ABC has control over uh, tier one, tier two rights for football, I, I think Texas will have fewer eleven a.m. kickoffs. In other words, if you're at an eleven a.m. kick in the SEC, it's probably gonna be because it's either you're not very good or the team you're playing isn't very good. Yeah, and also I, I talked to my dad about this. Like, man, once Arch Manning is starter, Texas is going to end up playing like 75% of their games at 730. You know Probably, what I mean? yeah. Because, like, again, like the tech example, <laughs> there's no way he's not on prime time, you know, 75% of Texas's games. There's just no way. There's so much money to be made for everyone involved in sports, uh, Arch Manning. There's no way they're not going to make him the primetime guy. I think um, even I think even though this year Jordan even and granted we haven't seen kickoff times for the schedule yet, 
other than the Oklahoma game, which I would imagine ABC will put that in their 2.30 window, I would think. Uh, it's either going to be 11 a.m. or 2.30. Yeah. But Texas coming off of it, I mean, you, you've got a – when's the last time networks had this where you had – I mean, probably back in 2010 was the last time you had this where – you had a season where Texas was this marketable. Like it's worthwhile to put the Texas brand other than the Oklahoma game, give it prime real estate on TV because you've got a team. You're coming off of a conference championship. You're coming off of a, a trip to the CFP. You've got a legit Heisman contender with Quinn Ewers. You're going to be coming off all this momentum from the draft. However much you want to factor in the arch mania into that also like, and plus it's year one in the SEC Texas is going to be one of the the really hot properties for ABC ESPN to want to feature now that they've got full control. In other words, if you want to maximize your your television dollars not in your in your first year and try to start to recoup some of this money you're shelling out to the SEC, man, give Texas some prime real estate. Give Oklahoma some prime real estate. Those matchups are going to be gargantuan for ESPN ABC. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> again, I just don't see any way Texas isn't, like, at least playing past 6 o'clock for 75% 70%, 70 of the games Arch is going to start at the college level. I, I feel pretty strongly about that just because of everything we've talked about the last few minutes. Um, for, like, I yeah, guess, like, dude, like, so, like so, to the weekend of the September 21st, like, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Norman, there's no way in hell it's going to be an 11 a.m. kick. That's getting either 2.30 or – you're getting primetime treatment on that deal. It does kind of suck, though, because I haven't even thought about this till now. But, like, with, with you bringing up how, like, Texas is probably done playing at 11 because they they might not – they might just have only one Fox game this year. Michigan, yeah. Like, if, if Fox isn't in the SEC and it's all ESPN, man, like, that sucks. We can't watch as many great games spread across the day because they're probably going to be yeah. consolidated to – to two thirty and seven, they'll probably try to stagger some, like to start thirty minutes before an hour before each other. But like, still, we're, we probably might have seen the last of eleven a.m. or not the last. I doubt it's the last, but you won't. The number have, of eleven a.m. Yeah. SEC kickoffs is going to get cut in half. You may, maybe two, maybe two a year instead of half your schedule being eleven a.m. Yeah, that's the bad deal with the Fox thing. I, I think. I think that's why Fox, <clears throat> for Fox to have the Big Ten deal, I think that works out for Fox perfectly because traditionally the Big Ten has played games in that their big games have been in that 11 a.m. window. Because yeah. there's, there's a reason, like, you think about it, when Texas went to Columbus in 05, that was the first night game at the Horseshoe. Really? Yeah. I don't think Michigan had a night game. I forget it was – oh, man, was – Brady Hulk the coach, or was that still Rich Rod? I don't remember, but it I know I have a Michigan buddy, and he says they only do like one of those a year for a home game. Starts out, I can't forget. I mean, let me look that up. Got but it. yeah, the Big Ten, the Big Ten TV windows, they're used to having it at 11 a.m. Plus, I mean, when you're on the East Coast, you're on Eastern time too. I know some of those states are central time, but uh, on the on when you're on Eastern time, it, it makes more sense to be in that noon window. What's uh yeah, no, I think, yeah, that's you know, that's what I was giggling about. I think those um, I think those <laughs> I think those days are I think those days are over. CB, if you got the, the Rose Bowl DVD, you can you know watch that thing as as much as you want. But yeah, it's uh dude, I don't even know I don't even know what LHN's showing right now. It's probably either a baseball game or a softball game, but it, there's a decent chance if you get Rose Bowl, you got like a like a 25% chance of being right. Yeah. So when Texas played that game versus USC, I had turned three years old less than a month before. <laughs> right. <laughs> but because that game is on Longhorn Network, like all the damn time, I can probably tell you what play is going to happen before it happens on like probably about 70% of the plays, just because I've watched it so much. And like, I even know some of the lines because it's on LHN so much. So I am interested. I, I highly doubt it's going to be on. Like, there's no way um, yeah. they play it on there. Um, but, yeah, and then as far as the other people talking, like uh, how Arch, uh, someone in a circle had said that, um, you know, he's not going to take any dollars until he's earned the starting job. You know, 
I, I really did. I don't remember seeing that or hearing that at the same time, like because there's so much to be quite honest, just bullshit about not that Arch is doing bullshit, but the people who cover him are creating bullshit. I try to kind of stay out of, you know, reading about him or whatnot. So I miss that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what his setup is in terms of when he wants to start taking dollars. But, you know, someone in the circle came out and said, you know, they don't want to accept any money until he's a starter. Then it makes a lot of sense that they're turning down the six hundred dollars. So yeah, um, I was just looking at it. So Michigan played their first night game in two thousand eleven. So that was year one of Brady Hoke. Okay, it was the first time Michigan had a night game at the Big House. Yeah, Bevo Lance Jason mentions it. Jason, I'm sorry, I just know you as Bevo Lance Jason from the the Horn Days. So I apologize if you're no longer going by that moniker. But Texas OU typically, yeah, it's going to be an eleven a.m. kick, and that's one look. I mean it. This is probably a better topic for, for Chip to cover because I know Chip knows more of the ins and outs about how TV works than I do just because he's been covering it a lot longer than I have. But 11, the you know Texas OU is one of those games that ABC would be like, hey, Fox, we don't care what you're showing. We know you're not showing Michigan-Ohio State. You want to show, you know, if Rutgers is having a good year, you want to show Rutgers-Penn State, go right, go right the hell ahead. We'll put Red River on ABC and – blow your ratings out of the water and just own the ratings weekend. Yeah, and have another instant classic. But, yeah, and uh, I guess, you know, real quick before I forget or other stuff, I do want to circle back to uh, my stop at Prosper. Okay. Um, they, retired, so, they retired Jake's number yet? Uh, No, I don't it's, – it's – I honestly can't think of any schools that have retired numbers. What's the worst start, dude? One the last one I was down there many years ago, like Kevin. Smith. I think Drew Brees is retired at Westlake, or am I mistaken? Because he didn't wear a nine in high school, did he? I know Jaden Greathouse wore nine. He wore fifteen. Um, you know, if if they've got something up for Drew, I wouldn't know. I I couldn't tell you where it is. Got it. Um, but no, uh, Prosper stop. Yeah, so they they did have uh, his jersey hung up with you know their other dudes who have you know, made it to the next level or nice. the NFL. Um, actually have a, it's his Under Armour all American Jersey. I have a photo of it, uh, up on my Twitter. I posted from this morning, but, uh, speaking of Jake majors, um, Connor Cardi came down, uh, for junior day. That was his first and only visit to Texas, or I believe it's his only, or I believe it was his first and only visit, but got the offer on the trip. Um, before the trip, you know, he, not that he necessarily, um, not that he necessarily like was opposed to Texas, but you know, he was picking up a lot of offers where, you know, they hadn't offered him. Right. And, uh, him and Jake majors, they're not super tight. It's not like they're communicating, you know, all the time, but they are in contact. And, uh, Jake was in town, uh, last month and or in January, sometime in there. And, uh, he stopped by the school and, and him and Connor Cardi ended up having a about an hour and a half sit down conversation with each other where, you know, Jake just kind of tried to help him out, answer any questions he had. And, you know, also just talk about this is what I did when I was in your shoes here at Prosper. And this was what worked for me. This is what didn't work for me. But also, you know, he spoke highly of Texas to him. Um, and, you know, I, I have the quote from Cardi that, that I'll put out later today or tomorrow. But, you know, he, he said on record, you know, that that did change my view of how I looked at Texas and. You know, I think they're going to be a contender going forward for sure. And uh, as far as the rest of his recruitment goes, he is a top 12. He put out like uh, sometime recently, a, a week or two ago. Uh, of those schools, I think, you know, he, he's in, one thing that's for sure for him, he's incredibly open. There isn't a leader at all for him. But I would say of the 12 schools, uh, there's a group that appears to be separating from the pack. And I'd say that's uh, A&M. Texas, Texas Tech, Oklahoma, and LSU. Uh, he has offers from all over the country, but, you know, talking to him, uh, he said, you know, he would probably prefer to stay closer to home. He, you know, he's very prideful of where he's from and in Texas. And, you know, talking to, to coaches, other people in and around Prosper, um, you know, they kind of expect him to stay in the region as well. So, you know, kind of where this is trending, uh, I think I'd be pretty surprised if the decision wasn't AM, Texas Tech. Texas, LSU, or Oklahoma. Um, but 
you know, his, his timeline, he's wanting to, to commit some time between the end of his official visits and the start of his senior season. So, you know, we'll have a better idea where things are looking as we get, you know, closer to the summer. But um, that's the update with Connor Cardi. And, you know, I'll have that and, and more stuff out later today or tomorrow. But just wanted to hit on that before I forgot. Nice. Uh, has Prosper got anything up in the halls uh, recognizing uh, Mario Edwards? Because, you know, Mario Edwards went to Prosper before he was at Denton Ryan. Yeah, I was about to say, I thought he was at – and then Ryan hit the portal. Um, no, Actually, I, I don't know, uh, but I his wasn't dad, really looking around. Yeah, his dad got a job at uh, at Denton Ryan on that Ryan staff. And then part of that defense, him and Alex Delatore, that defense that uh, they, they lose to – did they lose to Lake Tra- – yeah, they lost to Lake Travis and Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield beat them in the state championship game. I'm sorry. I just looked down at my phone. Who are we talking about? Prosper? No, Denton Ryan. Oh, yeah. Man, when late Travis won five in a row, they took down Highland Park, Longview. I think they beat Longview twice, if I remember correctly. Um, Waco Midway. Waco Midway was the fifth one. And then the other one must have been Ryan, like you said. Yep. So, and I, again, I'm pretty sure they beat Longview two of those five. So, mm-hmm. they did it all. And the thing with late Travis, like, they do go really deep every year, but one thing that isn't really talked about is how they get to play San Antonio teams and teams from the Valley. Um, so that, that does help, but you know, that that's the death row of teams to meet at state. And the fact that they won five is still ridiculous and five in a row. So does the, does the rest of the state frown on the Austin schools when they are aligned in region four getting Valley week? Hell, yeah, for sure. And like, <laughs> Also, like, man, like, Pflugerville Weiss, I think, has more prospects than anybody probably in Austin, or at least in Austin, if not Central Texas. Yeah. And I think they're a really good team, you know. But, like, they're the number one team in their district, went and played Cedar Hill first round and got ran off the field. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just because, like, it's a different level of athlete, different level of program up here in Dallas, especially in South Dallas. And I think Weiss is going to have more success because they've dropped down. They're back in 5A now. Um, so I think that'll really help them a lot. But, like, man, the two years there in 6A, like, it didn't matter who the hell they had because regardless of how they do, they have to match up with someone in the District of Death, right? Mm-hmm. They're a District of Doom. So, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I do think the rest of the state kind of looks down and scoffs at the Austin area, Central Texas area, San Antonio area teams, whenever they got them in the schedule or, or in the playoffs, just because, you know, the the programs, like I mentioned, the top programs here in Houston and Dallas, like it's usually just a different type of caliber of athlete. And honestly, you know, just the program top to bottom, the coaching is better most of the time as well. You know? Yeah. I mean, and I, I mean, I, and you look at the size of the cities and I guess <laughs> – uh, prospects per capita, you could say. And like Austin is nothing compared to what Houston and Dallas produce. And I think honestly, it's just the culture here or the, here, the culture in Austin isn't what it is in Dallas and, and in Houston. There's not as much media coverage. There's not as much exposure on the kids. And quite frankly, the, the coaching staff just don't do nearly as good of a job of getting their kids recruited. And they don't make the effort to get their kids recruited than most of the other staffs in Houston or Dallas do. And, and I've always felt that way. And, yeah. you know, when I lived in Austin, I always did everything I could to, you know, bring more, bring more exposure to the kids in the city and the programs in the city. But, uh, you know, I, it was a great business move for me to move to Dallas. And, you know, I still try to help as much as I can for kids in that area. But yeah, it just feels like it's honestly like it's 10 years behind, you know, Houston I, I and Dallas. Part of, the, part of the reason, too, um, you've got – you know, I can't tell you how many social media brands, be they legitimate or not, that are at high school games in the Dallas area and the Houston area every Friday, yeah. every Thursday, every Saturday. I mean, <laughs> you 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 rolled with Snoop, and Snoop is kind of Snoop kind of has. There's a reason why everybody follows him because he's pretty much. That's the only way out. Yeah, he's pretty much kind of he's pretty much got no competition. He's got the market cornered because I, I don't know if it's nobody else wants to put in the, the work, nobody else wants to grind, whatever it is. 
Snoop is your guy. I mean, you want to know what's going on in, in the high school sports scene. And granted, Snoop's, Snoop's so what Snoop does is different from recruiting, but you know what I mean, right? Like Snoop is, is the only entity I can think of in this, like, you know, I'd go to a game in the Metroplex and I'm like, oh, hey, who are you with? Like, oh, yeah, you're with 24-7. I'm with so-and-so. I'm like, I, I don't even know what that is, man. Like, oh, yeah, we just started last week or whatever. Like, everybody's got some kind of pop-up company. Uh, you know, it's like I said, a lot of them are legitimate. Some of them aren't. But you don't even have that going on in the Austin area. No, you don't. And, like, like everyone who works in the recruiting industry, or at least everyone who works at 24-7 Sports that lives in the state of Texas, lives in the Dallas-Fort Worth area now, now that I've moved from Austin. Mm -hmm. The only person who doesn't live in DF Dub is Brian Peroni, who lives in Houston. But he wouldn't go to a ton of stuff, so we didn't really count him. And now that he's in charge of the database and isn't a writer, like it doesn't mean anything that he lives in Houston. All of us are in Dallas. So, and and CB to see yeah. your, your comment, I never see the day OBJ make a state championship run like they did. They just had a really good group of seniors, um, the 2023 class and the 2022 class. And the 21 class with, with Trell McCutcheon and Drew McCuba. Those are three of the best classes that have ever come to that school. And I've said it a thousand times, and I'll, I'll say this till the day I die. LBJ wins a 4 D1 state championship in 2022 if Austin ISD doesn't screw them on the bus drivers. <laughs> if Austin like, I'll ISD die on that hill. Cheap. <laughs> I will die on that hill. I, I know I know Coach Fenner and anybody that was involved in that LBJ program, they're never gonna say it publicly, whatever they want to say. I'll say it for him because AISD got too cheap and didn't want to pay for bus drivers. It cost LBJ a state championship. Yep, it did. And like it's I just don't get it. Like I the the school ISDs, Houston ISD is probably the worst run ISD in the state of Texas, for sure, it's up there for Southern U.S. West. Talking about Houston ISD? Houston ISD, yeah. yeah Austin ISD true. isn't great. The ISD isn't great. But, like, there's always just so much horse shit going on with the city ISDs. Like, the ISD with COVID, the, the, the director of athletics, like, literally said, like, we never win anything. Why, why would we do fall sports during COVID? That's what he said at a yeah. school board meeting. So whenever it came time for SOC to win their first ring, and they have uh, the documentary. Not too happy that, that the DISD superintendent is on there, you know, saying all these things because they know what it was, right? Yeah. And it, it's the same thing in Austin ISD and Houston ISD. Like, you know, I education is obviously incredibly important, but like, dude, like, just care more for athletics and, and try to Man, create something. DISD has won so much. I, I can think of two state championships they've had stripped from them. The Carter football yeah. title in uh, 88, and then uh, Sock had a basketball title in 2009, maybe? Somewhere like, or somewhere around there, Sock had a basketball title taken away. Or maybe it was earlier than that. Yeah, I, think no, they, Darrell, I think it was when Darrell Arthur was there. They did, and I, I found that out because um, <laughs> so a lot of people were pissed off in Dallas that Camorian Morgan transferred from Red Oak to Sock. Um, and it, it's pretty well known, at least up here. Um, and I guess among you know people who cover Texas high school football, but uh, Camorin Morgan's father who was a big time basketball player in Dallas when he was growing up, and he played at Sock before going over to a uh, La Tech. Um, but he was on they won like I think it was three titles in a row, and he was only there for his senior year, just like his son. He transferred into Sock for his senior year. But if he was there his junior year, that was the year that they had the state title stripped. Wait a minute. Um, is his is his dad Bobo Morgan? Yeah, that's his dad. God, that makes me feel old. Oh man. Oh. When you yep. when you said that Ronnie I'm like, Bobo no Morgan, way. that that's that's come on like, Morgan's there's dad. There's no way Bobo Morgan's his dad, but yeah. Oh, geez, man. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that was a hell of a team, man, with him and uh Kevin Rogers, Darrell Arthur. That was that was a golden Darrell Hastings. That was kind of a golden era of sock basketball. I remember because San Antonio Sam Houston now has that state championship and they got the banner hanging in the school. And I'm like, you all can hang a banner, but I remember Darrell Arthur and Kevin Rogers turning the second half of that game into a dunk contest. Like it was <laughs> they lost by like 40. 
Yeah, that's that's like uh, <laughs> that's like how McKinney is state champs in basketball. Yeah, in because 2022. Of Rose, yeah. Dude, that shit was so hilarious because of like all the bullshit the UIL put Anthony Black through. And like, <laughs> I'll never forget this. And this probably might have been why the UIL really brought down the hammer on Duncanville. But I'll never forget him going for like 28 or something. In the state game, he wins MVP of the tournament for 6A. <laughs> it's like about an hour, two hours after they won. He posts a picture of him in like the mirror in like an elevator. And it says, thanks for the medals at UIL Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's him smiling his ass off. And uh, everyone yeah. in Dallas thought it was hilarious. It took off. But, you know, I bet that pissed off a lot of people at the UIL. And oh, honestly, sure. like. Look, uh, Anthony Black, like, I, I've talked to you all about how I feel about transferring in high school. Like, I really don't give a shit if it's going to help you get recruited. Like, that's the right move to do, in my opinion. But Anthony Black's stepfather was quite literally the head coach at Duncanville, and his family moved to Duncanville. Like, yeah. I don't get what else you have to do. It's the same stuff as a UIL trying to uh, – the kid from – I think his name's Grayson Rigdon. He originally his father is a coach somewhere. I might be mixing yeah, this up. Uh, the kid. No, I, I think you're go go tell the story. And I think you're thinking. I think we're thinking about the same thing. Yeah, his father got a job at another six man program, and of course, you know you're gonna move with your dad when your dad gets a job somewhere else. That's what he did, and the UIL tried to suspend him for a year because they're like, "This is a football move," and he was like, "What?" Yeah, like I don't know. I saw someone ask him about UIL earlier. I forgot to answer that question about if they ever think if NIL will be a thing in Texas. Honestly, I think uh, <laughs> I think it's the same thing as how it is with, with marijuana, <laughs> where it's going to have to be legalized federally before Texas, the state of Texas does it. Just because yeah. the UIL people are very – I don't even know how to describe them. I guess uptight, old school, orthodox. You know, They made it very clear that NIL was something they wanted to stay away from whenever it first got discussed at the high school level. Either that, either that, Jordan, or it would take it would take something, some some kind of mass exodus of top end football recruits going somewhere, going to another state where they can cash in on NIL for the THSCA to be like, look, you y'all need to help us. We we got to have something here. So, and then you got to deal with you got to go through the state legislature and all that stuff. So, it, I, I think it's. The UIL is not going to, to your point, and, and I'm just kind of adding on here, the UIL is not going to do anything, I don't think, in, until they, they're they forced to do something, until they absolutely have to. They're not going to be – they'll be reactive on the NIL front, not proactive. And that's not me citing sources or anything. I mean, I could call people and find out what's going on, but that's just my opinion. I don't think they're – that's typically how they've handled this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I just think it's hilarious, the conversation that's going on in the comments about the Bevo Lance Jason. Because I've always wondered, like, yo, what the fuck is Craigway saying in because, front of Jason? Okay. Like, what? So think, I'm, I'm on think, the same thing as everyone else well, that's, like, you can thank Trey putting it together. That, because when we're at the Horn, Trey would give people names. Uh, if you texted into the show and you were a regular texter, you had a name like i don't know if this ike is the same ike as uh, i like ike that used to text into the show but like i i can tell people by uh when i meet people when we do like a meet and greet and you can ask jason this if i if i meet you you can tell me your name but if you tell me your see ike is i like ike you can t tell me your texter name on the from the horn and i'll be able to I'll, I'll know more about your personality than i will if you just tell me your real name but Trey would assign names like there was somebody that texted in uh, every time they texted in their text name was pooped 11 times in one day. <laughs> so I'm like, so I, and it was funny. I wouldn't read those. I'd make Craig read them so I could hear Craig way say pooped 11 times in one day says blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I seriously couldn't tell you the amount of times. Like I felt like I was having a stroke when they'd say Bevo Lance J. I'm like, what the fuck? Like I'm hearing Bevo, but I don't know what the last part is or anything. Because uh, because Jason has a Chevy Avalanche. Oh like, yeah, yeah, out. I saw that. Uh, yeah, got the Chevy. Yeah, Avalanche. so I'll I'll remember that, Jason. If I ever, I assume you live somewhere uh, in on the Austin. J on Jason, the Austin area, Jason, so. if I'm if I'm remembering right, lives out in the the dirty drip somewhere out towards. Uh, wow. Hey man, that the slums of Dripping Springs where my my dog Novasad's from. We called him Slimy Novasad. Man, the drip, the drip is growing, man. 
Yeah, it has, man. I've I've talked to to some of my friends about it. Like, um, I live in Dallas right now. I eventually do want to get back to Austin, and you know, when I have kids, I want to raise them in Austin. But you know, I grew up in Lakeway, Lake Travis area. I don't want to raise my kids there. Like, that's just not the real world. It's it's just not the real world. It's a bubble, and uh, you know, a lot of the kids I grew up with just don't have a work ethic. They never worked a day in their life, and they're not set up for success, right? I want my kids to go somewhere, you know, not like that. And I think Jimming Springs, uh, you know, the vibes I always got when I was over there for Novosad or over there at their house or whatever is, you know, there's still, you know, money. It's a safe area, but it's definitely not as, you know, stuck up-y, I guess. And yeah, the same type of vibe as the West Lake Lake Travis type of vibe. So hey, I've man. always loved Drip and the people out there are dope, too. It's a cool little town and, you know, it's growing a lot, but it still kind of has, you know, a, more of a small town feel where Westlake and Lake Travis have a suburb feel, you know? Yeah. get You know, Rodney and I were actually talking about this before you jumped on because I grew up in a small town. When Rodney grew up in Lockhart, it was really a small town. It's still – you go to Lockhart now, it's grown, but it's still it's still a one high school town. It still feels – it doesn't feel big. Um, man, I would encourage you, Jordan, when you, when you have kids and you're moving back to the Austin area, raise, raise them in uh, – a surrounding area where kids in the summertime where their main job is still going to be go hauling hay for somebody in the summertime. It's a good place. It's a good kind of place to raise your kids. Cause I was telling Rodney, yeah. I don't know if you caught that, but I, I had, I had some buddies that were in the co-op program in school, which they would go to school half a day, then go work for half a day. And they would like go to the morning athletic period, go to school half the day, and then go like bus concrete with their dad, then come back for football practice. And for me, it's like, well, dude, I don't want to get in this weight workout. And my guy over here was just in the hot ass sun, busting concrete, and he's coming back and getting this workout. What's my excuse? You know, so it's builds camaraderie, builds, uh, you know, has people come together. It's it's a small small towns. Small towns are good, man. They they got their pluses. They got their minuses, but they got their pluses too. Yeah, no, Jeff. Just just say my kids will be fruit cakes if they don't grow up in Florence, Texas. Just say it. I mean, it does. It does put some. It does put no, some uh, some hair on your ass to grow up in a place like Florence, America. I'll say that. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely more than BK. I know, and I know there's if there's any if there's anybody I went to school listening to this, they're like, Jeff, you're so full of shit. Like it's <laughs> <laughs> this motherfucker sat alone at lunch, man. Uh, man like somebody will ask something. No, dude, I was I, I was uh, I had a I had a full lunch table. Um, yeah, no, nah, but I'm like some people okay. ask me, sometimes some people ask me questions like I'll know something about like hunting or something or mm -hmm. whatever, just some random like some random ass thing to do with like farming or ranching or something. And then I like, how do you know that? I'm like, dude, y'all forget where I grew up. Like I might not have done this, but I was around it enough to at least or had friends that did it that have at least an idea of what's going on. Yeah. Okay. So you gotta break it down for me. I know Ike is riffing here with bringing up Gerald, but Wait, what's the hate with Gerald? Are, are them in is Gerald and Florence like not, Lake not Travis, Westlake, or something? What, what's anymore. going on? Not anymore. Um, because Gerald's grown and it's bigger now. It's a, I think Gerald's a 4A now, Florence is a 3A, but they're separated by I think from from one school to the next, it's 13 miles, mm. uh, down, uh, down the road. So, so that's the ops, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's it, it was a big it was a really really big rivalry back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, we we didn't like them. They didn't like us. The only thing that uh the kids from Salado could agree and that the kids from Salado and the kids from Florence could agree on is that we both hated Gerald. So, uh, yeah, it was it was just one of those it was just one of those rivalries back in the day. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I was always F, F Bala FM 487, Jordan, is what it was what it was all about. Interesting. Y'all ever get into, you know, like going mudding on the other team's field or something? Um, I'm trying to remember because I was out of high school when this happened. I want to say the kids from Florence went to Gerald and poured gasoline in the shape of a wang on Gerald's field and lit it on fire. Fuck so, yeah. yeah. Stuff like that can go down. Good old, good old small town fun, man. I mean, can you beat it? Can you beat it? And my um, brother, my brother will remember the story, but there was a massive brawl that took place. Florence and Gerald were playing a basketball game in Florence, 
and the kids from Salado came over to start a fight with the Gerald kids, and there was like just this massive brawl that broke out. So that's see, I mentioned there's pros and cons to growing up in a small town. That's kind of the con stuff. You got to deal with some skullduggery, some hooliganism. Yeah, the the craziest rivalry stuff I can remember from Lake Travis was reading in the newspaper when because a lot of people don't know this, especially like kids these days, but. It wasn't Westlake and Lake Travis as the main rivals. It was Lake Travis and Dripping Springs originally. Yeah. When and when that would happen, like every year, is like say the games that drip, Lake Travis is going over there and going mudding on their field the night before the game, and vice versa. It went on for multiple years where they're playing that game in like Round Rock or downtown Austin or a different stadiums because it had to be a neutral site with turf. Um, and then for Westlake, I remember when I was in like middle school, they had a bunch of kids. So the way Lake Travis is set up is it, there's like a ninth grade center that's linked to the main building, but mm-hmm. it's separate. And it's like an open design where there's a big courtyard. And a bunch of Westlake kids had somehow gotten in the courtyard like overnight when I was in middle school and spray painted like a bunch of dicks and, <laughs> you know, random stuff around the freshman ninth grade center and wrote like Westlake was here or something. And that's how they ended up figuring out exactly who did it because <laughs> the kids didn't wear masks either. Trey, you uh, have you looked at any psychological thing on why when adolescent males want to graffiti something, why the wang is the go-to <laughs> thing for graffitiing things? Yes, according to a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different scientific research, it has to do with the fact that uh, we all think with our little heads until our late twenties or early thirties, and some much past that. Gotcha. BK, you spray painted a wang on something at some point during your high school days, didn't you? I don't know if I ever spray painted a wang during my high school days, but I do know my senior year of college, I had stolen an overhead projector and we drew a wang on it and flashed it across the courtyard of my car apartment complex. We used it as the bat signal. Like if we were going out getting drunk that night, the wang was flashing on the building of the apartment I was living at in West Campus. It's that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> so yeah good times there and i think uh i'm in the category of folks who will be thinking with their little head well into their 30s oh, yeah, I never, man. I never spray painted a wang on any walls or anything but i did spray paint my wang uh, a bright neon green at one point no, okay what was that for research i guess the aesthetic yeah, for you and you only to look at because nobody else was going after so you. That. You weren't actually wearing a morph suit. You were just buck ass naked, but spray painted green. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wanted to give people the opportunity if they uh, if they wanted to to have my wing look like something else in the background, they could do that. I didn't know if like you were doing some kind of black light thing and going for something there, but all right, it works. Yeah, that could've, it could have worked for that too. Sure. Different strokes for different folks, I guess. All right. Well, that's enough. Uh, that again. That's enough Wang talk for me today. Uh, Trey, BK, that's a pretty good segue for whatever you guys are talking about today. <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks, fellas. We'll uh, we'll be back to do it tomorrow. You guys have a good show. Good stuff. Y'all. Yes, they do, DJ. I'll see y'all. <laughs> Oh, man, 53 more minutes of Wang Talk coming your way right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Welcome to another edition of Trey and BK. Or Wang Sports Sports. Unfiltered, as Rex likes to say. Mm. Yeah, we might have to change our name to that after that crosstalk with Jeff and Jordan. And you really never know what you're getting with crosstalks on our show today. Oh, Jeff is so good at steering it into very weird directions, which I love. And your dad is listening today. What's up, Papa K? Like a train wreck or wang wreck. I can't stop listening. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. <laughs> I think comment of the fucking month right there. Oh my gosh. What a start to a Tuesday show. Hell, it's more fun talking about that than what happened to Texas basketball in Waco last night. We'll get into that. I want to ask Trey if he has any strong thoughts about Arch Manning's decision, at least his reported decision, to opt out of the NCAA football video game, which, of course, will make its return later this summer. Uh, We'll be at the dish tonight. Texas baseball taking on Texas A&M. Big game there. We got some NFL to get into. 
Uh, plus, where are we at in society, of course, to uh, wrap up the show, like we always do right here on Trey and BK. Yeah, I guess we'll start with Texas basketball, Trey. Uh, the Longhorns at one point held a 14-point lead against the Baylor Bears in Waco last night in the last ever scheduled meeting between these two teams as conference foes. And, well, things fell apart in the second half. Baylor went on a 24-4 run to take the lead and take control last night. Of course, in the middle of that run, you had the injury to Dylan DeSue, who it seems like Texas has dodged a bullet, but we'll wait and see exactly what the future looks like for Dylan DeSue. But obviously a scary sight watching him go down and then him having to basically get carried off the court by a couple of trainers last night. Uh, Texas was playing really, really well for a while, and then it all completely fell apart. A total implosion in the second half last night and uh, a frustrating loss for the Longhorns in their last road game of the regular season. Hate it for Dylan DeSue, first and foremost. This is a guy that, when he is healthy, is one of the best players on the court. That has been the case going back a couple of years now. But the staying on the court part has been very difficult for him. Things are exacerbated perhaps last night by the fact that he was dealing with a stomach virus. And when, whenever you're dealing with something like that, inherently you're going to be a little bit physically weaker. So I guess that left him a little bit more prone to injury. Now he didn't play a ton up to that point, but it was just that one little awkward movement that led to at least a knee strain, if not a sprain and him possibly missing a game, maybe missing the big 12 tournament. I just hope he's back for the NCAA tournament because this team even with Max Aismas cooking like he was last night, it took a heroic effort to text for Texas to build that sort of lead. But as soon as Max Aismas cooled off and Dylan DeSue wasn't in there to provide that added scoring punch, this team was in deep trouble. And they had a hard time finding baskets over the last 10 minutes of the game, unfortunately. And it stinks because Texas was in complete control up to that point. And after that, I wondered in the moment, do we see this Texas basketball team respond to losing one of their best players seemingly for the rest of the game, if not longer by everybody really just banding together for a team effort to close out this win. And unfortunately that did not happen last night. Credit to Baylor for sticking with it, I guess. But uh, ultimately this feels like one that really falls at the feet of uh, this Longhorn basketball team for just kind of choking down the stretch and just losing their way offensively against a Baylor team that flat out stunk defensively up to a certain point. Yeah, you know, to me it was a minor miracle that Texas was able to build that type of lead with Dylan DeSue only playing 10 minutes, right? Like, completely agreed. We got that email and that Twitter notification right before the game that said Dylan DeSue is a game-time decision. He's dealing with a stomach bug. And once I saw that, I'm like, okay, well, if DeSue can't go or even if DeSue's limited, uh, we've got no chance to win this game on the road against one of the best teams in college basketball, the 11th ranked Baylor bears. And then, yeah, with the Sioux not playing much, Texas was able to get out to that huge lead. Max Aspis, you brought him up. He was red hot in the first half. Hell, everybody for Texas was red hot in the first half. They scored 48 points in the first 20 minutes. The most Baylor had given up in a first half all season long, but yeah, things just fell apart. I mean, Baylor did a good job of, Slowing down Max Aismas, they were face guarding him and they were doubling him pretty much every time he got the ball in the second half and without doing the suit. You know, Trey, every coach talks about a next man up mentality. Texas did not show a next man up mentality because everybody went down as soon as Dylan the suit went down with that injury. So, yeah, I, like I'll be honest, when he got hurt. I didn't really think about the rest of the Baylor game. I had chalked it up as a loss. I was like, OK, is our season over? Because if Dylan the Sioux can't go. The rest of the way, then, yeah, Texas will still make the tournament because they've done enough to get in, but they ain't winning a game in the tournament when they get there. They might lose Saturday. They might lose the Big 12 tournament opener, and they might lose their NC2A tournament opener if uh, something is seriously wrong with the Sioux. So, yeah, my mind shifted from last night to, shit, the rest of the season very, very quickly. Now, if they lose to Oklahoma and lose their – first round big 12 tournament game and DeSue remains out that entire time. It's an outside chance right now, but there is a chance that they miss the tournament altogether because we see the tourney committee seed teams or put teams higher or lower based on a star player being a part of that action. So if he's out and it looks like he is going to be done for the rest of the year, I do wonder if this team loses out, if they find themselves on the outside looking in when it's all said and done. 
Yeah, I'll eat my words if I'm wrong, but I think there's a zero percent chance that Texas misses the tournament. Now they, they I, might I be sure right about that. Oh, you you <laughs> probably are right, but I do just wonder because they have a very wacky thinking with these things sometimes. Yeah. They might be shipped to Dayton and they might have to play in the first four yeah. if they lose these two games and Dylan the Sioux can't come back for the tournament. But uh no, I think Texas has done enough to this point to where they are a lock to make it to the big dance. But yeah, you know, obviously you'd like to win at least one more to feel better about your chances of getting in. And more important than that. Yeah. You would like to hear some good news about Dylan the Sioux. I mean, it's a sprained knee. I guess the good news is he did come back to the bench after the game or during the game last night. And he was not wearing a brace. He was not using crutches. So it looked like he was better off than he was when he had to leave the floor right after he went down. But obviously the uh, success of this team's season moving forward depends on if that is a serious knee injury. I mean, Texas would have made the Final Four if uh, Dylan the Sioux could play in the tournament last year. This is not a Final Four team this year, even with Dylan the Sioux, but uh, their, uh, their chances of actually making something happen when we get to March Madness hinged directly on that knee. So it's frustrating, man. I mean, that game... Like, oh, my God, there are so many milk carton guys for Texas basketball right now. Like, Dylan Mitchell is just getting cardio workouts during these games. He's not helping the team win at all. And he his minutes have been falling recently because he's been bad. But obviously, with the DeSue injury and with Kendall Weaver in serious foul trouble all night, Mitchell had to play a lot more, and it's like, okay, here's an opportunity for you to kind of turn your season around, Dylan, help your team get a win, get back into the good graces of NBA scouts, like put on a show, and he did nothing last night. It's it's nine total points for Dylan Mitchell in these last three games. He's been in single digits in scoring in five of his last six. His defense has taken a step back. Like there are plenty of things you can point to, Trey, for why this season has been as up and down as it has. You can point to Rodney Terry. You can point to Hunter. And we could talk about those guys too here. But Dylan Mitchell, a former top 10 recruit in the country, a guy who everybody was excited about his return because you think, okay, if he has a good season, then Texas can have a great year. And maybe he's a lottery pick next in the draft. He's been bad. He has been non-existent way more often than not. And it feels like he's playing his worst basketball at the worst possible time. We talked about this earlier in the year. There's just games where Dylan Mitchell doesn't seem like he's engaged from the get-go, and it affects his play throughout. And that has been the case going back a week and a half now. I mean, he had an up-and-under attempt last night at some point in the second half where it's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? You're not Michael Jordan right now. Like He's, he's out there just uh, not really caring one way or the other, and I hate to see that because this team needs him now more than ever. When this team was able to start that six-game stretch against ranked foes, three and two. Part of that was getting uh, a more focused effort from Dylan Mitchell. Clearly, they need to go back to the drawing board or do whatever it was initially that inspired him enough to, to look more like, uh, I don't I won't even say an NBA lottery pick, but a guy who could play the in the league at some point in the future. Right now, if he tries to go pro, I would be shocked. Maybe I wouldn't be shocked because the NBA does draft on potential as much as they do actual talent in the moment. But I would be shocked if... Dylan Mitchell was sticking on an actual NBA roster next year. If anything, he's going to be a G League guy, but uh, he, he still needs to get it figured out and become a dominant player night in and night out at the college level before he ever considers going pro. I forget dominant. He just needs to be an average player. Right now, he's not even that. And yeah. I don't I, I don't know what Dylan Mitchell does because if he comes back for another year and he doesn't take a big step, then his draft stock is going to be non-existent. Yeah. Like he's actually hurt himself by coming back because – it's another year of people seeing that he might not be that good. So if it's just one year, you're one and done. It's like, ah, you could chalk that up to a bad year. Like Greg Brown still got drafted second round. Uh, people thought he was going to be a lottery pick coming out of Vandergrift, but he still got drafted. And I think if he came back for another year, it might've been bad for him, right? Like Dylan Mitchell to this point, him coming back for a second year has been bad for him. And if he comes yeah. back for a third year and once again, it's not great, then it's going to be even worse for him. So, I texted some buddies last night. I, I don't know if you have an answer off the top of your head, but I like Dylan Mitchell is one of this basketball program's biggest disappointments in a long time. And I asked some friends, like, who's who's bigger? And, and and one person said Greg Brown, and I'm like, well, Greg Brown was only here for a year. Like, he was also a top 10 player. We wanted more for him, but, like, he didn't come back for a second year. If Brown came back for year two and was looking like Dylan Mitchell right now, then, yes, he's in that conversation. 
Somebody said Will Baker. Will Baker, a five-star. He was a top 20 player in the country. Ended up transferring. Baker, though, wasn't as highly ranked as Mitchell. And I saw Will Baker play at Westlake in high school. No disrespect to the kid. I, I didn't think he was going to be that good. I didn't think he had the chops to be a great major college basketball player. So I wasn't expecting as much from him as I was Dylan Mitchell. Like, you got to go back a while to find, like, a, a recruit who has been this highly touted and this disappointing at the University of Texas. And, look, there's time for Mitchell to turn it around. Legacies are made in March. If he helps Texas go on some sort of second weekend tournament run, then the whole narrative changes. But right now, this dude has to be considered one of the biggest letdowns in recent Texas basketball history, Trey. Yeah, I'm trying to think of former Longhorn McDonald's All-Americans. You got Mo Bamba, you know, one year, not awesome, but better than better than this. Because the first name that was off the top of my head was, was Greg Brown, but Will Baker is a good option too. And he ends up transferring. So he hardly, hardly even played at Texas. Maybe it is Dylan Mitchell. And that sucks to see because there were signs that he was starting to get it early in the season and then partway through conference play too. But sadly that has not been the case. And uh, this, this team's postseason future probably rests a little bit more on Dylan Mitchell's shoulders than it did even a couple of days ago because of uh, the uncertainty surrounding Dylan DeSue. Speaking of guys, and gosh, it's hard to say that he was uh, witness protection or uh, was on the court, even though it didn't seem like he was on the court because he was this team's leading rebounder last night. It is maddening to watch IT Horton get regular <laughs> minutes for this basketball team. I mean, you want to talk about a sign that a team has a low postseason ceiling. It's the fact that IT Horton is out there for more than 25 minutes a game. He plays 27 minutes last night. Again, he gets the nine rebounds. That's almost by default because nobody else had more than three rebounds on this fucking basketball team last night. Yeah. And IT yeah. Horton by default becomes the nine rebound guy, but oh my goodness, it's infuriating to watch him out there consistently. They got out rebounded now, too. Yeah, they got out-rebounded by 15 last night. Baylor didn't miss much. There weren't a lot of rebound opportunities to go around because Texas just couldn't create those first missed shots for Baylor. But you're right. I mean, look, IT I. Horton's a total liability on defense. Like, uh, Baylor was just going after him every single time he was on the floor. Uh, we know Max Aismas has his limitations on defense, too, but at least he's bringing it on offense more often than not. But, yeah, I mean, IT Horton was bad. Brock Cunningham towards the end of the game, it looked like he was trying to foul out. <laughs> I just it was absurd. They called a flagrant on him. That was the dumbest thing ever. But still, that was his fifth foul. He was going to leave either way. Well, and that's the ramifications of that bullshit that happened in Lubbock too. We talked about it the day after. It's like, yeah, yeah that that might be funny because it pissed Texas Tech fans off. That makes him a marked man again amongst officials, and so they're probably another foul in that game that he may not have committed. I do hate, though, that he looks around completely confused every time a foul is called on him. It's like, will you please stop? You know exactly what a foul is. You know what you're doing this entire time, too. And by the way, Kendall Weaver, who I think plays with, he plays in more control than Brock Cunningham does. He's not as flagrant with the physical contact. He's starting to establish that reputation now, too. We've seen him in foul trouble uh, a couple of games recently, including last night, as you already mentioned. Well, everyone was in foul trouble because the refs couldn't keep the whistle out of their mouth last night. That, look, I'm not blaming the refs for why Texas lost. Texas imploded on its own, but they only shot 27 free throws in the second half. They shot 42 for the game. Yeah. Now I'm mad at Texas for not being more aggressive on offense and maybe trying to get to the line more because I, I feel like the refs would have made those calls if Texas was doing what Baylor was doing and playing more downhill, but the refs called almost nothing in the first half. And then all of a sudden they just, you can't do that. Like you, you can't just go one half letting the boys play. And then in the second half, just calling every single thing. I mean, Texas would breathe on somebody and it was a foul. So it's like, you know, it wasn't elite eight Miami bullshit, but it's like, what, what are we doing here? That game was supposed to end at 10 and Scott Van Pelt didn't start Sports Center to like 1025 because the refs just couldn't stop calling fouls and sending Bader, Baylor to the line. It was dumb. So I don't know. That's sidebar. Tyrese Hunter's also so frustratingly bad. And that's like Texas said this to the Buck this morning. Texas was picked to be number uh, top 20 team in the country this year and third in the Big 12. Mainly because of DeSue and Aismas, but also like Mitchell and Hunter were supposed to be boom, like right there, three and four. 
And the fact that every single show after a game, we're talking about those guys just not being consistent and it's March 5th like that. That's why Texas has been as inconsistent as it's been. That's why this is a 500 team in conference play right now. And probably a team that's going to be like an eight or a nine seed in the tournament. The, the, the other guys who needed to be as close to as consistent as to Sue and Acemas, they just, they haven't been. And there's not enough depth beyond those four to where you can make up for two of your star players or guys who are supposed to be your star players just not showing up. It sucks having to fully accept the fact that Tyrese Hunter is, he's not an afterthought at this point, but my belief that he could step up and become that third guy more often than not is just completely dashed right now. And I hate that because two years ago, two seasons ago, as little college basketball as I watched, I, I loved watching Tyrese Hunter play. And he's just turned into a different player here at Texas. Part of that is probably the fact that he's not the guy with the ball in his hands more often than not on the offensive end. But uh, if you are going to be passive like he is a lot of times and you're going to be okay with this combined ball handling role that Texas has rolled with these last few years, you've got to figure it out. You have to learn how to still be effective still a good defender, but you have to figure out how to be more effective as an offensive player in that capacity. And he has not figured it out just yet. And technically has not technically, he has one more year of eligibility remaining. I would not be surprised to see him go someplace else for that last year. Shouldn't be professional unless he's trying to play overseas, but uh, maybe better off for him to play that final year of college ball someplace other than Austin. He got off to a great start last night, too. Hit a couple of early threes, yeah. and then in the second half, like, he's one of the guys. All right, DeSue's out. Acemas is getting doubled. Baylor's sh shading its zone to guard Acemas. Like, you're the dude. And he got a couple of wide-open looks at threes. He just wouldn't take them. We've talked about him looking like a player who's lacking confidence right now, and last night I think was a perfect example. Like, that, that should have been a moment for him in the last 10, 12 minutes for him to just step up and help put the team on his back. And he didn't. He cowered. They all did. Everybody except Mac, Max Ace Miss cowered last night when the Sioux went down. And nobody does stuff like this. But, God, I felt like Ace Miss should have gotten the bus to himself on the way home. Everybody else should have walked from Waco after that performance. So. All it took to get Max Ace Miss going is putting a giant gash above one of his eyes. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was awesome last night. It sucks to waste a historically good performance like that. Season high, moved into eighth all time in college basketball scoring. He was great, but I, I couldn't figure out why Scott Drew took so long to start like actually playing defense on him. That was the only reason yeah. Texas was able to stay in the game as long as they could. As soon as Ace Miss, as soon as they started like really doubling and shadowing him, it was clear that Texas just had nothing else going for them. So. Uh, frustrating one, you know, eight point loss to Baylor, uh, not the worst thing in the world, but considering, yeah, you had a 14 point lead and you were up significantly for a large portion of that game. That does feel like uh, an added groin kick to the loss. And now you got to bounce back and try to win this finale on Saturday. Well, this just gets back to the idea of it taking heroic efforts to even be in games against the best competition on your schedule, which is not a recipe to consistently win those sorts of games because you've had several examples where you've had a guy go off like this and you're still losing the game. Like Max Ace missed last night. I feel like Dylan DeSue had one of those games where it may have been the Houston game where they came back and they forced it into overtime, but they still lose that one as well. You can't squander those sorts of nights by your best individual players because everybody else sucks to join up, you know? I agree. I'm sorry. There's a gnat just flying around right now, and it's killing me. Oh! Oh! Whoa. What a catch! What a Whoa. catch! That's the clutchest catch since I don't know when. Uh, since Des Bryant. There we go. Uh, I don't know if I got it. It was on my microphone, so I muted my mic and hit the mic, but... I don't know. Sorry. That's annoying me. Uh, yes, you're right. It shouldn't take historically good performances to hang with good teams. And hell, some of those performances are being wasted. It's just, it's the lack of depth. But usually when you talk about depth, you're talking about like your bench. For Texas, they don't have enough depth in their starting lineup right now. Because they're not, they're not getting consistent play from like two to three of their starters seemingly every night. So... Yeah, I, I, once again, they'll make the tournament, but you obviously want to do more than that, especially after an Elite Eight run. The Sioux's health, a big key, even if he is healthy, though. 
there's there's plenty of reasons to be skeptical about uh, this team's chances to bust some brackets. Jonathan says it's frustrating to not see Texas use zone defense. I typically like man more than zone if you have the players to do so, Jonathan, but I understand where you're coming from there. Ultimately, Baylor is such a good three-point shooting team. It's uh, probably not something that you're going to stick with for long, but hey, mixing it up, if Baylor is starting to hit shots, will maybe force them to rethink how they're going about things too. That did not happen last night. And Sam says... You know, it comes to the head coach, uh, to the head coach keeping players fully engaged to a degree, but it's also on the player too. I'm not yeah. going to completely exonerate uh, the players for being total space cadets at times. Like sometimes it is on the individual, and the head coach can say or do whatever until he's blue in the face. But if the player is not is just going to go through the motions and not be laser focused at the start of a game, it, it is at least partially on the player too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see one of your teammates go down, you. That, that should light a fire under your ass. You shouldn't need a coach to do that. You should be like, all right, let's go win this one for our guy. And it literally looked like Texas forgot how to play basketball once to Sue got hurt. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to laugh at your point. Cooter says, dude, BK, you are hired to best wranglers. Hey, it's in my blood. All right. So my dad does the same thing as Cooter does just True. in Dallas. So they can get along. But yeah, it's uh, genetics, man. I got a, I got a disdain for bugs and pests and mosquitoes and everything like such as, in the words of Miss T in South Carolina. What the heck is CB talking about here? Was that the fly that caused Wags eye issues? Uh, you missed chaos theory today. Yeah, Wags came on and it looked like he had pink eye. Oh, like his eye was like swollen and red, and it was a disaster. And he needed a few extra minutes to try to get whatever was in his eye out of his eye Ugh. and he basically did the whole show like a pirate i mean he didn't have an eye patch but he could only see out of one of his eyes and it didn't look very fun for him Not but, really. i had uh, something happen to me like that back in college i was at texas tech at the time before all my friends failed out and i transferred back to ut and I was just uh, hanging out, I think, in my dorm room. And because we would drink in there and sometimes leave open cans of beer and other booze around, uh, fruit flies would form. And this fruit fly, it flew right into, I think it was my right eye. And it flew into my eye and it like flew up under the lid. And I tried to get it back. I tried to get it out real quick. But the eye, the bug ended up like behind my eyeball. Oh. Like deep in my eye socket. Dude, this thing... Finally came out. I'm not even kidding you. Like three years later, I could feel it constantly for multiple years. And then one day it, I, I just did that deal where you're like lifting the eyelid up and trying to, to work something for like you have an eyelash in your eye. Finally got it out. Thank God. Because I think otherwise I uh, may have lost my mind and had to do something much more drastic. So your eye was hurting constantly for like three years. It wasn't a, sharp pain but it was like a dull pain like it was something that i could always feel especially god. when i blinked god it wasn't anyone farting in your pillow or nothing like that well yeah but that's what i paid them to do this had <laughs> nothing to do with the uh the pillow farters god three years why didn't you go to a doctor or something like i figured it, it would eventually work its way out which it did oh my god yeah michael with a good point that's that's texas tech rationale right there yeah, not, not no. doing anything about that. That was uh, also, I think I was the one person on campus making good grades at that time. Unfortunately, I wasted all the classes that I was naturally smart at at Texas Tech. And so when I came back to Texas, it was like, oh, shit, got to take my sciences and my Spanishes now. This is not going to end well for me. And it did not. No, no, a little tougher at UT than it is in Lubbock, Texas. Yeah. Me thanks. Me thanks. All right, uh, we'll shift gears here. Keep the text coming. The code of text line, 512-222-9328. Of course, the YouTube comment line, alive and well. Uh, Texas basketball, we want to hear from you, your thoughts on last night's game and uh, your predictions for the rest of the season. Once again, just one more regular season game left for the Horns this Saturday against Oklahoma. Longhorns will go for the season sweep of OU after knocking them off in Norman a couple of weeks ago. Uh, before we shift gears, though, and get into some of the other stories we have planned today, we'll give some uh, sponsor shout-outs, and we will start with a TV spot from our friends over at Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. 
Our newest location in the gorgeous Hill Country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Colbert, born and raised in Austin. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Many thanks to the Covert family. Also, a shout out to Altstad Beer, the best beer that you could find all throughout the great state of Texas. Uh, one more shout out to Altstad for footing the bill for the 30th birthday bash this past weekend at Kelly's Irish Pub. Had a great time out there. Uh, Altstad was flowing, and hey, it's the best beer in the world. So, uh, get you some HEB specs, twin liquors, total wine, 34 wine and spirits, wherever you normally buy your beer, you can find Altstad beer. And it's also popping up more and more at your favorite restaurants and bars throughout the state as well. Every Altstadt is brewed without preservatives, without additives, without unnecessary sugars. So you can feel good about what you're putting into your system. But most importantly, guys, the taste. That's why you keep going back to the beer that you drink. Altstadt has the taste down pat. It's an authentic German beer drinking experience. And every single one of their brews absolutely hits the spot. There's bound to be one or two or three for you. It's Altstadt beer. No impurities. No regrets. Uh, Trey, any strong thoughts? So you want to get to this first? Yeah, Roy says, hope the bug didn't live in your eye for three years. No, it remained dead in my eye for three years. My eye fluid was like formaldehyde, keeping it whole. Ew. Yeah, I feel like uh, if it was living, it would have flown out, right? The issue I was did. that it died, so it was just kind of stuck in there. It was stuck, yes. Yeah, that's gross. Um, any thoughts on this Arch Manning NCAA football video game story? Anwar Richardson of Orange Bloods tweeted out last night that Arch Manning is expected to opt out of the EA Sports NCAA football franchise, which of course returns for the first time in a decade later this year. That tweet went viral, and everything that has to do with Arch Manning is going viral these days. Uh, any thoughts either way on that reported decision? It's a little bit surprising because up to this point, Arch Manning has not been very showy with his decisions. And even though you could take this as, well, he's trying to focus on the football side of things. It, it, if this is true, he is making a little bit about the Arch Manning brand versus saying, no, I just want to be a part of this. Like all my teammates are. Yeah, I'll be a backup quarterback. Or maybe it's him trying to use leverage to get a better deal. I think all those things are on the table right now. I think the least likely line of whatever this turns into is him not being in the game. Like, I don't think it's him saying, oh, I don't want to be in the game because I want to focus on football. There's something else going on here. It could be Anwar Richardson reporting something that's not true, which I don't necessarily believe that's the case. I'm just running through all the options here. Or it could be him trying to gain leverage and whatever amount they think that EA should pay him to be a part of this coming year's game. Yeah, that will happen at some point with somebody, right? I don't know if Arch is going to be the first guy to complain about the money for the video game. But at some point, some superstar player in college football is going to be like, why am I making the same as the 85th scholarship player on Western Kentucky? You know, like what's going on here? Nobody's going to try to play with that guy. No one's going to buy the game for that. They're going to buy the game so they can use me, Caleb Williams, just to use an example. So at some point that will happen. But I, I think this just falls in line with what Arch and the Manning family have said since day one, that Arch is not going to take a dollar in NIL money until he's a starting quarterback at Texas. Like, I, I think that's what this is because every player in the game gets 600 bucks and a copy of the game, and I guess this is just Arch saying, like, no, I've turned down every other NIL deal that I've had, basically, to this point, except for that one trading card where he donated all of the money to charity from the uh, from the proceeds of that. Maybe it's just Arch trying to do that again and saying, hey, this is an NIL deal, and I don't want any of those. See, I've been told, and take this with a grain of salt, I've been told by people behind the scenes that the him not taking a dollar in NIL money isn't exactly true either. It's just these announced deals or these, these mega hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars 
deals that they're not necessarily going down those sorts of roads. But you may be right about that. Perhaps it is as simple as them saying, we're not, we don't want to do this. We don't want to put, put any attention on him until he is this team starting quarterback. Uh, by the way, guys, there is a chance he becomes this team starting quarterback at some point in 2024, even mm -hmm. if temporarily, because he is now Quinn Ewers backup and Quinn has missed multiple games each of the last few years with injuries. Yeah. I think you hit the so, nail on the head. Yeah. With what you said at the start, sorry to cut you off there, but I think you were perfect with, you know, he, he's trying to not bring attention to himself, but he is bringing a lot of attention to himself. I, I don't know if Arch ever wanted this out there, by the way, but like the fact that this is out there is bringing unnecessary attention to a guy who doesn't seem to want unnecessary attention. And it's not fair, but that comes with the territory. When you have that last name, like you got to know. And by now he should know after what happened in that tech game, the fact that the loudest cheer of a 50 point beatdown of a rival that got you into the big 12 championship game was when you came in as the third string quarterback to make your college debut like that, that should tell you that, Hey, everything I do is going to be psychoanalyzed. So even if this was an attempt to not be a distraction, it's becoming a distraction by saying something about this. And yeah, Rex, there are a lot of people who have been told things. And yes, that's why I said take it with a grain of salt. But the people that I talk to by, behind the scenes have an incredible track record. So I share that information with you knowing that. I'm not just taking it from two, some two-wit moron. I'm not saying like you, Rex, but some two-wit moron who says something online. I'm not running with that sort of information. So understand yeah. that uh, sourcing does matter too, even if I'm not telling you explicitly where it's coming from. I have heard it from somebody that I do put a lot of trust in and yeah. a couple of some, somebody's for that matter too. So again, take it with a grain of salt, but also know that that specific line may not necessarily be completely true beyond the Panera deal. The um, Panera deal, Panini deal. Panini, there we go. <laughs> He's doing a Panera bread deal. I'm, I'm out on the, uh, the trading card bit. I know that a lot of people are in that bit. Jeff Howe's a big trading card guy, and there are a lot of other people who are in the thick of that. But yeah, my my time with trading cards is a lot of is like a lot of people's time with video games. It ended when I hit my teenage years. Mm. You can get paninis at Panera, just for the record. So can you? Classic mix up. Yeah, I think so. Not uh, the trading cards, but the sandwiches. I think. Hey, uh, uh, do you have anything else that you wanted to add here? Because I do have another video game related story. Yeah, real quick, just looking at Anwar's tweet, the last sentence of it reads, I'm told Arch is focused on playing football on the field. Like, if, if someone from the Manning camp told Anwar Richardson that, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like, that makes it sound like Arch is thinking he'd have to miss practice to go work out for EA in the video games. Like, dude, you're, you're already in the game, you know? focused on playing football on the field. You don't have to change your focus at all. They're going to put you in the video game. What does that even mean? Focused on playing football on the field? Yeah. If you don't want to buy the video game, that's fine. But being in the video game, you don't have to do anything different to be in the actual game. EA Sports, it's in the game. You're in the game. You can focus on spring ball and getting better in real life and still be a member of the video game. So, uh, yeah, whoever, whoever leaked that to Anwar like made Arch Manning look even stupider. It's one thing to just opt out, but for that to be your reasoning, like he's getting dunked on for that. That's, that's just bad by whoever threw Arch under the bus like that. Anwar could be helping the Mannings do their bidding. That's out there now. And so EA realizes how important a figure Arch Manning is for the return of this video game. So they may be willing to up their offer. Now they may have thought that, they didn't need to necessarily pay him ambassador money to be a part of the game like they do Quinn Ewers and Carson Beck. And there's a handful of other guys that it's already been determined that they are going to be ambassadors for this game. You should try pretty hard to turn Arch Manning into one of those sorts of guys too. I mean, we know national outlets that try to cover this Texas football team by tying things to Arch Manning, even though he was this team's third string quarterback this last year. Uh, my friend Sam Paniotovich, who you know as well, was told by his Fox Sports bosses in between the end of the regular season and that college football semifinal matchup with Washington, hey, we need you to put 
an article together having to do with Arch Manning, the future of Texas football. And he's like, dude, I have it on good uh, information here that Quinn Ewers is going to be this team's starting quarterback next year. And the editor at Fox News, Fox Sports was like, I don't care. We need to tie it into Arch Manning because Arch Manning is what gets the clicks. So ESPN knows, even though this game is going to be a bestseller regardless of whether Arch Manning is in it or not, that they are better off if Arch Manning is a part of things. And to do that, they're probably going to have to pony up a little bit more than 600 bucks in a free game. Now, mm. if Arch Manning really didn't care that much about the NIL side of things, he'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm just one of the guys here. So we're just going to go 600 in the free game. But mm. uh, the Mannings are, are much too smart for that. And they realize that this is uh, the first really big opportunity that he has that he may also take two other than that Panera deal, the, uh, the the sandwich trading card deal that he took uh, a couple months ago. The Arch Manning half soup, half sandwich combo at Panera Bread coming to you. With bacon, I hear, is what it is. All right, real quick before your other video game story, I just want to announce this. Uh, the Texans are reportedly re-signing tight end Dalton Schultz on a three-year, $36 million contract. So okay. starting to see some... News drop in the NFL. You can't sign with other teams right now, but guys can be re-signed and franchise tags can be placed and guys can be cut. Uh, there's your first sort of big news with a Texas team is that uh, pending free agent Dalton Schultz will no longer be a free agent because he's going back to Houston. And now I'm curious what your video game story was. Okay, so I don't know if CB tweeted this to both of us or all of us or who it, who it uh, was sent to, but thank you, CB for, uh, as usual, being the unofficial associate producer for all of Austin slash Longhorn media, as you are with us right now, and as you are a regular part of the YouTube comment section as well. But how about this, BK? It was shared on Twitter a little bit earlier by MLB's official um, Twitter account, Everyone has major league dreams. Now it's time to unlock them. Announcing road to the show, colon, women pave the way. A new way to play MLB the show's road to the show mode as a female player. Let's see the highlight. Can you hear this? Yeah. When it comes to big league dreams... No two are alike. Some want to swing for the fences. Some want to put on a show. Some want to perform when it's all on the line. And some want to change the game. And it's got the entire sports world taking notice. Whatever your big league dreams, they're yours to unlock in Road to the Show. Unlock your dreams. Own the show. All right. So the show is going to have the option to be a female player that makes the big leagues. Thoughts? Um, fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantasy. It's fantasy. I, I don't care. I mean, they've got this road to the show mode. Where you want to talk about, oh, women in Major League Baseball, that's unrealistic. Well, you know what else is unrealistic is you sitting on your couch becoming a big league player who hits 400 with 75 home runs and 200 RBIs in a season. Exactly. I, I'd also argue that that's unrealistic. So, yeah, you that's know, fine. unrealistic. A Shetland Pony being able to dress up in a Major League Baseball uniform, much less actually hit well enough to make it to even single A, much less all the way through the minor league system. And become a member of the Houston Astros. What movie is that? I assume that it's an option that you can have in MLB The Show. Oh, Just take random talking. animals and have them turn into baseball stars. Do you get emotional support pets as part of this mode? Apparently so. You get to choose what animal you fly with as part of your customization in this game now. You get a translator and everything. <laughs> Hillary <laughs> Swank is apparently the translator for the horses. There you go. Or uh, Derek Jeter's wife, because she can talk to horses. Oh, that's true, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm fine with this. Now, the first uh, female pitcher I go up against is, you know, I'm taking her 450 feet to center field. But, you know, I got no problem with uh, with them being in the game. That's that's cool. 
What about non-binary baseball players? Like, we got to make sure everybody feels included, though, right? Sure. Okay. Now, butt slaps have been a part of past baseball video games. Is the butt slap still an option in this one? Because that's where things could get a little bit dicey. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I assume that MLB The Show would remove that feature. If you call it a feature. Maybe that animation is a better word for guys to gals and gals to guys on the field. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Does this encourage you to buy this game, Trey? Oh, no, I'm not buying another baseball game. I've got plenty on my hands with FIFA and soon to be the uh, the new college football video game minus Arch Manning. There you go. Yeah, I'll stick to MVP Baseball 2005. I think that's the I last baseball game that I've purchased. I did used to love on NBA 2K. Gosh, this would have been, I think, the PlayStation 2 version of this game. On NBA 2K, you had the ability to create a player. Creating the fucking fattest point guard imaginable. Yeah. Who had crazy skills and just have him dominate the league. So yep. part of me thinks that it would be fun to create a female player and have her work her way through the minor leagues. And I mean, she is she makes Cecil and Prince Fielder looks felt. You know? <laughs> have a, yeah, have I mean, a big fat lady dominate yeah. baseball. Uh, that's you're right. I mean, that's what everybody does with the create a player mode, right? They either make the guy really short or really tall and they make him look as ridiculous as possible. And it's like, there's no way somebody that looked like this could ever have any sort of success in a professional sport. Yet they're the best player in the sport because you're playing on rookie and you've got all the sliders adjusted in your favor. And then there are going to be some guys out there who complain. This ain't realistic. Get the broads out of the game. I mean, yeah. my my point guard, dude, I'm not even kidding you. He was like 5'7", 350 pounds. He had a blonde afro. He had a headband. He wore Rex Specs. And his name, he wore the high socks to his knees. And his name was Richard Head. Yes, I'm an idiot. Mm, nicely done there. Did, did the announcers actually call him Richard Head? No, they called him Dick for short. Ah, uh, Dickhead. That's good. Yes, nicely done. I'd love to hear Kevin Harlan on the call of uh, of that. That'd be fantastic. Mm. Dickhead, yes. <laughs> no, nah, that's more. That's more Marv Albert. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh man, I just I don't know. Last last thing on this, like, how many women are buying MLB the show? It's like, like there, no, no guy is going to buy this game because of this feature. Now, if you're a guy who's not buying this game because of this, like that's the dumbest thing ever, and get a grip. But like, how many women buy a hundred a year? Will this increase the number to a buck twenty, a buck fifty? It's just, I, you know, I don't play this game every year, so I'm not the guy who's like, oh, I wish they would focus on fixing this feature instead. Like, I don't know what's right and what's wrong with the game, but it's just, it, it feels like a headline seeking poll and uh, you know does this is this pub actually going to help them sell the game i, I don't know but that's all i got on that it may discourage some from buying the game and if it's discouraging you from buying the game i i don't know how gung-ho you were to buy the game to begin with yeah great point great point no. all right there's your video game stories of the day with arch manning and with women being in mlb coming soon Monet Davis, look forward to that. How about a word from our buddy Tom McKay over to Audiovisual Consultations? Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audiovisual Consultations. Today's home electronics can be a bit daunting. My company has spent the last 36 years making sure they are not. For those of you who have not experienced our services yet, we'd like to invite you to give us a try for all your home electronics needs. We carry all the major brands of televisions and stereo equipment at prices you can't find in stores. And we come to you. There's no need to leave your home to find great pricing and incomparable service. No traffic and experienced sales geeks or pushy showroom tactics. We believe in having some fun and dreaming big. Do you have a dream for your home entertainment? Let us know. We can make it come true. And we are always there to help after the job is done. We cultivate clients for a lifetime by treating everyone like their family. No, not those family members. I'm talking about the ones you actually like. So relax, hug your kids, make love to your wife, and smile. 
Then, when you have a moment, give us a call at 255-8678. It's 512-255-8678 or online at avconsultations.com. Oh, man. We could have a field day with some of these fake names that people are commenting right now. And Craven Moorhead, I think, was a person that I made up back in the day. (laughs) Well done. Yeah. I think uh, if I was creating a female player, it'd be Ophelia Cox would be her name. Oh, come on. What? Phil McCracken? Is that better? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> oh, there's so many of those. It's been a whole hour just uh, just going back and forth with those names. Uh, real quick before, where are we at in society today? Trey, a uh, thought on our friends over at Big Hat Spirits? Oh, yes. Big Hat Spirits. BigHatSpirits.com. Daneman, I had something teed up a few minutes ago. Let me try and get back to that real quick. BigHatSpirits.com is where you go to check out their website. What can you see at the website? Well, why don't I show you right now? Yes, that's right. So many great flavors uh, from Big Hats and their cocktails in a can. You see the ranch water right there. You see the jalapeno ranch water, the margarita. They have these Big Hat compadres, uh, things like 100% lime, no salt, uh, little mixers that you put on top of the can of that cocktail in a can. Also the chili lime salt as well. More flavors include that prickly pear paloma there on the left, blackberry smoke, the Texas mule, and the margarita mocktail. I wanted to pull this up for a couple of reasons. One, to show you the cans themselves, but also to show you the map that I talk about each and every day when I talk about Big Hat Spirit. So here is the top of the website here. Scroll down just a little bit. There is the map of Central Texas, all the Big Hat icons all over that map. Click the icon that's closest to you to get to the location that sells those big hat cocktails in a can i'm going to click on this one right here that's near me liquor it's on fm620 and uh from there i can go grab those big hat cocktails in a can and you can do the same thing by visiting bighatspirits.com redefining the cocktail in a can about that the screen share for today's big hat spot it's uh using technology to our advantage well done my friend and uh, somebody else you could use to your advantage our guy steve over at pest wranglers we'll let you hear from him right now hey it's steve from pest wranglers and i don't know of a single mosquito that owns a home of the backyard but they sure like to hang out in your yard and make you miserable pest wranglers can fix that for you our mosquito treatments are designed to kill adult mosquitoes as well as keep mosquito larvae from developing for up to three weeks use us all summer or just once before that big party no contract no hassles no blood sucking mosquitoes check out our reviews and see what others are saying about pest wranglers pest wranglers effective reliable affordable online at pestwranglers.com Where are we at in society today? That's right. It is your regular look at stories that show we as a people are headed in the wrong direction. Very occasionally, I will bring you a story that provides a sense of optimism that has us all saying to ourselves, hey, maybe we as a people are starting to figure something out. But sadly, today is not that day. As I look at our friend Jack, who adds another name to the fray here, Dr. Howie Felter Snatch, MD, just in case the doctor didn't clue you in, Howie Felter Snatch is an MD on top of being a doctor as well. CB with the Ivana. Hump a lot. Mm. Bang D ow. <laughs> the pilot, Bang Ding Ow. Ah. Missing flight along with We Too Low. And some Jack, won't. the answer is potentially yes to whether Cooter is hiring. I think the last time he and I talked about this, the answer was yes. So if you want to get in touch with him, get in touch with me behind the scenes, and we'll make that happen. I'm going to send a uh, resume in as Dixon B. Tween her legs. Everyone's favorite childhood what? movie star. What does the B stand for? Uh, between. <laughs> Dixon between her her legs Dixon between tween her legs <laughs> uh yeah there's an echo in here I guess <laughs> oh no all right well we have a few minutes for where are we at and I'm just gonna warn you people the next couple of weeks where are we at is is gonna be even sloppier than usual because I am in full south by southwest swing spoke with former NBA player Evan Turner a little bit earlier 
try and maybe get that on these airways before the end of the week. He's going to be a part of South by this weekend. A podcast he does with Andre Iguodala. It's called the Point Forward Podcast, and they've got a live episode coming up where they're speaking with Megan Rapino. And uh, we talked a little bit about that, but got into a lot of other stuff as well. So stay tuned. Check it out through Texas Sports Unfiltered for some of these conversations, but also my podcast, booksonpod.com. But I do have a headline for today, BK. Headline! Headline! Strip club worker charged after allegedly hitting customer with a stack of cash when he refused to tip dancers. You're going to be shocked by this, but the story comes from Florida, where Mm -hmm. a strip club employee was arrested for allegedly smacking a drunk customer with a stack of cash after he refused to tip customer, uh, the dancers rather, as the headline says. Victoria Jones is 28 and was charged with misdemeanor battery and admitting that she picked up a small stack of money and threw it at the customer at the Body Talk Topless Club in Port uh, Port St. Lucie, according to court documents. The arrest affidavit did not say if Jones was a stripper or had another job at the club. So why don't we take a look at the picture so you can decide for yourself. Mm. She didn't hit him with a roll of quarters, right? Just a stack of money. Thank Could've goodness it was just a stack of money. Roll of quarters would have done much more damage. And did you say she threw it at him or she hit him? Threw it at him. Is that, does that hurt? Do you have to press charges? I mean, I guess some people are just trying to get money, so there's probably a window to win a lawsuit there. But does that, does that hurt? Someone throws money at you? Depends on how thick the stack is. All right, so I have to ask you now, stripper or cocktail waitress? What do I think she is? Yeah, based on this picture. Uh, I'll say cocktail waitress. Yeah, that's what it seems like to me, too. Like, she could be a stripper, though. Like, but oh. they was they said worker, right? We worker. get a little bit of a description here. Police found her in the back office, and she was wearing all black at the time that she was apprehended by Florida police officers. So, all black leads me to believe that she was, in fact, a cocktail waitress and not a stripper. Hmm. Yeah, or a busser. She wasn't a busser. Manager? She was in the back? Could she have been a manager? Just like hearing reports from her dancers about how this guy just kept coming in every night and never left a tip. Maybe she just got fed up. She was like losing dancers because of it, so she wanted to stick up for her staff, something like that. I usually skip this part. (laughs) Busser damn near tipped her. The accuser, his name is John McKelvey, he's 24, no relation to Ron, told police that the dancers, quote, were upset that he had not provided them any tips, but said he, quote, did not see any signs stating it was mandatory to tip. What a fucking scumbag. Mm. Boys were upset that McKelvey had not thrown any money at them, with was com- which was common practice at the establishment. Yeah, it is a strip club after all. Upset, Jones then slapped the victim twice and spit on him. Ooh, maybe she is a stripper, the report stated, with cops seeing a red mark on his face. Jones then told officers that the customer, quote, was drunk and being rude and had been following employees from table to table, verbally insulting them. Jones said they were messaging around as she picked up a small stack of money and threw it at him, telling officers, this is a place where money is thrown everywhere that's true however surveillance footage shows the employee threw the cash and then immediately followed up by slapping his face then leaning toward him as if she was spitting according to an affidavit she was released from jail after posting a 500 hundred dollar bond is reportedly set to be arraigned next week you got to pay extra for the spit now do you she just threw that in for free after she was mad that he wasn't giving her any money? Oh, you're saying he needs to pay extra for the spit. Yeah, some people will pay extra to be spit on, won't they? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if this if that's true, I don't know if we believe her because you just said the police footage kind of disagreed with part of her reporting, so I don't know if we believe the first half of her reporting. But if this dude was just heckling women, sitting there, getting drunk, and not spending any money, then I get why worker would get pissed off. Now, you could probably just ask them to leave instead of doing all of this. 
You can just get security over there to just pick this guy up and kick him out. That that would have been an easier solution, and I don't think the cops would have been called if you did that instead. But I see uh, if that's true, I, I sense why she was upset that all this was going down. Look, if you're going to go to one of these places, respect the fact that a lot of these women grew up without a strong male role model in their household. And desperate times call for desperate situations and act accordingly. Yeah. Do the courteous thing if you're going going to go there and give the occasional dollar bill to this woman who likely has a couple of kids at home or a serious drug habit that she's trying to support. Yeah. Don't be the asshole is going around verbally abusing these girls as they are uh, having to take their clothes off in front of you, you scumbag. I felt like verbal abuse with all those stereotypes towards these women. Goodness. I have one late entry to today's Where Are We At? We don't have time to today for to, for it today, but I am going to read you the headline. Okay. Headline! Headline. Las Vegas hotel guest stung on testicles by scorpion while sleeping. Quote, it felt like sharp glass. That is tomorrow's edition of Where Are We At in Society. Very good. Looking forward to that. We just need Bucky in this strip club. Does he still have his uh, scholarship fund over at the Yellow Rose? Ooh, I think that there. expired back in the early to mid 2000s, maybe. Okay, I was gonna say he could help uh, foot the bill for for this woman who's upset that she's not getting paid enough on the job. JD is guessing manager for this oh, yeah. woman too. Yeah, I think there's a chance that that happened. I think this guy's punishment or her punishment should be just this guy gets to keep the cash. I think that's it. I think that's the wash. The money that was thrown towards him, he gets to keep. And that's it. Like, I don't know if he even spent any of that money. It sounds like he didn't pay any of that. So he's basically getting free money in a paid for night at the club. But that should be enough. I don't think uh, anyone should go to jail for something like this. I don't think. There should be anything serious that happens. If it was just a little money toss and a slap in the face, I think right. it's no harm, no foul. Should just be a wake up call for this jabroni to uh, make sure he's actually doing what you're supposed to do at those places. Wake up call indeed. If you don't want to pay, then just, you know, there's free stuff online. Just watch at home. That's what you're looking for. But you got to pay if you're going out to those places. Agreed. You know, I'm going to Vegas in a couple of weeks. So now I'm very intrigued, but also slightly mortified to hear. Tomorrow's edition of Where Are We At in Society. Well, you know the headlines. So brace yourself. I will. I will indeed. All right. I see one half of Chip and Zay. Our man Zay Collier is here right now. What's going on, Zay? What's up, fellas? I guess our hey. guy bootleg Doug Flutie didn't get your text last week talking about being on time. What, what the hell's mm. going on? Yeah. Yeah. I'm coming at him like that. Like, who does he, who's he think he is, man? He didn't even go to Baylor last night. Mm. Come on. Go What's he doing? Bootleg ass, Doug Flutie, I believe was the <laughs> exact terminology he used yesterday. Ah, speak of the devil, bringing up his bogus ass stats. What? Come on, man. I got to see the arm. <laughs> what are you, you talking know? about bogus ass stats? Yeah, the stats that you were throwing out yesterday. You and Clarence Chill Hill <laughs> putting up Brady, Randy Moss numbers. Come on, man. I need to see some film. I feel like it's kind of a Wilt Chamberlain going for a hundred situation. Like, where the hell's the film? Mm -hmm. Did it really happen? Or did mm -hmm. Wilt I got, just I got take film. it? Okay. I got film. Newey okay. Scruggs put it on his sports cast. There is like news footage of it. <laughs> Do you have that? Yeah, I do. I got to get it off of a VHS tape. God. Don't you worry. I'll do it. Now I've I'll been challenged. I've been meaning to do it. Now it's going to happen. Let's see it. We, we need that on TSU. That'd be perfect. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a do-rag. I'm wearing a do-rag. <laughs> For what? Because <laughs> I was balling. Fool, because Moose Johnston was coaching the other team and we were lighting him up. We Ooh. even have like a cutaway of Moose Johnston saying, uh, you might even want to roll the pocket. They're doing that with some success. Yeah, 
I was doing that. <laughs> Flutie. Chip Beeman over here with the do-rag going on. Oh, yeah, I was the MVP. I got my picture with the Miller Lite girls. It was it was awesome. Okay. Oh, you asked Michael Penix. The do-rag helps, man. Oh, yeah. Dude was oh, yeah. I wore, do-rag at the combine. I wore a do-rag for all my tennis matches. I mean, I was kind of a – Oh, boy. I was kind of a punk. <laughs> but I was winning all the time then. Now I'm old. Now I just uh, remember the good old days. That's glorious. Oh, my oh, God. God. All right. We'll what get else you got for me? Shoot. Oh, a lot. I was a about lot. to say, I, I was already excited to listen, but now it might be one of those can't miss shows. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. We got Hummer. We got Hank. We got me talking about my MVP days. Zay talking about Rock the do rag on the show one day. (laughs) Okay, I will. (laughs) Yeah, I'm ready for that day. Uh, Might be, uh, might even be tomorrow. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's happening. No. All right, fellas, appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all, fellas. Appreciate y'all. Hey, in the immortal words of Judy Brown. Happiness is a choice, and we're happy you're spending some time with us on a wild and woolly Tuesday with Chip and Zay holding it down midday right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. One to three, we are your homeboys, keeping it real, the voices of reason. Well, some days, I mean, I'm usually always a voice of reason. Zay. I could be all over the place. You can be all over the place. He can be. He he, but that's, that's what makes it fun. Um, football season never ends. We will definitely talk some spring football with Hummer, Chris Hummer, when he joins us at 1:30. Uh, but Zay last night was um, it was the tale of two halves. Unfortunately, uh, the first half kind of surreal. I mean, Max Acemus couldn't miss. He is just pouring it in. Texas is up by 14 at Baylor. If anyone from the burn orange could have defended Jalen Bridges for a hot second, they might've kept him from going for 32, including six of six from three to start the game. Once again, Rodney Terry starting IT Horton, and Horton played pretty well in the first half and gave you nothing in the second half. And our man Kendall Weaver is rotting over there on the bench. Yeah, he had four fouls, so I, they were trying to, you know, figure that out. He was always in foul trouble throughout the game, like a lot of guys were. I mean, 42 free throws. It's hard to win when the opposing team gets that many and they make 34. I say it all the time. If a team makes more free throws than you shoot, the Horns shot 21, Baylor made 34. What are you going to do with that? Like, that's just, it's bogus. Those refs yesterday were absolutely bogus. If I was Rodney Terry, you got nothing to lose. Might as well go off on them and say, yo, Scott Drew, salute to his team. That's a team that has a chance to go to the Final Four, but that was bullshit. I would have went to the podium. He, and he said that oh. in a nice Coach Terry way. He said, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fouls, and it's hard to get in the rhythm when the game getting mucked up like that. I would have just straight up said, yo, that's bullshit. Ain't no way that should be happening. I get it. They built the arena, so it looks like Allen Fieldhouse, so maybe they could get those Kansas-like calls. That's what it felt like yesterday. It felt like those refs were playing into the Baylor fans and atmosphere. You know, it felt like a little Big 12 screw job, a lot like we saw in football where Texas was the most penalized team in the league and still won it all. Like, that's, that's ironic. And then the teams they played were the least penalized team. Like basketball, it's the same thing. Every team that Texas plays, they're giving up the most fouls in the conference. Like, I get it. They do have some disabilities defensively, but still, like, come on now. There were certain calls that were real ticky-tack in that second half. And, yeah, IT Horton, he hit a couple of shots, and you're kind of like, okay, cool. But Dylan Mitchell, we talked about him yesterday. His job was to guard Jalen Bridges. That's your job. 
Jalen Bridges was lighting his ass up. Him and uh, 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 oh boy, big man Cameroon, they were in pick and roll basically the whole second part of the game, just killing Caden Cedric and Dylan Mitchell to where you have to get Dylan Mitchell out. And if you're Rodney Terry, you got to switch it up and maybe go a zone to stop them in the second half. Stop that 50 points. That's ridiculous. So if the refs are calling it like they are, which is Bush League, I get it. How do you slow it down to give Baylor a different look? Because Scott Drew and that offense, they figured it out. They realized, okay, if the refs are going to call it tight like this, we're just going to attack them for the rest of the game. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have our uh, Ray J. Dennis get where he needs to go on pick and rolls, make good passes. If he has a mismatch to where Max Aceves is on them, post them up and then see what happens. If they double, make the right pass. And that's what they did. But, yeah, you can't have Jalen Bridges do what he did yesterday. That's their fourth option. If your fourth option's getting 32 on you, yo, that's tough. And Dylan Mitchell, that's your assignment, man. If you're going to the NBA next year, which you're definitely entering the draft with how weak it is, probably the weakest draft that we've seen in the last decade plus, then how are you going to expect those guys in the NBA not to challenge you and go at you? If you're Scott Drew, that's what you're saying. 23 is not the best offender. He might look like it. He might have a chance to be, but he don't really want to guard. Challenge him. And Jalen Bridges was like, yeah, because when we played him at the mood and I busted his ass for almost that game winner before Tyrese Hunter had that layup for the actual game winner, I could get anything I want on this guy. And what did we see last night? Six for seven from the three-point line. Went 10 for 13 from the free throw line because he was getting anywhere he needed. Like, that's, that's just unacceptable. And, yeah, the first half was good, and then the second half, everything just went in the shitter. And you think oh. about the timing that Dylan DeSue got injured. Like, that was well, huge, man. That's what I was going to say. I mean, uh, with with 10.50 left, Dylan DeSue is turning to run back up court and crumples to the floor, grabbing his left knee, has to be carried off by two dudes, can't put any pressure on his left leg, and we're waiting on results. Now, Ronnie Terry said... We think he's going to be okay. Chris Budden of ESPN reported it as a knee sprain, which usually means a tiny little tear of a knee ligament. But, oh, good God. Yeah. If it's if it's a significant injury. Uh, yeah. If, if it's a significant injury and they're on the bubble and uh, I'm the committee, I'm not putting them in. Hey, like, come on. I, I, I'm not. Hey, this goes back to what Florida State went through with Jordan Travis. This is that exact same well, situation to me. I know the metrics and it's different and stuff with the net and all that ranking, but there's teams that get screwed over every year. If you're looking at a team that's on the bubble that's fully healthy and you're looking at Texas that's without their best player, I don't want that product in March Madness. Okay, well, hold I don't on. Care if I'm Let's... biased or not. Oh, but the buzz of Bahaba. How about we wait and see how they look against OU? Uh, okay. <laughs> Caden Shedrick. No Home Depot belt for the fourth straight game. Dude's actually shooting at a nice little clip. Had some had some moments. Maybe Dylan Mitchell will pull his head out of his rump roast and play see, like a – That's you hubba bubba than me. Oklahoma's on the bubble. That's not good. Like the committee's probably thinking, damn, this is well, the game that gets the team in. How Texas looks after this pillow fight I, on Saturday at one. I, mm, like that, I think that just the whole just energy with the team once Dylan DeSue got hurt, like they're already coming back. The game 68 62 Texas at the time yeah. of 1050. And then the guy that you know his history with injuries goes down like that. Like, it's hard to think about winning at that time because now you're thinking about the future. Now you're finally starting to figure it out as a team. You beat Texas Tech, big-time game. You beat Oklahoma State. You're just completely rolling Baylor in the first half, and now your best player who has injury problems in history gets hurt, and you see him limping off the court, no ability to put pressure on that leg. I'm, that was ball game. Right after that happened, I was like, well, Texas lost. Just like that. 
This team, yeah. they don't have that, you know, overall mental toughness, especially with a team like Baylor. Like Baylor's good. Let's not sleep that Baylor is just trash or something. No, Baylor is a good team. Jacoby Walker is a freshman that's going to be a lottery pick. Yes, it's a weak draft, but if you're a lottery pick, you're still a pretty good player. Ray J. Dennis might be the most underrated point guard in the nation. Jamal Shedd gets a whole lot of love. Marquette's Tyler Colett gets a whole bunch of love. Ray J. Dennis could lead his team to a national championship. It's all on Bridges. It's all on Nunn. It's all on old Cameroon. But, man, yeah, last night that was brutal. And then just the refs, man. Like, come on, Brock Cunningham, reputation foul. What are we doing? Like, that's that same BS that you saw in the Elite Eight game when Brock Cunningham's boxing out. Legal basketball move, that big-ass dude from Miami who completely jumps over his back. And then what do the refs do? They call it on Brock Cunningham. Why? Because it's Brock Cunningham. We got to get that out the game. We have to get that out the game. LeBron James just went over 40,000 points. In reality, LeBron James should probably have 45,000 points. Why? Because reputation, he's a big guy, so he's, you know, initiating all the contact. But if he gets hit on his wrist, oh, well, he's strong. It's LeBron. Shaquille O'Neal should be second in the whole league in points. But nobody called fouls on Shaq because he's too big. Oh, this and that. If he's getting fouled, he's getting fouled. You know, this whole reputation. Well, Shaq stuff wouldn't have hit focused. the free throws anyway. Uh, you know, he wouldn't have had more of a chance to. <laughs> but would you give my point here? Like, Brock yeah, Cunningham, yeah, yeah. Jacoby Walker slid and then sold it. And then sold it. Jacoby Walker, you're ready for the league, my friend. Leave now. You are ready. He sold the hell out of that. Ain't no way he's flying back five feet from that. He knows it's coming, but he know, he's a smart player. He knows, oh, this is Brock Cunningham. I'm going to fall and see what happens. Flagrant one? Come on, man. I get it. What Brock did last week is Texas Tech flat out dirty. That was dirty as hell. That definitely deserved for him to be booted. Absolutely. What he did last night? Nah, man. That's a bad move. In a very close game, it was 74 70 Five minutes to go. They end up getting the ball back. That's a bad play. That's a bad play. And, yeah, it seems like the Texas Longhorns are starting to get a little Big 12 screwed over on their way out. And, yeah, it's a well, bad time for that to happen. Well, so Shedrick, he played pretty well. He played pretty good D on Misi, too. Misi. Yeah. Only had seven points on two of seven shooting. Ojanua, or whatever his name is, he ended up with, uh, he had uh, 10 points yeah. on four of four shooting. Um, yeah. Baylor out-rebounded Texas. Texas dominated in points off turnovers. Like, they turned Baylor over 13 times and only turned it over five times and outscored Baylor. Um, 22 to seven in, in points off turnovers, but yeah, the air went out of the building when Dazu went down, they were up 13 with 12 minutes left. Then, uh, Dazu goes down at 10 50. They're, they're only up six and then they got boat raced the rest of the way. Um, yeah, that, that team, they do such a good job with their spacing on offense because Texas in the first half, they were doing a great job with their rotations, just helping the helper. If a guy gets beat, there was somebody there to get in the way and muck things up. In the second half, Scott Drew was like, okay, let's run our offense, but let's run it higher. So once the bigs go to set the screen, Caden Shedrick, he doesn't want to go that far up. And once they started putting bridges in that action, you have to because this guy's hit five straight threes. So that's that's when you're if you're Coach Terry, you gotta. I know you're not a zone coach, but you have to have it in the back somewhere. It might be deep down in there with the crumbs and the peppermints and shit. But go, you gotta go deep sometimes. You gotta be able to. You don't know how the game's gonna play. You can't just say, "Oh well, let's just kind of change up what we're doing on man." No. The way the rest were calling it, the way that Baylor was going at you, go to a zone, a little two, three, which we've seen this year. It's not like it's not in the bag. It's not like it's not an option. Go to that. 
Find where Jalen Bridges is. Don't allow him to shoot any more shots and then live with everything else. If they beat that, then, hey, you got to salute your hat to Scott Drew and a championship caliber team. But to not try it, to not try to slow the games down, I thought that was a miss by our team. And you might look at the film and say, man, maybe we could have went in zone. And I don't know. But, yeah, it's it's tough. You were up by 14. I don't care if Dylan DeSue goes out or not. you got to win that game. Well, Dylan Mitchell, I'm tired of talking about Dylan Mitchell in defense because you're right. That was his moment that this was this was your chance to shut down a guy who's killing teams. And he goes six of six from three to start the game. (laughs) Dylan Mitchell. Put out an APB for Dylan Mitchell. Well, come on, man. I, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, I, And the shots that Bridges was making, especially at the beginning, these weren't – he doesn't have like a Kyrie Irving back. He was just kind of walking him into his spot. And Dylan Mitchell, why are you backing up? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, you're too athletic to be backing up or to be just timid from the matchup. Because you know he shouldn't be able to blow by you. That shouldn't be a thing. He wants to shoot that three. And he's shooting the ball with a lot of confidence right now. So you got to get up in his shit, man. Get up in his jock. You got to be able to smell his cologne. That's how, like, tough defense you got to play. But if you're letting him walk into his three, like, that's what guys practice. And he started getting going early. And, yeah, that was it. That was it, which – I guess if you're looking at the scouting report, your job is to probably slow down Walter and Dennis first. But again, (laughs) Dylan Mitchell, you're you're better than that, man. You really are. And yeah, another miss last night. Like a guy that had a perfect opportunity and he killed you last time. He killed them in that January game that Tyrese Hunter had to make that last second shot. Like he shot that step back. Who was it on to tie the game before Tyrese Hunter's shot? Dylan Mitchell. He loves that matchup. Loves it. And if I'm an NBA GM, that terrifies me. Like, yo, this guy doesn't get simple defensive principles. Like, yeah, we're because not, we're not teaching that in the NBA. You should come in already knowing that, you know? And if yeah, you're RT, you're- this goes to you. Like, where's the development? Bridges has been shooting threes all year. It's not like he just – you know, it's not like your scouting report says, oh, just leave him. Yeah. Let him shoot that. No, he, he's gone off on people from three this year. He's That's shooting 42% from three this year. Yeah. And he's, let me see here how many he's attempted for God's sake. I mean, he's, he's attempted well over a hundred. So it's like, you know, and Dylan Mitchell, like you said, he's athletic enough to close out. Yeah. But he doesn't, I don't know, man. He doesn't lock in. I don't ever feel like he's anticipating anything defensively. I don't feel like he's ever in position to do any. He, he's super bouncy. He takes up fakes. He is light on his feet, which allows him to get blown by. Yeah. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, like, and now, like, beforehand, the only positive thing he was really doing on defense was getting steals that led to, you know, breakaway dunks. He ain't getting those no more, you know? Like, he's not <laughs> – those. that's on the scouting report that he likes to gamble on those. So if he overcommits, then just go back door on him, and you'll get him. You know, because he doesn't do the best job of keeping his head on the swivel and turning when his man leaves. He just kind of stays with his head locked in on the ball at times. And yeah, I don't know what you do. Like, I, I, really I was don't. like, put freaking Kendall Weaver on the guy then. I mean, even though he's got six inches on him, at least Weaver will use those long arms to try to, you know, make it more difficult. Yeah. Because Mitchell wasn't doing anything. But yeah. that was that was a tough one because you're watching Max Aismas in the zone 
going for 33 and you're like, oh man, are they going to, they're going to waste this. I, I don't know. I'm, you know, me, I'm, I'm wary of starting it Horton because if he hits some shots and he, like I said, he did okay. He had, he let him in rebounds and at one point, I think he had, you know, six points, six rebounds, pretty early in the first half. And then he finished with eight points and nine rebounds, but you didn't have Weaver in the flow at all. And you're right. He had two first half fouls, but he wasn't in the flow at all. And I don't know. I don't know what you, I, I, I T Horton is great to me in the middle minutes. Like, I need Weaver to start the game, set the tone defensively, then, you know, bring in IT Horton. If he's got it going, great. If not, I want him out, though, with four minutes to go in the first half, and I want him out with four to six minutes left in the game because that guy never hits shots when it matters. So I, I, don't, I don't get that RT can't see that. If, yeah, if I mean I... – if you're losing, if, if they're just, that was a 14-2 run, you got to put some defense in there. You know, I mean, and yeah. we wasn't even in there for that. It just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, you're, you're just hoping that IT Horton does what he came here to do, and that's shoot the ball well. Like, he just, a lot of that erases the defensive liability that he can be or just kind of being invisible out there if you knock down shots like coach terry is waiting on that because they need that if they want to make a run they're going to need it horton to knock down something because there's going to be games where kendall weaver doesn't shoot the ball well or tyrese hunter or max ace etc um but yeah i don't know i don't know where you spread it out with because Yesterday with those fouls, you had to play them, and Dasu came in with the stomach bug, and now you got the injury. Yeah, that was what was so amazing. I mean, Dasu barely played in the first half, and Texas was up 14. Let's check in with our man, Hummer, national college football writer for 24-7 sports. Hummer, did you watch this uh, Texas Baylor basketball game last night? I Yeah, I did, unfortunately. Got to yeah. see the yet. Uh, most of the second half there, um, I guess when you're basically playing with your best player shorthanded, it's hard to pull that game off, uh, what they had to do, but certainly a disappointing loss for Texas. Yeah. What do you, what do you make of this team? Uh, they're streaky. Uh, it's kind of, I guess kind of what you've come to expect from Texas in Big 12 play. I think they've shown flashes where they can compete with the best teams in the conference, but they're just not a consistent enough um, in difficult situations to pull a lot of these games out, unfortunately. Hey, Hummer, are you surprised by this stat I'm about to throw at you? Longhorn opponents in basketball are averaging the most free throw attempts in the conference, and this past season in football, the they were the most penalized team and then the opponents that they play were had the fewest penalties on average. Is that surprising it's at all? Theory theories day today on a Tuesday. <laughs> I like it. No, both sports though. Come on, man. That's just I, I hate being that guy. I don't want to be that guy. I want to think that all refs are nice, all zebras are good people. There aren't guys out there like a Brett Yormark who just want to see Texas go in the crapper before they go to the SEC. But the stats say something different. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's not hurting the women's basketball team or the uh, baseball team so far. I'll say that. But um, I, don't, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I watch this Texas basketball team quite a bit. They foul all on their own quite frequently, so I don't really know if that's on the refs. Um, I think it's a lack of consistent interior protection more than anything and guards who have trouble staying in front of people consistently. Um, so no, but the, I mean, I get it from Texas fans perspective. Like you're on your last legs of the conference. Um, your football team was victorious on the way out. You're hoping for results from basketball and I can understand why they flash out of that. Yeah. 
that uh, baseball team. They need they need some pitching. Oof. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, Hummer, fourteen days to Texas spring football, and Texas has a lot to replace, especially on defense. I mean, obviously on offense, but of course they brought in a cavalcade of receivers, but replacing Jalen Ford. I find this to be very fascinating because you've got, got Anthony Hill, who's can probably do anything. David Benda, 60 year senior. You got Kendrick Blackshire who comes in from Alabama, who was a higher rated defender by PFF than Tresman Marshall, who started at middle linebacker last year. You've got Mo Blackwell trying to bulk up so he can play middle linebacker. And Leonga Lafau, who Jeff Choate called an elite pass dropper and called him a true middle linebacker. Your thoughts? I like the position, although I suppose there are some question marks there. I really like Lafau. I've heard great things about him, um, obviously. The praise in the media has also been really strong for him uh, via the coaching staff. Um, Anthony Hill's obviously a building block, and you're right. I think he can do whatever you ask him to do. He could be an edge rusher if you really needed him to full-time. Um, he's that talented. And I think by bringing in Blackshire, Blackshear, uh, which the Texas coaches did, you provided starting caliber depth at that position. He might end up starting. He might not. But I think that's Texas shoring up an area with a bit of a question mark in terms of um, experience on the roster. Um, if you're Texas, you probably don't feel as good about this position as you do maybe edge after this uh, offseason work that you did. Um, but I think it's a pretty solid position for Texas. And there are some really high ceiling players who could potentially take a leap. Yeah, Homer, you talk about the edge position, and it was good, not great. Baron Sorrell, he was solid. Ethan Burke, he was solid. Both of those guys expected them to have a big time 2024. But, you know, you bring in guys like Colin Simmons from Duncanville, and you bring in guys like uh, Trey Moore from UTSA, and I – you want to get back to just those days where you had guys like Joseph Osai and stuff. Do you think any of those guys could make a big jump in the 2024 to push Texas forward in the SEC and kind of solidify Pete Krakowski's defense? Well, I mean, I, if Ethan Burke, we've talked about this before, if Ethan Burke can continue his progression uh, that he had from 2022 to 2023 and bring that into 2024, he could, be the best edge rusher Texas has since Joseph Osai. He could be the best edge rusher Texas had since um, Charles Amenahu, potentially. Um, not quite as big as Amenahu, obviously, but he's got plenty of size coming off that edge position. We saw flashes last year. Um, he's obviously a high ceiling player. Baron Sorrell was solid last year, as you mentioned, and he's a great rotational piece, um, potential starter or depth piece. And then in Trey Moore and Colin Simmons, I think you have two really high ceiling guys. Um, Trey Moore, I know Chip has mentioned this before. Um, I'll be curious to see him transition into the SEC. Um, he feasted against some of the lesser competition in the American last year. But when you talk about somebody with all the measurables, um, height, length, um, bend, explosiveness, like he lines up and matches up in those areas. And he provides Texas a punch there that I think they've been missing, especially at that buck position. And you can say the exact same thing about Colin Simmons. Um, that guy was born to pass rush. Um, he has the ability to do so at a rate that's pretty unique and pretty rare, especially given what Texas has had the last decade or so at the edge position. It's been a really long time, at least in my opinion, since Texas has had a true superstar edge rusher and Colin Simmons has that potential. Um, so with those four pieces, I think Texas is in a really good position to have much better edge production than they have in a couple of years. Yeah, it's interesting that Pete Kwiatkowski coaches the ends. And I'll be interested to see if if that changes with Kenny Baker. You know, Bo just coached the interior 
D lineman Kwiatkowski coached the ends, and you know that's kind of a interesting little quirk there. Um, the fact that you've got Kenny Baker as a new position coach, Johnny Nansen as a new position coach, also adds intrigue to those position groups because what we might have known about where guys stood with the previous position coach is kind of out the window as the new position coach gets to evaluate and put his mark on everything. So, you know, and the, and the players have to adjust to that coach. I mean, Sarkeesian has done a good job, certainly replacing guys on offense, but now he's replacing guys on defense. And, you know, we know those guys in the interior D line trusted, loved Bo Davis. Now they got to trust and love Kenny Baker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and coaching transitions, I feel like in college football, people assume they're always going to be seamless. Um, and that's probably a poor assumption, but that's not, that's not always the case for college football playoff teams. What Nick Saban did for more than a decade was very much abnormal. Um, the ability to have your entire staff transition, to turn it over and to keep going. Um, Texas is fortunate in that they've lost some key position coaches. Don't get me wrong, but they're not having to have coordinator overhauls and scheme overhauls at the same time. Um, they've avoided that for the most part, even though losing Jeff Cho is certainly a big blow to the defense. Um, so from that perspective, Texas is in better shape than a lot of teams that saw significant staff turnover in that way. But you're absolutely right. Like Kenny Baker is going to teach a different way than Bo Davis. Kenny Baker is going to have different priorities than Bo Davis. Um, and that can be an adjustment for players. So um, it definitely opens up the depth chart. Um, and it's also going to create some question marks going into the spring uh, for both the players and coaches alike as they sort through what the what both parties really need and like in the position. Well, CB says, Chip, I hope LaFoul's good because you've been hyping him up since TSU started. I haven't really been hyping up LaFoul. That might be Jeff Howe because I'm not I'm not sure about LaFoul yet. Like, I wasn't blown away with the 46 snaps that he got Last year, I, I felt like he was hold. He wasn't, you know, he was timid, which is, you know, young players learning whatever. I, I need to see more before I throw out any rousing endorsements. I'm I'm higher on Kendrick Blackshire probably than most, because I talked to some people at Alabama who felt like Nick didn't get his NIL money's worth from Tresman Marshall coming over from Georgia, um, and and may have stuck with a guy who, you know, that maybe Blackshire should have gotten more reps. He was the highest rated defender on the Alabama defense last year, according to PFF in 106 snaps, but he had good, good ratings the year before too, Hummer. So I felt like, I feel like that Kendrick Blackshire is kind of an under the radar pickup among the transfers, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, he's somebody that played at a really high level in short bursts last year. Um, I think Nick Saban is often concerned more about where a player is going to be positionally, specifically at the linebacker position, um, than production sometimes. And the lack of playing time can sometimes be a reflection of um, the way they click within that defense, um, linebackers especially. Critical in that regard for Alabama, that Mike Linebacker position. So I think that had a little bit to do with it. But when Kendrick Blackshire was on the field, he absolutely performed. And um, I don't think it ever hurts if you're a Texas, um, if you're Texas, to bring in a Duncan, former Duncanville uh, superstar on the team too. Um, it never hurts for your long-term perspectives uh, recruiting that school. And I think Kendrick Blackshire is somebody with a really high ceiling that um, if things click for him, could be an excellent addition. Uh, to that defense. And there's a reason why 24 seven sports gave him a four-star transfer rating 
despite playing, I'm sorry, a high three-star transfer rating, despite him only playing 130 snaps last year, there's a belief that if things really click into place, he can be a difference maker. Hummer, there's now a stigma going around with Texas and what we saw at the Combine this past weekend of how well these Texas athletes did, like Xavier Worthy breaking the record, and JT Sanders looking as good as he did, et cetera, et cetera, that the Longhorns underachieved in 2023. And I get it. Steve Sarkeesian wasn't perfect with some of his play calling, but this is still a team that won the Big 12, got to a college football playoff. Do you think that narrative is valid that a lot of people are throwing around with how successful the Horns were at the Combine this past weekend? I would love to know the people. I mean, like, what did Texas do from 2010 to, like, 2022 that made anybody think last year was an underachievement? Um, I mean – I mean, sure, like you could argue like maybe if Michael Penix doesn't have the game of his life and Texas catches Michigan on the right day, they could have won the national championship. But like you're one of the four last teams standing in college football. You go on the road and you beat Alabama, a college football playoff team in Alabama. You win the Big 12 for the first time since 2009. Like, I don't know how you possibly underachieved. I mean, maybe like. It's a different story, but maybe you remember that like Duke team with RJ Baird and Zion Williamson that yeah. only made the elite eight. They underachieved, right? Like you're talking about one of the most gifted college basketball teams of the last 20 years. Did Texas underachieve? No, I don't think so. Like, it's not like Texas is going to have seven first round picks um, in a couple weeks. Um, it was a very talented roster. I think it's a more talented roster than people gave it credit for going into the year. But do I think they underachieved? Absolutely not. Did Quinn Ewers underachieve as a deep ball thrower? Sure, sometimes, like especially given that speed. Did Xavier Worthy underachieve with his hands sometimes? Yeah, absolutely sometimes. But like Texas did not underachieve as a team just based on NFL combine results. They had the best season for a Texas team since 2009. I think it was a very good year. Yeah. What'd you think of the what'd you think of the combine, Hummer? What did, did you learn anything? Anything uh what were your takeaways? I won't lie. I did not watch a ton, a ton of NFL Combine over the weekend. I was blown away when I saw the Xavier Worthy 40 time. I knew Xavier Worthy was fast. You don't run a 10-5 in high school by accident. But him putting up that time really um, surprised, maybe not surprised me, but it, it was definitely an eye-opener. Um, and I learned that A.D. Mitchell is probably going to go really early in the draft. Um, I know that 4 one really catches – people's attention but ad mitchell being his size and running a 434 with his vertical as well is going to put him on like i think late day one consideration maybe um if the right team wants to make a reach for him although this is obviously a very good receiver draft and somebody like lad mcconkey lad mcconkey from georgia for example i think is also gonna merit late one late day one consideration um he obviously tests that out of, out of out of the world um this week as well um, and I mean, from a Texas perspective, I know it's not like what everybody's talking about coming out of here, but Ryan Watts, I think he had like what a four, one, three, uh, short shuttle, right? Like in the 20 yard shuttle, which is incredible for somebody his size. Um, I'd always, I'd always wondered about Ryan Watts as a horizontal, uh, lateral mover. And that, that time is pretty incredible for him. Somebody his yeah, size. Four, one, three. Yeah. That's anything above, like if you're you're following the short shuttle anything like below like four one five for a skill position player is elite and that's a very elite time for him yeah i'm fascinated to see where he goes and and at what position because he's an athletic specimen i mean his four five three in the 40 isn't terrible for a guy six foot three actually he measured six two and some change 208 but um yeah i'm i'm interested to see how that goes um yeah i mean like six two um four five like six foot two what is he six foot three 208 five inch arms um yeah not bad, not bad. um six foot two um 34 yeah, 34 and a half inch arms yeah, like that's, he's got plenty of length and makeup. Speed. That's like offensive uh, lineman arm length. Yes. Offensive very, tackle. very, very long. Yeah. Um, so I, I think Ryan Watts really helped himself with combine. I think. Yes. Um, Vertical is 42. Yeah. Um, 
this dude, I mean, you showed out. You showed 42 out. 42 with 35 inch arms. Like, um, he's going to win the majority of those jump ball situations, too. Um, like, that is ideal NFL, like, ideal measurements for an NFL DB um, and um, testing time. So, I'll be very curious where he ends up. Texas, Texas really could end up having quite a few day one and day two picks um, when it is all said and done based on the way people tested. What, uh, whose spring football are you keeping an eye on Hummer? Texas is getting a late start on March 19th. <laughs> I I'm going to be honest. This is bad of me to admit like two schools are already done with spring ball and I had no idea. So Hawaii and Liberty are totally, totally finished. So these things are happening. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I'll forgive you. Um, I, there's a, I mean, I think the most interesting spring ball nationally is at Ohio State, um, just because they have a lot of quarterbacks in that room, and I'll be curious to see who stays in that room at the end of it. Um, if you want to talk about SEC schools and what I'm watching, um, I'm very interested about Kalen DeVore's first spring at Alabama. They have almost nothing at defensive back, so I'll be very curious how that room shakes out. Um, if you're a Texas fan, I'd be paying close attention. Um, to a school like Arkansas, uh, which has a lot of question marks right now going into spring, including who's going to be their starting quarterback. Um, I'm very curious about Texas A&M. I think Texas A&M is positioned to be immediately very good. Um, you saw Mike Elko at Duke. Um, Duke was immediately very good under Mike Elko, and he's inheriting what is still a extremely talented roster in College Station. I think they return like the 20th most production in college football and a quarterback I really believe in in Connor Wagman. And I'll be very interested in the Colin Klein experience there as offensive coordinator. So um, a lot of interesting questions this spring across the country. Yeah, Hummer, I just saw y'all dropped on 24-7 Sports, the top 10 rankings for the transfer portal with the teams, and y'all had a and at two. That surprised me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, they lost a lot, but they added a lot as well. I was uh, I was counting earlier. Texas A&M brought in 10 new scholarship defensive backs um, this cycle, um, which is a ton. They totally reset that room. And they also added some key pieces at key positions. Somebody like Cyrus Allen coming over from Louisiana Tech, I think can be a legitimate wide receiver two, wide receiver one for them. Uh, they added Nick Scoriton from Purdue, who led the Big Ten in sacks last year. He's a Brian, Texas native. So from right down the road. And I mean, they were handed a pretty difficult hand at AM with a lot of their best players deciding to go in the portal like Evan Stewart and Walter Nolan. But that new staff did a really nice job keeping the majority of the roster intact. And then they also added in the portal very aggressively, something that Jimbo Fisher, frankly, wasn't really willing to do at times. We talk about Dabo Sweeney not adding in the portal a lot, but Jimbo Fisher, for whatever reason, did not lean heavily on the portal to fill needs late in his tenure. And I think it really cost him and uh, Mike Elko showed no hesitancy in doing so. What do you think of uh, like, when you look at A&M's schedule, um, which I'm calling up on the fly. Um, it's not easy, Chip. They open with Notre Dame um, in college station. So I think they open with Notre Dame and bookend with Texas, right? So for the regular season, that's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting start and finish in College Station. Um, yeah, but um, they do means, avoid. I think they do avoid Georgia and Alabama next year, so that is a pretty big plus for Anna. No Georgia, no Alabama. They get Missouri in College Station, LSU in College Station. They play at Florida, at Mississippi State, at South Carolina, at Auburn. And their other non-conference games are McNeese, Bowling Green, and New Mexico State. So that, uh, what do you, what are your thoughts on Notre Dame going into next year? Well, first, I just want to say by SEC standards, it's an extremely favorable schedule. It was uh, incorrect in my assessment there. They don't play a single ranked team on the road next year, and um, at least preseason wise. So if Mike Elko can get things going pretty quickly, that's a possible college football playoff team. Um, in my yeah. opinion, uh, with the talent on that roster. Man. Texas doesn't play uh, a ranked SEC opponent on the road next year either. Yeah, I would say if you go look at the schedules for next year, 
Hey, you're looking at potential contenders in the SEC. Texas, Texas A&M, and Missouri all drew, drew pretty favorable roads. Oh, I'm sorry, not Texas, Texas A&M. Texas, Texas A&M, and Ole Miss all drew very favorable roads um, with the 2024 playoff being an interesting wrinkle going to 12. So that'll be something interesting to track. Um, as for Notre Dame, I think it really depends on how Riley Leonard um, evolves and adjusts in that Notre Dame offense. Um, I think the pieces around Notre Dame next year are very strong. Um, they bring back... Um, a good chunk of their roster and they had a really strong transfer portal hall. Um, they were very aggressive in that way this off season. So I think the Irish are going to be pretty good, but as always, that schedule is really tough and they're going to have to really get a lot out of Riley Leonard next year. Um, if they hope to make it through, um, I think they go at Texas A&M, they get USC on the road, they go to Florida state. Um, so as always, uh, that Notre Dame schedule doesn't really do you any favors, but I think Notre Dame's a preseason top 12, top 10 team, and they can make a run in the playoff as well, given that it's a 12 team uh, event. So if Elko wants to get every, get Aggie land on his side, no time like the, like the opener. Yeah, I feel like if you beat Notre Dame and you beat Texas in year one, Mike Elko might get the statue by the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I would have put it past them. Nah, I would have put it past those Aggies. Hey, Hummer, yeah, it's so easy to look at AM and obviously Oklahoma if you're a Texas fan, but you got another rivalry with Arkansas that you got to play this upcoming season. And Sam Pittman, I think that dude's on the hot seat. You bring Bobby Petrino back to be your offensive coordinator, which we know is history in Fayetteville. What's Arkansas looking like this upcoming season? Uh, there are a lot more. Um a lot more questions and answers about um, Arkansas uh, right now. Um, Sam Pettman's definitely on the hot seat. I would say his seat is scorching going into next year. Bobby Petrino is obviously on campus. And I, I think that's a good hire for Arkansas. He's an excellent offensive coordinator. You saw AM's offense, especially early on when Connor Wagman was healthy last year, have a lot of success. And I don't think Jimbo Fisher's unraveling had anything to do with Bobby Petrino and his ability to call plays. So that was a strong hire, but um, they obviously lose KJ Jefferson, three-year starter. They lose Rocket Sanders, one of the best running backs in college football, the transfer portal. They lost several of their best defensive players to the transfer portal, including a pair of starting linebackers. Um, Taylor Green comes in from Boise State as their presumed starting quarterback, but um, even he was shaky at times at Boise State the last couple of years. Uh, certainly a more consistent runner than thrower at this point in his career. Um, I think Arkansas just had a starting offensive lineman retire today after being an all uh, SEC freshman player last year, um, just because he didn't want to focus on football anymore and just wanted to be a student. So there hasn't been a ton of good news around Arkansas football recently. I still think it's a pretty talented team. And I think the players do like Sam Pittman, but it is going to be an uphill road for them next year in the SEC. Um I think what you're going to see moving forward with the SEC is a lot of those middle of the road teams, your Mississippi States, your Arkansas, your, um, I don't want to throw teams under the bus here, but the programs of that ilk are going to have less and less of those like eight, nine, 10 win seasons just because the schedule is so difficult. And it's a really bad year next year for Sam Pittman to be on the hot seat because it could get really brutal uh, with what they bring back. Hummer, Texas, obviously playing Michigan. Um, September 7th in Ann Arbor, Michigan had 18 guys at the combine. How good is this Michigan team in 2024? Um, I think their defense is going to be really good. I feel very confident about that. Um, they're going to have to keep everybody around in the transfer portal in the spring. Uh, I think that's certainly going to be a question. Uh, there are a lot of players on that roster that I think teams would be very happy to grab. I know there was a report in the athletic, I think a couple days ago that a Michigan player got offered $1.7 million to go in the portal. Um, I would call BS on that one. Uh, nobody's paying $1.7 million um, for somebody on Michigan's roster right now, at least for a season. Um, but there certainly is a ton of interest around that team defensively. 
But based on what they bring back, that is a top 20 defense nationally, no question. Uh, you got future first round draft picks all over that defense. So that unit's going to be good. The question is on offense. I have no idea what they're going to look like. I don't know who their quarterback's going to be. Um, and that's going to be a big part of it. Um, perhaps they have that answered figured out at the end of spring ball. And um, Orgy, the, uh, the quarterback they bring back, I think has a lot of potential as a runner, um, but there are some question marks about him being the starting quarterback and perhaps that quarterback's in the portal, but until that is figured out, I have a hard time judging Michigan right now. Yeah. Hummer, over 10,000 college athletes have opted in the new college football video game that will be out this summer, but one guy made headlines because he did not, and that is Longhorn's backup, keyword, backup quarterback, Arch Manning. I don't think this is a big deal at all, but a lot of people do. Why do you think that is? I mean, his last name is Manning, so everything's going to be a big deal with him. Um, I would, this is what I kind of think about this. It feels like more of a distraction to not be in the game than to be in the game, right? Like we're getting a whole new cycle out of Arch Manning not being in the game. But at the same time, it's not like Arch Manning put out a statement. He's not going to be in the game. So, um, I don't know, like take it or leave it what you will. Maybe maybe the Manning family didn't want like a virtual like Manning versus Quinn Ewers controversy on Xbox Live. Uh, or something. <laughs> I, I, I don't really, I don't have a good explanation about this. Or maybe it's as simple as like somebody like Arch Manning feels like his likeness is worth more than $600, which I, I guess is understandable. But it it's a non-story and if anything it feels like more of a story that he's out of the game than if he would have just showed up in it so but like people are still gonna have fun playing the game and i'm sure arch manning will be fine uh without being in the game too yeah. hummer you're the best we look forward to it every tuesday appreciate Absolutely. you man Absolutely, y'all. See me on those sticks in June and July, guys. Play on NCAA football. <laughs> I got oh, you. Yeah. I appreciate you, man. <laughs> All right, y'all. Hey. Be cool. All right, there he goes. Chris Hummer, National College Football Writer, 24-7 Sports. We'll check in with our man, Hank South. Oh, Arch Here. going Michael Jordan on us. That's what MJ used to do in the 90s. If you tried to play video games like NBA Live, etc., it would have the point guard. Who was the point guard back in Ron Harper? It would have player 89 or something shit like that, which was supposed to be Jordan. That dude was absolutely unstoppable. But MJ was like, no, nah, man, my name is bigger than the game. Y'all better break me off some paper EA Sports. EA Sports was like, no, you're going to get what everybody else gets. If anything at all, Jordan said, nah, and he was out the game. So, yeah, it's, yeah, you still pick Bulls back then, SD. Yeah, you'll still roll with player 99 or player 89, whatever the hell Mike was. But, yeah, Arch, just create the player, man. It's not a big deal. Like, he's the backup anyway. I'm not trying to play with a 75 rating Arch Manning. That's not fun. That guy's going to throw a lot of picks. Even though Arch might be better than that, he hasn't proved it yet. So I'm not trying to play with no backup quarterback anyway, even though I joked on Twitter just to get a little roar on switching those guys in and out, Arch Manning and Quinn Ewers, every possession. But, we're, yeah, he's fine. Let's leave him alone. Like, leave him alone. I, I think it's ridiculous that that story went viral yesterday and people think that Arch is entitled because he's too big for the $600 and this, that, and the third. Like, shut the hell up, people. Just, just enjoy the game when it comes out. And if you want to play with Texas, cool. You don't have to play with Texas. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a video game guy. So I'm like, is this a big deal? <laughs> Yo, wow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I get it. I mean, I know people went nuts when when the EA, EA NCA football went away and um and all that, but yeah, I've just I've never been a video game guy, so that all that stuff just goes Yeah. But you love EA NCA football. Hell yeah. Oh my gosh. Yo. That's it right there, because back when it was coming out, it came out during the summer. 
So you still like or had times to go hang out with the homies like every day during the week while Madden came out when school started. So, you know, you play online and stuff, but my old ass online wasn't really popping back when I was a kid. That's when you had to go old school and go to your neighbors, walk a block or two to go play it organically. But yeah, man, it's somebody's going to make a roster and there's going to be a bootleg arch manning anyway, because you could do that now. He just won't be in the original roster that EA is going to make. So yeah, it's fine. It's not a story. It's not. Everybody just wants to hate on Texas. And this is another way to do it by trying to throw arch manning under the bus, which as Hummer said, he hasn't came out and said, I'm not in the game. You know, but you're starting to see athletes, they'll post on their Instagram or Twitter that they are in the game. And then they'll like hashtag partner of EA Sports or something. Quinn Ewers did that and a whole bunch of other Jalen Milrow, big time players, but, you know, in college football right now. They've done that. Arch hasn't. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. He might change his mind. Who knows? All right. Say another big headline that came down. Overnight, Russell Wilson is going to be released from the Denver Broncos. And if he clears waivers, he would cost whoever picks him up only like a million or two million dollars. The Broncos would have to pick up the rest of the 39 million. Doesn't that make him like an appetizing option for a team like the Raiders or a team that Atlanta. Yes. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. New England. Like, do you go down the list? A lot of teams don't have that franchise quarterback. I'm not saying that Russell Wilson is that, but he has been that before. I still think he's a gold jacket type guy and will go to Canton one day. Yes, he might be a little odd. And, you know, we've heard Dan Neal. Huh? He's a little odd. He's a, he's a little he's different. He's definitely odd. Yeah, we've Dan Neal, we know how he feels about him. You know what I'm saying? And Dan was absolutely right about him being cut. And yeah, I think that has to get cleared up because okay. so this is that out. this is my question, Zay. Does he make sense for the Cowboys at a million dollars? No, hell no. No, no, too much baggage. Why not? Too much baggage. Too much bag. America's team, too much baggage. I don't think so. I don't think so. Does he have a Super Bowl ring? He does. Yes. But he also had one of the greatest defenses of all time on this with his, you know, on his team. That that's that, you know, Cowboys defense is good, but that Legion of Doom, Legion of Boom, whatever the hell they were called, they won them a lot of games with Richard Sherman and Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor and Bobby Wagner. The list goes on. A lot of Hall of Fame guys on that defense. So, I, yes, he's a Hall of Fame quarterback. But now this version of Russell Wilson, I think he's too toxic for what the Cowboys have, which is already pretty toxic. Like CD Lamb's mama be going on Facebook, cussing out Dak and stuff like this. All that, there's just too much. That Russell Wilson's the last person they need. And he's not that much better than Dak, if that. Like, I, I don't know if he is at this point. Yes, he's proven, but that was like a decade ago. Well, you know, here, I, I think, I think him going to Denver and Nathaniel Hackett taking over as head coach and play caller was a disaster. And they both went down the tubes. Hackett got punished. Russell got punished. But Russell, the Broncos kind of got it going. You were betting on them every week at the end of last <laughs> You're right. season. You're right. And they were winning. Mm -hmm. And he was connected with Cortland Sutton. And I feel like Russell kind of got it going. But by then, there had been so much turbulence between Russell and the Broncos because of the first year that it was almost past the point of no return. If you bring Russell into a healthy situation with the Cowboys, now Dak may not think it's healthy, but Dak, I'm done with Dak. So I don't care. I, I'm, I'm 
I'm like, I only got to pay a million, two million for Russell Wilson. I, that's Jerry, risky, man, that's risky. Just the stories that you hear with Russell Wilson from Marshawn Lynch, which Marshawn Lynch, he ain't all there. Like that, that Madubla Magata, he ain't all there. But hearing stories from him, hearing Richard Sherman, like they don't even have his number. They couldn't even come in contact with him because he's that full of himself. That That's not what the Cowboys need. And yes, Russell could change. He could see the writing on the wall and say, you know what? I need to take a step back. And even though I might be in this limelight and have a big time, a celebrity girlfriend or excuse me, wife. I I need to humble myself and realize that, yo, if teams are waving me, I don't care if the Broncos are having the toxic environment or not in the front office. That's still a sign of change. So if he could change and not be about himself because he gives you just that fakeness, it doesn't seem authentic with him, you know, and it did in Seattle. But again, you started to hear all the things about him off the field and you're like, gosh, I don't know. That's not very quarterback like. That doesn't sound like what Tom Brady would do. That doesn't sound like what Peyton Manning would do, you know? So if Russell Wilson, I mean, if the Cowboys are that desperate, then hey, make that move, Jerry. But I think that's a lot you're bringing in. And now you got to get him acclimated to the offense and stuff and the receivers. Like Dak's got that. Dak just hasn't won the big game. You know, but it's hard for me to see somebody in Russell Wilson's position to think that he's that same guy that won it over a decade ago for the Seahawks. He's not that guy anymore. He had a good year, 28 touchdowns, only nine interceptions, had a solid year. But just with the Cowboys being America's team, I don't know if Russell Wilson is that. Like, that's a lot. That's a lot of luggage, baby, that you're bringing in. That's a lot. I think it's a. I think it's a low risk, high reward situation because you're going to have to break the bank for some of these other quarterback free agents. This one you can get for nothing. And you just, you got options. Because yeah. if they don't want to pay Dak, and I don't want to pay Dak, I wouldn't have paid him what they paid him in the first place. Yeah, I I got a chance to bring in a Super Bowl winning quarterback who probably is humiliated now, and would love a chance to stick it to everybody. Probably is going to be motivated, and a guy you know can play at a high level. I mean, obviously his legs are a big part of what he does just in terms of buying time in the pocket and being able to run just like Dak. You know, when Dak's at his best, he's willing to run when the pocket breaks down. And Russell, you know, used to do that. Can he still do that? Those are the questions I'd be asking because I'm willing. To, look, the America's team is a circus anyway. <laughs> Look at their owner, right? So, so he would just fit in. Oh I'm yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> the unicycle on the tightrope that's a hundred feet in the air. He just yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I Come mean, on, Russ. Come I, and join the circus, baby. But 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 what's everybody else doing that circus stuff? Cool. Your quarterback can't be that. Aikman wasn't the circus. Aikman was the no, no, actual no. structure. Right. You know? Yeah, but he's not. Russ, I, th I still think Russ is about winning. And I think we saw that at the end of the season with the Broncos. But by then it was Sean Payton. Sean Payton's got an ego too now. A little bit. A little bit. And, and so, you know, he didn't want to – he didn't – he didn't like Russ's idiosyncrasies. I think Mike Mike McCarthy is a guy who's just like, can you win games for me? Because I'm calling these plays here, and I'm trying to I'm trying to get me a ring. I got a quarterback who is a time bomb. He looks great all year, and then when I need him most, people were talking about his haircut yesterday. Cause he got a new cut. Yeah, I guess he had like a goatee or something. And 
I don't know. He looks the same Dak Prescott to me as a new kid, new baby and stuff. So that old asking for less money, that's gone out the window. Because once you start paying for diapers and probably a nanny and stuff. Yeah, Dude, he, ain't. he got paid $45 million last year. Mm-hmm. If he can't get his diaper budget in order on that, then – they really need to cut him. <laughs> well, I want to say it's not what Latrell Sprewell said back in the '90s, where they were trying to pay him like seventy-five million. Maybe it was later on. He was like, "I got to feed my family." <laughs> These Antonio, athletes, man, I, I got to feed my family. I got to take care of my family. Shut your ass up, you choker. What do you mean, feed your family? You're getting paid millions. Budget better. How about that? How about don't go to Roof Chris every night? How about that? How about eat good? You know, you could maybe pull that off at a cover three. You know what I'm saying? Because cover three got them deals and stuff. But come on now. You got to be smart with your paper. And yeah, that, some of these guys, they don't even try to be smart. And they use that as an excuse just to get more. I get it. Try to get as much as you can. But yeah, if I'm Dak Prescott with how he's played these last few years, Taking less money, that's the right move to go. But some of these dudes, we talk about ego, they can't help themselves. You know, Justin Jefferson's talking about $30 million a year from Minnesota. Um, a year. We talking about Amon Ra getting 25 a year. You know, how much better is Justin Jefferson and Amon Ra St. Brown? Not that much, if you ask me. I'm a little biased. I don't give a damn, but still not that much. <laughs> like, they're right there. I'm in Raw was first team all pro, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, some of these guys just prideful. They asking for a lot. They ain't willing to give up much. You know, Tom Brady, not everybody has a supermodel wife all those years. Who's a cheater? We talked about that. Poor Tom, man. I hope Tom's getting counseling. You know what I'm saying? Tom don't deserve that. He probably going I through Tom's it. Tom's getting laid. <laughs> why, why are you assuming that? Tom, I mean, might be, Tom might be celibate right now. You know Tom. He he's might be dating Arena. Me. He's dating the supermodel, Arena Shake. He's and, doing fine. And he might be locked in, working on his vocals and how he needs to go about things in his broadcasting career. We know Tom, when it's all about work or his job, He's going to go 100%. He's probably looking at Tony Romo right now as the enemy. He's probably looking at Chris Collinsworth right now, the enemy. You know, Greg Olson, all those guys. Yo, people are going to expect a lot from me. I'm one, I want to be not only the best NFL player of all time, I want to be the best broadcaster of all time. I want to be. I want to get a game like Madden. You know what I'm saying? Tom, I, I could see Tom thinking like that. He ain't worried about old girl. You know what I'm saying? If old girl what are you worried in, about him for? Huh? What are you worried about him for? He's got because his wife was cheating on him. What do you mean? What am I worried about him? He's still human. You think just because he's pretty, he don't have to go through the same things that we do? Us non-pretty folk? Come on now. I'm, I'm worried about him. That jujitsu dude could whoop his ass too. What is this? Brady's banging Bradley Cooper's baby mama? Damn, CB. <laughs> Why we how, have to say how does, how does Why can't we man say per- dating? How does my man Terzay Hilton not know this already? I mean, I'm keeping up with Tom, but not that much. All right, let's let's talk some ball. What did I just walk in on? My goodness. <laughs> oh, Zay's worried about Tom Brady. <laughs> Hank, his wife was cheating on him with the jujitsu instructor for years. Everybody wanted to look at his age on why he had such a bad last season in Tampa Bay. No, he was mentally fragile. Because he had a whole bunch of stuff going on at home. Again, you're Tom Brady. Yeah. And your wife's cheating on which is Giselle. It's not like it's just any woman. It's Giselle for the jujitsu instructor who, again, he does jujitsu. He could probably whoop Tom's ass. You know what I'm saying? Tom can't well, even wouldn't. put up the dukes with him. Because jujitsu, ah, chop his she ass would, down. She wouldn't them. have cheated on him if he'd have quit after that Super Bowl. See, see you wrong for that, Chip. You wrong for that. He had you it gotta, right. He should have walked out on she, top. She knows what she married. A winner. Well, he can bounce <laughs> back. Tom Brady can bounce back. He'll be oh, fine. Oh, haters, man. 
He's I, gonna be I, I fine. hope he's going to therapy. I'm here for you, Tom. If you need a therapist, somebody to talk to, I'm here for you, man. You come on the show. Talk it out with us. You know what I'm saying? All right, Hank, before we get into the combine, what do you what do you think of the idea of the Cowboys bringing in Russell Wilson since they'd only have to pay him a million or two million and the Broncos would pay the other 37 million? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm like of the belief that I don't think Dak is really a, like, I think he's like a, one of the brighter spots. I, I know he has his like mess ups. He has his turnover issues, you know, but he doesn't I, have the clutch I, gene. I'm a Dak believer. I think he's going to get it done eventually. Wow. eventually. Thank you, Hank. I'm with yeah. you, Hank. Chips want to get rid of him, bring uh, in toxic ass Russell Wilson with Sierra. Yeah. You know, you got to hook up Sierra too. You know, she's going to be high maintenance. Uh, you got to give him his private office too in the state or, you know, in the, so you can go watch film. And, yeah, and man. Doing workouts on the plane and stuff. Like, you yeah. know, we don't need that. Yeah, and, and the last got, thing the Cowboys Lance, need. You know, you, you got a good little quarterback room going there with uh, Rush and, uh, and Trey Lance behind them. How many playoff games they win this past year? <laughs> Who threw two picks, including a pick six in that game? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, get, get him, get him, Xavier Worthy or, or Adonai Mitchell. Put him opposite a CD, and uh, they'll be good. Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm so done with Dak, and I'm amazed at all the people who are like, yeah. But you're a Lions guy. Yeah. So you see it in a different, different lens. I see it through a cold, unfiltered, because Dak. That's the worst kind of coach killer is the guy who's great all regular season. This is the way Dirk Nowitzki used to be. Yeah. And then Dirk broke through and said, F it. I'm ready to own my past. I know who I am. I'm going to go ball. And he did. And the Mavs won it all. And I was hoping beyond hope that that was Dak in 2023. And then we get to the playoffs. And it was the worst version of him. It was also the worst version of the Cowboys defense. But yeah, I, I kind of honestly, I, like I lost hope and I shouldn't have because they were still playing well. But when Trevon Diggs got hurt, I was like, well, you know, I, I feel like that's going to eventually bite them in the butt. And, I mean, they had guys step up, but, you know, Jordan Love just kind of diced that that secondary in, in the in that playoff game. So, yeah, the linebacker position killed him is what. Mm -hmm happened because yeah. Vander Esch going down suddenly they're undersized they didn't have DeMarvian overshone yeah but, hey there's right. always next year <laughs> Hank you did an unbelievable job of uh of covering Texas at the at the NFL combine what Appreciate uh it. I mean 11 guys lots of different storylines what uh what were your big takeaways yeah. Um, I mean, I, you have to start with Xavier Worthy, um, you know, breaking the combine record. You know, um, <clears throat> I think everyone in, in, uh, was on Twitter saying, you know, don't run it again. You know, what what, what was I don't even remember what the first time was now. It was four two five. Four two five. Yeah. And they said, hey, sit on that. You're good. And, you know, I, I think the fact that he came back and did it again, just that's going to maybe boost him up a few spots on, on uh you know, where he gets picked just to show kind of that competitive fire. Um, so I, th I think you start with that. That was obviously, I think, the biggest thing. I think the second biggest one was Adonai Mitchell. You know, everyone was saying, oh, he's going to be like a 4-5 guy. Comes out and does a 4-3-4. Four, four. I think that was the fourth best time for wide receivers, uh, third or fourth, right behind. Uh, third best Bryce. time for wide receivers, sixth yeah. best time overall. Okay. So, yeah. So, you know, he kind of secured his spot in the first round. You know, it, it's, it's funny because, like, one of these guys is going to go to the Chiefs and just be like probably the best receiver in the league next year. Like it's going to like it's just you know it's going to happen and uh, uh, be one of the best receivers in the league. You know, um, but I think those two guys were kind of the big storylines before those before them. You know, obviously the big that all the talk of the day was uh, you know Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy on Thursday and just you know the workouts they did. Obviously Murphy ran a really good forty, had a good on field. Both of them had really good on field workouts. Um, then Sweat at 366 running a 52. I mean, can you imagine like getting tackled full speed from him at, like and not, not that he's ever going to like be full speed coming at you at, you know, that pace, but uh Well, he shoved Jalen Ford out of the way in that Tech game. Yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah. Swatted a 
240 pound man away like a fly. Yeah. So uh, they obviously helped their stock. Jatavian Sanders had a really good, I mean, they all had really good combines and, you know, some, you know, some of them didn't work out. Obviously Brooks couldn't do anything. Uh, Whittington was nursing, I think what was the hamstring, uh, you know, so he did the bench press and I think had one of the best bench presses reps of, uh, of the wide receivers. Um, Ryan Watts looked really good um, time. You know, he's big, he's got size, you know, move. Um, so I think just overall, you know, the, the, I, I, I think Texas had the most buzz of any, you know, college program. Usually this thing and what we wrote on the Horns 24-7 is like, you know, this is an event typically dominated by the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Ohio States. And, you know, all the buzz was Texas this weekend. And, um, you know, it's not going to stop. You know, even Isaiah Bond on Sunday morning or Sunday or Saturday night was already saying, you know, next year 4-2 flat. And, I, you know, I wouldn't put it past him. I know he, he's an Olympic sprinter guy. Like, he's not he, – he could probably do it if, if he comes out next year. Um so, you know, that's just, you know, Quinn next year, you know, there, there's, they're just kind of starting this pipeline of just NFL production where, uh, you know, the combine is going to be a, a favorable event for, for Texas if, for the, for the next few years to come, but really, really a strong performance by all the guys. Um, you know, I think it just, uh, you, you have to start with worthy, obviously breaking that, that record by John Ross. And which is interesting, and Jeff, Howe mentioned this Sark also coached John Ross. So Sark's now coached the two fastest, um, players in the nfl combine yeah that's right yep yeah hank obviously xavier worthy with his 40 time that stood out but now you trying to dissect these guys and you go negative before positive and everybody's gonna look at that weight and be like ah 165 Ah, i don't know about that but me and chip we always talk about the dude doesn't play like he's 165 dude he likes contact he'll lower his head and especially with that speed you know yes the injuries are there but he plays through those injuries like i remember texas tech he kind of got a little tweak up and he ended up catching a touchdown and dragging somebody in the end zone with him. So the toughness yeah. is there. It's just I think that way it's going to scare a lot of these GMs off, and I don't think it should. No, I don't. I agree. I think that's one of the things he did best this year. Um, you know, the final year at Texas is, is showing that physicality. You know, just mowing guys over when he gets an opportunity to. And you know, that tech injury, we were. I, I was in DKR. Me and my wife went to that game, and like everyone was just holding their breath. You know, it, it like, honestly when they showed it on the replay, I was like that that might be a season just like seeing it immediately after, but he came back and played and he showed his toughness. He showed that he can keep going, but yeah, I mean, just look at guys. Like, I mean, Devonte Smith might be 160 pounds wet. Like he, he does fine on the Eagles. Um, Deshaun Jackson, I think is like 165 or was in, the, in that range. And obviously one of the better wide receivers, uh, you know, of this century. Um, so, you know, I, that's not something I think should be a concern for anybody. I mean, just, Turn on the tape. Look at his measurables. Look at you know everything he's done. His his, his body of work. He he'll he'll be fine. Yeah, and Ad Mitchell. I mean, he only measured six foot two, but my God, the four three four and the forty combined with all of his big plays. Yeah. I mean, his tape is outstanding. Yeah, you know, I had um, an NFL scout say, okay. Yeah, A.D. Mitchell, he's he's the truth. Yeah, because look at his tape, and now you combine that with four three four speed, mm-hmm. and he may have moved up ahead of guys like Keon Coleman from Florida State and that kind of thing. So, um, be interesting. Yeah, um, and the cool thing they were doing, and they've done this before, obviously, is that simulcast where they like show them compared to like guys in the past and you know they have the yeah whatever, the, um what's it called they had that with yeah. andre sweat and patrick oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, no it's awesome but they they said uh like ad mitchell of all the receivers at least six two is like he i think he's just i think he was ahead of dk Mac, metcalf like in i think i retweeted it it's somewhere it's one yeah they're the only movie. two yeah who, and so like who. I think he, I think he posted a faster time than DK. I think DK was in the four fours, um, and then AJ Brown they showed up next. Like, I mean, he, that he really, really helped himself. Maybe more so than anybody. I mean, obviously he was already getting a little bit of late first round buzz, but you know, I think he he's certainly secured his spot. Um, you know, in in that first round on uh, on draft night. Yeah. 
JT Sanders also had a really good showing. Brock Bowers, he really didn't even compete or do anything there. And I think that JT Sanders, I probably wouldn't pick him over Brock Bowers, but when it comes to measurables and his hand size and stuff, yeah. like that's where he has Brock Bowers beat, just that natural ability. And just to think of where he came from when he was at Denton Ryan and yeah. they were just deciding, are you going to be an edge rusher or a tight end? And that dude might be, you know, a high taken tight end in this draft. Like talk about what he did at the combine yeah. and where he might go. Yeah. I think he, I mean, just without, with Bowers not working out, that probably helped him. The, I mean, obviously, you know, he did what well, did well too, but you know, to kind of be that, be to have that stage where, you know, you're kind of the, you're the top guy working out at that position. Um, and, and, and again, helped himself um, with his times, his measurables, his on-field workout. Um, you know, we're in this kind of tight end age where like, you know, you, you, these freak tight ends are coming out of college and, you know, making impacts early. We saw Michael, uh, Michael Mayer with the Raiders this year do really well. These young tight ends, uh, what's his face? Um, Dalton, uh, Dalton Hyatt on the, was it Dalton Hyatt? Is that his name? On the Bills? He played at Utah. I know Dalton, you're talking about. Dalton Kincaid. Why am I saying Dalton Hyatt? That's like a former recruit I used to cover. Um, Laporta. What's that? Sam Laporta for Chips. Yeah, yeah, all these guys. And so, you know, I, I think everyone's kind of seeing the, this benefit. And, you know, I, I think with with, um, with Sanders, you know, I mean, he didn't obviously have the biggest of, biggest of years, but, you know, it's all about that potential with him and, you know, what he can do. He's still kind of scratching the surface of, uh, you know, his ability. So I think he uh, he certainly helped himself. And I, I, people are already kind of being like, you know, could, could he sneak into the late – first round now um after after that workout so you know if texas could you know sneak in not sneak in but get four four first round picks that'd be that'd be pretty wild yeah that would be almost insane because yeah but alabama had six first round picks i think i think that's a few the, years yeah. ago and yeah. i think that i'm not sure if that's the record it might be I think it is um yeah I, isaiah bond you you covered him because you covered Alabama recruiting. What what's this kid like? Uh, I saw that too on his social media. Four two four two zero next year. Yeah. Um, what uh, what kind of personality? How would you yeah. describe Isaiah Bond? He's great. Um, he's a he's a really good kid. I didn't get to know him as well because you know, or like you know, I didn't get to see him in person as much because it, it was kind of still in the you know COVID restriction era where you know we had to be couldn't really go out and do as much as we usually did. So didn't get to see him as a lot as much in person, but, you know, really good personality team guy. And obviously, you know, if we ask Bama fans, they'd be like, Oh, you, you left his team, but you know, kind of a unprecedented uh, coaching transition there. Um, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt there with uh, wanting to move on it and, and check something else out. Obviously Texas recruited him really heavily out of high school. One of Sark's first big targets when, when he got to Austin, but uh yeah, I almost actually uh, on on Saturday night when I saw that, or I almost tweeted after uh, Worthy set the record. I was like, you know, I'd, you know, Bond could break this next year, but I didn't want to, you know, take away from <laughs> Xavier Worthy's moment. And I was like, give let's give him a day, and then maybe uh, hype up Isaiah Bond for next year. Uh, but no, great kid. Um, I, I think obviously, you know, you, you he he was really loved by all his Bama teammates. I think they're still very close with him. Um, he just wanted to come, you know, get in a situation that, you know, I, I think people don't realize like how big of an impact, you know, having a guy like Quinn Ewers back is to, to see them, you know, add these, especially the transfer wide receivers, you know, getting golden. Like we, I feel like we overlook Matthew golden all the time. And for a minute, he was the top wide receiver target, you know, in the portal um, back in December. And then, obviously Silas Bolden, and then you, you, you get Aaron Butler late. I mean, I think all these guys like the idea of, you know, maybe getting a year with Quinn and then a year or two with Arch after that. So um, big time pickup, but I, th I think he's going to make big, big plays next year for, for Texas. Yeah. How do you think Sark goes about the wide receiver room, Hank? Because, you know, we know how he gets down. If you're the starters, you're starting. And if yeah. you're the backup, you ain't playing very much. Like ask yeah. Casey Kane, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. 
how how do you think he's going to go about it this year? Because that roster is so deep. I think about Ryan Wingo, who you've yeah. been very high on for a long time for obvious reasons. Like, how is he going to see the field as a freshman? Can he get some playing time over maybe yeah. a Matthew Golden or a Silas Bolden, et cetera? I, I don't know. I would hate to just see guys on the bench being wasted, yeah. especially like a Jonte Cook or Ryan Niblett, DeAndre Moore. They're just so stacked in that wide receiver room. Yeah. And I, I think someone asked Sark about that on national signing day. And he was like, you know, we get these guys, we have these guys now. Now the fun part is figuring out how we're going to use them. And and I think we will see, I don't think it'll be as set in stone as, you know, we saw, you know, Worthy, Mitchell, Whittington, like those were the guys. I think, I think this year we'll, we'll, we should, well, I think we'll likely see more guys kind of rotate in and, and kind of get different packages and different, you know, formations. I, I think we'll see a more, heavier usage of kind of, you know, the too deep there at least. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm true. I'm curious to see myself because I guarantee you when that, um, when the spring portal window opens, all these teams are going to be like, Hey, you know, we're come play for us. You can be wide receiver one here because Texas has like seven wide receiver ones on their roster. So, uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see Texas, uh, you know, whether that, um, not like I'm not trying to like indicate that something that one of these guys is going to leave, but you know they're going to have to get through the spring um, window, and uh, you know you you know these other teams are going to come calling trying to get one of the one, a few of these guys off 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 their roster um, just with that pitch alone, saying you know are you going to play? You know negative recruit Texas in that aspect. So yeah, I'm curious to see how they kind of fit in, but I think we'll see more guys uh, you know get get playing time as opposed to to this past season. I think of the early enrollees, um, you know, Aaron Butler is kind of where I'm going with this. Who Who's the most polished? Like, who's the most college ready of the of the freshman receivers in this class? You got Parker Livingstone, Aaron Butler, Ryan Wingo, Brady DuBose. Yeah. I I mean, I, I wouldn't argue Aaron Butler. The only thing I, I, I think he he's – you know, he, I, I still just lean towards Ryan Wingo just because I, I think he's just, you know, the real deal. Um, you know, just, he's already college built, you know, he's a big kid, moves well, good route runner. Um, I'm just looking down the list of the wide receivers. Um, I just, I'm just really, I've always been high on Wingo. Um, so that, that's kind of where I lean. I, I feel like they could get him involved in several different ways. Um, maybe even special teams. Um, to where he can make an impact early in the, in this stacked wide receiver room. So I lean him Butler, obviously, you know, you, you want to, you know, Texas speed, you know, you want to, you want to keep those guys, you want to get your fast guys on the field. So I, I could see him getting some, um, you know, some, uh, some playing time as well. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, like with uh, covering Bama, you know, they would get these, these kind of classes where it's like, they have so many guys. It's like, then it's always cause sometimes like the guy you don't expect that's, ends up being like, for example, John Mechie, you know, he was kind of an overlooked guy for Bama in the class of 2019, you know, they're coming off signing Waddle and, you know, they still got uh rugs, Judy Smitty. And, you know, I think even Calvin Ridley was still at some point was still there. And like, you know, you just don't think about him. And then he ends up, you know, being their, their, their go-to guy opposite Jamison Williams in that, uh, in that uh, championship run season before they both got hurt. But um, yeah, you know, I, I, I like Wingo, you know, wouldn't be shocked to see Butler kind of make some noise this spring and, and into the fall. Yeah. Who's your comp for Aaron Butler? Ooh. Ooh, I don't know. Let me look at his profile again. Look at me just uh, you right, right on the spot there. Um, guys, uh, Greg Biggins has Stefan Diggs. Ooh, oh, that'll work. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'll lean. I mean, Greg Biggins has seen him more than anybody, so I'll lean on our our twenty four seven sports expert there. Let's go, Diggs. Just yeah, it's a pretty good comp. That's uh, that's some some big shoes to uh, try to fill. Not, I mean, yeah. he's not filling his shoes, but you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what What about on the defensive side, coming in as a freshman, not named yeah. Colin Simmons? I'm gonna make you yeah. work, Hank. Not sure. named Colin Simmons. <laughs> Which freshman on the defensive side do you think can make an impact? I'm it's got to be either Kobe Black or Xavier Filsamy. I just think one of those two, you know, and obviously, you know, you got Makuba, uh, opposite Derek Williams. Um, so you know, they might not 
be called upon, you know, to, as, you know, as needed. But I, I think, I think both of those guys, you know, we, you know, we've been hearing nothing but good things about them. Um, so I think I wouldn't be shocked to see, you know, one of those two, if not both play pretty often. I think they're both pretty, pretty polished guys. Um, and obviously in the program already as an early enrollee. Um, so I'm excited to see them this spring. Um, feels to me in particular, but you know, I hear more and more buzz about Kobe Black lately too. So, um, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to see them kind of to how, how they kind of mesh into this, this roster, you know, um, with the guys that are already there and, and, uh, you know, where they're standing coming out of the spring. We talked about <clears throat> Santana Wilson, um, who will not be here until June, but what about Jordan Johnson Rubel? What, what did yeah. you like about him? Uh, coming out of the yeah from Fort Worth he went to the IMG Academy yeah yeah he, he's from Fort Worth went to IMG um I the kid's just a really physical hitter like he he will just like lay the wood um and I think that's what stands out the most about him he's not you know he loves the contact um and and, and so you know obviously that that helps with run support you know he, he I, I think he's probably a little bit more of a developmental guy but at the same time I say that you know, I, 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 you know, these IMG kids always, you know, they they come with a little bit, you know, the, the learning curve isn't as, uh, as steep for them, you know, just because they've, they've been around, um, you know, essentially what is a college program. They, they play, you know, D1 talent every week. So, you know, it's, I think it comes a little bit more naturally to them when they, when they get to the next level or they get to college and, and enroll. So maybe he, he's a guy that, you know, quietly, you know, sees the field a little bit earlier than, than maybe we expected or anticipated looking, looking at it now, but love his physicality. Um, you know, he, 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 he makes plays on the ball. You know, he, he's got good, good ball skills. Um, you know, I, I like Jordan Johnson rebel for sure. Yeah, okay, Jay Lacey's been playing in flag football tournaments and stuff. Everything looks good with him that? still being KJ Lacey. Oh, he's been playing yeah. in flag football tournaments. I see that dude loves ball. Like every time yeah. I see something on him, he's always at a camp or yeah. playing in seven on seven games. Like he doesn't stop. I like that about him. Yeah, and that's a commitment. I mean, like you're you're flying like Mobile doesn't have many direct flights. Like you you got to fly Mobile to probably Dallas or or Atlanta and you gotta take a couple flights to get wherever you're going on, on these, on these weekend trips. Um, maybe there's a mobile to Austin. I don't know. I haven't looked, but um, no, yeah, he's been all over the place. He, he spoke with 24 seven. He was in California this past weekend. Like you said, at that flag football, um, you know, he's saying all the right things. He he's, he's excited about Texas. You know, I, I think most quarterbacks love, <laughs> love, love what Steve Sarkeesian's doing and, and everything. And, and, and again, you know, it, this is the first class where it's like quarterbacks in need, like, after this year, you know, you assume Quinn is leaving and, you know, your quarterback room is, is, is Arch Manning and, and Trey Owens. You know, I don't think anyone would feel comfortable just having two scholarship quarterbacks. Um, so, you know, maybe it's a class we even see them try to get another guy. Um, I'm not, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I would, it would make sense. Um, you know, obviously after, after the transfer portal departures from, from a few guys, but you now Lacey's happy with Texas. He's recruiting other guys. Um, I believe, He's going to be in Austin uh, for that. There's an Elite 11 camp in Austin uh, in like two or two or three weeks. It's like March the 21st weekend. I think he's coming out to throw in that. Um, and obviously we'll visit Texas if, if he's out here. Um, so we'll be able to catch up with him there. And then he'll take his official visit in the summer. He's still going to, you know, go check out Auburn Ole Miss. Um, I think, you know, by the time summer like wraps up, I, I would imagine KJ is going to stop visiting elsewhere if you know assuming he's still committed to texas which i believe he will be um there's there's gonna be a point where it's like okay you know focus on my senior year gonna enroll early you know the quarterbacks kind of have to give you a little bit better of an idea they can't really play as much of the you know the recruiting uh recruiting games later in the process because because teams do need to know you know that's an important position to have you know kind of secured down you know entering the the senior season so uh no he's he's solid with texas and uh yeah, big time, big time prospect. Hank, great stuff, my man. Thank you. Love, uh, love talking ball. Yo, Hank, last one for me, man. Why ain't Arch Manning on the game, bro? What's going on? <laughs> what, what is he doing? I can't believe this. This uh, is a yeah. catastrophe. <laughs> but come well, on, everyone's man. just gonna have to go to create a player. You know, make number sixteen. I think we'll we'll, we'll survive. Uh, Brad Crawford had a really good story, kind of like 
putting to bed all the misconceptions about, you know, that it's just such a crazy, like, I, and I'm not going to lie. I saw Anwar's report last night. And when it came across, it said like breaking Arch Manning. And I was like, he's entering the trash portal. Oh my God. <laughs> I was like, but then it's like, he's not going to be in the, uh, not going to be in the games. I was like, Oh, okay. That's a bit different. I can't believe that's a story. <laughs> I just, I can't get over it. I really can't. Hey. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, I don't think it's a huge deal. Um, you know, I don't think well, he's I told on- Zay, I don't play video games. So that whole thing is just like, yeah, over my head, you know? Yeah. It's, it, it's wild. I don't think he's really hurting on the NIL front though. Like what he's like the second highest, like what, what's on threes, you know, valuation. He's like the second highest guy. And yeah, he's not even on starting threes, quarterback. So I, think, I, think he's, I think he's doing, I think he's doing okay. Yeah. Hank, so. good stuff, my man. Appreciate really that. appreciate it. I always look Thank forward to uh, the Tuesday conversations. Me too. Thanks, y'all. We'll see you next week. Thanks, All right, man. man. Hank South. Make sure you check out the uh, Stampede every Monday, the kind of the insider uh, notebook on recruiting at horns247.com. Okay, let's get uh, let's get to the commentaries here. Um. But uh, Apple Lisa, I mean, they want you to be in the car you really want to be driving. That makes sense, right? And here's the thing. Buying a car, not a great investment because it is a depreciating asset. So why not lease it? And why not lease it to where you're always under warranty, you're always in a brand new car, and you're picking any make or model of car. That's right. Apple Leasing leases every make and model of car. They don't care what car you pick. That's different from when you go off to the dealership. Um, And if you had a bad experience leasing in the past, it's probably because you leased from a dealership. You lease from Apple Leasing, you want to change make and model of car, no problem. Easy lease. Everything about Apple Leasing is easy. You owe it to yourself. You deserve to be in a new car. You're going to be in traffic in Austin, Texas. So give them a call today, 346-9977. Visit AppleLeasing.com. Tell them Chip Brown sent you. And Brain Vault, the mouth guard that is changing the game. Patented, proven to reduce the effects of concussion. So you want to play hard, but you want to play safe. And Brain Vault, developed right here in Austin by Austin's dentist, Dr. Greg Eckert. Dr. U-E-C-K-E-R-T. Um, this is the mouth guard that is going to Protect your competitor. Maybe you're the competitor. We're not talking about some piece of rubber that you go get at a sporting goods store, throw in a boiling pot and shove it in your mouth. You're getting fitted by Dr. Greg Eckert, a dentist. This is the mouth guard that your competitor, you, whether you're playing flag football, pick up basketball, you know, cheerleading, lacrosse, of course, football, but uh, Brain Vault, brainvault.com for a fitting and audiovisual consultations, our man Tom McKay. When you're ready for the big screen of your dreams, Tom's ready for you. All you got to do is call 255-8678, and Tom and his crew will bring everything to you. The best price on big screen, surround sound, electronic shades, new lighting, surveillance, avconsultations.com. Give them a call, 255-8678, and Say mentioned cover three. Oh, yeah, baby. Cover three. This is the spot. This is where you want to be, especially come March Madness. You just set up shop at cover three. Watch all those games. Big 12 tournament time. Cover three. High-end food and the best place to watch your favorite team with your buddies. Right there in Anderson Lane up in Round Rock and cover two at 183 and Lake Creek. All right, Zay, let's get to it. It's time for some commentary. And Jerry Jones, I got news for you. Whatever that little little angel or devil on your shoulder is saying, sign Russell Wilson, sign him, sign him. It's only going to cost you a million or $2 million. Broncos are going to pay the other $37 million. 
That way, if Dak is wilting under the pressure, you've got a Super Bowl winning quarterback on your roster. I wouldn't be opposed to letting go or making Dak play for his final year of his contract. Don't extend him. Do not extend him. Don't do it. Just, I said, and I said this on the air years ago, I would have franchised him, franchised him, released him. And of course, that would have involved other smart moves by the Cowboys, like drafting young quarterbacks and always developing young quarterbacks like most smart NFL teams like the New England Patriots have done for the last 20 years. But because you didn't do that, Jerry, now you've got a chance. you got to get out of jail free card. you got a chance to sign Russell Wilson. Yeah, he's weird. Okay, he says stupid stuff like Mr. Whatever that. Unlimited. Mr. Unlimited. Unlimited. <laughs> and he's, he's probably insecure because his first wife cheated on him with Golden Tate. But those are bygones. He threw for 28 touchdowns and nine interceptions. He's won a Super Bowl. He had the Broncos going so well last year that Zay was picking him every week in his picks and winning. <laughs> Jerry, don't be afraid to make a bold move. Don't make, don't be afraid to make a bold move. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Dak is going to be someone else come playoff time. He's pretty much shown you since his rookie year, other than that win over Tampa with distraught Tom Brady two years ago, that he's not the guy. That when it matters most, he's not going to deliver for you. I'd rather take a chance on a guy like Russell Wilson. Do it, Jerry. Be bold. That's bold. It would be bold if he were to... You know, pull the plug on Dak Prescott and go with somebody like Russell Wilson. Like that's just the thing, though, Chip. Like, is Russell really gonna come? Because Hank made a great point. Like, Russell brings so much like other just distractions in with the things that he thinks he needs to be successful, like having his own stuff. No, you're a part of the team. I get it, you're a quarterback, but do that on your own. You know, like the, don't ask the team to do certain just like specialties for you like that. That makes you on the outskirts of what the team needs. Like the team needs you to be that guy. They want to come to you when they have a problem and trust that they don't want you being buddy buddy with the front office and stuff. you got to be a part of the crew. You know, you got to be a part of the bros. That's why there's that saying bros before y'all know the rest. So, like, if you ain't bro, you talking about him being insecure, you got Sierra. Ain't no way you should be insecure about anything. And that might be the problem. I think she's gotten to his head. She seems like the type of woman, which I love me some Sierra. Goodies is still my jam. One, two step, classics. But she Goodies. seems like the type of woman that lets Russell know, yo, bro, you ain't getting what you owe. You ain't getting what you deserve. And Russell's over here like, damn, baby. You're right. You're right. I deserve this, that, and the third. And other guys on the team are like, why do you deserve this? You're the quarterback, but you already get special treatment. You're asking for extra special treatment, you know? And again, you heard Dan. Like, I, yo, Dan Neal says what he does about Russell Wilson when he comes on our show. I trust that. I trust I do that. Too. Dan, Dan's seen it at the highest level of what a quarterback should be and how they should carry themselves in a John Elway. So for him to say all of those things about Russell Wilson, that's a big risk. That'd be a bold move. But, hey, if the dollar signs make it worth it, why not? You know, like, why, why not? I still think Dak Prescott should take less money and you should stick it out with him. I think Mike Zimmer – that means something. And Dan Quinn, I feel like that whole defense this past year, especially at the end, knew that Dan Quinn was on his way out and they played like it. But this would be bold. 
That's what you bought. I like it. I like drama. You know, I like petty. Make the move, Jerry. Make the move. Bring Russell Wilson to Dallas. Go ahead on. Go ahead on. I, I will say this. Dak. Dak has had four seasons with double-digit interceptions. Russell has played – well, Russell had uh, 10 interceptions his rookie year, but he's had uh, – well, he's had four seasons with double-digit interceptions. But Russell Wilson – what four, six, nine Pro Bowls? I get it. He's 35. That's the other reason I'm like, you know, he's insurance. Or if Trey Lance is oh jeez, he's already on the roster. My point is you got to find out what you got. All right, let's get to the uh right call. Let's get to the right call, baby. Before all that, though, Covert BK, shout out to the Covert Automotive Group, family-owned automotive dealerships that have been doing it. Y'all know how long, over a 100 years, man, and they've been doing it very well, providing a high-quality selection of new and pre-owned vehicles. You will be satisfied leaving Covert B Cave. Oh, you're a Buick lover? They got that. Oh, you want a GMC? They got that. Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram. They have all those brands to choose from. You're going to find what you want at Covert B Cave. You should definitely take my word for it, but some of y'all be tripping on here and be like, oh, Zay, he tripping. No, check it out for yourself. Go to CovertBcave.com. They got all the latest specials and inventory so you can see it for yourself and then come back to me and be like, oh, yeah, Zay was preaching a little bit i got you covert bk they got you nobody beats a covert deal not now not ever all right chip the right call today haven't talked a little nba in a while just want to update the people i'm still watching the nba enough to talk about it you know and even though college basketball is getting to the point it's march and we know what that means with college basketball but just want to paint the picture of what's going on in the nba right now for some who might not be paying attention to it as much victor Wimbenyama is the real deal i he's the real deal i was one of the first to hear about victor Wimbenyama as chris bennett he'll let you know on that other station i let bucky gabo know who he was like four years ago that this dude could change basketball, and he's doing that for the San Antonio Spurs. He was the rookie of the year in February, 21 points, over 10 rebounds. The dude's having games of like five blocks consecutively. He might be the best rookie that we've seen since Tim Duncan, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, et cetera. He's that type of player. And, yeah, just his impact, like – what he does defensively, how quick he is, how smooth he is, the ability to switch out on guys and contest. Then offensively, the Spurs are finally giving them the ball. It seemed like November, December, you got Vassell and Keldon Johnson and you know guys like that. They felt like, oh, we're still the men here. We're still the main guys. No, you're not. You never were. Once he got on the team and on the roster, your role changed. And I think Red Popovich has figured it out with those guys that Victor Wimbenyama is the number one option. That's why he's shooting over 40% from three this last month, too. So that dude is an absolute star. Another thing that's going on in the NBA right now, the Boston Celtics are for real. They're for real. 11 straight wins. They're way ahead of everybody in the East. Best record in the NBA. They're for real. Everybody's going to think, oh, this is the same Boston Celtics team. No, it's not. Like last year, they went game seven with the Miami Heat. If Jason Tatum didn't tweak his ankle early in that first quarter, I think they would have won that game and they would have given the Nuggets a run for their money. But now Jason Tatum, he's back playing with a vengeance. Jalen Brown's playing with a vengeance. Both of those guys look great together. But bringing on Christoph Porzingis, so he could be a third option. Like, he's never been the third option. When he was with Dallas, he was asked to be number two. And if you play with Luka, that might take some time. I don't think he was given a fair shot in Dallas. 
And in New York, he had those issues with, you know, it's New York. Back then, those that front office, just a lot of toxic energy going around in Manhattan. But now, as the third option with the Boston Celtics, with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum being one and two, Porzingis is in a really good spot. Really good spot. He looks good. He just has to stay healthy. Knock on wood if you're a Celtics fan. And then Drew Holiday. He's one of my favorite players ever. I remember watching Drew Holiday as a 16-year-old in Houston, Texas, his California team coming down for the Kingwood Classic, and he was one of the best high school players I've ever seen. He was coming down, chip, shooting threes with the left hand, smooth, ambidextrous type player, finishing, finding guys, locking up defensively. He's kind of changed their culture on their toughness. And yes, Marcus Smart was that guy last year, but Drew brings a different type of skill level that Marcus Smart, as good as he was, doesn't bring. And we put that with Derek White. They're the best two backcourt defensive players in the, in the league, easily. Those dudes lock up and they're long and they just make life hell for, you know, offensive point guards. So yeah, I, I'm all on the Boston Celtics bandwagon and yeah, I'm my Phoenix. I wasn't son. sure. I wasn't sure Porzingis could stay healthy. I that's still a question mark. <laughs> Season ain't over. You know, he's still got to play in the playoffs and stuff. He's been great like, for them. He's been so good. And Al Horford, who's he's a, he's 50. a role player. He's this dude's like fifty. You're right, and he needs to be coming off the bench. Like he got exposed in the playoffs last year. It's not Al Horford's fault. He's still a solid player, but he shouldn't be starting or finishing games for the Celtics team. They needed the big that could do that, and they got Porzingis to do that. So, yeah, if they stay healthy, man, they look really good. But I know I picked the Suns to win it all. They can't stay healthy. If Bradley Beal's playing, Devin Booker's out. If Devin Booker's playing, Bradley Beal's out. If both of those guys are playing, KD's out. Like, they, the big three, they may have played – 10 games together tops, if that, if that, they cannot get healthy. And that's are they going to be healthy when they play the Celtics Saturday? No, probably not. <laughs> probably not. And, you know, that sixth spot, I mean, that would be a great series if they started now to play the Nuggets. If they were healthy, I could see that going seven. But, man, that's just got the worst luck. And they picked up Royce O'Neal. I thought that was a solid pick. You know, Grayson Allen with his dirty self. He's been playing good basketball for him. But, you know, like I got to get Booker, Bradley Beal, and Durant playing together. They And even if they get healthy, they still have to get acclimated to one another. You know, like it's just – it sucks, man. It sucks because I want Durant to get another ring. I really do. I still don't think he would get that respect that he deserves because just media has completely tainted his, you know, career with what he did with Golden State and that whole Charles Barkley. Oh, he's a bus rider, not a bus driver take. But yeah, this this team, they still have everything it takes to get there, but they got to get healthy. We'll see what happens. But yeah, that's just a little right call breakdown of what's going on in the NBA. Love what the Celtics are doing. It, it would be a huge disappointment if they didn't win a championship this year. I know the Nuggets are going to be there, but it'll be a huge disappointment if this Celtics team bringing on Christoph Porzingis and Drew Holiday don't win a championship in 2024. Wemby. So good. He leads them in steals. It's ridiculous. He's a good passer, too. Like, he throws these long wraparound passes that, you know, you're not going to get in the way of that because, again, he's just so tall and his measurements are ridiculous. So he's he's starting to turn into a really good passer, too. His feel for the game is just ridiculous. And, yeah, Spurs better get it together. Like, you better go after Trey Young very hard this summer. Because you got to bring somebody that can play with him. I like Trey Jones. I like Vassell, Johnson. You know, those guys are solid role players, but they don't push the needle for nobody, not for no championship caliber team. He's going to have to 
or the, that front office is going to have to figure something out to pair a player with Victor Wimbenyama. Trey Young seems like the best fit right now, but hey, it's a long career yeah. ahead. What do you what do you make of his uh, team leading three point four turnovers per game? Yeah, it happens. He's a rookie. It happens. You're gonna, you got to figure it out. They're probably doubling him a lot. And, you know, he, he, he makes risky passes. And when you make risky passes, it's kind of like a quarterback who tries to thread the needle. You're going to turn it over every once in a while. But, yeah, I think that just comes with repetition and still figuring out the game and what Greg Popovich wants out of him and, you know, figuring out the league and the pace of it. But, yeah, that should go down. I mean – the greatest players of all time are all on top of the turnover leaderboards. Like you go look at the top five, it's like Stockton and Magic and LeBron and Kobe and Jordan and shit like that. Like the greatest Wait, players ever turned the ball. Were, you, over at a high were you on top of the turnover leaderboard at Bowie? No, I never turned the ball over. Yeah. No. Never, but I, I'm not a good player. That's the point. The ball's not in my hand. The ball's not in my hands enough to turn that ball over a lot. Like that's just it comes with the territory, you know. Like if I turn the ball over a lot, that means the ball was in my hands a lot. CZ wasn't trying to have that, you know. I had my moments, but I had to pick and choose when to go off. Pick and choose, you know, kind of like. Jalen Bridges did with Dylan Mitchell on him. Oh, Dylan Mitchell's guarding me. I'm take. I'm taking his ass. He can't guard me, you know, because it's Dylan Mitchell. He can't guard me. Bam, six for seven from three point line on that ass. Come on now. Come oh, on. trust me. When he gets to the combine after this season, every NBA team's gonna be like, "Hey, what the hell happened in that Baylor game?" <laughs> When Jalen Bridges lit your ass up, six of six from three. Yeah. He's six nine. You're six eight. Why on earth should we take you over him? Yeah. Yeah. Cause they ain't even look at that Bridges in the combine. Cause he's so old. Excuse me. Cause he's so old. Like almost what, 23, 24? You know, they're not even looking at him. So yeah, they're going to be asking those questions like, dude. Why isn't your defensive IQ better? You're too athletic for you to be this bad defensively. What's going on? You know? What's up, fellas? Hey, hey. Yo, guys. How are y'all? Good, good. How's it going? Doing well, doing well. What have y'all been up to for two hours? I heard the first 20 minutes and I had to go to a meeting, but it sounded great. So well, you guys get into more. Hey, why is they busting your balls so much, Chip? On Cause what? Because it's, it's on fun. On everything, Zay. Yeah, because it's fun. <laughs> Yo, this dude wore a do rag at one point of his life. I heard. I heard, man. Come I, on I knew now. He was great at tennis, man. But I, I want to see it, Chip. I, so Chip knew Chip. When when did we meet? Was I eighteen? We were talking about it at uh at yeah. BK's birthday. Yeah. Like, yeah. What? Late nineties. Yeah. No, I so I started one of the first escort services for uh, for adult males. Uh, <laughs> that's not how we met. I just wanted to bring that up. Right. I was like, okay, I did not know that about my man KD at the not time. Not true. Not true. I mean, I, I ran an escort service, but it was for females for about five. Whoa, years. hold on, hold on, hold on. I got something for you. Uh oh. Uh oh. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it, Chip. What's this guy going to do? Was it like a pamphlet from Vegas or something with all the escorts from five years ago? <laughs> oh, hey, now. That is great. That is so awesome. <laughs> Who the, is that you? There's the bandana. Look at that forehand, man. Wow. There's my state championship medals. Wow. Now, I know that the picture isn't providing a, an accurate depiction of what's going on here. It looks like you're about to completely whiff on that ball, though. But I know that you're about to get some topspin on that ball and rip it back to the other side. I've already hit it. Yeah, the topspin is... Oh, you oh, already no. hit that ball? Okay. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that's Here a good one. go, Zay. The pink do rag. <laughs> what are the medals around the picture, Chip? So this is this is the state championship medal. Pretty cool. Right there. You won a state championship. Yes, sir. Hmm. These are regional medals. When you uh, when you co-hosted a show with Chad, would you rub that in his face that you won state championships? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know how good Chad was. Well, I mean, he was that played? he was that walks a hat you when there are two ways. So who's backhanded cheap? Which we may see tonight at the dish. Because I played in the biggest class in Michigan, and we had to play against the privates, <laughs> right? Like in Ohio, I think in Michigan. The publics and the privates play, you know, in the state championship together. And it was always like I was at a public school and we won. It was a huge deal because we beat like all the private schools from Detroit that recruit. So we had a great team now. I mean, was Country Day Weber's place? Were they recruit were they like Westlake recruiting every sport? Yeah. Yeah. Detroit Country Day. West Bloomfield, Gross Point, University, Liggett. That's where Aaron Crickstein played. Um, Who? Luke and Murphy Jensen played at East Grand Rapids High School. East Grand Rapids is the school that American Pie is based off of. Wow. Didn't By know. the way. Yep. Hmm. Adam Hertz went to East Grand Rapids High School. So, Is that who banged the pie? I don't know who banged the pie. Yeah. I don't know if Adam Hertz did that or who banged who, who banged the mom. That's what I want to know. That was yeah. Stifler, right? Uh, no, Stifler. That was his mom. It was Stifler's mom that got oh, there. Okay. Well, yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. Sorry. John William Scott. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she talked about that in a recent interview and said, "You know, I just was at an age I wouldn't get a lot of attention, and I banged more twenty-year-old dudes after that than." than I ever could have thought of. And I thought, you know what? Good for you. Yo, she's kind of resurrected her career. Oh, yeah. I don't know her name, but she's on. she was on that show, White Lotus, and my wife loved that show. Jennifer she, Coolidge. She's yeah. Stip, she's Stipler's mom. That's who she is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Always. Always. <laughs> Who's the geek who bangs her? Oh, yeah. I forgot his name. Yeah, he's kind of a nerd. Yeah. Yeah, or, nobody's gonna think of that. Nobody. I haven't Chip, seen that movie uh, in the, the years. The five guys, the five fab freshmen. We got Country Day with Weber. Can you give me the four others in the high schools they went to? Ray Jackson, LBJ. That's all I got. Bingo. Jimmy King, Plano. Bingo. East. Plano, Plano East. East. Jalen, Jalen Rose, Southwestern. We got one more, boys. We got one. Oh, I'm, not gonna ask Chicago. About, I'm not going to ask about Eric Riley or Rob Palinka, who were a big part of that seven, by the way. Juwan, what did he go to? Chicago Milrose? Chicago. Howard? Uh, yeah, Juwan Howard, Chicago. Yeah, I don't know. I want to say Mil Milrose, but that could be wrong. Nope. Chicago, and now I'm forgetting it. Jesus. Uh <laughs> and Ignatius? No, no. What's the uh, what's the like uh, city? Oh, Chicago vocational. Vocational, vocational. That's it. Yeah. Wait, Rob. Rob Palenka was a part of that rotation. Yeah, Palenka was a pretty good guard. He and huh. uh, Eric Riley and Chip will know more about this, but um, they were pretty good players. Man, like both those guys were returning and actually were big big parts of those teams. Hmm. Yeah. Yo, Jalen Rose had drug dealers betting on his high school game. Yeah. No, like <laughs> with like with like a gun in the pocket, like, bro, you you better miss this free throw. <laughs> I got plus eight, all right? <laughs> oh shit, Detroit's nuts. <laughs> all right, fellas. Bye guys. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all. Later, boys. Chicago Vocational. How that? How did I forget that? You know, I know that. I, I don't know if I've ever heard that school's name before. And I lived in Chicago, as everybody knows, for six and a half years. Drink up. It was just south of the highway where my dad lived, or the main road, as you're heading to like Comiskey. So, and it was on the right side, and it was—I mean, it—it it was a a rough area.
but that's where I want to say Zorge went there. Um, I'm wondering if it's where, where Pilsen is now then, because you said it was before Comiskey. Before Comiskey, but like where my dad would have lived on the south side or like probably close to Justine as you're going down. I forgot the main road. It's not like the Dan Ryan. Roosevelt? So I, yes. And it's on the right and it's kind of elevated a little bit. Oh, yeah. I know. I know exactly what that uh, the school that you're describing. I just never knew the name. Huh. Chicago Vocational. And there have been some, I mean, you know, my dad has uh, Mount Carmel to always go back to. And there are a lot of great players. McNabb. Uh, Antoine Walker, Denny McLean, Chris Chelios. A lot of guys have gone there, but vocational has got a ton of guys that went there. Is Juwan Howard still the head coach at Michigan? I think so. I mean, I've, they've been awful this year. I watched them once and they were bad. Yeah, I'm looking up their record right now. I'm not going to get it through here, but uh, yeah, somehow Juwan Howard has hung on. Uh, despite the fact that really all he has to show for his time there, he's been there since 2019, is one Big Ten championship in 2021. Well, that's more than he had as a player. That's true. Washington, or maybe, maybe, or a, uh, Washington Wizards, or was he Washington Bullets technically when he entered the league? Probably Bullets, and they may have won it his third year with the four of them, the year they beat UT, that I forced BK to watch that incredible, um, you know, round of 32 game probably between them when Roderick Anderson's throwing three-quarter, you know, uh, you know, court lobs to uh, Albert Burdett and Tremaine Wingfield and B.J. Tyler, who played awful that game. I B.J. Oh, Tyler, loved B.J. Like, if BJ would have played anywhere near where he should have or did, you know, he transferred from DePaul, but like BJ, those two years was incredible. And if he would have just played like he usually does, we win that game. But Juwan Howard was a technician down low, Jalen six, eight and a half. And as a point forward, as a junior too. So his shot had gotten a little bit better. Jimmy and Ray played into it. Uh, that was a hell of a game though. So Michigan does really suck this year. Yeah, that's what I thought. They Eight twenty-two on the season, three and sixteen in conference. Currently, a seven-game losing streak. I'm guessing Juwan Howard does not keep his job after this season. Yeah, but kind of like the Rodney Terry David Pierce thing, you got to pick and choose your battles, man. And if you've got two of the three biggest sports to replace, you may replace one and replace the next one. You know, replace the other one next year. So, uh, yeah, you may be right about that, but geez, the, the wheels have fallen off so badly with this program. It's almost like you're forced into a decision at this point. Yeah, they may be. Um, and, and look, I mean, you know, we'll see where it comes down to. I mean, Trey and I have been very, I think, long term about this the whole time. Who knows with Pierce and uh, Terry, but I mean, they certainly were up in the air. But, you know, Sark proved something this year. You got your volleyball coach, you got your, uh, softball coach you got your women's basketball coach the other stuff's all set up so you got to kind of pick and choose but it's why i didn't think pierce and pierce pierce has done a great job of of going on runs and making it you know where you can't fire him um and terry did what he did with with beard's whole situation but once sark was solidified which happened this year one of those guys, you know, you better watch out. Yeah. So Jawan Howard fired his long or the longtime strength and conditioning coach for Michigan earlier this year. John Sanderson is his name. Do you recognize that name at all? No. He had been with Michigan since 2009 when John Beeline hired him. And has had a pretty immaculate reputation up until when he got fired. And when he got fired, there was also an email that was released with Sanderson's side of why things went so south with Juwan Howard. I guess they had a physical altercation at some point, which led to the firing. How many physical altercations is this guy having, dude? You're, you're not at vocational anymore. Jawan Howard, exactly. Like as a player, it's one level of things, but if you're having physical altercations as a coach, that is a colossal red flag. Well, he was suspended. 
your strength and conditioning, your strength and conditioning right? coach might have physical altercations, but you as the head coach, that's fucking Tom Herman territory right here. That should not be happening. Yeah, and 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 my knowledge of college basketball is pretty impeccable from probably '67 because I, I was born in '78, and you can study history before you were born. Give it a shot, y'all. Um, until probably mid 2000s, but I gave up on it, and so I have no idea um, who that guy is. But I also forget. I do know he was suspended for the Big Ten tournament like last year for something that was a little over the top. Look, I don't know if this – no, this didn't have anything to do with it because this was a December 7th altercation. So this is a completely different altercation. And, and the strength and conditioning coach's version of events, he wrote that Jace Howard, who I guess is um, is the son of the head coach and I guess is a, a captain on the team, Juwan's son, captain of the team, out for the season with a stress fracture – uh, he wrote that Jace Howard was berating their trainer and caused a scene that prompted several players to stop and watch. Sanderson described the scene as totally out of control and said the, tra uh, the trainer was trying to calm Jace Howard down and get him to discuss the matter privately. Noticing the trainer looked increasingly desperate and panicked, Sanderson intervened, yelling at Howard from left, roughly 30 feet away, you're a student athlete and he's a professional. You don't talk to a professional like that. As disrespectful and entitled, he said he repeated that the tirade was disrespectful. Sanderson wrote in the email to Manuel that he tried to de-escalate the situation, turning his back and walking away. When Sanderson looked back, he said Juwan Howard came at him, angry and ready to fight, repeatedly yelling as players and staff held him back. Quote, he kept aggressively pursuing me to fight as the players and staff were doing their best to restrain him. He was out of control. It was an ugly scene. I had no choice but to stand my ground. I didn't back down. A few of the players and staff got in front of me as well in an effort to keep us separated. Uh, kudos to you, I guess, for standing your ground. That is, I don't know. Juwan Howard is not a guy that I'm looking to stand my ground on. I'm, I'm looking to be a part of the de-escalation there. Yeah, and but, you know, if you're doing that, you have everything working for you. You're a former player. They don't want to fire you. You're a former NBA guy. You're in the woke world, so you're, you know, the, you have everything going for you. His ass is gone. Um, if you're that bad and you've got all that going on. Yeah, you can get away with it if your team is good. His team sucks on top of him completely losing control of himself and the program. Yeah. Hmm. They were good, though, man. They were um, they were a lot of fun to watch. And I, got, I wanted them to beat Carolina so bad. Um, not as much because my dad had split the pot at that point, but I still, I like them more than Carolina. I really love those fab. I love the UNLV and fab five teams, man. Like, I mean, I, I, I became hardcore, you know, certainly a t-shirt fan. Um, that's a good example of a t-shirt fan because I was never going to go to UNLV and I naturally didn't like Michigan because of my dad, Notre Dame, but, uh, but I just could not deny how much I love the way they played. Yeah, those two teams helped advance basketball because they played such a different style of game. And obviously there are physical differences for the Michigan team, especially versus what everybody else was wearing at that time. And that made a big impact on my life. Heck, I'm still kind of a baggy shorts guy based on the fact that I was yeah. a teenager when the Fab Five was at its peak popularity. And uh, basketball was never the same after each of those programs went through what they did over the course of a couple of years. Dude, I wore, we used to wear undershirts when I was playing basketball, like in a 98 degree gin in Austin because of Alonzo Mourning and Larry Johnson. So mm. it, it does wear off, you know. I didn't do the whole morning thing with every free throw with the wristband. But yeah, I mean, th those guys wore undershirts. And yeah, I mean, I, I still to this day, I mean, you were in that era where we more wear more baggy stuff than kids that are wearing like nut huggers now, you know, which would have been like our, our coach in the eighties, you know, wearing the bike shorts. I've had to dial back the baggy shorts just a little bit. Like yeah, I got I'm, not, I'm not wearing them like I used to like below my knees, but, right. I, but I'm definitely, and I also like more baggy jeans. I don't want these tight fitting jeans. Um, certainly not the, you know, what do they call them? The, um, skinny jeans or whatever. Oh, um, yeah. But, you know, guys wear those. I'm like, what are you doing? 
And, and getting back to it, you know, the, the worst look I've seen in five, 10 years, and look, fashion is cyclical, it changes. Um, but some stuff we just don't need to bring back. And this whole high waisted jean thing with no belts, I swear to God, I've heard more Levi buttons screaming for help. I didn't realize Levi's had a voice or emotions. They're buttons, but they do. I hear them begging for help like someone who's buried underground. Do they sound like Gilbert Gottfried bellowing for help? No, I, I just... <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so the, that style is in gyms right now, too, although it's not jeans, obviously. It's every... I haven't seen dudes do this yet, but every female is wearing a spandex bottoms essentially that go to or over their belly button. Yes. And then they're also only wearing sports bras as a top. It, it, it makes nobody look better. And so it, See, I think it actually does make a lot of people look better because you're hiding the, the flab. You're hiring that spare tire flab. Hiding it. Yeah. Hiding it in a picture in front of all of us? I've seen wafer thin chicks and they don't look better because all of a sudden, like the little pouch is just out here for everyone. I mean, it looks like you've got fucking nine kangaroos hanging out in your fucking pouch. It, it, and, 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 and if you're fat or bigger, oh no, it just, it puts everything in there. Like, you know, you know, I mean, it's like a, it's like the fucking Wizard of Oz, you know? Um, I've got a bunch, a couple of little munchkins, you know? Yeah, uh, Cooter says they're called girdle pants. It's essentially Spanx that you're wearing outside of your clothes. It's that same material that makes you look like you have a different shape than you actually do. And granted, you're right. Most still don't pull it off, but it's even worse if you take the, if you pull the Spanx down and let, let everything hang as it naturally would. Yeah. Fupa pants is what I call them. Nice, Michael C. Michael. Great to meet Michael and so many other people at uh, BK's gathering on Saturday, by the way. Old to meet Michael. He was like, you and Trey are my spirit animals. And like talking with him and his buddies outside, like there were just a lot of people who showed up. It was really cool to actually meet them. I mean, I look for us. I mean, it's, it's probably cooler than it is for you. So, which isn't much, but. <laughs> it's a low bar. Yeah, it's a low, it's a low bar. Hey, I, I heard an 80s song that, um, Reminded me of the show a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's kind of gay at the beginning. And I mean that if, if, if we take it literally from what I'm saying, but what's the song? Sometimes when we touch the honesty's too much and I have to close my eyes and hide. I forget what that song is, but Obviously, we're not touching, literally, is my point about that. But we are kind of touching in the rest of the lyrics. I'm like, that's the show. Sometimes I have to hide with the honesty that we have. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I, I just looked up the name of the song because I could not have. You could have given me a thousand guesses and I wouldn't have gotten this. It's a Good duet. Name. Heard it today. By Tammy Wynette and Mark Gray. And the song, to your credit, is called Sometimes When We Touch. Yeah, so there you go. Good song. So you said all of the lyrics remind you of a lot. Of them. I, I mean, was saying Rod Stewart sang it. It's like that's probably the second verse, maybe. But it was yeah. It was like sometimes when we touch, the honesty's too much, and I have to close my eyes. And I, I can I want to hold you to till I die, yeah. till we both break down and cry. I, I want to hold you I, till the fear yeah. in me subsides. Yeah, I, that probably didn't really register, but the other parts do. I'm just another writer, still trapped within my truth. A hesitant prize fighter, still trapped within my youth. At times, I'd like to break you and drive you to your knees. At times, I'd like to break through and hold you endlessly. Yeah, I really meant that one verse. Uh, <laughs> as, as you're repeating it <laughs> like no homo no yeah no homo exactly <laughs> oh man that is hilarious so 
Uh, you texted me a little bit about the scouting combine, which obviously started last Thursday, went through the weekend. I've shared my thoughts on this channel with regards to how various Texas players did. Uh, what is some of what you think about the guys who went through those drills over the weekend? I think that if I had to put the over under for first rounders now, I'd put it at 2.5, two and a half. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's funny. So I went back and rewatched it. And we we're talking about Xavier and the drops and the durability. He's not 180, he's 165. <laughs> let's let's get that right that's you know, an important note it is um you know he's 180 you know no but um i you know i i said i was like you're like can he be a first rounder i, I can see it happening if he runs into it i'm like yeah if he runs like into john ross oh he did so um it wouldn't shock me at all if he goes late first round i think there may be some other things still there I mean, I would say Adnai Mitchell at four three five, maybe even more of a hey, you're going to be probably a first round pick now. Yeah, AD was borderline first rounds, and now I think he ends up somewhere in the low twenties. Whereas Xavier was probably just on the outside looking in, and now he takes that borderline first round spot. The problem for both those dudes, I guess, to a degree, they're both still elite talent. Is that this is such a deep wide receiver class? The teams are going to be selecting from. So yeah. a lot of teams may choose to pass on a receiver in the first round because they believe they can get someone of similar talent in rounds two or three, or maybe even beyond. Do you know, I mean, I, and look, you know, uh, Marvin Harrison jr. Technique wise and as a technician and, and just how, how refined he is, is I can see why he's number one. I think neighbors is probably the best guy but we'll see a is right there brian thomas jr could be better than all of them and it wouldn't shock me at all that's how that's how talented he is yeah and he turned a lot of heads heck odunze uh did himself a favor with how he performed over the weekend too i mean it is just you were in a four three five two I want to say it was just above that, maybe. Let me double check that right now, though. But he's also a little bit heavier than A.D. Mitchell is, too. So it may have been two to three hundredths more than what A.D. Mitchell ran, but still on that level. Vlad McConkie showed out. Uh, Troy Franklin from Oregon showed out. Um, funny enough, the guy who really had an awful time, I believe 4-6-1, was Keon Coleman. But mm -hmm. he'll still get drafted high because his, his, his radius – it, just his understanding ballpoint um, skills are just really fucking good. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think your point's well taken. I mean, it, certainly I'm looking at this draft, and if I've got 20 receivers and there's not much separation from 6 to 15 or 17, then I'm looking at, you know, I'll, I'll grab one of those other guys in the third or fourth round. Like, sure. We need a safety. We need an interior lineman. We need a tackle, whatever. And there's not much depth behind that compared to receiver. Yeah, I'm looking at a new two-round mock that just came out from ESPN. They have A.D. Mitchell going 28 to the Bills. Xavier going 32. 32 to the Chiefs. I haven't seen that. That was a guess, but. I Yeah. It would, I would be shocked to not see Kansas City go wide receiver with one of their first two picks. Even yep. if things did get better in the postseason, you still have to look at the full body of work and realize that there are easy ways for them to upgrade in this draft based on what you and I just talked about. Right. Um, but no, overall, I mean, I think I think Christian Jones showed out well. Um you know, the guy probably did not show out as well as I was hoping he would. And one of the questions I've had about him is how lumbering he is, is JT Sanders. Yeah. I don't think he killed himself, but, you know, if you look at the percentiles of what he measured with the 40 and some of the other things, it was not. And there were other tight ends who actually really showed out. Kate Stover's one of them. So. Yeah, I didn't see. Did Brock Bowers go through any drills? He didn't run. He said that, um, I guess he had some Propecia appointment that got that took everything back. So he was trying to add some plugs pretty much. So then prostate was feeling enlarged that day. So he decided not to run. 
He said he's just mad at the world, so he's going to stay at home and yell. <laughs> yeah, this, this draft has JT going 55th overall to the Dolphins. And then a few spots later, Jonathan Brooks goes to the Packers. A few spots after that, Tavondre Sweat goes to the Bills. Yeah. Yeah, Tavondre is only going to help him out you know, help himself out so much. I mean, so much Murphy totally solidified as we talked about everything. Um, you know, to Vondre, there's multiple things involved. Um, there's a lot of bad film on tape. With to Yeah. Like plays where he's making no impact for the plays that he, that he gets that enormous push. I don't mean this last year. I mean, in his career, but we uh, talked about preseason, High pad level, can only play for a down. You know, the endurance isn't there. And so this year, the tape's great. And it's something to look at with Adnai Mitchell. That, dude, I mean, you know, we don't have a ton. It's what, what I love about the NFL draft compared to the NBA draft. NBA draft's like, hey, yeah, it's first trimester. Everything sounds like it's kicking pretty well and can shoot the three. First round. Um NFL draft that you know they want as much uh as as much material to look at to actually give a diagnosis as as much money as they're spending so if there's good and bad then they're going to look at both I think the good will outweigh everything and I think that Bo Davis's tutelage and the fact he learned pad level and the fact that he got in shape is something that that'll help him out but he's also 366 so same question with Jordan Davis you know I mean that can get out of shape quickly. Yeah. So if you're the Saints, you don't draft him, right? The Saints? Yeah. Didn't the Eagles draft Davis? I'm saying if you're the Saints, you don't draft Devondre Sweat because of all the... Oh, I got you, because all the food. The I mean, terrible well, food I mean, in I, New Orleans. Well, it's also I'm I'm just telling you what they're looking at. I I, I would draft him because I think that I also don't judge twenty year olds for the rest of their life. I don't judge forty year olds for the rest of their life, but certainly not twenty year olds. You know, I think Tavandre has turned a corner and gotten learned technique and learned leverage and and really for him pad level and it showed all year. I mean, he was the most dominant interior lineman in the country, so. I, you know, and it's also the NFL. So he's a two gap run stuffer. I mean, you, you don't need him every down uh, that I would gamble on it. But, um, but yeah, I'd keep him out of the, uh, you know, keep him out of the, but shit, if he goes to Kansas city, will that be, be any better? I don't know. In terms of food. I don't know. I, I don't Better than new Orleans. Yeah, probably. Cause <laughs> Everything is deep fried in New Orleans. Now, look, you can fry, find deep fried food anywhere. It is America after all, but New Orleans seems like the most glaring example of that, where it's somebody who may have issues with weight. You just, you don't take that chance too early. Like if he falls to New Orleans in the third round, okay, that's a different story. But if he's there with New Orleans second round draft pick, you got to look a different direction, I think. Yeah, and by the way, like I said, I'm just giving you the reasoning that they're looking at with that. Um, I would look, I would look more at talking to him in the last year and being like, this guy really has it together. You know, most alpha males don't have their shit together at 21. By the way, the ones that I actually want to hang out with. Yeah, it's true. A guy who will admit that he didn't put up a great performance over the weekend from the Texas side of things. Keelan Robinson. I expected anybody else to get into the four threes other than Xavier worthy. It would have been Keelan Robinson. I thought he had a shot at the four twos, but he was underwhelming running a straight line. He was pretty underwhelming with some of the other explosive movements that they're measuring distance. And he will probably, I mean, this may have already been the case heading into Indianapolis, but he will likely end up as an undrafted free agent rookie now. Yeah, I think it would have been, would have been the case either way. And I said that last time we talked, but now it's definitely going to be the case. And now you just wonder, do you get a Malcolm Roach type UDFA where you are a priority? Because there's different levels of UDFAs. There's priority UDFAs where you'd rather sixth, seventh round, you're begging, don't draft me, don't draft me, don't draft me. 
and you get a really sweetheart deal like Malcolm got with the Saints, um, who obviously wanted them and recognize the uh, undervalued guys at UT that hadn't been developed. Um, so now you just wonder wh- wh- where do you sit in that, you know? What'd you make of how Christian Jones did on Sunday? I mean, you know how much I love him. Uh, he looked good, looked lean. I mean, for, for that size. Uh, thought he ran well. Um, you know, I don't take too much into any of those drills they do. But he looked agile. Um, I, I'm telling you, I, I know he killed all the other stuff with interviews. So, yeah, you know, um, I mean, I think he had a good good week. You know, I mean, the fact that Daniel Jeremiah said that he'd be, I heard you guys, you and uh, I think Jeff talking about this yesterday, was going to be, he thought, a day two guy. Man, I mean, that's probably late. You know, anytime you say day two, you mean third round. Um Otherwise, mm. I think he's a second round pick. Okay. So, do, he's third round guy. Probably a late, and but that still would surprise me. I'd still probably think fourth, fifth round. But, you know, the biggest thing is don't hurt yourself there. And a majority of Texas guys didn't hurt themselves. And, and you know, I think only helped themselves out. Certainly AD, certainly Xavier, certainly Byron, Christian did. I don't think JT killed himself, but. Just as I've always watched him, I just I've kind of thought, you know, how electric will he be as a tight end in the NFL? Because there is a rumbling aspect to him, dude. There just is. Yeah. He is just physically, he's so big. That's obviously going to help him out. But I think that his skill set isn't necessarily easy to measure on some of these basic tests that they put these guys through. I agree. I agree with that too. Cause like I think a, hands and I think he's got good feel too. The, the feel for the game is important with him. You see that all over the game tape. He is, he finds ways to get to open fields and takes really smart angles also to pick up extra yardage too. So yeah, there's a maneuverability there that I think people may be sleeping on a little bit because he didn't excel at the combine. And I'm fascinated to see what JT Sanders becomes as a pro. Cause I I still think he's going to be good. Is he going to be Travis Kelsey level good? Well, no, but nobody's Travis Kelsey level good. Maybe except for Rob Gronkowski and a few uh, a few others over the years, a Tony Gonzalez type, let's say, or maybe an Antonio Gates. But I still still think think he has a chance to be a Pro Bowl level performer at the tight end position before it's all said and done. Yeah, he could be. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to say he's not, but the questions, and I have some weird questions about Bowers. Bowers, I don't know why either, but I think it's more some of my Georgia friends, Evan or Dave, that have watched him so much. And I, shit, I probably watched him as more, as much, if not more than they have, but that just kind of how will it translate? And that's always the biggest question. How does it translate to the NFL? We've seen guys that you don't think will, and they do. And some guys you think, well, of course he will. And they don't, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, at the end of the day, I think Brock, certainly Brock, but I think JT will be all right. He's going to make good money. His biggest thing at his size is, can you be an inline blocker and actually really, really be a guy that they have no idea. You know, one of the things about George Kittle that blow, really blows me away, George Kittle's a damn good blocker, man. Yes, he is. He's got that dog in him, though. I don't know if Jatavian yeah. Sanders has that that dog oh, I, necessary to be a blocker oh. for a guy who's known more as a pass catcher. That's funny, yeah, because I think JT has a dog in him. I don't know if we've always seen it with run blocking, but his run blocking went to shit after the ankle injury. Because I don't think he could really plant and set his feet. So that's the other thing that I would need to bring up with Brock Bowers. And look, Georgia guys and you, y'all have watched way more Brock Bowers than I have. But Brock Bowers was clearly not the same player at that after that ankle injury that he suffered this year. Like he was out there competing because he's a dude who wanted to try and help his team win games. And he did even though he was maybe at 75, 80%, when he is at full speed, he is a freak. Yeah. He he does have that, that Travis Kelsey sort of potential. It, he does. And also I'll say this, 
you know, I haven't looked at PFF grades, just watching him for three years. He was a pretty damn good blocker when I watched him block too. That's where I haven't watched nearly as much of him. So I'll trust yeah. you on that one. So if, so if he is a solid blocker to go along with being an elite pass catcher as a tight end, that's a, that's a great combination for somebody like that. And it's why he is uh, penciled in as a first round draft pick right now, probably in the top half of the first round too. Well, blocking takes a lot of anger and just years of, you know, being pissed off. And when you're balding as a 50 year old man, there's a lot of pent up frustration there. So he's, you know, He's hitting the fucking linebacker in the ribs like, you don't want to bring the cart back at Central Market, you piece of shit. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of pent up stuff there. So this first or this uh, mock draft has Brock Bowers going nine to the Chargers. If you're the Chargers and you take Brock Bowers, you've got to discourage him from going with the shaved head look for as long as possible. You want him to wake up every day looking into that mirror and seeing just that uh, that fading tough to top his head to keep him as pissed off as humanly possible. Offer up the minoxidil. Offer up some of those other things to help with hair growth, which really just helps maintain whatever is left because of the potential aggression that comes along with those pharmaceuticals. That's fair. That's a good point. I could see him with the Chargers. And, uh, no, he's going to help someone out. And I think JT will, too. I mean, I think JT is going to be a – a, a good player. It's more what you're talking about. Like, I just don't know how good is that pro bowl. Good. Is that the 15th best tight end in the NFL? Good or average. What is that? He won't necessarily be a top tight end next year or maybe even the next two years, but I think by year three and four, he'll really establish himself as a, let's say top five to 10 tight ends in the league. Was there anyone else? I mean, Ryan Watts looked like he had good numbers, but he's never played safety. So, I mean, I'd, I'd still be surprised. I mean, someone may take a chance in the sixth or seventh round because of his size, and he ran well. I his numbers were decent for a cornerback, so for him to go, move, move to safety now, I think it's going to be a pretty natural fit for him. I think the learning curve is going to be accelerated uh, because of what he already does well and what's going to be asked of him as safety, including – uh, what's not going to be asked of him as much, and that's turning his back to a quarterback and trying to stick with a speedy wide receiver in coverage. Um, but according to those who know more about these things than I do, his numbers were actually pretty good for a cornerback and, and uh, exceptional for a safety. I will say this, man, a couple white hopes showing out. Cooper DeGene from Iowa we talked about. And how about Peyton Wilson? who I loved at NC State. He had, two, I think, two ACL injuries, a lot like Penix. Um, bigger guys. Brother, actually, is a pitcher for the Brewers. Um, athletic family. But he ran a 4-4-4 at that size at linebacker, dude. I want to say the fastest linebacker. Mm. He's a big dude, knows for the football. If he can stay healthy, Peyton Wilson's going to be a steal because he's probably not a first-round pick with the ACLs and the health concerns. Mm. I know nothing about him, so I'll just uh, I'll trust you on that one. He's a baller. You said NC State. Yeah, Peyton Wilson. Yeah, I watched. A, I don't think I watched any NC State this last year. So good, good for uh, good for the Great White Hope showing out at the combine. Great White Hopes, both of them, uh, including uh, is it Dijon or Dejean? I I don't know. I mean. Talk about a team that I'd only watch on mute on one of my five TVs. You know, Iowa's, you know, watching your parents fuck, except without as much action. Yeah, and then he got hurt at some point in the second half of the season, which made them even less watchable. Yeah. No, I mean, their defense was very – their defense was great, dude. I yeah. mean, that offense was just impossible to watch. I mean, it's you coaching, you know – one of the kids' basketball teams at eight. Hold on, I was a good basketball coach this I'm year. I'm talking about. I'm talking about the scoring. Oh, okay. So yeah, Iowa was so bad offensively that their um, their total for the first half of their game against Michigan was half a point. Yeah, <laughs> that's what that's what their yeah. projected total was, and they went yep. under. Yeah. <laughs> so so Chris Kapachek, who I work with. Played at Air Force, but his whole family went to Iowa. And he texted me that. He's like, dude, what should I do? And I'm like, 
honestly, I was like, I wouldn't touch it. But if I had to, I'd go under. Which is, I mean, crazy to go under half a point. But it hit. It hit. Yeah. You want to see the renderings of what might become the new stadium for the A's in Vegas? Please tell me it's like two big tits. Close. All right. There's a shot from behind home plate. Oh, what is that a soccer stadium? It's a baseball stadium. There's the stadium from the outfield, I guess, out or beyond the outfield. So it's covered but open? Yeah. I mean, this is so fucking gaudy. This is like the perfect baseball stadium for Vegas. I mean, the, it looks like a fucking symphony hall. It doesn't look like a baseball stadium. No. What are y'all doing? I, it, some are suggesting on Twitter that they're basically putting these renderings out because Vegas doesn't want the A's anymore. I don't know what happened there to where all of a sudden this relationship soured, but Vegas's mayor came out within the last couple of weeks and said, actually, Oakland, y'all should try and figure something out with the A's here. We don't know if this is going to be a good home for them. Yeah, Oakland can't figure their own shit out. It's taking care of their own people. No, no, it's a complete disaster there. As much press as San Francisco gets, because San Francisco is supposed to be the highfalutin of those two communities, uh, Oakland is well past San Francisco in terms of just how big of a fucking disaster it is. So I was, talking, a disaster. was talking with Malik, who your buddy's with, uh, a yeah. couple weeks ago. He said to say hey. Um, and he um, he's born and raised in Berkeley, has had a printing shop in Oakland for, what is that, like 20 years now? Yeah. Uh, ended up selling it and is doing stuff from a different spot. He was like, it's just, I mean, and, and Malik is as socially liberal and as understanding of a human being as you could ever meet, you know, just does not want to castigate anyone. Was like, yeah, I'm fucking done with this place. Like, oh, when, did he completely move out too? He's about to. When, wow. Malik, when Malik tells you that, dude, ball game. That's, it's sad, but it's not surprising. Malik, who was willing to give a benefit of the doubt for 15 years, finally had to wave the white flag. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, Malik can be as understanding and, and as lenient of a person as I've ever met, but he's not a moron. Yep. You know, at some point, it's like, I'm getting out of here. So, um, yeah, and that's a hard to sit. Like, we can, we can say it's an easy decision from where we're sitting. Malik has lived there his entire life. So that's yeah. leaving home. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it'd be like if Austin got so bad where I'm like, Trey, I'm leaving. It's like, you said you were going to wait till your parents died, you know? And I'm like, well, you know, by the way, I haven't told them, can you give them a buzz? <laughs> by the way, you're meeting Bob at Chinatown tomorrow and meeting Cindy at a gun store. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> give it to him lightly. Oh God. Um, speaking of that, boy, I tell you what, man, I may actually, I'm pretty sure. Um, I got John Bufalina, correct? Yeah, you know, the, the original location, and we on our own went to Douay, which is now the better of the two locations. Yeah, I haven't been to the, the new one. Uh, off is that still East Caesar Chavez? It's off of, yes, it's a little bit further east now. The space is nicer, I would say. It's a little bit more open. They have windows around two of the sides of the restaurant. I forget if there's outdoor seating or not, but they're very different menus. As a matter of fact, there's only a few crossover items on each menu. Even the Caesar salad is better at the Douay location than the Caesar Chavez location. Wow. But I digress. You apparently have a new pizza place that what? you and I need to try and that uh, you're going to let everybody else know about right now. Yeah, what are they getting different in romaine? I mean, what's going on here? It uh, is the, the way that they were cutting the romaine, the dressing, and I think there was a difference in how the parmesan was uh, was prepared before being put on the salad too. Yeah, so we talked about a couple weeks ago or a week ago about you know what what I had in Austin, what Trey had in Dallas, San Antonio, and Houston. You really have been around, man. It's pretty impressive. Um, but like what we grew up in Texas with pizza was Domino's, maybe Gaddy's, Pizza Hut, uh, 
what was the garlic sauce that we talked about, laughed about? No, the garlic butter. Garlic butter from Papa John's. Um, but it really was, you know, one of the best things for me moving back from New York is I was exposed to the best pizza. And we kind of had it here in Austin. Um, I think Home Slice does a good version of a New York slice. It wasn't Joe's or, you know, some of the best ones I had in New York, but it was close. Via does a great Detroit style, which is different. And and then um, really the margarita or that very thin Neapolitan style, I thought Home Slice nailed. Which are not home slice, Bufalina nails, which they do. But I got to tell you, so maybe not Bufalina because it's a little different. But, uh, and this sounds like a pizza shop that Brock Bowers would like. Bald Danucci. <laughs> um, and they've got one store. It's in Westlake. It used to be the old Blockbusters. I told the kid who was serving me that, you know, talk about an old man. I go, no, hey, bad. this used to be the Blockbusters. You know how big Blockbusters was when in 1990 when I was 12? He's like, dude, you know, take your fucking pizza and get out of here. He actually didn't. He was actually a really good kid and was like, oh, yeah, well, it does make sense. This is a Blockbusters. Thanks for coming. So the service was great. But I got a kind of Roman style, which would be more close to what Via does with Detroit style, more box and thicker. Potato pie. Okay. And then I got the uh, Bianco, which was more of a New York slice, right? Yum. How was it? It's the best pizza place in Austin. Whoa. Take them apples. Take them apples, all right? Okay, I'm looking at the menu right now. I, I do have to admit, Roman style. I don't get out of here. Quicker pizza, not as big of a fan. I'll try the New York style slice, though. You know I'm all about that thinner slice. Is it a crispy crust on the bottom? Yes, but not too crispy. And the dough was incredible. And I'll tell you this, as much as, because you know I don't get the Via Detroit styles much, mainly because gut issues like you. Although we'll say with Dave, and I mean this, like, dude, I have not had acid reflux. Good. So those, those pills do, they work magic. They really do. If both you and I had our reflux issues subside just from taking those pills for a couple of weeks. I mean, that's yeah. ask for much of a better Testament. Encapsulate USA. And what's our code to get people money off Texas sports, TX sports, I believe. I I've never received a, any information regarding a, um, what? code. We've talked about it on the show, man. I've, I haven't received something. Look, there are a lot of words said on this channel that I'm a part of during the week. Uh, the the code, the discount code is something that has just apparently not stuck in my brain. God, this guy's like, you know, some 80-year-old who's loaded marrying some 20-year-olds, you know, waiting for the prenup to not be signed. Dude. Um, I don't have anything in writing. We talked about it. From the moment that I wake up at 6 to 6.30 in the morning until my wife goes to bed at 10 o'clock at night, I have people talking to me all fucking day. So do I. <laughs> and I am, I am a, I'm not a total loner. I have the I ability like to talk. Day. I love talking with people, but I get past that threshold about halfway through the day. And then it's just we, me fucking winging it the rest of the time. By the way, that was an encapsulate pill. It'll clean you out. It's great, um, but it's really helped out with all that stuff. I like a dude. I talk with people like I don't. That, that reminded me of the Larry David Richard Lewis hour and a half I sent you. You know, when he's like, "Look, you know, I'm a former alcoholic. I've got, I've got liver issues." He's like, "My parents died." He's like, "Oh, your parents would have been 95. You got anything else for me here?" I'm assuming that he is a part of the rest of the season too, but they, on Sunday's episode, it was the first episode to run since Lewis died last week. They did a, uh, in memory of Richard Lewis and they gave the years of his birth and his death. And there's actually a storyline between Larry and David in this episode. And it's hilarious because <laughs> I don't want to ruin it for you. I know you don't watch curb at this point. You may want to go back and watch at least the start of this one. Because he oh, ended no, up, it. whatever. They, they, there was something having to do with AA, 
and Richard Lewis got up and spoke in front of a, a group of uh, sober people. And apparently he was making the crowd laugh. <laughs> and Larry's like, and he's afterwards, he's like really happy. The happiest Richard has maybe been in the history of the show. And he's like, man, I think I had some, I think I had some stuff there. <laughs> he talked about how he's going to work, work up some, uh, some AA related material. And he's like, oh yeah. It's like, you're going to film your first, first special in a while. He's like, yeah, I may get in touch with the HBO people and see what they think about it. So he's like, that's, that's where you are now. You're having a, to cater material specifically to former drunks. Oh my God. Uh, you were never all like, so, um, but no, I meant it more. It's funny. Cause when I watched all that, there were different sides of both of us, you know? Oh yeah. Um, where, you know, especially when, when Richard's like, you know, you hate people. I love Larry's line. I do. So what? Um, I don't, I don't hate people. I, my threshold. I was talking about me. <laughs> I hate a lot of people. I don't hate everybody though. And I do like, and I do like conversations just like you do, but we both have that limit that when we go past that limit, we're not worthless per se, but my ability to retain whatever the fuck is being talked about goes down greatly. And the reality is as much as we've got certain parts of both them and so does BK, we're not, we're not fully them because we're not Jewish. Well, Holy shit, Charlie Strong. Put that finger down. My God. <laughs> God. <laughs> that is terrifying. You think they only love me for my looks, huh? Well, I knew it wasn't the looks. Now we know what it is. <laughs> oh, God. I love rapping with y'all. All right, you gonna go pick up the kids or something like that? Gonna go grab my mathlete, and then I'll be back in a few. All right, sounds good. Is that an innuendo? Probably. No. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> Eating any math things? No. I mean, I was horrible at math, so any academic success that I had was as far away from math as possible. Right. You? I was okay at math until it got hard, um, but it was never my strength. And even if it would have been, I wouldn't have done that. I mean, I was, I was good at with my memory, and you were great at it too, at spelling, but also early on with math. But I never, you know, I'd compete in class, but I wasn't going to do anything outside of class with that. Like, you don't get any credit for it. And I'm going to go play ball. I'm going to go play yard football. I'm not going to go watch. I'm going to go watch Tiffany Amber Thiessen if I'm not doing that on Saved by the Bell. <laughs> yeah, any sort of academic extracurriculars that I was in as a child came because my parents wanted me to do them or basically forced me to do them. Like, if you're staying after school. This is good for you. You're doing this. And I'm a kid. They're my ride home. So what am I going to say? Right. Well, the other thing, too, having a sister who is nine years older, she was the mistake. Mm. Um, that, uh, that, she gave me info that like most kids didn't get. So I think at eight, nine, ten, she told me, Hey, none of this matters until you get to high school. You're none of it matters. They don't look at grades, they don't look at anything you've done, Boy Scouts, any of that. Like it, you know, I guess you could put Boy Scouts in, you know, for your college admission, but they really care about what you do from ninth to twelfth grade. So that just, you know, my dad was pissed when he found He's like, why'd you tell him that? Like, we know, <laughs> we know the kid's looking for outs everywhere. I mean, come on. Yeah, that's, she did you a solid with that oh, one there. Total solid, man. Yeah. That, she, went to te- she went to Southwest Texas State, and I went to go visit her and a couple of her hot little roommates. I'm 10, you know, they're 19. Or actually, I was 11, and they're uh, 20. And went down by the river and everything. I mean, dude, I had never seen anything like that, bro. Oh. And then she had a party and all of her friends came over and bikini. Like. Yeah. Back in the day, too. I mean, that even for like a 10 or 11 year old now seeing college girls, that'd be great. But this is what pre cell phone when people just weren't subconscious about everything they did getting put on the Internet. This is pre-cell phone. Also, Texas State has become a really good school. Southwest Texas State in 1989, bro. 
Well, if you're saying Texas State now is a really good school, that tells me everything I need to know about how <laughs> bad it used to be because Texas State is still the ultimate party school. And I, I believe me, I loved the few times I went down to San Marcos, but that that place is still nowhere close to being known for its academics. Yeah, well, it wasn't then. It was known for just smoke. Think of tech, but uglier chicks. Mm, yeah. Wait, yeah, uglier at Texas State than at yeah. Tech? No, no, Tech had uglier chicks. Sorry. Okay. okay. Um, no, I mean, th- th- yeah, Tech, but hotter chicks. I mean, th- they were they were smoke shows. Yeah, there's still plenty of them now. Or at least. Oh, I know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, maybe they've gotten a little smarter. I feel like most schools in the state have gotten a little smarter over time. I mean, shoot, you and I talk about it all the time. Like, we, we couldn't get into Texas right now with – who we were growing up no chance hell no no way i'm not even sure i'd apply right now yeah no, I'm, I'm not either it'd be a waste of time more than likely which it's a great degree to have because it's appreciated so much for me but even for you it's appreciated you're 30 now and like that thing just keeps over it's like you went to texas yeah it was even harder to get back in then yeah <laughs> that was impossible back then. You know, there weren't that many students back in the day at UT, which made it clearly much more difficult to get admitted. So yeah, it was like Notre Dame. They let in like there were like eleven thousand kids there when I was there in seven. Yeah, yeah, it was a historically low acceptance rate that year. So I was a part of that. That's that's good to know. Oh man, good times. Shoot, we got a couple of shows together today. Yeah, we do, buddy. I'm. Oh, yeah. I'm- to it man uh, yeah get out there and um hang out and and you know i love the left field people and i'm kind of curious to see the environment you know because the, the crowds have been great and the crowds have been there the, the pitching staff hadn't yeah and look at home the pitching staff was now obviously they weren't playing great teams at home but uh, this team was seven and one and all the uh, they the last series they played at the dish they didn't give up a single run now the SEC teams that they've played and the team that they're playing tonight, a little bit better than Cal Poly, but uh, hopefully a return to home can help this pitching staff find some of what it had through the first eight games of the season. If not, with that Aggie offense coming to town, this could be an ugly one tonight. Yeah, get the W. I don't have I don't have a lot of hope long term with the staff. I just don't think they have enough arms. And it was kind of our worry we talked about before the year. Um and I always like to let it play out. I think it's unfair. I mean, just to lose your shit 10 games in, you know, whatever. But, yeah, I'm not not feeling great about just how many arms they have and if they have enough. And, and look, Will Mercer, the Notre Dame transfer, who I watched at Notre Dame, would have helped out. You know, this was not Eric Gagne when he was on roids and pumping. Yeah. You like that old school name right there? That's well done right there. That's a name that I know too. So I'll always appreciate that one. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for picking a college baseball player who had a ton of success at the big league level. So I was bound <laughs> to know him. I always appreciate that. Yeah, it's you know, outside of LBJ, is there anyone on the staff, starter or reliever, that you have confidence in? Like Hurley's shown us something during his Texas career. And there are some guys who have had good performances, but like outside of LeBaron Johnson, is there a guy that like you you can know what to expect? when he takes the bump, whether it's as a starter or a reliever? No. Like, I hate to, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying that, but no. Um, Like, I'm pumped to see Tanner tonight because I think Tanner's someone that as he gets the confidence back and and could be a really good guy. Hurley's not bad. I mean, his numbers, I think he's 3.69 if I looked at it earlier. You know, have fun with that, PK. But um, it was around there. And um, and there are guys I've seen that were younger who I liked against bad competition. But as we talked about, you know, once there's two things when you face serious bats, pitching changes, and when you face serious arms, all of a sudden that 320 average they have as a team doesn't really hit that. Although I'll say this: outside of the LSU game, offense was not the issue this week. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you score double digit runs. I think you and I were talking about this off the air. Like uh, there have been years where if Texas got to five runs, you could say good night to it. That's a win. And you score 10 and 11 in back-to-back days and you come away with zero wins. Then, 
you can't put that on the offense. Like it was frustrating that Texas didn't score after the fourth inning on Sunday, but shit, 11 runs against Vanderbilt like that. That's got to be more than enough to get you a dub. Yeah. And one thing I've given Pierce credit for that I think he has, has done a good job of adjusting with is understanding you could be up seven, three and you still have to bunt in a certain situation. Right. Did you're up 11, three, you're not bunting. Like let it fly. Yeah. And so it's and like, that's not a manufacturer type run situation. Now, if it gets to 11, eight and you've got guys on first and second, no outs, we're bunting them over with our eight guy. Right. Sure. Um, and then probably squeeze in and, and let's get it around uh, to Jared. But always go to Jared, Trey, or BK, which, mm. I, which I think you will at some point, right? Go to to, uh, to get that big ring. Yeah, Jared Thomas's house, sure. Has he got onion rings or something that he's cooking? What's going on? <laughs> but, like, I, 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 so I don't blame them on that. But, yeah, the staff just bothers me. I, I just don't think. You know, we'll say this. People should come out and and also come out. There'll be offensive linemen out there for Texas One Fund. If you can give to the Texas One Fund, please do that. Yeah. You know, I, I found out some information that bothered me about a week ago within my channels. And by that, I mean Mafia. And, you know, Marucci, the back company, is pretty much paying for all L- LSU's fucking nil yeah that must be nice for them i know but i know it sounds like i'm always picking on lsu baseball i have nothing against arizona state miami cal state fullerton arizona hell even usc so it's not like i'm ripping on every top program but i'm gonna call shit out when i see it and lsu's cheated every step of the way i would call this the least flagrant it's nil and someone's paying for it hey but how's marucci doing how are we not part of that? What I'm saying is, I'm not. I'm not getting on you. I want us to be part of it. Right, right. Or if it's not Marucci, some other bad company, Easton or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Some sort of apparel company or equipment company oh. that would be chomping at the bit to get to work with the place like the University of Texas with all the history and pageantry that this baseball program has. It, it sure feels like, I mean, we're starting to see it with football, but obviously there's more competition in football than there is in baseball in terms of big money being thrown around. Like we, we should have baseball, if not number one in terms of NIL and money pumped into the program. We should be top three, maybe top five at the worst. Yes, we should be number one because it's the best program. And by the way, everything I'm saying about Marucci and LSU is what everyone's saying about Texas and the Pancake Factory, and I totally get it. So like I said, it's actually the least – flagrant that they paid Skeens 500k after we offered him 250 and he agreed to it um that and that's marucci coming in to get tommy tanks or Skeens or and like i said it compared to to Bertman forcing these guys to take roids and gorilla balling it and shaving bats in 09 and trading two bats between nine guys like it's it's you know this is pretty above board yeah well, yeah. it's legal. It's legal is what it is. I was going to say, it feels like everything's above board right now. Like, I'm sure there are some things that aren't, but it, it feels like, yeah, you can obviously get away with a lot more now. So for a program that's been doing shady stuff for a long time, it's like, oh, shit, we've already been doing this. We, we don't have to change that much. Now we just oh. don't have to hide it the way that we kind of have in the last few decades. This would have been the Astros changing from the trash can to me as a bat boy and sinking low and the catcher's dropping low. It's like, dude, this is actually, this is pretty much ethical, all right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's it's like I hear stories like that, and it's like I'm happy the football program's right, but it's just there, there should be enough resources and money in this alumni base and this donor base is big enough to where uh, everybody should be benefiting and Chris Del Conte talked about that even before an image and image and likeness right he wants Texas to have a top 10 program in every sport and a lot of the programs on campus are top 10 level right now but there are still a few big ones that uh, just aren't consistently there and unfortunately baseball is is one of those right now and you feel like there are things that could be done to help that weird question I I'm not gonna snip this and um tell you later on you know in a year you're wrong is rodney terry the coach for ut next year yeah that's what i thought yeah 
uh, I mean, the the only way he's not is if they find some dirt on him off the court. Which I don't think they will. I no. mean, Terry's a good dude, man. Yeah, it would take a Chris Beard type of situation to cost Rodney Terry his job, and that ain't happening. So, yeah, he'll be uh, he'll be back next season, and he should be back next season yep. too. I mean, it, it hasn't been great, but uh, right now Texas would be an eight seed in the tournament. Like in Chris Beard's first year, they were a six seed. It's not like Chris Beard came in here and had Texas competing for a national title right away. Now I think it's pretty well documented which of those two coaches I have more faith in, but. Yep. Uh, now, you know, making the tournament that that sure as hell doesn't get you fired. Even if Texas missed the tournament, I would tell you RT is getting at least one more season. But this team's going to make the dance now, uh, even if they are one and done. That would suck. Uh, there won't be a change made atop the uh, men's basketball program. I didn't think so, and I, I'm with you. I don't think there should be. It's just you know, I see a lot of frustration. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just thinking what could have been, right? Like yeah. just getting getting that taste of like, oh, we have our guy. Like we, we really have our guy. Yeah. And then just in this in the span of a year and a half, it's just it's taken away from you. Hell, in the span of a night, it was taken away from you. Uh, I think that's part of it too. It's just like, God, we we felt like we were set up for a half decade, a full decade, maybe even longer than that of success. And now it's like, ah, this is what's happening with this team. So I think that's contributed to to the frustration and obviously the way RT got the job too has, has irked some people just, you know, being the interim guy versus being the big name hire like Chris Beard was that you plucked from another program. So he's got some things working against him, but he's this year hasn't been bad enough to where CDC is going to make a uh, knee jerk reaction. He also earned it. I think. Yeah. From, but like, I mean, if you wouldn't beard left, would, would we have thought that it would have been that type of run? Right. Yeah. I mean, if Texas lost to Penn State in round two in that 210 game, then uh, there would be somebody else coaching right now. Yeah. Uh, I, I, th I honestly think once Texas made it to the Sweet 16, RT had secured the job and then they beat the hell out of Xavier in the Sweet 16. And that strengthened his case. And, uh, you know, he's got the he's got two excuses that are legitimate for why Texas lost that game. Number one, Dylan DeSue didn't play. He was the best player for the team in the tournament before he got hurt. Number two, I, like Uncle Luke paid off the refs. So Miami shot 400 free throws in the second half. Like, ain't, ain't no coach in the world who could have prevented that shit. That was bullshit. So I don't, I, I don't think Texas beats UConn. I don't think anybody beats UConn last year the way they were rolling. But you know, you get to a Final Four, and I, I think that maybe changes people's thoughts on RT, even the way, even with the way this season has gone. Yeah, we've been to one modern day Final Four. So yeah. Shout exactly. out to Slater Martin, 43 and 47, whatever, but. Yeah, he was on that 03 team too, right? He was the Brock Cunningham before Brock Cunningham. <laughs> Man, when TJ would feed him in the corner, ooh, watch out. <laughs> yeah, it's a good squad. Good squad. All right, I will see both of y'all out at the dish here in a little bit. Sounds good. See you, brother. You see that the NBA is considering – eliminating the corner three altogether by extending the three-point line to where it essentially hits the sideline at the wing. I mean, with these guys' feet, it's already been an issue for a long time. I don't know how they get their feet in there. Um, maybe expand the whole court, which is a bigger issue, but I've talked about that. Like, it's when I, you know, a few NBA games I'll even tune into for a second. You know, it's like, you don't think they're bigger, strong? No, 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 they are, dude. They're too big now. I would. You know, it's men playing on a women's volleyball net. I would consider, speaking of, I would consider expanding the overall court. But the first thing that I would do, and I always have to preface any basketball court change that's made by saying the infrastructure is already in place, so it's never going to happen. Right. I would raise the rims to 11 feet. Yeah, I've heard you say that before, and I can see that. That I would more expand the parameters where I can shoot deer with my new 2024 rifle. Um, and I always thought the NFL should have done that. What the NFL did instead was just change all the rules where you can't touch offensive guys. So I don't know what, what would have been better. But, um, but look, I mean, Major League Baseball did that. and Give them credit, you know, when they change the mound. Like, sometimes you have to do that. And... And but they, lo they lowered the mound, correct? 
Yeah, they lowered it after Bob Gibson in was that sixty eight. Um, you know, just shut everyone out. So that could have been some racism in there, um, that which wouldn't shock me at that time. Um, but it ended up being better for the sport, you know. Yeah, same with no longer allowing dwarf bat boys to take the plate in promotional stunts. Heard about your fat point guard you created. Oh, God. Richard Head was an all-time character on NBA 2K. Richard Head. There was one The Simpsons had. I was going through those names you were talking about, and there was some funny shit people brought in there. There was one The Simpsons had that was... It was so fucking funny, especially the way Mo would say it, you know. It's like, hey, I'm looking for a hey, hey, we got a call for a Harry P. Nest. Is there a Harry P. Nest here? I'm looking for a Harry P. Nest. You know, I mean, it was fucking great. Was that actually on The Simpsons? Because that's pretty far for them. I'm almost, I mean, I don't know where, I, I, I never watch The Simpsons. I think it's great, but I just never watch it. Um, yeah, I'm almost positive that was The Simpsons. Uh, one was IP freely. IP freely. One was Jacques Strap. Yeah. Harry Peanut. This would have been like 20 years ago, if not 25, probably. Al Caholic, mm. Oliver Close Off, Seymour Butts, Homer Sexual, Mike Roch. That's pretty good. Mike Roch. I remember that one. Yeah. I'm a stupid moron with an ugly face and a big butt and my butt smells and I like to kiss my own butt. That's from Treehouse of Horror. Q Jass. B I mean if you're but though, like don't don't end up saying Q Jazz, you know. Yeah. Amanda Hug and Kiss, Ivana Tinkle. Ivana Ivana Tinkle's funny because it just it works. Ania. Uh, I'm sorry, Anita Bath, Maya Butt Reeks, Waylon Smithers, Yura Snotball, I Ate PP. Where where are you reading this off of? Simpsons.fandom.com. Okay. Hey, would you cuddle me? Ollie. Well, the, the, the Hey, would the best one, you remember what that one was? Hey, would you blow me? Yeah. Let's see. Drew, oh God, is this seriously? Wow. Uh, good for the Simpsons, I guess. Drew P. Wiener. Okay. Drew P. Wiener. Yeah. Um, Yuri Nador. Yuri Nador? Oh. Urinator. Oh, okay. Mo Ron. Um, I could have swore Harry P. Ness was there. I mean, I, I'm not. I mean, maybe I saw it somewhere else. I would have been like, I think twelve. So we're maybe. talking. Okay, yeah, this is well beyond when you and I would have been twelve. Tess T. Coles. Not bad. Ivana lick you. Yeah, that's it. All right, give me one minute. Give a quick shout out. I'll give a couple quick shout outs while we are at it, starting with Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Now, let me tell you about the great people at Big Hat Spirits, BigHatSpirits.com. They didn't create that cocktail in a can, but they do it the best with great flavors like what you see on the screen right now. If you're watching on YouTube, that would be ranch water, jalapeno ranch water, the margarita. They have that prickly pear paloma, the blackberry smoke. The Texas Mule, and yes, you see on the far right there, that margarita mocktail for you non-alcohol fans. 
Not only do I love all the great flavors with BigHatSpirits.com, I also love that they're low in BS. That means, as you see right there on the bottom of the screen, no syrups, no gluten, non-GMO. They're BPA-free, 100% natural, real spirits, real alcohol, real kombucha, and no added sugar in every cocktail in a can provided by BigHatSpirits.com. And since we're at the website, I'll show you what I mean when I say go to the top of the website, scroll down just a little bit to that map of Central Texas right there, click on an icon to find the location nearest you that sells those big hack cocktails in a can. Let's see, this is down near San Marcos right now. How about Twin Liquors in San Marcos? They have the Big Hat Spirits cocktails in a can. Go to Big Hat Spirits. Dot com. And now a word from my buddy Tom McKay of Audio Visual Consultations. It's a jazzy version of this one. Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audio Visual Consultations. Today's home electronics can be a bit daunting. My company has spent the last 36 years making sure they are not. For those of you who have not experienced our services yet, we'd like to invite you to give us a try for all your home electronics needs. We carry all the major brands of televisions and stereo equipment at prices you can't find in stores. And we come to you. There's no need to leave your home to find great pricing and incomparable service. No traffic and experienced sales geeks or pushy showroom tactics. We believe in having some fun and dreaming big. Do you have a dream for your home entertainment? Let us know. We can make it come true. And we are always there to help after the job is done. We cultivate clients for a lifetime by treating everyone like their family. No, not those family members. I'm talking about the ones you actually like. So relax, hug your kids, make love to your wife, and smile. Then, when you have a moment, give us a call at 255-8678. It's 512-255-8678 or online at avconsultations.com. Thank you to Tom McKay, and thank you to my friend Steve Hunt. He is the man responsible for Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers. Their website, pestwranglers.com. I can go there right now for you, as a matter of fact. There you go. There's Steve on the left-hand side there. Pest Wranglers, as you see that motto, effective, reliable, affordable. There's a secondary motto. It's we love you, the customer. Great customer service is evidenced by the fact that they have countless five-star ratings and reviews on Google, Yelp, and elsewhere. And right now is a great time with the temperatures warming up to get out in front of mosquito season. The mosquitoes, they're coming with that warmer weather. Pest Wranglers offers eco-friendly treatments that don't target bees or butterflies and is non-toxic for birds and mammals. Stuff is so effective. It's been used in Africa for ma malaria control. And they offer more of a conventional treatment for faster knockdown as well if you've got a pool party or a backyard party coming up in the next couple of weeks their treatment is effective for up to 21 days that conventional mistreatment for either of those treatments there's no horrible odors and both are wallet friendly typically under 100 bucks per month and as always no contract get yourself on the schedule or uh, find out more info by going to that website that you see on the screen on youtube right now pestwranglers.com Tom, as I welcome Kevin Dunn back now. Love Steve, man. Steve's a good dude. We need to hang out with him again. Yes, I have something on the books with him for early May, perhaps. We're going to see a comedy show. Well, I've invited you to this as well. We're going to a comedy show at the Mother's Oh, no, I appreciate that. I'm glad I'm still part of the club. Well, you are still a part of the club. I don't invite you to every comedy show I go to because I know you have a, a limited threshold for that sort of thing, but that's pretty much my life away from home right now is sand volleyball and comedy shows. So uh, yeah, I like going with different people and getting their input on things and trying to pick comedians for, for my friends and the folks that I like to hang out with. Who are we going to see in May again? Steve Byrne. Who yeah, right. I'm talking about him is a Pittsburgh native and it may legitimately be the, f the hardest that I've ever laughed at a comedy show. He was a Creek in the cave a month ago. Creek in the cave was like a quarter full Wow. Well, I had complete control of that room. And I imagine at a place like the mothership, it's going to kill even more. That's Baldinucci type praise there. Baldinucci? Oh, the pizza place? I dude, look, I, I have, we have to try it, man. Like it's so I, I work right near it now. Um, and it is like I'm gonna be going there all the time. So where where is the blockbuster? Because I'm imagining the shopping center where the Randalls and the Jason's Deli is. Is it further down B Cave though? It's where the Jason's Deli used to be. Oh, the Jason's Deli is no longer there so either. The Jason's okay. Deli was there. The Blockbuster there. You had Chinatown, the one that Linda owned, not Ronnie. 
you had Amy's ice cream and you went around to Tom Thumb at the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that, that shopping center. So I just gave you the whole spiel. I gave the poor 23 year old. who was super nice about everything with me. I'm like, Hey man, can I just tip you cash? Like, you know, just thanks for listening to the old man, you know? Yeah, I kind of want to go there tonight because I've got to find something for dinner after the baseball pregame that we're doing. But that's probably a little too far away. I need to find something on the east side or maybe uh, maybe something in downtown or something that's heading back towards Cedar Park. I mean, if you're doing that, you could always, <clears throat> I don't know what what's easier, probably Mopac for you to hit 183, but you could always just take that to... 360 and take that all the way up. Yeah, that's too far off the beaten path. I'm having all to right. cross, go across town. We'll meet there. We'll meet there. I'm trying to get them as sponsors on the show because it was that good. I'm like, holy shit. So, yeah, look, I, I, uh, I went out on Saturday and ended up downtown and was trying to find some late night grub after the late comedy show. And, Sixth Street was too much of a fucking mess. I didn't want to walk back down Sixth Street after we left the comedy mothership. Was and there so, any good food down there, like at night? Yeah, actually, I did before the the late comedy show. I, I grabbed uh, some uh, burrito and a taco from this little stand, and it was delicious. Mm. And the pizza that I got on Sixth Street was not that good. It wasn't Ropolo's. It's whatever is out in front of the Jackalope now. The guy was a complete asshole to begin with, which isn't that surprising. It actually tracks with that place. And then the pizza was very mediocre too. It's like, look, if you're going to be that big of a prick about things, your pizza had better be on fucking fire. And it is not. So after the show, we went down Red River because I'm like, dude, I got to find something right now. I just want a decent slice of pizza. Went to some place called Hoboken Pizza, I believe. I've seen that, yeah. Fucking garbage. Do not go there. Pizza not good. And... I, they were serving these, I guess, deli style sandwiches too on these thick hoagie rolls. The bread, I don't know if it was stale or starting to go bad or something. The bread was awful. There was too much of it and not enough of the uh, the sandwich ingredients. So unfortunately, the, uh, the late night dining options, although I still ate a ton of it because I was wasted and just needed a booze mop, were terrible. Yeah, how fucked up did y'all get on Saturday night, man? Oh, I was wasted. Of course, I went home and went to bed. Well, see, I say I was wasted, but it was just a combination of drinking and smoking. So drinking, I probably yeah. had a nice buzz, and smoking, I was baked. And so the two things together were, yeah, <laughs> had fun, but that yeah, was it. also not walking all that straight by the end of the night. Yeah, that's all right. You had rides home, so you were all good. Um, that's that's exactly it. My buddy who was visiting from out of town was like, hey, should I just drive down there? I'm like, no, there's no need to drive down there. I'll pay for the Uber back. If that's what it takes. God, what is the Uber back on that? Not cheap, Bob. Not cheap. About a hundred some odd dollars. Which is up from the typical 40 to 50. I know. I just think about these people that are like month to month and are in Round Rock and want to have one night. I'm like, you know, I mean, the reality is just go downtown and don't drink, you know, or have a beer or two, you know, and then drink three waters the next two hours and, you know, be really safe on the way home. And that's what I normally do. Like, that's not typically my styles to go out and get wasted, but it was just one of those random nights. It started in the middle of the afternoon with BK's 30th birthday celebration. So carried it over. I had the two comedy shows, getting to hang out with a lot of my favorite people, you included, at Kelly's, then BK for the Mark Norman show, and then my buddy Jesse for the Dan Soder show. And it's just, uh, you, it's all about moderation. If I were doing that even every weekend, one, right. my body would be completely breaking down, but I also wouldn't enjoy it. But something like that, like a one off, yeah, great. Let's go. Let's yeah. go. Go, go have fun and, and do it up. Um, Speaking of let's go, it is 4.30, so I am going to shut this operation down so I can meet y'all over at the dish, or actually technically occupy left field yep. here in about an hour. Yeah, I hope there's some parking there. because Where should I try to park? 
Well, I mean, I, you know, where I live, I actually looked at it and I'm like, and I don't plan on drinking there. I mean, I'm sure I'll have a couple at, at, uh, Occupy Left Field over, you know, me over five innings off two fucking beers probably. But, um, I was like, it'll just be cheaper and one of y'all can give me a ride home on your way home, right? It's like yeah. fucking 12 bucks from where I live and that was like at 2 p.m. Oh, perfect. What the fuck, what the fuck are y'all doing? It's a, you know, I, I ride my bike over there all the time. How is I was just thinking, maybe, maybe I should load my bike up and park somewhere off of Manor and just ride over there. I mean, I, I thought about it. I mean, I've got, I, I'm maybe going to meet someone later on, which is why I'll, I will be wearing this out there. So you can leave all the jokes, I actually bring them. Um, but where I may have to go meet someone later on. So that's why I'm going to drive and, and I'll, I'll hang out for a couple of winnings, you know, cause I like those guys. But honestly, I mean, I, I, I had a couple of people offer me tickets to go to the game. I just don't give a shit about this baseball team. And, and by the way, that's long term. I we've got long term investments. So if you've been around for ten years or fifteen years, Trey and I have forty five in, and hopefully another forty five. When you've been a fan for so long, you start to look at your portfolio and say it's a bad year for the stock market. I'm still in. I'm just not going to look at it. And that's where I'm at with basketball and baseball. So I watched two seconds last night and went old man and went to bed. But I, you know, I just don't, I don't believe in Terry or Pierce or what they're doing. So anyway, let's enjoy the pregame show. Text me where you're parking. Don't say it out loud right now so that everybody else doesn't take that idea too. Sounds good. Later, buddy. Later. Thanks to everybody for hanging out today for Kevin Dunn and everybody else at Texas Sports Unfiltered. I am Trey Elling. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Actually, we'll talk to you here in a little bit for the Longhorns versus Aggies pregame show from Occupy Left Field. Until then, have a great afternoon.